What's up everyone, Cold Fusion here. Folks who have been following the content on my channel for the past two years will be aware of a little project that I have been working on. And, despite life and some setbacks getting in the way, here it is. If you have just stumbled upon this video due to being interested in this game, or if you simply want to kill a couple of hours, thanks by the way, then welcome. In 2018, I played the original game for a measly 60 minutes. Due to circumstances at the time, I stopped playing the game and vowed that I would pick it up and complete it later, as I truly felt that I was missing out on one of the most lionized games ever released. Despite this, it was pushed onto the back burner and faded out of my mind into obscurity. Fast forward to 2020, and the long-awaited FF7 remake had finally been released. I vividly recall wanting to start playing the game after I'd finished my Blood Tinge playthrough on Bloodborne. Put this game to PC, please. And after a full week of binging the remake in its entirety, I found myself in the position of pursuing this sub-franchise further. Little did I know that this would cast me down a rabbit hole so deep that it would end up becoming one of my favourite games. So much so, in fact, that it was the catalyst that I needed to begin my first ever long-form critique on this channel. The aim of this critique is to objectively criticise the remake as much as I possibly can. However, don't let this sully your mindset into believing that there will only be objective statements made. There will be a fair share of my own opinions scattered within also. This critique will be broken down into four major categories. Story, Gameplay, DLC, and the conclusion. Within each category there will be a series of segments that will allow the game to be broken down further. For brevity's sake, the time bar and description will allow you to jump to whatever topic is most relevant to you. Now, there are plenty of people on the internet that have very firm takes on this game in one way or the other. Frankly, I believe both perspectives to be quite flawed, and I myself have a much more nuanced take on the game generally. I want people to come out of this video with hopefully a different mindset regarding the writing, gameplay, and the broader discussion on remakes as a whole. Before we delve in, this is your first and only disclaimer that there will be major spoilers for the remake, as well as the rest of the Final Fantasy VII compilation. If you haven't played those titles yet, or you're waiting until the remake trilogy releases in its entirety before tackling the compilation, then you might want to bookmark this video and come back later. In, like, four or five years or so. Anyway, without further ado, welcome to my critique, of the Final Fantasy VII Remake. We begin with an eagle soaring through the sky. As the bird of prey pushes through the clouds, we are greeted by a majestic view of the metal metropolis that is Midgar, in all its splendour. Getting to see it during the day is quite a rare sight, as well as all of the basic errands that are undertaken by the various construction workers, store clerks and milkmen that we are shown during this montage. Life is depicted very specifically through this lens for those that live atop the plate as a somewhat idyllic society that benefits from the fruits of Shinra's labour. Of course, things aren't quite that picturesque, as the soundtrack appropriately elicits here. The music changes from a grand swell to a melancholic moat, as an old water-deprived flower withers away at the side of a road, before showing us some children staring at the domineering reactors that surround and shelter the city. The Mako expulsion careens into the sky, which moves us into a more familiar sight, that of the Mako particles that hover gently in the darkness, before showing us our first glimpse of a woman with Viridian eyes. She stares at the pipe from where the aforementioned Mako particles originate from, but then leaps up, startled. She stares down the alleyway before turning and running away hurriedly, 
almost as if she sensed something unusual or malicious. And this is where we have our first notable departure from the original. In the original game, she stands up calmly and looks towards the street, before walking in that direction whilst nothing strange occurs. However, in the remake, it almost feels like a mirror of what the original represented. And not without cause, for she clearly senses something odd, something that shouldn't be there. Keep this in mind for later. It is also worth noting the music after the woman looks down the alleyway. It is a reserved rendition of the track One Winged Angel, a piece of music that holds a lot of infamy within the gaming community, and something that will be elaborated on down the line. The lady with the flowers bumps into one of the pedestrians which causes her to drop her flower basket, spilling her flowers on the pavement. As she gathers them back up, a man steps on the last one. She picks it up and cradles it, showing a level of affection most people wouldn't. We then pull away to reveal Midgar in its entirety, with the opening theme reaching its climax, as we come all the way back down to a train screeching to a halt, revealing a lone blonde figure atop said train. As the train comes to a stop, two Shinra security guards inspect the train for irregularities, yet one of the guards is alerted by the sound of his comrade being attacked, which causes him to investigate. He then gets blindsided by a man wearing a bandana, followed by a swift kick by a woman who is also sporting a bandana. As a third member presents himself, they look onwards to the addition of a fourth, a significantly larger man by the name of Barrett. Barrett commands the others to keep going and then beckons the fifth and final member. The last person to disembark is our central protagonist, Cloud Strife, a former soldier of the Shinra Corporation. And the term soldier, capitalised, isn't some kind of shorthand to refer to the Shinra personnel by the way. It is actually an elite unit made up of three classes, first, second and third. Third being the lowest, first the highest. First class is an exclusive cabal replete with the strongest warriors Shinra has to offer. Cloud describes himself as being a former first class operative, so I think it is safe to say that he is one mean motherfucker. Barrett leaves Cloud to engage the starting force of guards, though we are supposed to believe that these guards just let Barrett run past them with no qualms. Pshua dude, whatever. The group pushes forward, letting Cloud handle the guards. It is worth mentioning that Cloud isn't just some regular dude with a massive sword. One of the core aspects of being a soldier is the physical enhancements that they receive via experimentation, which supercharges their physical capacity including the density of bone and muscle fibres, allowing for superhuman feats of strength and endurance on top of their mental aptitude, which is also bolstered to insane lengths. This explains their reaction times, as well as a first class soldier's ability to fight faster than the mortal eye can track. Basically think of them as Captain Americas, but even more juiced. The only difference being that their physical size and build isn't altered, but don't let that fool you. Cloud may appear lean and fragile, yet he is certainly stronger physically than the walking mass of muscle that is Barrett. Eventually they reach a security door leading to the official name drop of Cloud. So what's Soldier Boy's deal? Is he one of us now? He's got balls this, uh, uh, what was his name again? Cloud. Cloud Strife. Right. And he isn't a soldier anymore. Still, he's a professional, unlike the rest of us. I'm glad to have him. <laughs> this is a one-time gig. When it's done, we're done. Uh, uh, uh. Barrett pushes Cloud out of the way, showcasing some obvious tension. Whilst the names of the three aren't all presented here, their names are Biggs, Wedge and Jesse. Yes, obviously Biggs and Wedge are references to the Star Wars characters, and this isn't even the only Final Fantasy game that features characters with these names. Hell, it is pretty much a staple of most of the mainline games. Wedge comes up to Cloud and insinuates that he must have an ulterior motive for being here. Come on, nobody do something this crazy just for money? They may not think you're a true believer, but you know what I think? Not interested. What? After Cloud rejects a discourse, Barrett calls Wedge away to keep up with the mission, and hopes that Cloud is worth the money. Cloud is the odd one out here, the rest of the group are clearly tightly knit, whereas he is the muscle. 
They are very Ocaran to his skills, yet he was also hired because of his knowledge of Shinra, due to being a company man, of course. After another series of conflicts, Cloud and Co enter the main reactor, with Wedge waiting outside on escape duty. Whilst Biggs and Jesse tamper with the door controls, Barrett uses this moment to draw some info from Cloud, yet he also uses this opportunity to question the legitimacy of Cloud's betrayal to his former employer. Soldiers may attack on command, but I hear they make good guard dogs too. Bet you've seen a few reactors. So how do we get to the bridge above Mako storage? <clears throat> Ain't holding out on me, are you? Stamp scared to bite the hand that fed him? Or is he a loyal little dog? What results is a strange, pained headache from Cloud, presented alongside a greenish static visual to really sell that idea of excruciating pain. Despite this, Cloud rebuts Barrett's concerns by answering his question. Different reactor, different layout. Depends when it was built. Never seen one like this, but I'll manage. This line is consistent with what we learn of Cloud's past much, much later. In fact, we don't even learn of it within this part of the game. Biggs opens the door and Cloud, being the point man of the group, enters first. Upon entering the room, the guards react and immediately close the door to stop them. This leaves Cloud in the somewhat awkward predicament of killing the guards. That's my line. Cloud's response to the guards is quick, yet gives us a good display of his character with how cocky and arrogant he is. Not out of hubris, mind you, for Cloud is acutely aware of just how strong he is, and how these guys pose no threat to him. This almost egotistical mask of his, and the line that presents it to the audience, allows us a good taste of his early characterization, which eventually, throughout the course of the story, gets tested as he will be posed with threats to himself and others that will humble him, and shape him into the character that he is yet to become. The posse continue forward, to an elevator that will take them deeper into the facility. Whilst they wait for the elevator, Jesse makes an inquiry. So, you know Tifa, right? It's not really my business, but are you guys close? This question prompts a similar reaction that Cloud had earlier, but with an actual visual this time. The vision, or memory, itself is of a town by the name of Nibelheim, the hometown of Cloud. A young Cloud leaves his home and explores the Dust Bowl town, before a girl calls his name. It is Tifa, the individual that Jesse quizzed him about. Before anything more is shown, the memory cuts out and Cloud is close to answering Jesse's question. Barrett interrupts them as the elevator arrives, upon which they enter. We are greeted with a different location, and a burly man in a trench coat walks down the carpet. This man is called Heidegger, and speaks as if he is giving a report to a superior. This is exactly what the well-dressed man is, as he is the president of the Shinra Electric Power Company, or the Shinra Corporation for short, or Shinra for even shorter. President Shinra himself, a creative name, I know. Heidegger identifies our party as Avalanche, and presumes them to be of the same faction that attempted an assassination on the President. Giving us a clear understanding of where Shinra and Avalanche lie in opposition to each other for the time being. Back in the elevator, Barrett gives an impassioned lecture to Cloud on the plight of the planet, the importance of the planet's lifeblood, and Mako energy. Aside from Barrett trying to give us his perspective on the matter, it also doubles up as an appropriate use of exposition to give the player some context on what the purpose of this mission even is. This cell of Avalanche are enacting a bombing mission on a Mako reactor to prevent Shinra from extracting the basic essence of the planet, the living tendons that hold the planet together. Put simply, they are eco-terrorists, and offered Cloud money to assist them as a mercenary, thanks to his knowledge of the reactors and other Shinra tech. Cloud instead displays scepticism, mocking Barrett for his belief. Straight I do! Get help. <laughs> Say that again! Says it all, really. <laughs> With the addition of Barrett to the party, the flow of combat is adjusted to allow for the control of two characters. This is good for overlapping character abilities, and using items or spells to bolster the other characters that are present. For example, 
Let's say that Cloud goes low on health, yet cannot use a potion to raise his health from a critical level. Then you can either swap to Barret, or issue a command to him by pressing the shoulder buttons so that he can consume an ATB charge to heal Cloud. There will be further elaboration on this during the gameplay section. Cloud and Barrett have some great banter here. Do your job, Shut up and move over. It almost seems as though they derive pleasure from denigrating one another. A detail that I really like is that Cloud informs Barrett of the weakness that the Shinra mechs have, by telling him that they have reinforced armor plating, and as such they should use magic to break through it. If the player hadn't used a magic command to this point, this is where the game informs the player about it without being too blunt. Think of it like some kind of diegetic tutorial, where the info assists the player, yet still fits within the context of the universe. Barrett asks Cloud a question. What are you? 20 something? First. Huh? Soldier first class. It doesn't go into the 20s. What the hell are you talking about? I mean your age, not your goddamn rank. I, uh... No, for all I know. A soldier's rank could be the same as his age. Mm-hmm. Guess that makes you a one-year-old, huh? Live and learn! Whilst it is a strange answer, Cloud is pretty much a wallflower, and clearly displays signs of awkwardness and social insecurity. This factors very heavily into his character, although that is a topic for later. They finally reach the central reactor, which elucidates some feelings from Barrett. We will learn more of Barrett and his motivations further down the line, yet for now we are given the knowledge that he has been planning and preparing this for years. I know exactly how he feels. We part ways with Jessie temporarily here, though she uses this opportunity to spout some flirtatious dialogue at Cloud. As Cloud and Barrett descend further, tackling more of Shinra's defensive units as they go, Barrett makes a rather profound statement. that Cloud bypasses. He gives a very dry and sardonic response to his comment, showing that Cloud doesn't give any pretense to thoughtful and philosophical topics, and that instead he thinks very literally and tactically. The man takes a more practical view of the world. He isn't stupid, far from it in fact, yet he simply doesn't focus on anything outside of his field. The duo clamber down the ladder and waltz on over to the reactor core. Alright, let's see if Little Stamp really can bite the hand that feeds. Hmm. Go on, do the honors. Prove to me you're the man Tifa says you are. That you're one of us. Never said I was. I'm just here for the paycheck. Then do the damn job! Barrett is evidently trying to test Cloud's loyalty here, yet Cloud takes the plastic with minimal fuss. As he sets the device, he gets another headache here. You know what, we'll refer to these events as Tism Visions from here on out, okay? This Tism Vision in question showcases a lone feather floating to the ground before dissipating. Cloud's reaction is of deep concern, yet... Okay, we have to take a brief tangent to discuss something here. Spoilers are incoming. We know that the feather represents Sephiroth, right? And that this Tism vision was likely brought on as a result of the Mako fumes as well as the fact that the reactor reminds Cloud of that fateful night in Nibelheim. Yet, Sephiroth doesn't unleash his grey wing at that point of the story, so Cloud shouldn't recall this as anything noteworthy because he isn't aware of the wing yet. Unless, of course, he is recalling fragments of memories or visions of events he has yet to experience by this point in the chronology. This would favour the theory that Cloud is unintentionally privy to information beyond his current reckoning, and that he will, in future, act upon said knowledge in order to enact or prevent certain events in the story. I suppose the feather is also a nice reference to the players that are familiar with Advent Children. Besides, it isn't the only Advent Children reference in this game. <coughs> Anyway, uh, back to the synopsis. Cloud's reaction is of deep concern, yet he immediately senses something rushing towards them and enters his defensive stance, prepared to draw his sword. 
For some reason, Barrett seems to think that Cloud standing still, ready to draw the sword, is a clear sign that he is betraying him? Chill out, man. He isn't gonna kill you. Soon enough, the threat makes itself known. Our very first boss of the game is the suitably named Scorpion Sentinel. As it makes its grand entrance, we are greeted to a banger of a track by the fucking geniuses that genetically engineered this soundtrack in a lab or something. But I'm getting ahead of myself, we shall be discussing the music later. For now, let's break down this fight, shall we? The Scorpion Sentinel is a brilliant first boss, as it does everything that it needs to in regards to introducing players to mechanics that they will use in the rest of the game. To me, this is a cornerstone of opening bosses, and there are a few other bosses in games that elicit this same sense of teaching lessons to the player. Here are a few examples. The core tenet that links all of these bosses together is their ability to subtly adjust the player's mindset in the way that the devs intended. An example from the Scorpion Sentinel that exemplifies this point is in how swapping between two characters is important. The boss has an attack in which it can grab a character, disabling them from the fight for a few seconds before damaging them. This forces the player to swap and make use of the other characters that the player has at their disposal. By actively taking away the player's control on one character, this reminds the player that they can switch between characters and encourages them to swap more frequently against normal enemies too. Even if the game didn't give the player a message to indicate this, it would still be subliminally injected into the heads of them. This isn't the only game that does this, Doom Eternal in particular also has a similar principle with weapon switching too. Another example of where character switching is encouraged is when the Scorpion Sentinel leaps onto the walls in the second phase, as this makes use of Barrett's ranged advantage to full effect. Whilst the player can just wait for the boss to come back down, this does mean that the player loses out on a free opportunity for some easy damage. The fight is really well structured due to its phases which are brilliantly woven into the fights thanks to the in-engine cutscenes that occur when the boss's health reaches a specific threshold. Though this can lead to the player using a powerful ability just as the boss reaches this threshold and losing out on the damage it offers, because the boss becomes temporarily invincible. This means that one-shotting bosses with high-level characters is impossible, though the bosses in this game have a large amount of health anyway. Still, it cannot be understated just how brilliantly the dev team managed to create boss fights that function well mechanically, as well as being presented well cinematically. Another element of the game's combat that is taught here is the difference between attacks that can be blocked and the ones that should be avoided. Generally, most attacks should be blocked to mitigate the damage you receive, although there are some attacks, such as grabs, that absolutely have to be dodged. Unfortunately, the regular dodges in this game don't have iframes, though there are methods of dodging that are obtained later that do. It is also worth noting that every character has a different dodging animation, and some are better than others though in a way this can represent what sort of playstyle you should use with each character. For instance, Barrett has a dodge that is very slow and doesn't cover much distance, and also takes him a while to recover from. When combined with the fact that he has an ability called Steel Skin which grants him hyper armor and reduces the damage he takes, one could argue that you shouldn't be dodging much with him anyway, and instead should rely on his recommended playstyle of a tank to soak up damage, as opposed to avoiding it. Back to the boss, some of the Scorpion Sentinel's attacks that coach the player into either blocking or dodging are as follows. Mark 99 launches? Block. Death Grip? Dodge. Electro Stomp? Block. EM Field? Dodge. And so on. Next up, 
enemy weaknesses. We already touched upon this earlier in regards to the use of magic to deal significant damage to enemies, but the player can also use very specific elements against different enemy types to delete them more easily. In this scenario, the Scorpion Sentinel, as a robot, is weak to electricity as its internal systems can be overloaded. If you have played any Pokemon game, you know what point I'm making. Fire beats ice, wind beats flying types, etc. In Phase 2, the boss activates a barrier which makes it immune to magic attacks and significantly blunts physical damage. However, this can be removed by focusing on a generator behind it. The boss has a move in which it targets an individual character, though this blinds it from the other. You can use this opportunity to swap to the character that isn't being targeted and run around it to attack its weak point. On a somewhat related point, certain enemies and bosses have multiple regions that can be attacked to force the boss to lose certain moves and abilities or to stagger them, which presents the player with a monumental opportunity to deal some serious damage. The Scorpion Sentinel is no such exception to this rule, and you can damage its legs to cripple it briefly. In its final phase, the Scorpion Sentinel activates a self-repair unit to replenish its health, thereby cluing the player into the knowledge that other enemies and bosses may be able to do this too. By this point in the fight, the player will have very likely accrued their first Limit Break. Limit Breaks are powerful moves that can turn the tide of a fight and are obtained either via using abilities, staggering enemies or taking damage. The fact that a lot of people obtain their first limit here is a testament to how well balanced this fight is. Due to its health pull, the boss will take a while to go down, yet it doesn't pose too much of a threat for it to be too challenging to newer players. Yet it still manages to be formidable enough to keep veterans of the original on their toes. Eventually, after a chaotic fight that causes the room to be set aflame, the Scorpion Sentinel falls into the abyss, defeated. You hear that? Damn thing showed you how it's done. Come on, we've gotta move. In the ensuing chaos, the bomb was activated, prompting a swift exit for Cloud and Barrett. This sequence is pretty cool and gives a more bombastic feel than the original did. Cloud engages his chivalric side as he saves Jessie and they continue upwards together. After getting irritated with her small talk, Cloud does the thing that he does best fight. I am interested to hear how other people interpret the 5 seconds is all we need line. I believe it is Cloud explaining that fights can end in a matter of 5 seconds, and how you should remain focused and keep your head in the present rather than thinking too much about what could happen in the future. There is merit in that as it links pretty well to the major theme of the remake. Even with the smaller time bank, there is still a ridiculous surplus of time allotted to the player in order to escape. Honestly, I wonder what the sense of urgency for the player is needed for. They could have simply had no time limit, yet implied that the characters get out of there quickly regardless of how long the player procrastinates for. If it is harder to fail even with the shorter time bank, then what is the point in the decision at all? As the elevator takes the duo up, Barrett becomes antsy, yet when he turns around, he discovers Cloud with his arms folded and eyes closed, representing the cool and reserved figure he fronts as. This reminds me a lot of Qui-Gon Jinn in The Phantom Menace, when he is waiting for the barriers to drop before facing Darth Maul. As the bomb explodes, President Shinra beckons Heidegger to activate the internal defences and robots within the reactor with one objective. Destroy. Shinra destroys their own reactor, with the intent to cause more damage than anticipated. It's clear that Shinra wants absolute control over everything and as such, enacted this false flag attack to simultaneously make Avalanche look evil whilst making themselves look like the saviour. Even when they lose, they win. The entire gang reunites and heads to the exit that Wedge was covering, with Cloud once again assisting Jesse. As Cloud seems like he is about to fall to his doom, he performs an athletic leap and lands next to Jesse, prompting a comment. Okay, that was pretty cool. Cloud offers a smirk, and the Come two on. of them flee to safety.
We begin the second chapter with our party regaining their energy, their task successful. Barrett impels Wedge to lead the group out of the tunnels and back to street level. Jessie shows concern about her preparation of the bomb that was used in the mission, because she made sure to follow the instructions to the letter when crafting it. Despite the assurances from the rest of the team, she still shoulders the blame for the actions that occurred. Of course, we know that it was Shinra that escalated the damage, yet the characters do not know this. Despite this, an argument could be made that, had Avalanche not attacked the reactor, many lives would not have been lost. As such, this opens up a discussion on the levels of activism that are morally acceptable, and how far certain people can go to do what they think is right. Avalanche's provocation for destroying the reactors is to prevent the planet's life force being drained in favour of powering the lives of the world's population. This is, of course, proven to be the correct viewpoint ethically speaking when Bugenhagen shows the effects of macro production on planet life during the Cosmo Canyon segment in the original game. With this in mind, would this justify Barrett murdering an innocent reactor worker in order to prevent this? To Barrett, he knows that making significant changes in society often requires bloodshed, regardless of whether or not he prefers it. The others are rather adamant on this view, but eventually capitulate because they believe in Barrett's good intentions. Still, this is a cudgel that Shinra can easily use against Avalanche, because the people, who are the primary victims here, directly benefit from the use of Mako and wouldn't agree with this level of eco-terrorism. Hell, this is even addressed by Cloud later, so let's simply put a pin in it for now and instead carry on. As Barrett makes a compelling speech to the others, Cloud proclaims, What's done is done, showing his incredibly pragmatic view of the situation, likely brought on by his status as a social outcast. It is a strong piece of connective tissue that binds Cloud and Barrett together, because they are the only ones who agree with each other whilst the others present extreme guilt for the actions that they have just made. Despite Cloud's cold, standoffish nature, he almost gets a little perturbed by Barrett directing the fees comment at him, as if he doesn't want to simply be seen as someone who will do anything for money, no matter how reprehensible. He does feel a level of guilt here, but is good at compartmentalising his emotional state, seeing as he remains focused here. It is a major component of his character that he conceals his feelings on certain matters, for many different reasons, yet there are instances where he lets some feelings slip. Anyone who is familiar with the original game knows what I am referencing here. I think proof of this is when Wedge looks towards Cloud after Barrett tells them to move on. Cloud sheepishly looks down and away from him. Of course we know that Cloud isn't scared of Wedge, so this is an example of his insecurity and social anxiety. When the group splits up, Cloud asks Barrett for his pay. The reason he asks for it this early could be down to him trying to prevent himself from being scammed in a deal, or perhaps to avoid interacting with the others when he returns to home base. There is cause to assume that he doesn't want to stick around throughout most of the story due to certain lines of dialogue, as well as his actions, so this could be somewhat the case here. When Cloud gets to the bottom of the stairs, he is greeted by Jesse. I don't need to tell you what this is, right? Of course not. It's healing material. You can have it for saving my life. Just doing my job, nothing more. Yeah, yeah. Fact is, I'm lucky you were there. <laughs> Cloud is incredibly high-strung and insecure, which leads to him becoming defensive. He hides behind his knowledge as a soldier to cover all of that up. There is a lot to say about Cloud's character, and why he is the way he is, with digressions allowed to discuss the minutiae of his personal problems and his mental health, but we'll get to that. As Cloud moves through the ruins of Sector 8, he gets separated with the others whilst on the way to the station. The screams of the people, when combined with Cloud's look at a destroyed building, trigger another Tism vision. We are presented with another change from the original. Why is Sephiroth here? 
Cloud's Tism vision doesn't stop, and instead gets worse as he follows the erudite figure. Whilst he follows him, you can notice that the Sector 8 buildings have merged with the buildings of Nibelheim. He keeps following Sephiroth down an alleyway. Eventually, he is face to face with the monster that ruined his life. You're not real. You're dead. I am. Uh... I killed you with my own. <gasps> oh, you need not remind me. It was the crowning moment of our time together. But that was then, and this is now. I have a favor to ask. Our beloved planet is dying. Slowly. Silently. Painfully. Can you bear to see the planet suffer? Cloud. Were the planet to die, so many things would be lost. Your hometown burns so bright. The sound of her voice, pleading for me to spare you. The shiver of her flesh, yielding to cold steel. That which binds us together would be no more, and I would be loath to live in such a world, which is why I must ask you this one favor. Don't worry, it's a simple thing. Run, Cloud. Run away. You have to leave. You have to live. You bastard! Good, Cloud. Very good. Hold on to that hatred. Considering that Sephiroth isn't really here, we are left to debate whether or not he is a phantom, or if he simply resides within Cloud's psyche. Regardless, him being here is new, which means that this scene is significant as it cements what the remake is going for. We were already aware of this thanks to the opening cutscene, so we have full confirmation that the remake is supposed to be a continuation of the canon. Something good we get from this scene is that Cloud seems genuinely terrified of Sephiroth here, and credit has to go to Cody Christian for his delivery of all of Cloud's lines in this game. This vulnerable side to Cloud is a brilliant oxymoron to what we have seen of him up to this point, and shows the passion he holds to the people he cares about, as well as the people he hates. Sephiroth's line, Run, Cloud. Run away. You have to leave. You have to live. Is actually Sephiroth mocking the words that Cloud's mother screamed out to him before her death. This is what provokes Cloud to attack, by getting under his skin. Initially, I believe this to be a display of Sephiroth indicating the importance of Cloud's survival, and how his death would be problematic to Sephiroth. This could be significant foreshadowing to a potential death for Cloud, however, the recent Ultimania Plus book confirms that this quote is Sephiroth mirroring Claudia's words, in order to torment Cloud. After this scene, Cloud takes the scenic route to get to the train station. I want to point out the music in this part of the game for a second. The Promised Land Cycle of Souls is an incredibly melancholic yet beautiful track that is a remake of a track not from the original game, but Advent Children, which was simply named The Promised Land. That track played during Marlene's recollection of the events of the original game, and is honestly my favourite piece of music in that film. The reason it is so significant here is the position it is played. The track plays just after we meet and have a dialogue with Sephiroth for the first time, yet before we meet the next major character of the story. To those in the know, Cloud, Aerith and Sephiroth are consistently recognised and depicted as the main trio of Final Fantasy VII, and this piece of music playing after Sephiroth, before Aerith, and whilst Cloud is the main protagonist, should represent just how pivotal the connection between these three characters are. Cloud, Aerith and Sephiroth, hero, heroine and villain, they have the limelight here. Just as Cloud descends onto Loveless Street, he comments on the reactor destruction aftermath as a mess, which gives us a nice sign about his humanity. As he progresses down the street, he sees a florist, panicking and swatting at what appears to be nothing. She turns towards Cloud, and a Tism vision activates, 
with Sephiroth appearing and laying a hand on her shoulder before boldly proclaiming, You are too weak to save anyone, not even yourself. The reference to that infamous scene from the original is quite obvious. The flower peddler seems genuinely shocked to see Cloud, as he succumbs to yet another Tism vision as she tries to help him, and as such facilitates the very first meeting between Cloud and Aerith. They don't share any formal introductions here, yet she does offer him a flower for helping her supposedly get rid of the things that were accosting her. Cloud has no idea what she's talking about, so she brushes it aside and tries to move the conversation forward. I suppose that now is a good time to discuss canon, and how we parse out the canonical and non-canonical options the game offers you. For a lot of optional choices, we don't have clear canonical knowledge on what actually occurs, so I will simply fill that part in with what I feel is the most appropriate or character accurate for the context. For other options, like the resolution scenes, we have a more clear guideline to go off of, such as Ultimanias or dialogue from the game that indicates what actually happened canonically. I want to make that explicitly clear here, because canon is crucial, and there will be too many people who will get irritated by my assessment of the game's story or the characters. Everything that I will include in the synopsis as far as the basic events go, and specific choices, can be backed up objectively. Got it? Good, we can continue. I bring this up because there is an optional choice here, in which Cloud can either accept the flower, or reject it. Canonically, Cloud accepts it. This has a basis in FF7 Dismantled, a companion piece that was released alongside the original Japanese game release in 1997, as well as the credit sequence, which will be a very strong indication on what constitutes as canon. On top of this, you also have the Ultimanias, and many other lesser examples to prove that this is canon. If you are wondering why I'm getting so hung up on this point, trust me, you will understand soon enough. If we cannot distinguish between things that have actually occurred canonically, and things that didn't, then we cannot have a discussion on the events of the story. It is fundamental, like how we can all agree on the fact that Luke Skywalker is Darth Vader's son, or how Andy Dufresne successfully escaped Shawshank Prison instead of rotting in there, or how we can all agree that Ned Stark definitely died in King's Landing as opposed to surviving. What I am saying is that if we can't agree on canonical events in this story due to people not understanding that there absolutely has to be a canonical option when presented with two optional decisions, then we are going to have a hard time discussing any story, let alone an RPG. This is where objectivity enters the discussion, and that is what I am trying to preserve during my assessment of the story. Back on topic. After Cloud takes the flower, free of charge mind you, she claims that the yellow lily that she bestows upon him represents reunion, especially that between lovers. With info we receive later, we learn that Aerith likely has a feeling as to who Cloud is, and her own connection with him. This would make the lover comment quite sincere, as opposed to an off-the-cuff comment, though that is a kettle of fish reserved for its own video, since a lot of people have simply wrong interpretations on what this means. I saw that side-eye cloud, you sly dog. This does line up well with how their meeting is described in Dismantled, in which Cloud claims that he bought the flower because a flower that is worth a few gil is worth it if it gives her a smile. He also notes her impressive eyes, a strange comment unless he has the hots for her, and besides, who can blame him? After their discussion, the things that Aerith talked about harass her again, which prompts her to grab Cloud's arm, requesting his assistance. This time, however, Cloud finally sees what Aerith was panicking about. A myriad of ethereal entities envelop them, which causes Cloud to defend himself. What I find interesting here is that I don't believe Aerith could see them prior to her and Cloud's interaction. She could only feel them. That being said, her grabbing Cloud's arm seems to set events in motion, so to speak, and that the two of them are now bound for eternity. Like the other pieces of the compilation, and even other pieces of media depict their relationship as. As the Shinra security become apprised of the things occurring, Aerith flees down an alleyway, leaving Cloud to handle the guards alone. Sword on the ground! Right now! <laughs> <laughs> 
Cloud engages the troopers, showcasing his capabilities as a first class soldier. After a lengthy escape, he finds himself cornered by a platoon of Shinra troops. Cloud dispatches of them with relative ease, leaving one last group to deal with. Things take a turn however, when one of the guards seems to recognise him, inciting a novatism vision. Instead of questioning the guard and surrendering, Cloud swipes at a guard before avoiding the Stormtrooper tier gunfire and leaping aboard the train to freedom. Here's some food for thought. Does the guard pause because he recognises Cloud, as a former colleague perhaps? Or does he recognise the Buster Sword? After all, the sentence he says is... Wait! I know that... <laughs> it is relatively ambiguous in how it is worded, so it could be for either. If he recognises the sword, then the guard was either a close colleague to Zack, or he could have been one of the recruits from years ago that Zack interacted with. Either way, this topic can be deliberated on below if anyone actually cares. Fortunately, Cloud managed to get onto the train that the others were stowing away on. After a surprising display of concern from Barrett, Cloud asks the others about the strange phantoms that he encountered earlier. None of them have a clue, and Cloud remarks about only having seen them once she grabbed him, though none of the others would know who she refers to. It's worth noting the camera angle when Jessie praises Cloud, as she clearly notices the flower. After a snarky comment from Barrett, Cloud gets defensive and ends the conversation, prompting the others to leave for the train cars. It stands to reason that Cloud doesn't enjoy being belittled or insulted, as most of this stems from his upbringing, so his response to the mockery is warranted. As Cloud progresses through the train cars, he could speak to the members of Avalanche and burden some of their troubles. That being said, Cloud doesn't seem interested in what Wedge has to say, which is a similar cold-hearted response as to the one he gives in the original. With Biggs, he acknowledges his fear for doing the mission, with Biggs stating that he is still shaking after the incident. Cloud claims that you get used to it, which is once again indicative of Cloud's character, but also it teases us about Cloud's fears. Eventually, there will be something that elicits that sense of emotion from him as well, but what will that scenario be? Lastly, Cloud heeds what Jessie has to say. She clearly blames herself for the fallout from the bombing, and, despite Cloud's assurances to her innocence, uses this situation as a learning lesson going forward. She thanks Cloud for being a good listener, which fits considering that he's an introvert, and introverts are typically much better listeners than talkers, believe me. When Cloud catches up to Barrett, he finds him listening in to the conversation of a bunch of Shinra suits discussing Avalanche and the terroristic behaviours that they engage in. Barrett isn't scared to debate his ideals, and challenges them on what they say, which leads to the employees feeling pressured from Barrett's aggressive antics. They all leave for another seat, and Barrett vents his anger. The theme that plays here is called Shinra Creed, and is the remake version of the music that plays in Corel during the original game, so it makes sense why it is used here with a clash of beliefs between Barrett and Shinra. Jesse comes through and beckons Cloud to look at the monitor to give us some more exposition regarding the layout of Midgar. After some flirting, she talks about the Orwellian ID checkpoints which will set up the plot elements regarding that for later. Barrett precedes this discussion by having an introspective commentary on the poor people in Midgar's slums. Take a good look. It's because of that great big pizza in the sky that people down there gotta struggle to survive. Shinra sucks up Mako, while the soil turns to dust, the air fills with smog, and the flowers die. Then leave and don't look back. <sighs> That's what's always worked for me. Cloud rebuts this with his own survivor mentality by telling them to simply move on. With this quote in mind, we can confirm that Cloud doesn't look back on any aspect of his past fondly, 
and his disposition consistently reinforces that perspective. Why am I specifying this quote? Oh, no reason in particular. To cap off the final scene of this chapter, Cloud makes an interesting yet offhanded comment that can tie into the core theme of this game, fate. As he says, Like this train, I suppose. There's only one way it can go. Late in the night, the group finally arrives in the Sector 7 slums. The members of Avalanche gloat in their successful mission before being criticised by Barrett for being far too brazen in public. One step closer to a brighter future. Hell yeah! Guys! Lower your voices, huh? People are listening. Oh, ah. Right. Ah. Hm. They then embark for the local bar, 7th Heaven. Cloud comes across a man taking down the posters that are pro-Avalanche on the messaging board. Having common working class people that are sympathetic or even downright subservient to Shinra is a topic worth exploring, as it would help to flesh out the political landscape of this mythos, not to mention it would allow Shinra to be more complex as far as morality and ethics are concerned. Unfortunately, this isn't utilised all that well, and we'll discuss this in more detail much farther into the story. Cloud has yet another Tism vision, this time of flaming debris plummeting down on top of him. The man notices Cloud flinching from this and presumes him to be a Mako Junkie, due to Cloud's vibrant blue eyes which will be elaborated on within this chapter. Cloud notices that the strange entities have appeared again, and they fly towards the other Avalanche members. Cloud rejoins them, and they head further into the main square of the Sector 7 slums. As we reach 7th Heaven, we are introduced to both Marlene, who is referenced earlier but of whom we weren't sure of, and Tifa, the voluptuous barmaid and former acquaintance of Cloud. As they head inside, Tifa inquires about the flower that Cloud has as a lapel adjacent, saying that it has been a while since she has seen a real one, and he gives it to her. Where'd you get that? I can't remember the last time I saw a real one. <laughs> How sweet. When did you get so thoughtful? It is a nice gesture, though it is worth noting that he only passed it to her after she prompts him about it as opposed to being some kind of deep romantic offering. After some general interactions with Barrett and Marlene, Marlene recoils from Cloud which angers Barrett, blaming Cloud for scaring her. Despite the aggressive stance, this gives us some brief insight into Barrett's strong sense of paternal duty over his daughter as well as being a nice contrast to the harsh eco-terrorist that we have previously seen. As an aside, the child voice actors and actresses do a fantastic job in this game, which sets it apart from most other titles, as well as proving that you do not need adult women to voice young boys in order for the acting to be compelling. When are we going back to the other camp? The one near Blackwater? Yeah. Well, we're not. This is our spot. For now, anyway. Why? I forgot a storybook there. We left so quick. The actors here are clearly very accurate to how children normally speak, even down to the inflections and lisps. After Barrett takes Marlene to bed, Tifa then gets to chatting with Cloud. Instead, Cloud, having a one-track mind, asks after his money that he has earned. Almost as if she is dodging the question, Tifa asks him to follow her outside. He obliges, and she sets him up with a place to stay for the time being. As they walk to the apartment building, they converse about the mission. How was it up on the plate? It was chaotic. Sorry for dragging you into all this. It was wrong of me to be in danger like that. I promise I won't do it again. Dangerous part of the job. Don't worry about me. Hmm. I'll try not to. We once again see that Cloud cares a lot about his image, seeming very cool when he tells her not to worry about him and that he can take care of himself. We also get a hint towards the character relationship that he and Tifa hold when she says that he is not exactly a people person, which sets the stage for the plot point of Cloud's past to deep into the plot of the original game. With Cloud besmirching the propaganda machine that Shinra commands, 
we can tell that he has a severe and deep hatred for the Mega Corporation. As a former soldier, we can only ponder on what led to this feeling of betrayal, which would cause him to desert the faction. Of course, unless you're aware of the original game's plot, that is. They then reach the apartment, and as Tifa tries to speak gently about other topics, Cloud interrupts her, once again querying her about the money that he should be receiving. She gives him sour news, as they spent most of the money on preparations for the raid, so she can only give him a pittance. Despite his floundering for his payment, Cloud also harbours an ounce of humility, and accepts her offer to earn the rest of his share by helping her tomorrow. With this matter settled, they both decide to retire for the night. Sometime later, Cloud is startled in his sleep by a strange noise coming from the room next to his, the one that is hosted by a person that Tifa said she would introduce him to. With a sense of urgency, Cloud leaps out of bed with a great display of agility and reaches for his sword. Cloud is clearly alert at all times, to a paranoid degree, something that will be rather important for his character later on. With the sounds coming through the walls, Cloud decides that he will make his introductions now. Hey. You okay in there? Oh. Coming in. As Cloud enters the room, another Tism vision presents itself, and he witnesses Sephiroth again. In a spout of furor, Cloud unveils his sword, amusingly catching it upon the doorframe in a moment of levity and prepares to strike down the deadly foe. Sephiroth, however, pushes him to the floor, resulting in a struggle in which Cloud gains the upper hand, and, as he is about to bring the sword down, is accosted by Tifa. Despite his urges, Seph grabs his leg and another vision plays. As Cloud comes to, he realises that it wasn't Sephiroth that he was trying to kill, but a weak, dishevelled man with a clear sickness. Tifa helps him up, stating that his name is Marco and that he is a nice guy, quiet and stricken with ailments, but nice. She dismisses Cloud, and both return to their rooms for the night, this time, hopefully, without any distractions. The following day, Cloud heads down the stairs to be greeted by the apartment's landlord, Maul. She informs Cloud that Tifa is waiting for him at 7th Heaven regarding the matter that they discussed last night. When Cloud asks Maul about her relationship with Tifa, it rotates back on him, with Maul insinuating that Cloud should treat her well. She clearly has disdain for him, and some part of that is understandable seeing as she cares for Tifa's well-being. However, she continues this barrage of unpleasantries against him even when Tifa is there later, and Tifa defends Marl in this instance. I think that could have been handled better if Tifa spoke on his behalf as opposed to favouring Marl. Due to Cloud being the fish out of water here, and she is supposedly his childhood friend after all, Cloud meets Tifa at the bar and they discuss the job that he agreed to undertake. The remake offers more time in Sector 7 than the original does, and this is certainly a good thing. Not only does it allow more time for characters and world building to be fleshed out more, but it provides a much needed reprieve after the rather chaotic first two chapters. Furthermore, as we see in the next chapter, having this extra time in Sector 7 allows for a greater sense of believability regarding Avalanche's plan to attack the other reactors. Plans on that sort of scale would likely take days of planning, preparation and resting to successfully accomplish, not to mention staving off the heat of the law enforcement that will be looking for them. In the original, we head to 7th Heaven and go below into their secret hideout, which is a little strange for a random mercenary who doesn't believe in the cause to be allowed into. After a sleep and some discussions with the other characters, they immediately head off to the next objective. I actually appreciate the fact that we take some time out instead of rushing to the next major plot point. A hallmark of good stories is when they take the time to slow down, and have characters interact with one another such as discussing their feelings about matters, about each other. FF7 is a perfect template for this, especially when the party leaves Midgar, as they will spend weeks, if not months, adventuring with each other across fields, plains and forests to their destination. It is during these moments where you slow down. In summary, I think Square's decision to slow the plot down and add more content to parts of the narrative 
actually enhances rather than detracts from the overall quality, though we will discuss the importance of pacing within its own segment. The two head out to deal with the clients of the water filters that are required to provide clean water in the slums. Interestingly enough, Tifa likely dragged Cloud along with this because he can act as an enforcer to intimidate the clients if they become… uncooperative. Despite this, one of the clients is Maul, and they have a discussion. As Maul denigrates him, we see Cloud almost childishly trying to defend his image. After finishing up with the filters, Tifa recommends Cloud to take some work from the neighbourhood watch to provide help, as well as to pass the time for Barrett to come back from his rounds with the money that he is owed. They find that Biggs and Wedge are covering today's shift, and the two inform Cloud of a bunch of monsters residing within the Scrap Boulevard. As a reward, Biggs insists on upgrading Cloud's Buster Sword for him, but Cloud refuses. This conversation unlocks the weapon upgrade system which will be detailed later. After this, Tifa asks Cloud about tagging along. When Cloud tries to go it alone, she mocks him about not knowing the way to the scrapyard which causes him to concede, and so, Tifa joins the fray. If Cloud is more of a balanced melee character, and Barrett is more of a ranged tank, that would make Tifa a speedy DPS. She has the fastest speed stat of the party, and, when utilising her unbridled strength ability alongside her other abilities, she can become a whirlwind of destruction. This level of skill surprises and impresses Cloud as they fight alongside one another in the scrapyard. Granted, he doesn't know about her training under Zangan, but still. Once they defeat the nasties that infest the scrapyard, they return to Biggs and Wedge and tell of their exploits. When Biggs asks Cloud about how the sword is treating him, it triggers a Tism vision. Yeah. We've been through a lot. Oh. You okay? I'm fine. Cloud refers to how he and the sword have been through a lot together which is what triggered it. Of course, to the more familiar FF7 enjoyer, we know that there is more to this line than meets the eye. Cloud's headache prompts Tifa to ask about Cloud's life after he left the town all those years ago. Cloud deflects from this however, and the two table it for another time. Tifa notes that the weapon store owner might be willing to provide something thanks to word of Cloud's actions spreading throughout the slums. She is correct as the store clerk provides Cloud a new weapon free of charge, the Iron Blade. This opens up the option of different weapons favouring different stats and strengths. For instance, the Iron Blade favours a higher magic damage output than the Buster Sword, yet at the cost of less physical damage. On top of all of this, the Iron Blade offers Cloud a new ability in the form of Triple Slash, an incredibly powerful and useful ability that works well against both singular enemies and groups. Initially, the ability is tied to the weapon you use. However, after a certain amount of uses which can be sped up if you fulfil the specific criteria that the weapon ability asks for, it will become available for use no matter what weapon you wield. For instance, Triple Slash can only be used whilst the Iron Blade is equipped, yet if you either use the move successfully a certain amount of times, or if you can strike three or more enemies on each use of the ability, you can maximise the proficiency faster. We will of course go through the weapons and their abilities in much greater detail later. Tifa then brings up the side quests that you can accomplish in this game after a discussion with Weimer. This will also add to the hidden affection system within the game which has a payoff later. One of the first patrons of Cloud's merc work is a strange youth named Chadley, who wants to determine Cloud's physiological capacity via many challenges that the player can engage in during the game which will unlock many useful materia to purchase, as well as the ability to face off against the various combat simulations that he will provide further on. As someone in the employ of Shinra, Chadley jokingly endorses the idea that Cloud can strike him down if he feels that is the best course of action. Whilst Cloud and Tifa tackle the tasks of the slum folk, they come across a commotion occurring around a house in the area. When they investigate, they find that a local dude named Johnny has been taken by Shin regards for questioning, specifically regarding the things he knows about Avalanche. Cloud and Tifa tail the gods to their destination to save Johnny and accomplish their task. Cloud seems perfectly fine with killing Johnny here in order to prevent him from spilling the beans on Avalanche. As Cloud and Tifa make their way back, Tifa comments on Cloud's more pragmatic actions. 
Making note of Cloud's eyes and how they're emblematic of how much he has changed from the innocent child that he used to be. He has changed. Cloud responds by saying that the Mako experiments that he and all of the other members of Soldier were subjected to give his eyes that brilliant radiance. Whilst this is a plain statement of fact, and a nice bit of lore for the continuity, I actually like to believe that this is an example of Cloud being too cold to acknowledge Tifa's point, in the same way that Drax struggles to comprehend sarcasm. It's just a metaphor, dude. His people are completely literal. Metaphors are gonna go over his head. Nothing goes over my head. My reflexes are too fast. I would catch it. After completing all of the side quests, including one from Weimar which sets up a plot detail for later, Tifa asks Cloud if they can head back to the apartments to recuperate. After changing their own water filters, Cloud enters her room for some one-on-one -on -one time. So, after you left the village, hmm? I let you off the hook before, back at the hall, but not this time. Uh. Uh. Hmm? Well, when we were kids, everybody wanted to be a soldier, right? Yeah, I remember they were on the news every day during the war. Thing is, by the time I finally made it in, they didn't need heroes anymore. It was nothing like what we dreamt of. It was just working for Shinra. Just... I'm sorry. I know it's a touchy subject. Not exactly small talk. Especially with someone you haven't seen in a while. As per this discussion, Cloud divulges his regrets for joining Shinra, as they weren't really in need of heroes after the Wutai War ended. Perhaps due to them not having seen each other for years, Tifa suggests that they take a night out on the town to catch up on stories past. Here, the player gets the option of three articles of clothing that Tifa may wear. The player only gets this option if they partake in all of the side quests available in Chapter 3. After the choice is made, they leave and proceed back to 7th Heaven. Before they head inside, Tifa asks Cloud if he will stay in Sector 7 for much longer. He says that he likely will, so he can build up his finances. However, he doesn't give any reason aside from that. I don't think that Cloud wants to stick around and embraces his introversion. For a guy who seeks both friendship and companionship, he is lawfully quick to shun them, though one could argue that is true to life for a lot of shy, introverted types. Art imitates life after all. They enter, and Tifa pours Cloud a drink. I suppose this is the time to discuss the general redundancy of dialogue options within this game. You see, the original game had a purpose behind every dialogue choice as it would affect certain scenes later in the game via the affection system. In the remake, however, most of the affection points between characters seems to be dictated more by the quests that you complete whilst in the company of certain characters, likely to represent the favourability that the player has towards said character. In this case, the dialogue option here is between Cloud wanting a drink and not wanting one. The issue is that regardless of whether Cloud wants one or not, Tifa pours in one anyway, and the dialogue post decision doesn't change either. Posing the question, why bother with options at all? We know that Square wanted to stick by a more concrete, canonical narrative this time around, with certain choices that were present to the player in the original no longer being available. Here are some examples. With this in mind, why even entertain the notion of dialogue options? Was it simply a way of superficially showing the depths of their writing by pretending that dialogue choices actually hold weight as opposed to being meaningless? 
That's not to say that dialogue options that actually affect outcomes don't exist in this game, but you would think that this dialogue option here, one that is unavoidable, means that they should have put more effort into it, and it should likely affect Cloud's affection points with Tifa. If he rejects the drink, then he doesn't give her the compliment, therefore losing out on the affection buildup that would normally be generated. Of course, a sane individual knows that Cloud's compliment is pretty empty anyway considering he only gave it after being prompted by Tifa, seeing as he didn't give in straight away. If you want to genuinely open a girl's heart, other than via a knife, the compliments should probably be unsolicited. Tifa goes below with the others, and Jessie enters the bar. She gives her usual flirtatious spiel, and as usual, Cloud seems disinterested. After this, Jessie also goes below, leaving Cloud alone and unattended. From here, the player can interact with the flower given to him by Aerith, as it sits behind the bar. He makes an offhand comment about that girl seeming strange. The player then has the option to play darts to pass the time, though this seems mandatory as there isn't anything else to tide him over. The darts game is pretty awkward, but kinda quaint as far as minigames go. Hell, I'd take this over that janky as fuck marching band minigame from June on in the original. After some time passes, Tifa comes up first and hurriedly heads behind the bar, pouring herself a drink as if she's combating stress. As she sits down, the two talk. I heard you're having second thoughts. I know we have to think big if we're going to make a difference. But not like this. I just... I feel trapped. If it feels wrong, don't do it. <sighs> The line about her feeling trapped clearly comes from her adamance about her moral quandaries regarding the bombings. Unlike Barrett, to her, she feels as if there are better, cleaner ways of promoting their activism, rather than taking innocent lives in the process. She refuses to go with them, though this doesn't drive a wedge between herself and the others, as they all come up to the top and Barrett kindly asks Tifa to get them all around. Whilst Tifa is happily accepted to share in the festivities, Barrett gives Cloud his money and concludes their business. Cloud pretends not to care about being left out, though we know that he does seek acceptance from others. He says that he doesn't like contracts, which is fittingly juxtaposed by the verbal contract he agrees to with Aerith later. Subtly, the whispers make another appearance as Cloud leaves the bar. Before he departs, however, not only does Jesse imply that she has something else to ask of him, but it is worth noting that Tifa doesn't speak on Cloud's behalf and allowing him to stay which honestly speaks volumes. Upon leaving, Cloud bumps into some strange hoodlums hanging around the bar. They seem to be looking for a man with a gun for an arm. There is only one person we know that fits this description. Obviously these guys intend harm for Barrett, but what is more fascinating is that Cloud is either willing to give up Barrett's location if the pay is acceptable. We know that Cloud dislikes Barrett, but is he really so cruel to risk Marlene being an orphan over that hatred? Of course, that is if you believe that Cloud was telling the truth here, but seeing as the guys tried to screw him over anyway, we will never know if Cloud's statement was sincere. I am curious what other people's opinion on this is, so if you have something insightful to say about it, let me know. As Cloud gets back to the apartment, he is greeted by Jesse, who, after a flirtatious comment that Cloud is frankly tired of hearing of, has a proposition for him. I'll get right to the point then. Huh. What have you got there? An apology for not getting you on the mission. Uh. Or not. What do you think it is? A proposition. Nailed it in one. Gonna have to ask you to keep all this a secret from the others, though. It's a personal matter. Something I need to sort out tonight. Tonight? Tonight. You and me, together. I want you to come with me to the Sector 7 plate. I'll give you the details on the way. That's fine by me, but don't you have a pretty big day ahead of you? I do, but if I don't deal with this now, it's only gonna get harder. Anyway, I can count on you, can't I? 
A down payment. Other than wondering about how in the hell Jessie has a fucking summon materia chilling in her pocket, we see Cloud accept her mission. And as such, the chapter concludes. Cloud and Jesse arrive at the Sector 7 station late at night, but unbeknownst to them, they are greeted by both Biggs and Wedge. We understand that they both knew that Jesse would be here as she was supposedly acting weird. With this revelation revealed, Jesse seems rather embarrassed and turns towards Cloud briefly as she states, Was I talking in my sleep? What else did I say? I think this is meant to heavily imply that she has the hots for Cloud and might have let something slip during her slumber. When pressed, Biggs and Wedge give the reason for their tagging along. They believe that Jessie wants to see her parents, though Jessie's almost sardonic wink when confirming it clearly belies the true reasoning, of which we shall learn momentarily. Jessie asks Cloud if his parents are still around and he responds with a sense of dejection though the others play off of it almost comically. With this out of the way, our coterie set off topside. As they drive through the spiral passageway, Jessie gives Cloud the ulterior motive of her journey to the plate. According to her, and spurred on mainly by the devastating fallout of the Mako Reactor 1 bombing, the blasting agent that she used in that job was far too potent, and she wants to raid a Shinra warehouse for the components she needs to make a suitable replacement. Her reason for the secrecy is so not to concern Barrett, as she wouldn't want him unfocused for their next mission. Not to mention that she feels like repentance is in order due to her personal failings. Although Cloud tries to shake off the blame surrounding her, she truly does feel like she has to repair the sin she has wrought. We even get a nice payoff with Jessie recalling the lesson that Cloud imparted to her earlier. Survival can be a matter of luck or skill. You can't rely on luck. With your help, we won't need luck. But as the conversation nears its end... ID scan! Ready? I should point out that the minor excursion we partake on during this chapter is entirely new for the remake, and we get some other additions as well. To begin, we are given a rather sudden change in gameplay as we engage in mountain combat. The bike minigame is incredibly representative of the same minigame from the original, with the ability to freely move around as well as attacking from both sides of the vehicle. Cloud also has the ability to use special moves atop the bike, such as the brutal close range attack, spinning slash, or the long range, sharp gust. Some of the dialogue here is neat with Jesse constantly flirting with Cloud and him responding either with a conceited cocky retort or just blatant irritation at her overly pushy attitude. This segment is broken down into multiple phases, and the music is pretty sick throughout, especially when during the transitions. All in all, the gameplay here is quite fun, and it is about to get more hectic as you'll surely see. As they exit the tunnel, they are attacked by more troops, but they back off as someone else wants to tango instead. This is Roach a brand new character to the remake who some people don't seem to like. I don't sympathise with that perspective, considering that there isn't anything that he does that contradicts or tarnishes what already existed, so he seems like a fun-loving rival for this segment specifically. I would even argue that seeing soldiers with a unique personality that don't reside within first class would enhance the world building as it is very strange for every single soldier operative, except for the major characters to be faceless fodder for the protagonists to handle. These are elite operatives for Christ's sake, they should have some time in the limelight. Nevertheless, the player engages in a fight with him, which is a fairly solid fight mechanically speaking, though it won't really sit in most people's memories due to how quickly this bout ends. It seems as though Roach derives some kind of primordial desire to fight, and Cloud is the perfect sparring candidate. Their duel concludes as Cloud cripples Roach's steed. Despite his defeat, Roach takes it with humility and seems open to fighting again with Cloud some other day. Cloud and Co then leave Roach behind as they advance to their destination. The next scene, as well as the music that is played, changes based on the player's performance in the bike section. If the player ends with a low amount of health, then Jesse will treat Cloud condescendingly, as if annoyed by his lack of skill. If the player ends with a high amount of health, meaning they took minimal damage, 
Then Jesse treats Cloud to a kiss on the cheek as a reward for the player's success. At the end of the ride, they head on up the stairway to the player's surface, and we are given a rather quiet and lovely view of the urban housing that pepper the streets ahead. As the group reaches Jesse's house, Jesse tells Cloud to wait outside, like they agreed. Cloud waits at the wall for the others to finish, and after a brief cutscene, we are given the reason as to why Jesse asked him to remain outside. As Cloud sneaks into the house, under the watchful eyes of some awfully strange and totally not some kind of weird symbolic cats, he waltzes on into the building, and then to the room that she told him to enter. There he is greeted by a pale, sickly man tied to a machine, asleep in the bed. According to Jessie, her father is afflicted with Mako poisoning, something that we will come to know more personally later in the main plotline of the remake trilogy. For now, Cloud takes his ID card from his work clothing and leaves the building. There are some things in that room that offer some extra flavour for people interested in learning more about Jessie, such as the fact that she had played the part of Princess Rosa in one of the Gold Saucer's famous plays, the very same play that both Cloud and Aerith partake in during their beloved date in the original. As Cloud leaves, Biggs and Wedge do their best to cover for Jessie when her mother asks about her moving to the city for her acting career. Of course, Jessie gave that up for her pursuit of activism, and doesn't want her parents to be aware of that, potentially due to their stances on it, or because they might simply be worried for her safety. After this, we get a rundown of the plan. Hey there. Is it? Now comes the hard part. I'm gonna use this to sneak into the 7 6 annex. All right, let's get to it. Sorry, but you're staying outside. Only I know what to steal from where, so it's gotta be me who goes in. So, we came all this way just to eat pizza? <laughs> you think I'd let you off that easy? You're gonna earn every slice helping Cloud. Just do the thing where you draw everyone's attention away, like you did at my parents. What's the word again? Maybe I'm more nervous than I thought. Diversion. Yeah, that. Nice one, military man. So what? Does this mean we're gonna ask some Shinra folks out to dinner? Uh, you know damn well huh? what she means. Uh, uh, While you're inside, we make sure the guards are focused on the outside, yeah? Exactly. Couldn't have put it any better. When you see a flare go up, that's your cue. Rush the front gates and make for the warehouse plaza. The more hell you raise, the more time you buy me. Huh. You're gonna run this guy into the ground, aren't you? How much time do you think you'll need? Not too much. I'll be in and out. I'll send up another flare when I'm done. We rendezvous in the vacant lot up ahead. Hold on. How are we supposed to get back to the slums? Wait for the first train? No. I want to be back before that. Don't worry. I have something worked out. Now, let's get this done. <laughs> well, that diversion's not going to create itself. As the group head towards the warehouse, Biggs asks Cloud if Jesse's dad was in the building. Despite the dissuasion from the Avalanche men, Cloud is open to hearing about the situation surrounding Jesse. This is a nice scene to display Cloud's building camaraderie with the others, and represents one of our first tastes of Cloud's true personality. As they reach their destination, the trio advances past the guard post, only to find them all dead. The three of them all seem completely confused as to what happened here, so it should be significant, yet this is never addressed again. I doubt that Jesse eliminated them, so we are left with a bit of a convenience in that the guards aren't present to alert the others. Before the engagement, Cloud isn't recommended to head to the training area, and the bench vending machine mechanic is introduced. The player could purchase most of the items they need from the vending machines, though most of said items are pretty useless and the bench replenishes the player's HP and MP completely. As for the training area, the player gets something called a training bonus which grants the player 100 gil for defeating all of the sentry turrets, which isn't all that useful but at least there is some incentive to do something that is incredibly trivial. After the player is prepared, Cloud and the others construct their plan, yet Cloud's gaze is averted upwards. Vantage point, then we go to town on him.
Hey ya. So, what did you want to talk about? When spring comes, I'm leaving town. I'm going to Midgar. Should have figured. All the guys are leaving. But, but I'm not like them. I'm not going just to look for work. I'm going to be a soldier. The best of the best. Like Sephiroth. The great war hero, huh? Hmm. Isn't it pretty hard to become a soldier? Yeah. So I won't be back for a long time. Guess not. Think you'll be in the papers? I'll try. Just promise me one thing. When we're older, and you're a famous soldier, if I'm ever trapped or in trouble, promise you'll come and save me. Huh? That's what heroes do. They save people. Please? Just once. Uh... Come on, promise me. Fine. I promise. Looking at the fan triggers Cloud to recall a tender memory from his youth, that of his discussion with Tifa at the Nibelheim well. This is also another departure from the original, as normally Tifa actively reminds Cloud of the promise that is made in order to motivate him to help her in her cause. Considering its place in the story, however, I think this change is very suitable, especially seeing as Cloud remembers it of his own accord, as this helps to reinforce the notion that Cloud is almost aware of things that he wouldn't have known in the original. Perhaps this is due to the constant tism visions that he has been suffering from since the narrative's inception. After the well scene, Cloud then recalls the scene of Tifa proclaiming her feelings regarding the reactor bombings. Cloud connects the two situations intrinsically, and this steals his resolve for the fight ahead. As a flare ignites the dark sky, they begin the assault. I don't see any intruders. Maybe they went home. Oh, hey! Over there! Tar target sight! Light him up! This segment is a great place for the player to test their skills, as well as the materia that they have earned on the numerous enemy types that challenge you here. It is also a good place to build up the weapon proficiency on Cloud's Iron Blade here, in order to earn Triple Slash. So this is a nice opportunity for the player to cut loose after a more heavy focus on the story and characters in both chapters 3 and 4 collectively. To cap this off, the penultimate phase of this segment against the Sweepers causes Cloud's Ifrit materia to stir if you have it equipped. As the bar fills, either based on the phase of the fight, or in regards to where the player's health is currently set, the player can summon a powerful being to assist within the fight. The summon functions as an additional member that can use abilities in the same way that the main cast can. However, despite the fact that the summons can't take damage, they also cannot draw aggro from the controlled character either. When the summon becomes available, the player has plenty of time to activate them, but the bar will expire if ignored. When the summon is in battle, and depending on the particular summon that is used, eventually the summon will deplete its allotted time for the fight, and finish with an incredibly powerful ultimate move upon its exit. It is also worth noting that if the character that summoned the entity gets knocked out, then the summon will depart early, though it will still use its ultimate ability. The summons will be discussed in full later. After dealing with the mechs, the group finds themselves surrounded by Shinra forces, yet they are greeted by a familiar face. <laughs> the other forces back off as Roach challenges Cloud to a duel, man on man. 
Before the fight starts, Roach provides Cloud with an elixir to top off both his HP and MP stores in order to make it a fair fight. Like Goku giving his opponent a Sensu Bean in a similar sense. Roach's fight is simple, which is likely due to there only being one character for the player to use, though he does have some moves that require dodging rather than blocking, such as his Vacuum Blade. This fight encourages a more defensive playstyle, by focusing on both blocking and using the Punisher mode counters to break his guard, which allows for a steep buildup of his stagger gauge. All in all, this is a decent fight for the early game, and is a good stepping stone for fights later that will also take advantage of Cloud's more defensive abilities, not to mention this fight has great music. After beating him down, Roach comments on the fact that he wishes for them to spar some other time as he clearly sees this as a great way to test his strength and grow stronger. However, the other Shinra guards grow more irritable and decide to engage, but before they're attacked, Roach seems to be perfectly fine with killing his subordinates, and this lends credence as to why the guards on the bikes earlier called off when Roach was joining the fray, as to clearly not get caught in the crossfire. That being said, Roach clearly has a sense of honour and letting Cloud and the others die here would be a waste. He says his goodbyes and he careens off into the distance, setting up the possibility of him being seen again. After he leaves, there are still more pressing matters at hand as the trio start to get overwhelmed. But as things get dire, a group of insurgents with high-end military gear show up to help them out. It turns out that these guys are members of another cell of Avalanche, and chastise Wedge for his team being there. Biggs drags Cloud away and gives him the rundown. The flare above signals that Jessie is done with her end, so Cloud and Biggs exit the compound, meeting Jessie in the process. After some time, Wedge is dropped off near them and we get a pretty amusing scene. You get hit? Just swinged, I think. Uh, or shot! Uh, really? Let me see. Are we seriously doing this here? That's... wow. You guys are the worst! Huh? Your ass is fine. Maybe singed, but the only casualty is your underwear. This is like a bruise or a mild burn at worst. <clears throat> now that was a gunshot. <laughs> is that a smile I spy? Despite his denial, the others clearly notice that smirk of his, and we see his bond with the other members strengthen. As for their escape, the battle caused a significant amount of commotion which woke up a lot of the nearby residents, as well as the Shinra guard. I do find it very distracting that the team are able to flee without being stopped or questioned by the guards at all, seeing as they simply walk past them, though they reach a maintenance passageway which leads to a series of scaffolded platforms, one of which contains their escape routes. As they prepare their parachutes, Jesse whispers to Cloud, telling him to pop by her place for his reward. We then get quite the relaxing conclusion to this hectic jaunt that they just engaged in. Give me a minute! No. Why you have to be such a hard ass, bro? I ain't your bro. Done more. Just got hurt. You did enough. You took one for the team. Be proud. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> Feels like we're flying high these days. <laughs> now, more than ever. He's a keeper, all right. Yeah. Together, we can take on the world. Cloud and Wedge descend, and Cloud walks him back to his house. Along the way, Wedge discusses both Biggs and Jesse respectively as they pass by their lodgers. From Wedge's perspective, it seems that Jesse is just playing with Cloud, and that Cloud shouldn't be strung along with her flirting. Though I don't think that Wedge should be concerned, as Cloud isn't into her romantically anyway. 
When Cloud escorts Wedge back home, he starts to get quite defensive again as Wedge calls him bro. Despite the fact that bro is a rather innocuous term and not something that should offend Cloud in any significant way. He clearly has a lot of insecurities about his image and this is something that we will see get tested time and again. Wedge refers to Cloud being a big softy deep down to his cats, which will get rephrased later during the Evergreen Park moment. When Cloud knocks on Jesse's door, we get a pretty amusing scene between the two. Well, if it isn't Cloud Strife, was wondering when you'd show up. Without further ado, here you are. Thanks for stepping up, Merc. <laughs> and now for the cherry on top. Oh. Okay, I get it. Mind letting me breathe? Depends. Mind coming over tomorrow night? My roommates should all be out for a while. Are you seriously that desperate? Just let go already. Only if you promise to come back tomorrow night. Deal? However, we are once again presented with another dialogue option that has no deeper significance other than a minor change in the lines spoken. There is no resolution to any decision you make here, so it really doesn't matter. Once he receives the reward of a barrier materia, Cloud returns to his quarters. Before Cloud dozes off, he hears a knock which turns out to be Tifa. She heard some noise and wanted to check in. Cloud claims to have only gone for a walk so as not to clue her into what he and the others were up to. Here we get a discussion surrounding the promise that the two share. As Tifa returns to her room, Cloud calls it a night. The next morning, Cloud hears a voice talking to him as the weird phantoms make another appearance. Except, this time, it isn't something that only he is aware of. Tifa bursts into his room and tells him what is going on. Despite the onslaught of questions they might have, now is not the time for them. They push their way through the tsunami of phantoms that block their path and reach the bar. As the conflict concludes, one of the creatures attacks Jessie, causing her severe pain around her ankles. The fact that the main cast of Avalanche can see them, and the fact that Jessie is rendered out of the mission due to the injury that she has sustained, would seem to suggest that these spirits have an ulterior motive at play here that is yet to be revealed. The crew then ruminate on their next course of action, and considering that Biggs has already been sent ahead for recon, Barrett goes ahead with the mission to attack Marco Reactor 5. But with both Wedge and Jessie out of commission, as Wedge sustained injuries during the previous night, this forces Tifa to push her conscientious objection to the wayside and joins the mission. But to cover for the last spot, Barrett reluctantly asks Cloud for assistance. With the team assembled and the objective clear, the trio of Cloud, Barrett and Tifa head on out to the train station. Before the player gets there however, they are greeted by Chadley, in which the player can turn in any outstanding tasks that they have completed up to this point. It would be wise to do as many tasks as possible before this point, so that you can have as much material as possible, as well as opening up other intel that you could complete during the next few chapters, as you won't see Chadley until chapter 8. With this, the trio wait for the train, as the chapter reaches its conclusion. We rejoin our party aboard the train bound for Sector 5. After discussing the plan, they go and find seats to wait for their opportunity. Tifa asks Cloud to check in on Barrett, due to her being concerned about him, and Cloud obliges, leading to this scene. So, do you still support those terrorists? Avalanche is a blight on Midgar. Huh? Their bomb threat has thrown our offices into chaos, let alone the reactor itself. It's total insanity! But we won't lose heart. No! Everyone at Shinra agrees. The reactor will stay online. <laughs> Is that right? What? You got a problem with that? Do I have a problem with that? Oh, you can bet. We see the first instance of Cloud and Barrett's camaraderie here, as Cloud simmers down the situation before stating that Barrett is better than that. Despite Barrett's surprise, he instead hums a familiar tune to end the discussion. Dun, 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 
Barrett then tells Cloud to head back to Tifa, and frankly this does feel like padding, as the three of them could have been in the same car, which would have negated the need to travel back and forth. Though I do believe that they needed to get the character away from Tifa, so that they could transition her to a seated position out of the line of sight of the player. As Cloud returns to the first car, they are greeted by a sudden alert. It turns out that the ideas that Jesse had sourced prior to this mission didn't work, likely due to Shinra up in their security in the meantime. This means that their IDs are tagged as fake, and the security drones are on their way. Aside from the ID checkpoint plot device being paired off, it is very telling how Orwellian Shinra is when they are willing to deploy lethal drones to burst in through windows and potentially harm innocents in order to dispose of some stowaways, though this isn't the worst thing that Shinra will commit to. As Cloud deals with the drones, we are beset upon with an incredibly stupid scene. What are you doing? Trying to keep you alive. But I work for Shinra. I'm the enemy. I don't care. I don't want anyone to die. Please. I'll look after the others. As far as childish writing goes, why in the world would the middle manager refer to himself as the villain? Even if we ignore his loyalty to Shinra as displayed in Chapter 2, this would mean that he isn't aware of his own beliefs. Surely he would know that he isn't a bad guy because of course he isn't. He has a daughter and is simply a worker who doesn't have any idea as to the extent of Shinra's corruption. It would seem like he read the script and is having a meta perspective on the company as a whole. It is obvious that he wanted to have some kind of character arc here to show him doing good, but he never did bad in the first place, so this just comes across as rushed. Regardless, he helps the others to safety as Cloud is left to finish the bots. This segment is timed, and failure to destroy the drones within the allotted time leads to Cloud vacating the train by himself, though I'll touch upon this in a moment. Instead, Cloud does destroy the drones and catches up to the others. They then begin to disembark. Screw this. The station will be crawling with security. We gotta jump. Screw that. We need to slow the train down. Sounds like a big plan E. After being given a seemingly intimate moment, the pair set off in search of Barrett. Though this is the canonical option, I want to refer back to the other option which involves Cloud leaving the train himself by leaping through the window. Whilst you don't get the scene of Cloud breaking Tifa's fall here, you do get a better gameplay segment as Cloud is dropped off at the edge of the map and has to fight off the initial onslaught of drones alone. From here you will head towards the others and can enter a side room with some boxes to break. After this you can travel towards Tifa and engage in the fight as you normally would. The reason I think this path is superior gameplay wise is due to a better sense of combat progression, by starting alone and adding members as opposed to starting with two members instead, and because of the fact that you start at the end of the tunnel and won't miss any side areas. Whilst you can backtrack to the side room even if you jump off with Tifa, it seems unnatural to go away from Barra as Tifa even brings it up. If you start at the edge however, then you won't miss anything. Of course the reward is small, and can be picked up even if you don't do this, but I think that certain encounters like this can be curated in such a way that makes the gameplay flow more natural. As Cloud and Tifa travel towards Barrett, the screen transitions to a camera feed, which leads to the perspective of the head of security himself, Heidegger. <laughs> well done, well done! I felt sure we had them, didn't you? Sir! Born survivors is surats. Speaking of which, where's the third? In custody, sir. Return it to the wild. Yes, sir. Right away. Yeah. 
The duo find Barrett and switch to the other side of the tunnel to assist him. From here, they recant the plan they set. As the three of them sojourn their way towards their destination, we get the odd scene here and there showing Heidegger's perspective and Shinra's response to the trio's path. It is worth noting that this segment offers our first taste of three-person combat, which is the maximum number of party members that one can have at any time, which is even consistent with the original. There are exceptions of course, but that will be touched upon later. Thankfully the chapter is heavy enough with combat to give the player practice with swapping between them as well as synergizing their materia and skills. As we progress, Barrett points out Stamp, a small proud dogger that is kind of a mascot for Avalanche, though it is based off of a Shinra food product. So it is kind of like Avalanche turning Shinra's creations against them in a way? Regardless, I want you to remember Stamp, and remember him well, as he will be vitally important for a topic much, much later. This chapter doesn't have a whole lot of narrative meat to dig into, and, other than a comment that Cloud makes to mock Barrett's black and white worldview, most of this chapter is gameplay focused, and frankly, so are the next two chapters. So from here, we shall skip ahead to the next major obstacle. Get back! Our next boss is the lovingly named Crab Warden, a giant Shinra mech that was a mass-produced war machine during the Wutai War. As you might expect, this fight has multiple phases, and is designed to encourage the player to use all three characters, as the Crab Warden also has a scanner to lock onto certain characters and focus them down. There are also some AoE attacks that force the player to either make distance from the boss or position themselves between the tracks so as not to be caught by the electricity. A cargo container exists as some natural cover from some of the boss's moves, and, like the Scorpion Sentinel, it has multiple body parts that can be independently attacked to weaken the boss. After a lengthy fight, the trio flee from the ensuing explosion, and make their way to the service elevator, which will take them from the tunnel network to the Sector 4 underplate, which is where they will link up with Biggs to get to their true destination, Mako Reactor 5. Though, we are also given Heidegger's perspective to the Crab Warden's failure. To conclude the chapter, the trio take the elevator in the expectation of more challenges ahead. The mission continues in the sub-level of the Sector 4 plate with the trio facing a veritable labyrinth of steel ahead of them. As with Chapter 5 previously, this is a gameplay focused chapter with relatively little plot significance included within, and as such there won't be as much to discuss here. I generally like the banter in this chapter, and slower filler chapters like this allow for some nice exchanges between characters without the major plot elements taking up too much screen time. To accentuate this point, Let's take a look at another example of another game that does banter very well, Guardians of the Galaxy. Like its MCU counterpart, Guardians of the Galaxy has a ragtag cast of characters that bounce off of each other brilliantly, thanks to both great character work and tightly constructed dialogue. One of the best parts of that game is the ambient dialogue that the characters engage in throughout the missions. It is honestly astounding how many voice lines were recorded to facilitate the discussions that the cast have between each other throughout the game, and to illustrate that, here are a few examples. I still do not understand why I must remain on with the assassin. Oh, because you're part of Green Team. You assigned me to the team before you named it. My skin is not green. It's teal. Teal? What? I'm having the time of my life. Quill, shoot down a nest if you're having fun. 
speaks for itself. We're not dead yet. Maybe we are, and this is hell. Do not be ridiculous. This place lacks the eternal frost. What's I do? Your hell is frozen. The Tathians do not like to be cold. Try putting on a shirt! The point being made here is that dialogue is essential for allowing us to connect to the characters that we follow during the story. And whilst we get major character moments during plot intensive events as examples of strong dialogue, I am more referring to the small bouts of banter during the less important segments of a story. After all, we look back on these inconsequential discussions with nostalgia and reverence, after we finish the story assuming that we found the story and characters to be good. There'll be more instances of banter throughout, and when compared to a lot of other JRPGs, I would argue that the FF7 remake has pretty strong dialogue and acting in comparison. Back to the chapter, our three characters happen across a locked door without power, and as such look around for a method to open it. After some searching, they find a console that offers the solution that they have been looking for. It turns out that in order to power the door, they would have to disable the sun lamps throughout the underplate which would darken the sky for the residents in the slums below. Ignoring how the electrical infrastructure is apparently so goddamn awful that they need to turn other things off in order to power a singular door, which is a very silly premise by the way, why do the characters keep making such a big deal about their inability to see the natural sky due to the plate blocking it out? We see for ourselves that the sunlight and sky pour through the massive gaps in the plate, as well as the sides of the city and the residents have normal lampposts to light up the place during the evenings. So this weird thematic statement of the poor oppressed people not being able to see the sky whilst the rich privileged folks do simply does not work. If the point of the sun lamps is that they're used during the evenings and don't literally function as, as Tifa puts it, the closest we have to the real thing, then how are they any different to normal lights? Just to clarify, I don't have an issue with the sun lamps as forms of light during nightfall. I have an issue with the writing team trying to bludgeon us with the idea that they never see the sky when this is evidently bullshit. The closest we have to the real thing, as in the sun, but we see the sun all the time whilst being in the slums, so you already witness the real thing. Honestly, this could be a translation error as the writers really should have noticed this. Beyond this, the rest of the chapter boils down to exploring the area, occasionally switching off a sun lamp here and there to enable the player's method of advancement. We get to see some neat things, such as Cloud's incredible display of speed and reaction times as he avoids falling when trying to obtain an elemental material. Some strong chemistry between Barrett and Tifa, Barrett's fear of heights, Cloud showing some signs of bonding, Cloud also not showing signs of bonding, and, of course, Barrett's lovely singing. Where could they be going? Embarking on an adventure to find some treasure? Other than this, however, we simply have to provide power to a cargo elevator to proceed beyond this area to get to the Sector 5 reactor. I won't sugarcoat it, this chapter is seen by many as being incredibly forgettable, and I would have to echo this opinion. It isn't bad by any means, but I find it difficult to comment on many of the things that exist here from a narrative standpoint. This is a placeholder chapter to fill time, as well as serving as a remake of two or three rooms from the original game. Of course, adding length and depth to a piece of content is a benefit that a remake has, and I am not criticising the game for being too long here, I am simply stating that this chapter is unremarkable. As we get past the underplay and head towards the rendezvous spot to meet Biggs, Tifa says something rather naive. Apparently, Tifa is unaware that Shinra, the mega corporation that controls the city, and half of the entire world under a technocracy, have cameras. <coughs> anyway, the trio eventually reach their destination and are greeted by Biggs. With the path to Mako Reactor 5 available, and with their escape routes provided to them, they prepare to face their ultimate goal. We begin Chapter 7 with President Shinra preparing for an audience. Our trio enter the facility on the catwalks towards the top of the reactor building, just like the original, and use the pipes to descend to the lower levels. Tifa comments on how scary the descent was only to prod a quaint response from Cloud. It is pretty interesting that Cloud says this considering his clear terror regarding Sephiroth. 
Whilst travelling to the reactor core, the party spots a mysterious construction by the wall. Through the storytelling lore of Chekhov's gun, me thinks that this will come back later. I like the consistency of design throughout the Mako reactors as the player might subconsciously recall the layout from their time during the first chapter, and as such would be able to know exactly where they are going this time around. As they enter the main chamber, Tifa, as it is her first time in a reactor for five years, notes the pungent smell that defines the Mako, and says that it takes her back, something that we will get some more context on soon. They get to the bottom, and Cloud gets another Tism vision. This scene is a prime example of something requiring more context to generate meaning. Without the full extent of knowledge regarding the events of Nibelheim, this scene will be glossed over by new players, but with context, it is very effective to see a preview of events that will be represented in Rebirth. They then set up the bomb on the reactor core, and the remake does something that is objectively superior to the original. The plot hole revolving around the remote detonator in the original is cleared up here. Let me explain. In the original game, we simply see the characters set up the bomb before leaving despite the fact that in Mako Reactor 1, they needed to activate the timer on the spot. In the original, they never state that the bomb is on a remote frequency, and it seems like it just blows up randomly. Whereas in the remake, we get both a throwaway line to address it, and a scene of Shinra hacking the bomb and disabling the connection to Tifa's detonator, to give some rationale as to why there is a timer during the boss. This is exactly what a remake should do, and is exactly why people who say that the original game is better in every way, are simply wrong. As they try to leave, the ladder is pulled up, and the Avalanche party are given an audience with Heidegger. sweeping it for explosive devices. We now go live to the scene. I'm here in the Sector 5 Undercity. Having confirmed the terrorist target, you guys the Shinra Emergency Operations Center has issued an evacuation advisory. Hey. Residents are outraged that the tragedy of Mako Reactor 1 was only the no first attack bombings. in a campaign no of violence. President Shinra has issued a statement providing assurances that the terrorists will soon be brought to justice. And so, to a people beset by chaos and uncertainty, we will offer the finest comfort, bread and service. The big boy. I give you Sidra's latest triumph of technology. The Air Buster, your executioner. <laughs> Surely Cloud is aware that a hologram isn't a threat? I get the others flinching, but why does he? <laughs> the three decide to engage the Airbuster in direct combat, and their best plan to tackle it is to sabotage the Airbuster, and humiliate it in front of Shinra. In order to do this, they need to use keycards that they obtain, and remove aspects of the Airbuster to weaken it. This leads to an extended segment of gameplay revolving around finding and inserting keycards to remove bombs or deteriorate its AI. Frankly, this segment is dragged out a little too much and can be incredibly annoying on repeat playthroughs. Also, side note, why do the consoles consume the keycards? I'm pretty sure that the entire point of a keycard is its ability to be reused after the fact, so it is incredibly strange that the machine eats it like a faulty ATM chews up a credit card. After ditching each component, there is some occasional banter between the characters. We're about to make fools out of Shinra while the whole damn city's watching. <laughs> Times like these, you gotta save them. Oh no, if you're about to ask me to dance, then don't. Come on, don't be shy. How about you, Cloud? I don't dance. Cloud doesn't dance, huh? I guess we'll see about that. 
Before they deal with the airbuster, the player has the option to access the vault in which the disposed parts were sent. The player will engage in a rather finicky minigame involving levers that is also in the original. Although, unlike the original, this one is a lot more long-winded. When the player is done here, they can finally tackle the metalloid monstrosity that awaits them. That's right. Thank you for getting someone. <laughs> what did I get you? you strike me as the type to go on without air. Ain't enough hours in the day to hold you to account for all your crimes. And what a wasteful indulgence it would be, even if there were. Okay then. Let's talk about wasteful indulgences. What is Marco? The life stream. The lifeblood of the planet. Our planet. But Shinra keeps on slurping it up like a thirsty dog. What do you think's gonna happen if you don't stop, huh? Hmm. We do indeed keep on slurping it up, as you say. But for whose benefit, I wonder. The true nature of Marco is known to one and all. Yet the people willfully turn a blind eye to the cost. As you must surely be aware. Don't you dare try to put this on us! If anyone's going along with your plans, it's cause you brainwashed them! Such methods are beneath me. As are you, my faithful sewerettes. Henceforth, allies of wicked Wutai, our sworn enemy. Thank you for stoking our people's patriotic fervor. Wu-Tai! The hell we are! <laughs> you still don't understand your role in this! What do they do? Don't you see? You fools were never in control! Never anything but pawns in our plans to sell great and glorious war to the people! And your instruments of insurrection will detonate! Uh. When we so choose. God damn it! Now let us raise the curtain on our main event! As we see just before the Airbuster fight commences, President Shinra communes with the trio, though he does so via a hologram as opposed to appearing personally like he does in the original. Which is nonsense, by the way. Why would a man who is genuinely a feared to step into the line of fire of assassins risk his hide to demean the party personally? Having him address the so-called sewer rats from his ivory tower fits much better both thematically and logically. He then makes a rather puzzling statement claiming that Cloud's Mako enhanced cells will eventually deteriorate just like all soldiers do. This is called Accelerated Cellular Degradation, or ACD. And unfortunately, this is either an intentional misdirection or a blatant fuck up. The issue here is that ACD is not something that is intrinsic to soldiers as a whole. It is a symptom of the G type soldiers, like Angeal and Genesis. We see no other occasion in which soldiers, other than both Angeal and Genesis, suffer from degradation. And this is a whole pivotal plot point of Crisis Core. Both regular soldiers and S type soldiers, such as Cloud, Zack, and, of course, Sephiroth weren't affected by this, and one of the most important parts in Crisis Core is the reveal that Sephiroth's S cells were, in fact, a straight counter to degradation. To me, this is either a blatant retcon to what Crisis Core established, even though that game is a horribly written retconned mess for what it's worth, or it's a blatant red herring to catch people like myself and others who pay attention to the law off guard. Regardless, I thought this was too important to not bring up here. Back to the moment in question, 
The president insinuates that Avalanche are directly conspiring with the Wutaian government to overthrow Shinra and potentially kill thousands of innocents. All lies, of course, but the public are eating up the propaganda that Shinra feed them. So as to quote President Shinra. Before we engage the boss, Cloud once again receives another Tism vision after Tifa recites the exact same words that she said back in Nibelheim. I'm sick of this. I'm sick of all of this. It's just not but I feel like I'm Cloud! Get your head in the game! Counting on you, man. The Airbuster fight is, to put it bluntly, fucking badass. Aside from it being a considerable improvement from the very unimpressive boss in the original, due to the drastic increase in moves and functions, but also in how the fight is presented both visually and audibly. I mean, just listen to the music, man. A lot of this stems from the build-up to the boss throughout the entire chapter, and this is one of the few boss encounters in the game where the player has some level of control in curating the fight experience. Due to the bomb timer being set by Heidegger, there is a rather artificial timer for this fight, though it is very unlikely that the player is going to exceed the time limit so it just comes across as window dressing to make the encounter feel more tense. Considering the rather time consuming and linear chapters that came before, this truly does feel like a major boss fight capping off a whole segment of the story, and it lives up to it. The Airbuster is undoubtedly one of the best bosses in the game, and is an example of the remake improving on the original in every way. Here, have a taste of what it offers. The Airbuster may be nothing more than scrap, but Cloud may end up in an even worse manner. As Barrett shows a sign of appreciation, he carries Tifa kicking and screaming away from danger as the ensuing explosion propels Cloud off of the catwalk. And, despite his best efforts to stay up using his grapple gun, the cable snaps, causing him to plummet into darkness. The chapter opens with Cloud falling in what seems to be a metaphorical manner, surrounded by the phantoms that have harassed him and his compatriots time and again. The visuals change to that of flowers, clearly indicating his impact into the flower bed of the church. From here we are given a more blatant implementation of what was in the original, which is Cloud's true self breaking through his persona, like his conscience speaking to him. This isn't Zack, like some people tend to think. What is amusing, however, is that plenty of people who claim to be big fans of the original story seem to not understand what this scene is trying to convey, yet claim to grasp the deeper aspects of Cloud's character. Funny how that works, isn't it? 
As the real Cloud motivates himself to get up, we hear a soft voice trying to speak to him, before being undercut by the voice of Sephiroth, who strikes directly at his mind. Cloud is awoken by the soft voice of a familiar face, and this time, they exchange names. Maybe you're not okay. Ah, he lives. Finally awake, are we? You're... Aerith. It's Aerith. And you are? Cloud. Nice to meet you again. Again, huh? What? You don't remember? What about the flowers? Aerith seems particularly perturbed by Cloud's inability to recall her, though that is kinda typical for someone as distant as Cloud. Aerith points out that the flowers brought Cloud's fall, which prompts an apology from Cloud, which is a side we haven't really seen from him up to this point. She then directs the conversation to Cloud having dropped one of his materia when he fell, and then she informs him of the one she holds in her ribbon. That is where she does this, by the way. Discussing the white materia causes Cloud to have another Tism vision, this time regarding a certain infamous scene from the original, one that holds massive significance for the overarching story. She then says that the materia was a gift from her mother. We can also ascertain that it was given to her alongside the ribbon, as the ribbon is a good way of concealing such an incredibly powerful item. This, of course, would be an example of Square Enix committing to fixing the nonsensical retcons that Crisis Core inflicted upon the lore. Though the existence of Crisis Core Reunion, disrespectful name by the way, show that Square are very flaccid when it comes to sticking to a consistent continuity, but I'm getting ahead of myself here. The abhorrent mess that is Crisis Core will be torn apart by me eventually, in its own video, no matter how much of an unpopular take that is. <sighs> anyway, where were we? Ah, yes, let's get back to discussing content that is actually good, shall we? After Cloud agrees to stay a while, the pair are interrupted by a particularly foppish individual. Seeing as the Shinra goons are here to get Aerith, she strong arms Cloud into protecting her as her bodyguard, with the agreed upon price being one date. It is worth noting that in the original, Aerith specifies that she wants him to get her home safely, which is where the verbal contract would end, presumably. In the remake, however, they don't specify on when Cloud's duties as a bodyguard ends, though it is difficult to narrow down on whether this was an intentional change writing-wise, in that Aerith doesn't want to relinquish him that quickly, or if this was something that was an oversight, and the devs forgot to include it. I would argue that the distinction is important, as later in the original, despite the fact that Cloud's contractual obligation to her ended, he still consensually refers to himself as her bodyguard, obviously due to his strong feelings for her crystallising themselves in the form of keeping her safe from harm, sometimes to an obsessive and even overbearing degree. My point being that in the original, Cloud, despite how much he would shyly deny it, wanted the contract to persist, as long as it meant him getting closer to her, not only because her warm friendship is something he seeks, but also because he has a strong desire for companionship, brought on by his attachment issues in his youth. To him, his feelings for her extend far beyond friendship, but of course, that is a whole kettle of fish that deserves its own segment, or its own video, I dare say. Back to the present, however, after the agreement is made, Reno prods Cloud's ego some, and a fight ensues. As far as the fight against Reno goes, he has a lot of electric based attacks that obviously means he has a natural resistance to lightning too, so if you paired both the lightning and elemental materia into Cloud's weapon for the airbuster fight, then don't forget to adjust this prior to the boss. Reno is particularly slippery as enemies go, deftly dodging Cloud's attacks, and he sometimes follows up with a swift riposte too. One of his more difficult moves to deal with is his EM shot which cannot be blocked as this stuns Cloud, yet dodging too early causes it to track the player, so stay still and dodge when it gets too close. Of course, you could equip the lightning plus elemental combo onto Cloud's armour, so that he becomes resistant to the effects and tank the attack instead. Again, it is an RPG, so it's up to you. Other than that, however, the fight is deceptively simple. Simply go into Punisher mode, hold the guard up, and attack him after the counter lands for free damage. Even basic blocks leave him vulnerable, 
so play defensive and capitalize. In his second phase, he drops some electric balls, don't laugh, which can be disposed of with triple slash. Oh, and by the way, a cool trick in this fight is dodging towards his thrust attack, which with the right timing will cause Cloud to vault over Reno's head and pressure him. This is very similar to the Makiri counter in Sekiro, if you have played that game, and isn't the last time in this game that you can do this. In fact, it is actually beneficial to vault over the other boss, whereas here it is merely artificial. We'll discuss that boss in detail later, but for now, we conclude this one. Cloud is moments away from killing Reno before Aerith intervenes, which also causes our shadowy friends to show up, dragging Cloud and Aerith to the back rooms. No, not THOSE back rooms. As they make their way to the top, Aerith almost falls, causing a ghost to break her fall. As Cloud engages in chivalry, the Shinra grunts shoot at the beam supporting Aerith, causing her to fall. Cloud engages his monkey brain to save her, and loosens the chandelier from its position to give her an opening. We then get a rather laughable visual of Cloud casually tanking bullets as he heads toward Aerith. <laughs> Guys, bullets? Seriously? They aren't gonna work. My name isn't Zack Fair. <laughs> I'm going to hell for that joke. Eventually, they climb up into the attic, and Reno gives up the chase. I always find it amusing that Reno remarks that Cloud's victory was beginner's luck, despite the fact that Cloud is physically superior to him, but I digress. Aerith indulges Cloud's attempt to seem cool, which is very consistent by the way, as she isn't fooled by this facade at all. She can see right through his tough exterior to the unfortunate soul beneath, which really helps their dynamic. Though it is worth noting the little chuckle that Cloud makes here, as if he sees her mockery and isn't offended by it. Something you'll see throughout this chapter, and throughout their interactions going forward, is in how he genuinely enjoys her company, as he is considerably more receptive to her than any other character. Aerith notes that the strange entities have disappeared, and when she seems ready to answer Cloud's question, she relents. Almost as if she is trying to intentionally withhold information, or she simply doesn't want to open up about her theory yet. Regardless, they both leave the church, and prepare to travel the rooftops. It is interesting that they chose to have Aerith say Mosey to Cloud here, as this is a callback to his infamous line towards the end of the original game, where he echoes the same line. This could simply be a cute reference to the original, or it could be emblematic of the entire theme that this game hinges upon in regards to fate. As for the rooftop scene, this is packed with some of the strongest characterization in the game for both Cloud and Aerith, and is made so intentionally to curry favour with the audience by getting them invested in these characters if they weren't already attached to them via other parts of the compilation. It is also worth noting that some folks who worked on the game view this as their favourite scene in the entire game. Examples include co-director, designer and programmer Naoki Hamaguchi, as well as Cloud's English voice actor Cody Christian. Let's go through some of it, shall we? For starters, their exchange begins with Cloud outlining his plans, stating that he will take Aerith home before setting off to Sector 7 to meet up with Tifa, Barrett and the others in 7th Heaven. Aerith quizzes him on whether or not he knows the way back, prompting this dialogue. Despite the fact that Cloud said he knows the way in a tone that would imply he is being sincere and truthful, Aerith sees right through it, and calls him out for being too proud. Aerith's ability to intuit people's feelings is something intrinsic to her ancient biology, though this shouldn't be confused with mind reading. It also doesn't give her the capacity to sense deep personal thoughts that people have, though with time and the proper experience, this may be something that she could do. The point is that she has a unique ability to break through Cloud's facade in ways that other characters cannot. On top of her general social skills, not only does this help bring Cloud's personal issues and insecurities to the surface, so that they can be appropriately dealt with, rather than having them metastasize, but because this gives Cloud a vessel that he can share his trauma with. Of course, this is done subtly, as opposed to the characters blurting their issues out loud, but having a character that understands Cloud, truly understands him, allows for him to share a profound connection with not only a friend, but a lover. This creates the baseline for what is, to many people, one of the best romances in fiction, and I would even go as far as saying that it is my favourite. Granted, I am not exactly the romantic sort, 
You won't catch me popping Pride and Prejudice on during a cold Saturday afternoon, yet the strength of the character writing regarding these two is enough to get me misty-eyed, and that, my friends, is a very impressive accomplishment. That being said, I am acutely aware of the controversial shipping debates that spring from this game, seeing as I have alluded to them earlier in this very critique. And whilst I won't spend much time deliberating on that here, as that is something that is best discussed in its own video, I will say that those debates function on a lot of purely subjective preferences, materialising themselves in the form of nebulous arguments belched onto Twitter with the sole purpose of presenting misinformation, which, in turn, manipulate gullible newcomers to the series in looking at the games with a malformed lens regarding the characters, their journeys and arcs, as well as the overarching world and stories that inhabit it. If you couldn't discern what I was trying to convey through that word salad, allow me to simplify it. There are too many people who either make subjective arguments that lack any kind of substance when discussing the character relationships within the FF7 mythos, by basing them off their own desires. For instance, there will be plenty of people out there that would unironically say that Cloud has to be in a relationship with Tifa because she has big tits bro. As if Cloud, as a character, holds the same tastes or looks for the same qualities in a woman that a bunch of horny 30 year old redditors do. Not to say that he can't, as Cloud definitely finds female qualities attractive, as will be evidenced later, but the game does not represent Cloud's favourite cup size in any of its dialogue, so cool off it. The other type of people are, of course, your theorists and community pillars that will pride themselves on being able to discuss objective facts of the story with ease, yet still think that Cloud has Zack's memories. You know, because they didn't understand that segment in the story one bit. That is also something else worth tackling at another time, but just let it be known that I make sure to tackle the narrative and all aspects of the story in as objective a manner as possible, though that does still make me prone to inaccuracies. The reason these debates irritate me as much as they do is because there is an absurd level of cognitive dissonance that damages people's takes regarding the story and characters, and as someone who came into this fandom without a preset bias on what aspects I liked and didn't like, I was emancipated enough to assess the narrative objectively and form my own opinions from there. Unfortunately, there are too many people who began their FF7 journey with a game like Crisis Core, which poisons the well in regards to the understanding of continuity, and gives people a warped perception on what holds precedence within the story. Case in point, there are people out there that use Zack and Aerith's relationship in Crisis Core to belittle the strong bond that Cloud and Aerith have. <laughs> you dolt! Clarif isn't canon, go and play Crisis Core to see who Aerith actually loves. Despite blatantly ignoring that Crisis Core is a prequel, and that it was released a decade after the same tropes were used between Cloud and Aerith in the original FF7. These are the same people that think that Cloud stole the church troll from Zack, as if Crisis Core was the progenitor of this contrivance, when it's literally the opposite. I'm serious guys, I'm inches away from doing a video that tears Crisis Core apart. It really is that awful. And the recently released remaster, or remake? Remastic? Remakester? Whatever you want to call it, is only going to further reinforce the misunderstanding that people have regarding the continuity, which is a mighty shame. I think you can tell from this tangent that I am incredibly passionate about this story and the characters within but I am not some soy adult consumer that slurps up all of the slop that is thrown onto my plate. Just because Crisis Core is a game set in the FF7 universe, and that it includes the Skinwalker variants of the characters that I care about, doesn't mean it is good, and doesn't mean I should give a shit about it. Hell, openly critiquing and lambasting installments of a franchise you love is a virtue only a fan of something can have. And with that case settled, let's move on, shall we? As their discussion continues, Aerith's character shines through as we see the level of sassiness that she has around other characters, especially when clashing with Cloud's stoicism. Whilst this sass is a little off-putting to Cloud at first, after all, it isn't surprising that an introvert doesn't exactly entertain the notion of small talk and playful activity, he does eventually warm to this, which is kind of the point of their entire relationship throughout the story. Cloud is a hard ass and doesn't really enjoy interaction with others, nor does he appreciate anyone taking the piss out of him for kicks. But Aerith gradually wears down these walls and changes him as a person, and none of this has anything to do with his selective amnesia wearing off. This is good old-fashioned character development. 
Even this early on into their relationship, Cloud is already more talkative with her than anyone else thus far, despite her being a complete stranger. This is a sign of a guy that is clearly interested in her, even if said attraction has yet to advance beyond surface level. What seems like a cutesy, albeit damsel-like line, actually exposes one of the defining traits of Aerith as a character, and one of her core weaknesses, her fear of being alone. This, of course, is touched upon later, yet I find it fascinating that even though Cloud is merely a few metres away, her reaction to this shows exactly how untrusting she is of others when they claim to stay with her, as they are more than capable of leaving at a whim. As it is a fear, this transcends logical thought, People with a fear of spiders know that a common house spider cannot kill them or inflict harm in any meaningful way, nor would the creature have any desire of doing so, yet they still fear them. This is because phobias are deeply entrenched, and don't always seem like they make sense. Again, this is something I will tackle in more detail later in regards to her fear of abandonment and how exactly that fear manifested itself. But I like Cloud's response. <laughs> Those are the words of a soldier candidate? So petty. Not only does this show how much he changes around her specifically, but it is also a nice gesture to something that she finds discomfort in. Even a guy like Cloud is capable of showing heart. So, does no one live in these buildings? Nope. No one to get mad if we make noise. Awfully suggestive there, aren't we, Aerith? As they begin to climb the ladder, Cloud shows concern which prompts Aerith to claim that he worries too much and that she is an adult that can handle herself. This is a nice display of personal strength and agency that Crisis Core saw fit to remove from her character entirely, mind you. Despite this, Aerith, as evidenced by the prior scene, clearly does want someone to be around. A desire to have someone that is there to look after her, as she sorely lacked this throughout her life. And as it so happens, Cloud is that someone. Also, side note, Aerith curses for the first time ever here, which is kinda wholesome. This shows that despite her pure, altruistic bloodline, she is just as human as everyone else. Aerith's statement about the slums reveals a lot about her character, as she shows the capability to look past the ugly exterior of things to the beauty within. This doesn't merely apply to just Midgar and its design, but also to people. Aerith would likely also view some depraved ne'er-do-wells as having goodness inside them, as not only is she a kind and altruistic person, but her ability to sense the emotional state of others would clue her into the sort of nature that a person holds. She also exclaims that she wants to leave Midgar, but couldn't. In her own words, the outside world was too much for her to handle. Though part of this may be tied to her aforementioned fear of loneliness, and that travelling out into a massive world, and away from the people she knows, could affect that. Of course, there is more to this in the future. Aerith is already beginning to enjoy teasing Cloud, as this scene suggests. After contracted tetanus, the rooftop excursion nears its conclusion. You good? Of course. Hero. Never a dull moment with you. That a compliment? Uh, not really. <laughs> Thanks anyway. The fact that a rather pedestrian scene such as this was all it took to get me invested in this relationship speaks volumes. It's cute, what can I say? For your information, dear viewer, that assessment of the rooftop scene alone reached just north of 2,000 words. You're welcome. Moving on, Cloud again tries to act cool in front of Aerith. This isn't even a humble brag, as he sees Sephiroth in his dreams. He is one spooky dude. From here, we are introduced to the fourth and final party member of the game, 
Aerith serves as the archetypical mage character, or red mage, I should specify, as the Final Fantasy series features white mages that focus on healing and cleansing negative status effects, black mages that inflict elemental damage and deal ability and effects on enemies, as well as being the name of composer Nobuo Uematsu's prog rock band. And, of course, the red mage which is a character archetype that combines the benefits of both the black and white mages into one. Of course, the materia system means that any character can be a red mage, technically speaking, but Aerith's limits and abilities encourage her playstyle as a supportive character more than the others. As with the other playable characters, we'll be discussing her playstyle more specifically later. Someone looks like they're in their element. Cloud's non-response is indicative of the fact that Cloud rarely receives sincere compliments, especially from someone he is attracted to. Cloud shows a great deal of pride for his training and experience, mainly due to his desire to be noticed for his strengths. After they head past the train station, we come across a vending machine that contains Ket Shea's theme. Now, this may seem like a rather useless piece of information, but Ket Shea holds a lot of importance in regards to Cloud and Aerith's relationship. He is the one who both accurately predicts Aerith's untimely demise, as well as making an inaccurate prediction to their eventual marriage. So his theme being here could be a reference to that, or it could simply be a coincidence. If it is intentional, then this could even be an attempt to foreshadow the narrative threads in Rebirth and beyond. Nevertheless, Cloud and Aerith's peripatetic journey is interrupted when one of the helicopters drops off its passenger. As they head off on their tangent, we are given a great excuse for some more banter such as this knee slapper. No telling where you will come from. Monsters instinctively target weaker prey. Mm. You'd better watch out then, Cloud. <laughs> it is worth noting that Cloud actually audibly laughs at this. Yes, this is the same Cloud that has been incredibly deadpan and stoic throughout the game. Obviously, Cloud is human and is still capable of engaging in bouts of levity, which he does here. But what is interesting is that this is most likely an adaptation of the scene in the original game, where we see Cloud laugh rather explicitly when crossing the rooftops with Aerith. In fact, it seems that both scenarios feature Aerith rather prominently, almost as if Aerith is the only one who is capable of consistently amusing him to the point of actual laughter. Sure, it ain't no Tidus laugh, but he does chuckle. Again, if the point is being missed here, Cloud laughing here so early on in their relationship, especially when some may consider Aerith to be annoying or overbearing, is a testament to how Cloud really digs her. It is particularly troubling that so many alleged fans of this IP have gaslit those who see the romantic structure of their relationship as being crazy. I linger on this, as Cloud and Aerith's romance is massively important to their character journeys, which affects the plot as a whole. Their love story even inspired not only those outside of FF7, but also the more accepted relationship of Zack and Aerith. Hey, to those that love Zack and Aerith's relationship, you know that it pretty much rips off a lot of what was established in Cloud and Aerith's, right? Of course, Crisis Core does it considerably worse, but that's besides the point. Just let it be known that the point of the story synopsis, and the reason I am analysing the FF7 story, is so that people can have a greater understanding of the canonical material. That means, in layman's terms, that when I discuss Cloud and Aerith's relationship as being canon, that I have come to the conclusion that it is an objective fact. What I find funny is that in any other game, no one would dispute this, but because Tifa merely exists, and because they played Crisis Core first, this apparently means that they view it through a biased lens. Anywho, the point of the line and Cloud's response was that Aerith meant it as a way to prod and gird Cloud's ego, but Cloud actually found it funny, that's all. Aerith follows up on the joke from earlier, but what is interesting is how Cloud responds to her. How do you figure? It's stated in a very soft tone, almost as if he is curious as to what she has to say. We get a moment of respite as they edge closer to the Sector 5 slums. Cloud is surprised at Aerith's energy. No, that is not a euphemism. And Aerith is insistent on Cloud staying for dinner. Despite that energy, I like how Aerith's clear vulnerabilities are characterised. Whilst she is very magically inclined, far more so than the rest of the overarching cast, she is pretty pathetic physically. She isn't strong, fast, agile or durable. We know that far too well. And she gets tired easily. 
We'll discuss some of the other characters' weaknesses in their own segment in the character portion of the critique, as well as whenever their weaknesses are relevant. After Cloud engages in some gymnastics, the pair head on out of the scrapyard, though not until they have an amusing back and forth. Yes, we're home free. No need for thanks. I'd rather get paid. Hmm? You're getting paid right now. Hmm? Huh? Oh. This interaction is great, and no one seems to understand it. Aerith implies that being with her is payment enough. Which, to be fair, is true. And Cloud figures it out. No wonder people pretend their relationship is meaningless when they don't even grasp the basic chemistry between characters. As we get back to the main route, the two enter Aerith's hometown of the Sector 5 slums. What are they watching? Hey! Aerith rushes off to see the news on the screen overlooking the town square, and Cloud follows. It is here that Cloud gets a reminder of the reactor bombing, as well as a sense of comfort knowing that Tifa and Barrett weren't captured and consequently tortured for information. We are also introduced to Scarlet here. N no, no! Keep it in your pants, you degenerate! We're discussing the plot here. I'd like to take a moment to state how much I appreciate the pacing of this game, which funnily enough is seen as a criticism of this game, though I'm not sure how as seeing as the people who say this can't actually qualify their reasons as to why that is. We, as the player, have just come off of the back of three continuous chapters which involved a great deal of action, culminating in the Airbuster fight. Having Chapter 8 take place the next day, with a heavier emphasis on character moments with Aerith, really helps to calm the blood of the player before the next inevitable action sequence. This goes both ways, of course. If the game had only walking segments and no combat, the game would be awful. In fact, it would barely qualify as a game. Sadly, a lot of these pseudo-games exist, with the Dark Pictures anthology being the cream of the crop example of brain-dead sludge that requires no input from the player. I mean, for heaven's sake, in Little Hope, there are QTEs that you cannot fail even if you go out of your way to do so. It really feels like the quick time events don't matter. I missed every single one and it's not doing anything. Wait, how in the fuck did this get higher than a 1? Thankfully, when the game gives you a segment that involves very little combat, you'll be offered a chapter almost entirely dedicated to strict combat as a palate cleanser of sorts. Though this could be seen as padding, which wouldn't really matter as padding and filler aren't strictly negatives as it is all case by case, and I will elucidate more on this down the line, the overall point is that this chapter is a great tonal shift to bring the player back to focusing on the character and plot as opposed to simply killing things. We are then treated to a barrage of character traits for Aerith. Such examples include the fact that she is a good Samaritan, and is perfectly open to working for free or for a charitable cause as she finds it fun. This falls in line with her altruistic nature, though it is worth noting that she is the breadwinner in place of her mother, who is now retired. We are also shown that Aerith doesn't really have any friends of her age, as she mostly hangs around the younger orphans who are more open to her. This isn't to say that she doesn't interact with other townspeople, just that she doesn't have any true friends to hang out with. Most of the friends from her youth either left or fell out of favour with her. An example of this is Kyrie, as she is someone who ostracised Aerith based on her powers, labelling her as a freak and wanting nothing to do with her. Pretty ironic given Aerith's sweet and affable demeanour. After a series of discussions with the other townsfolk, Aerith leads Cloud up the path to her home and sparks another discussion. So, Cloud, what's your favourite flower? They're all the same to me. Huh. You sure you want to say that to a florist? Better than lying. Okay. Then what'd you do with the flower I gave you? I, uh... You give it away? I did. Ooh, to who? Tell me. Don't recall. Hmm... What? Thought you didn't like lying. I think it's safe to assume that the reason why Cloud doesn't tell her who he gave the flower to, or how he conveniently forgot in this case, is because he doesn't want her specifically to get the wrong idea of his relationship status. He does like Aerith after all, despite his attempts to cover it up, and as he and Tifa are not dating, with the flower being more of a courtesy, he doesn't want Aerith to think he is taken. It also speaks volumes about how little the flower gesture actually meant to him, as he brushes over it when he has no a priori reason to do so. 
In fact, the FF7 remake Ultimania Plus claims that he gave the flower as that was something that he figured Zack would do, being as he was a flirtatious and chauvinistic type, rather than being something that is intrinsic to Cloud's personal desires. So, if you're of the perspective that Cloud has Zack's memories, and that he only likes Aerith because that is Zack coming through in a sense, then you would have to concede ground and accept that his feelings for Tifa are as baseless as they are for Aerith, and that they're inspired by Zack's personality. That is, of course, if you actually believe in being consistent to a narrative, or a principled thought process, that is. But that is none of my business. Eventually, we are greeted to a serene vista of a wooden house orbited by flowers. It's interesting that Cloud describes the house as amazing, as this is not something we would expect him to say. Unless, of course, his feelings on the matter are sincere. I mean, he literally just said that all flowers were the same to him, so unless he has some kind of profound love for woodworking, this would be an example of him dropping his facade. They head on inside. Cloud meets Elmira, and she is cut off from her thoughts when she turns around and sees him. Whilst she seems quite open and accepting, this early exchange already tells us everything we need to know. She clearly sees not just a young man that her daughter is dragged in, but a soldier from Shinra, and with both her desire to protect Aerith from not only relationship-based troubles, but also from the organisation that clearly wants her, this gives us a clear understanding of her indignation towards Cloud. This, coupled with the fact that she sees Zack, Aerith's previous and only boyfriend when looking at Cloud, would only serve to further irritate her, as he is the reason for Aerith's first heartbreak, and the reason why she cried herself silly when he never came back. Elmira clearly doesn't want that to happen again, and, as such, doesn't approve. When Cloud implies that his job is over, as in, his contract, Aerith offers to take him to Sector 7, which prompts Cloud to get quite flustered and confused as to why she needed his help in the first place. Aerith prods Cloud's facade again, eliciting a stronger and harsher response from him. Aerith, of course, isn't fazed by this as she sees right through him and knows that he didn't mean what he said. The line, Quit acting like you know me, is intriguing if you subscribe to the theory that Aerith is fully and consciously aware of who Cloud is, based off of FF7's theme of mimetic legacy in which Aerith's future self in the livestream sent echoes of her consciousness back in time, and our Aerith is catching snippets of that which would grant her knowledge of future events, including those of the man she would fall in love with. It would explain why, when in the church, she says this. You don't mind, do you? Bodyguard work's not too different from Merc stuff, right? Uh, I guessed. From the sword. The guess would be a cover-up as to not clue Cloud into her true knowledge, as she already knows of Cloud and his occupation, despite Cloud never alluding to this via dialogue. This theory does seem very viable, but I personally feel it would be safer to wait for Rebirth to expand on the context before jumping to conclusions. It literally could just be a guess as far as we are aware. When Cloud shows reservations about assisting her with her chores, she then threatens to tell Elmira of the date she promised him. Of course, Aerith knew that Cloud would be awfully shy and even self-conscious about seeming like he is just simping for her, so she played that against him to get him into helping her. She isn't doing this out of malice, by the way. She clearly wants to get closer to him, and to be fair, I can't blame her. She's very clever from a social perspective, and knows how to run rings around him. This leads to a pretty amusing shot of him letting out a defeated sigh, before Elmira states that Aerith is quite a handful. That she is, Mrs. Gainsborough. That she is. Elmira seems like she is about to ask Cloud about him being a soldier, but decides against it. For now, Cloud has time to kill, and wanders the home. Aerith's house is idyllic, and Cloud seems to like it there. If Aerith lives, we might have a good idea at what their future home might look like. Assuming their relationship continues as intended, that is. After some time, Aerith returns with the flower baskets. They then set out to commit some flower eugenics. I jest. This entire sequence is beautiful, and despite this, it will be outshone in its beauty by a scene later on in this very chapter. Cloud and Aerith head around the garden and pick flowers at the request of one of the orphanage's mistresses. Aerith has some dialogue for each type of flower that Cloud picks, likely pertaining to some aspects of either their characters or relationship. The obvious example being the line about loyalty, initiated by picking the white flowers, 
The flowers you choose can change the arrangement that features outside the orphanage and will persist throughout the playthrough. The options cycle through a Moogle, Cactuar or Chocobo, three of the most iconic Final Fantasy creatures seen aplenty through the franchise. Other than the lines of dialogue that Aerith mutters when picking the flowers, and of course the aesthetic value, you do not get any reward other than the superficial elements, seeing as the dialogue is tertiary at most. After helping Aerith with the flowers, Cloud is left with some time alone. From here, Cloud can investigate around the town, and during his jaunt, you can find Chadley. If you recall back to the end of Chapter 4, I noted that you should turn in the intel that you have completed then, as it would be a while before you see him again. As you can tell, this is your chance to complete all of the intel that you engaged in during the previous three chapters, which, for most players, should be at least four. If you have completed four pieces of intel by Chapter 8, you get the chance to fight your first summon in a VR battle in order to obtain said summon for yourself. The summon in question is Shiva, which, incidentally, is the first guaranteed summon that you can obtain in the original FF7. Whilst you can fight her now, I would recommend waiting until Aerith rejoins before facing her, as she can be pretty tough with low level characters. That being said, if you abuse the Ice plus Elemental Materia combo on an armor piece for Cloud, you can pretty much solo her, assuming that the Materia level is up to snuff. Remember, even with the base materia level, it still halves ice damage, so even that should be enough to solo. Then again, if you didn't get the elemental materia from chapter 6, you shouldn't bother fighting her yet. Aside from Chadley, if you choose to leave, Cloud remarks on how he cannot leave without telling Aerith. What I find funny is that this simply isn't true. They are both adults, and he can leave now if he wanted to, but Cloud clearly wants to uphold his end of the bargain and enjoys her presence too much to simply leave right now. This also leads me onto the OST that plays within the Sector 5 slums, Hollow Skies. I'll touch on the ramifications of this track and its lyrical counterpart in the music section, but for clarity, this song is evidently emblematic of Cloud's pains regarding the loss of a loved one, and whilst Hollow is another one of Cloud's themes, I believe that Hollow Skies is the closest thing we have to a love theme between Cloud and Aerith. Of course, this video will be released before Rebirth, or so I hope, so my take might either be vindicated or vilified, we'll see. When Cloud returns to the orphanage, he sees Aerith talking to Oates, one of the kids that he encountered. Cloud reckons that the robed man that Oates described is Marco, the enfeebled man that he almost accidentally slew. As such, he wishes to go with her to investigate. Upon entering the hideout, the kids tell them where to head. I want to draw attention to another great piece of music, this one is called Let the Battles Begin Hideout, and I think it is strong in particular because of how it is incredibly representative of Cloud and Aerith's battle synergy. The track is basically broken into two parts, with the first half brimming with power thanks to the heavy use of brass, which represents Cloud, and the ferocity that he imposes into fights, whilst the second half which is primarily composed of soft piano notes, eases into the rhythm and calms the initial half. This half clearly represents Aerith and her more gentle nature, but more importantly how her nature softens Cloud's more blunt and uncaring disposition. These two halves, like Cloud and Aerith themselves, are perfect complements to one another and serve to make this a great track. Plus it sounds good. The two deal with the immediate threats and rescue the wayward kids. Cloud, based on his behaviour, clearly isn't a fan of kids, which isn't some bizarre kind of bigotry by the way, it is pretty intrinsic to his character. Despite this, the kids indulge his cool factor, which is a pretty important thing to him. As the kids annoy him all the way back to the hideout, Cloud is struck with another Tism vision. Tifa? What's wrong? Nothing. Is Tifa like your girlfriend? No. Hmm, but she's someone special. It's not like that. More like... I don't know how to explain. I see. 
To those in the know, we are acutely aware of Cloud's disdain to the other children in Nibelheim. So this vision isn't just a recollection of Tifa, but, more importantly, a specific memory of her being popular with the others, with friends, in ways that he wasn't. Something that lingers in the deep recesses of his psyche. Then there is the teasing that Aerith follows it with. Due to her intrigue, she presses Cloud to see if Tifa is his girlfriend, similar to this scene from the original. Cloud immediately denies the assertion which prompts further prodding, in which Cloud responds, it's not like that. This is true. Cloud's relation to Tifa and his childhood memories involving her are complicated, yet not romantic. All of this is dealt with during the livestream sequence in the deal within the original game, though I reckon Aerith is actually asking about this due to a theory that many have that, just like with knowing Cloud, she may also be privy to Tifa's existence and the friendship that they shall foster. More on that later. Lastly, this could be seen as Cloud practically confirming the notion that he doesn't want Aerith to get the wrong idea of his relationship status. He is interested in her after all. The kids are returned to the hideout, and eventually, the robed man makes an appearance. Other than confirming that the man isn't Marco, and that there are other men sporting the same apparel, this scene is interesting in how it blatantly correlates both the robed men and the reunion together. Whilst a newcomer may not understand the connotation, veterans will see the connection easily. The point is that an astute player could draw the lines between the robed men and Sephiroth with a minimal amount of explicit information, and that is a neat bit of storytelling. Aerith comforts Cloud with his seizure, and this is perfectly conveyed through Cloud's point of view. As he sees and feels her caress his hand, before looking directly into her eyes with the right words to calm him down. She barely knows him at this stage, yet she clearly shows a lot of care towards him and his mental state. She also knows how to assist him in a way that Cloud is open to and accepts. Her feelings for him as being already present are kinda implied with this line here, as this makes it seem like she knows more than she lets on. It is also reasonable to assume that she knows Cloud's true self somewhat too, and, as such, would lend to her knowing how to comfort him. Duh, she notes that she heard of Sephiroth's demise via the news. Well, that seems pretty normal, right? Well, unfortunately, this would mean that she would also know of Zack's status of being killed in action, which would contradict her knowledge of Zack's well-being in both the original game and Dismantled, where she claims to have no idea of his current status. It would be strange for her to lie about that given the circumstances, so in reality, all this does is compound a pretty egregious plot hole that already exists in Crisis Core. And before you ask, no, I am not talking about that here. Wait until my Crisis Core vid for a breakdown of what plot hole I am referring to, though there are quite a fair few. And now it is time for the side quests of this chapter, and, as with the side quests in Chapter 3 that boosted Tifa's affection rating, these help to elevate Aerith's affection rating for the scenes that come later. Cloud proclaims that he has no time for delays, and that he should head back to Sector 7, with Aerith saying, It's okay, I give you permission. After a dad joke and several other attempts to get Cloud to engage in some good Samaritan work, Aerith is actively trying to break down Cloud's walls in an effort to get him to open up to the world, to open up to her. That is what these quests in particular lend themselves toward, and exactly why Cloud's character arc truly begins in this chapter. As with Chapter 3, if you complete all of the side quests here, then you will be rewarded with an optional scene with Aerith. However, as this scene is required for a canonical payoff later, I will obviously be discussing it. Upon completing the side quests and calling it a day, Cloud and Aerith bump into a well-dressed man as they return home. Hello, Aerith. What do you want? Haven't seen him before. He your new boy toy? He's my bodyguard, if you must know. Wait a minute. Those eyes. Is he the one who beat up Reno? And what if I am? Need to cross my T's, dot my I's, that's all.
Cloud, leave him be. Rude's not a bad person, really. No, I'm not bad. But like it or not, I sometimes have to do bad things. Don't take it personal. <laughs> you Turks are all the same. All bark, no bite. You'll want to talk. The fight with Rude is a pretty straightforward one. Most of his moves can be blocked and parried easily enough, though getting caught by his melee attacks can be quite punishing. Cloud has to be particularly careful of getting caught by Rude's unblockable grabs, as not only do they do sufficient damage, but they can also throw Cloud into Aerith, damaging her as well. Speaking of Aerith, one of Rude's core characteristics from the original game is that he's incredibly chivalric. He goes much easier on the female cast during fights, despite the fact that the girls can hold their own. This is maintained here, as, when the player controls Aerith, he will use a move called Sweet Dreams, which puts Aerith to sleep as opposed to attacking her. This could also be seen as him not wanting to damage the subject as well. In his second phase, when he takes damage, he can sometimes use a barrier not too dissimilar to Dante's Royal Guard from Devil May Cry. If the player persists in using melee attacks on Rude whilst he is guarding, this can result in Rude unleashing a powerful Haymaker in retaliation. I also find it a little disappointing that Rude does not have his own rendition of the Turks theme. The track that plays during this fight is the same one as the Reno fight, titled The Turks Reno. I think it is safe to say that I would have preferred a variation of the tune that is unique to Rude, but eh, whatever. Please, just leave us alone. You know I can't do that. Hey there, partner. I'm sure you're having the time of your life, but we're needed on standby for a job. It's something about Sector 7. So get your ass back here now. Understood. Got somewhere else to be? Apparently so. Go home and stay there. You know I can't do that. Huh? <laughs> Before the two head inside, Aerith beckons Cloud over to a patch of flowers in her garden, resulting in the following scene. Talking to this. So, yeah, it was that kind of day. <sighs> Let's go. Shouldn't keep mom waiting. Hey, what'd they say? Good work today, guys. Kidding. They didn't say a word. But, you know... Uh, never mind. It's not like you'd believe me, after all. Hmm. Probably not. Oh. <sighs> Tell me anyway. Really? Yeah. It won't be much longer now. The flowers, they... They have something important to tell us. Something they... Need to share with us. At least, that's the feeling I get. But, before they can... There's a 
final step that has to be taken. Otherwise, we won't hear them. Maybe I should just give up. Honestly, it's what I do best. Could have fooled me. From what I've seen, you're no quitter. Well, today's special. That's why I've been working my butt off. Uh, what's so special about it? <laughs> okay, time to go. Learn to talk to her. Did the flowers say anything? Uh, good work today, guys? <laughs> That's the spirit. Obviously, Cloud is rather taken aback at seeing Aerith talk to the flowers, and yet, when she tries to move on, he inquires about what she asked. When she says that she was kidding and that they didn't say anything, I feel like this works not only in the literal sense, as in she didn't get a response, but also as a way for her to pretend that she was joking, so as not to make it seem like she is a weirdo to Cloud. This makes sense, given what she knows of him, and as such claims that he wouldn't believe her anyway. However, Cloud indulges her by letting her speak her mind, clearly showing that he is starting to seriously warm to her. It should also be clarified that when Cloud says, tell me anyway, it does not matter whether or not Cloud actually believes her. What matters is that he wants to hear her speak about things that she is interested in. By giving her the room to talk on this matter, he's subtly proving his interest in her, as most real-life relationships involve this sort of thing. Like when a partner or parent asks what you did today at work or at school. You know that they don't have the specific context necessary to have any interest in the topic at hand, but they want to strike up a conversation with the ones they care about, something I would assume that most of us can relate to. Aerith talks about a vague notion that the planet is coming to an end, and that a final step has to be taken. Aerith lightly clenches her fist here, which could be seen as her showing discomfort to what she may believe as her death being necessary for the planet's safety. The voices that she supposedly hears could be the voices of the livestream, but they also could be from the whispers directly, as they may be telling her to stay on Fate's course. They then give us a shot of Cloud, which makes it seem like he is actually listening, which precedes the dialogue of Aerith taking a defeatist approach. Cloud gives her a slight pep talk, which is a great indicator as to how good these characters are for one another. You know when I said that the relationship that Cloud and Aerith holds is massively important to both of their characters, and that it isn't simply some ship that I have latched onto? Yeah, well this is one example of that and there are a slew of them throughout the main story of FF7. When Aerith says that today is special, Cloud asks why, to which Aerith seems surprised at Cloud's oblivious nature, and, to quote Maximilian Dude, She met you, you fucking idiot! Cloud tells the flowers, learn to talk to her. This can be taken literally as if he is speaking directly to the flowers, which would show that he does believe her and that he is willing to make himself look like a tree-hugging fool just to defend her honour in a way, but it can also be seen as Cloud referring to himself, wanting himself to not be as shy and nervous around her. He would be telling himself to learn to talk to her. After that very tranquil scene, the pair return home to a frustrated Elmira, she tells Aerith to prepare the guest room for Cloud, and Aerith obliges. Though, it is clear that Elmira wants some one-on-one -on -one time with Cloud. Elmira doesn't want Cloud around Aerith, for fear of her getting hurt, or worse. Not only is this because of what she perceives to be Cloud's occupation, but because she has seen this before. Elmira was aware of Aerith's relationship with Zack, and, as confirmed by Dismantled, she was quite angry at Zack for leaving Aerith and causing her to become incredibly upset at this. Of course, we know that Zack didn't dump her, but then again, that might have been for the best seeing as he wasn't fearful to her anyway. But I digress. Elmira doesn't want this to happen again, for Aerith to end up in another unfulfilling relationship. Which, when backed up with Cloud's reaction to this, would prove that Elmira sees a spark between the two. The line, a normal life for power, you can't have it both ways, cuts rather deep as well, as Cloud does regret joining Shinra. 
It is made even worse when the choices he made in his younger years come back to bite him. If there is one thing Cloud deserves, it is to settle down with someone he loves, as this would make all of the trauma that he has endured throughout his life worth it. So to have someone whose approval he seeks outright say that he can't have that life? Well, it tears right through him. Their conversation is cut short when Aerith returns, cutting through the tension in the room with her cheerful attitude. Aerith notices that Cloud is feeling down thanks to her inherent traits as etc, and this likely spurs her decision to go with him that very evening. The following scene is noteworthy because of the scene that I have just touched upon. It is a memory that Cloud has of a conversation with his mother back in Nibelheim. During this conversation, she shows concern for her son's love life, and wants him to find a good girl to settle down with. Whilst Cloud claims not to care, the fact that we are having this scene play out now, just after Elmira disapproved of him, is not a coincidence. The devs place this here specifically, and with what Claudia says about the traits she would want Cloud's girlfriend to have, all of them fit Aerith. Yes, all of them. Claudia states that Cloud's perfect girl should be older, mature, and should call him out when he is silly. While Aerith would never keep him out of trouble, the other descriptions fit, even the one about maturity. There are many instances where Aerith acts in a mature manner, and there will be examples beyond this point that prove that. Also, while no specifics are given during the scene, it has to be about Aerith. Due to the fact that the scene follows the Elmira scene, and because the traits line up, it is simply too relevant to not be true. This is because the writers are using basic cinematic language to tie scenes together. If this dream occurred at a random point in time, or when he was sleeping at the Stargazer Heights Motel, then a case for ambiguity could be made. Hell, I would be right there with you. But this isn't a random scene. The devs knew what they were doing. After a rather strange and forced minigame, Elmira and Cloud talk once again before he departs. Elmira doesn't want Cloud to speak to Aerith again, a perfectly understandable take from a parent, especially seeing as Shinra wants her. Of course, Aerith is an adult, she is older than Cloud, incidentally, but I totally understand her point. Besides, she even apologises to Cloud. She knows that this might hurt him, but she treats family first, and as such, Cloud had to go. Without any arguments from him, Cloud leaves and heads off to Sector 7, to receive his agreed upon payment from Barrett for the Sector 5 reactor job, and to consider his options. However, he is stopped by a familiar face. Talk about a coincidence. As cute as this is, sincerely, where did she come from? I mean, there isn't a path from the house to where she was hiding, and there is no way she could have gotten ahead of Cloud, so the only other explanation is some form of magical teleportation. Yet, Aerith has never and will never display a power of this sort, because boy would that have been useful at some point. Unfortunately, without a strong case for her presence here, and considering that her being here is vitally important for how the next chapter pans out, it is safe to say that this is a problem within the writing. As for the dialogue itself, the fact that Cloud agrees for her to come with shows that, despite his promise to Elmira, Cloud does indeed want to spend more time with her, and this is reinforced in the next chapter. Aerith turns and walks away, and Cloud has a tism vision, but this one is more serious. Not only does this one last way longer, but the residual emotions he feels through witnessing this event likely spring from the mimetic legacy that is carried through these memories, causing him to shed a tear. This is the first time we see Cloud in such a state like this, mind you, and it either stems from him trying to catch her during the sleeping forest dream in the original, or from her death, in which he definitely does cry during. As for what brought this tism vision on, it was certainly a callback to the Sleeping Forest, though some mongoloids would have you believe it is from Aerith humming The Price of Freedom. But seeing as Aerith's English voice actress Brianna White has confirmed that she simply hummed some random chords in the booth, you can clearly jog on. Fucking Zack stands, man, always trying to force him into everything, but then again Crisis Core does plenty of that. 
Aerith, once again, can tell that something is awry, yet when she tries to ask Cloud, he shamefully hides his emotional state from her, once again desiring to not look weak. And with that, Chapter 8 comes to a close. What an absolute chungus of a chapter. Aerith ambushes Cloud at the edge of town, intimating that she wants to spend more time together. As she walks on ahead towards the Sector 7 slums, Cloud feels his heart skip a beat. It is on this quote that we rejoin Cloud and Aerith as they travel to Sector 7. Before we discuss the plot beats, I want to draw attention to one of the most beautiful tracks in the entire game in my opinion, Midnight Rendezvous. This track is such a lovely piece that it feels like it was intentionally included in order to represent the growing relationship that Cloud and Aerith possess. Oh, it was. Hmm. Well, that is interesting. Do with this information as you will. The characters exchange words before Sector 6 enters their view. Remember how I discussed the fact that Aerith is more mature than people give her credit for? Well, one of the reasons that people dismiss her as being childish is likely because of her cutesy demeanour and soft voice, whilst comparing her to someone who is more adult-like in their behaviour like Tifa. However, this completely undermines the worldview that Aerith has, as she actually has a clear understanding of how Midgar works as well as its complexities. Couple this with the manner in which she changes the tone of her voice, and you can see the true maturity that she possesses. It should be made clear that I am obviously discussing the game in regards to the English dub, though there are circumstances that I will defer to other languages when referencing scenes that have some inaccuracies during the localization process. For the most part, the localization is pretty damn good, though there are some instances in which the context of scenes and lines are negatively affected due to the limitations of matching dialogue with the lip syncing. That being said, some of the other languages don't suffer from this. Lines in French, German and Italian, amongst others, generally line up more with the Japanese writing whilst the English dub makes some mistakes. There are some examples that will be seen later in regards to the remake, but even the original has a myriad of translation errors. I would heartily recommend Tim Rogers' slow translation of FF7 that he made when he was still working for Kotaku for a video series that more accurately breaks down the errors with an attempt to correct them in the original game. Although, I would assume most people watching my video have already seen that series. Back to the English dub however, I wanted to say that Aerith's English voice actress, Brianna White, does a great job at adjusting the tone of her voice when Aerith takes certain matters more seriously. Before Cloud heads down into Wall Market, Aerith grabs him and redirects him towards a side path. According to her, this is a shortcut that will get them to Sector 7 faster. As they enter an abandoned and collapsed expressway, Aerith consistently tries to engage in small talk with Cloud. Though she did this a lot during the previous chapter, it is clear that she is doing this more frequently as this is supposed to be the date that the two of them agreed on. Another point of interest is the shift in tone for the music in Chapter 9, especially when we get to Wall Market. There are, of course, various composers for this game and that helps a ton for the variety of musical genres that we have been bombarded with. Sometimes this can be a negative if it isn't handled in moderation, but the remake does a great job at having many conflicting styles of music manage to fit the various contexts that the game offers, though I have a whole segment for that. We are then met with an obstacle in the form of a giant robotic hand, likely used for construction purposes, that can be used to get Aerith to the top of the rubble in order for her to lower the ladders for Cloud to climb. Why Cloud needs to do this as he can jump several meters at least is beyond me, but whatever. I suppose we have to simply assume that this exists purely for a gameplay purpose and nothing else. Though, as Cloud reaches the top of the ladder, we are granted a quick scene that establishes the purpose of this segment. Cloud isn't very familiar with high fives, due to the limited interaction he had with other people as a child. 
and whilst this is clearly meant to be somewhat amusing to see Cloud being so awkward and out of touch, it says a lot about Aerith's character in that she doesn't press him on his awkwardness. She gives him the space he needs to grow comfortable with her. Another exchange follows this, in which Cloud identifies Aerith as being tough. Keep this in mind, we're not done with it yet. They reach a second robot arm, and Aerith continues to tease Cloud. Not half bad. So do you moonlight as a crane operator or something? Yeah? It always gotta be so tough. Lucky for me, you'll make this easier. Yes, ma'am. I like how we visibly see that Cloud enjoyed her joke on him moonlighting as a crane operator, as this reinforces the point I made regarding the fact that Cloud is quite often depicted as finding amusement in Aerith's humour, something that he doesn't really do with other characters bar a few hyper rare isolated examples. Cloud feels a level of guilt towards not reciprocating the high fives, and thankfully, Aerith keeps trying to break through his shell, which gives Cloud a mini arc of sorts. The pair keep travelling, and find a recently lit campfire. Anybody around? Guess it's just us. Mm. It's still warm. Should we relight it? Have our own campfire? I need to get back. Besides... Looky here, boys! Caught us some burglars! Coming into our homes and stealing our shit? Doing crimes? <laughs> I'd say we're owed compensatory damages! <laughs> Campermen composite... I don't get it! Ah. How stupid can you be? It's crazy simple. <laughs> Compensatory damages is like, uh, it's like compensation for damages. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's what you get when you, no, when somebody else. We uh, haven't done anything wrong. Yeah, we were just passing through. Oh, a likely story. Uh. Okay, what do you want? Nothing but our due recompense, that's all. <laughs> due recompense, due recompense, due, due recompense? Uh, no, shit for brains, due recompense. It's like, uh, uh it's like, uh, 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 damages. Uh, 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 damages, recompense, recompense. I, <laughs> I think we've heard enough. After defeating this trinity of fools, we get some interesting dialogue between Cloud and Aerith regarding Cloud's past as a soldier. I think it is safe to assume that Aerith is inquiring about Zack and what became of him, when she asks if Cloud had friends with him soldier. This, paired with her noticing that Cloud wields the Buster Sword, makes it seem like he and Zack were close, which they were, but Aerith can only assume that. Of course, if she has future memories, then she might already be privy to this knowledge, but that is still a theory. Cloud, having a tarnished memory, cannot divulge any of his real interactions during his time working for Shinra, so claims that he never had any friends there. I do need to specify, though, that Aerith wanting to know about Zack does not mean that her date with Cloud is just for questioning. She does want to spend more time with Cloud, and develop a bond with him, but she is entitled to know what became of her former lover, if at all possible. I need to make this clear to the people that still, to this day, genuinely believe that Aerith is only interested in Cloud because of his similar tendencies to Zack. This is purely fallacious, as not only does Cloud merely mirror some of Zack's mannerisms, as opposed to siphoning his memories, but also because Aerith herself word for word states that she ends up loving Cloud much more than Zack which could only be the case if she can see both Cloud and Zack as separate people and personalities. This would also debunk the narrative that Aerith never knew the real Cloud, as it is actually the opposite. 
She is the only person aside from Tifa that had some kind of inkling of suspicion regarding Cloud's persona. Primarily because Aerith could see his true feelings thanks to her inherent abilities as a Cetra. Back to the plot. The two overcome yet another arm, and before I go on, I am aware of how many people hate this segment gameplay wise due to its repetitive and slow paced nature. But taking a blind singular playthrough into account, the gimmick doesn't exactly overstay its welcome. As for repeat playthroughs with attaining 100% completion however, yields a different response from me. Needless to say, on the three separate occasions in which I have platinumed this game, once on the PS4 around the game's release, once on the PS5 when Integrate dropped a year later, and lastly when I fully completed it on PC for the sake of this critique. This chapter was by far and away the most replayed chapter in the entire game. I'll discuss this more later when I talk about the hard difficulty, but let's just say that I am quite drained by this sequence at this point. As for the good stuff, Cloud climbs the ladder, and this time decides to take the initiative with the high 5. Though, thanks to Aerith opting for a high 10 instead, this leads to a rather awkward exchange which causes Cloud to die from cringe. Aerith playfully points out Cloud's real attempt to interact with her, but Cloud does his best to deflect from his own embarrassment. Unfortunately, this ain't gonna work as all this does is galvanise Aerith's efforts. She won't let that go. That being said, before they vacate the tunnel, they are accosted by some goons who refer to them as lovebirds. I've already made my point. Their midnight rendezvous is coming close to its conclusion, as Cloud finally gives in. Upon exiting the shortcut, they both reach one of the entrances to Sector 7. Despite Cloud's aversion to waiting, Eris suggests that they take a break after all they just went through, and despite Cloud's attempt to fight the tide, he can't exactly say no to her. This scene right here may be the prime example of how to utilise body language to accentuate a character's personality and feelings. As Cloud reaches the top, he sits away from Aerith, embracing his introverted side. Though we are given a distinct shot of Aerith noticing his decision to sit away from her. Unwilling to give up that easily, our extroverted girl shuffles closer to him, not allowing him to shut her out. The only way to get him to open up is to force her way in. Cloud puts up a leg to create a form of a piteous barrier in which to protect himself from copying any feels. Or to conceal a boner, perhaps. Boner! 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 Good start. Nah, I'm kidding. However, unlike with her previous attempt, Aerith doesn't push further, showing a strong awareness of Cloud's social limits, and, more importantly, showing her sheer and utter respect for him. From here, Aerith does something we have yet to see. She shows Cloud her vulnerable side. She opens up to him, rather than waiting for him to do the same for her. She refers to Zack and how Cloud reminds her of him, and as such this brings up old wounds that haven't fully healed. When Cloud feels more comfortable, he lets his guard down around her, as represented by him lowering his leg that he put up as a shield. He asks after her former relationship, and yet, when Aerith says Zack's name, Cloud fails to hear it. We know from the Ultimania Plus that Cloud has a minor amount of jealousy when realising that Aerith held a previous relationship, though it is when he finds this out that he becomes more comfortable around her. Aerith tries to help him with his migraines, and comments on his striking blue eyes. One part of this is a callback to how she viewed the Cerulean eyes bore by soldiers as scary due to what soldiers were associated with and known for. It is only when she met Zack did those worries get allayed, as he wasn't this horrifying image of a soldier that she had crafted for her imagination. That is actually one of the few things that I like from Crisis Core, especially as it is worked upon here, thanks to Aerith no longer being afraid of them, but also as she sees beauty in them, as she sees beauty in Cloud. This is why, narratively, Cloud and Zack are not rivals for Aerith's affection, nor do they contradict one another when they both fall for her. Though it is worth noting that Zack's interest in her factored in more to the short term, as he had other paramours and he acted upon said relationships as he wasn't exactly faithful. This is different from Cloud's clear desire for her hand throughout the course of the compilation and cameo games. Zack was her first love, and Cloud is her true love. This cannot be exemplified more than the line, Gotta look forward, not back. 
The other part of the eyes comment is actually in how both Aerith and Tifa comment on Cloud's eyes with differing perspectives. Tifa felt fearful of them due to how harsh they looked, and how it made Cloud seem like a far cry from the kid she knew growing up, whereas Aerith adores them. Now, this isn't to say that this is some kind of definitive proof of Tifa hating Cloud or vice versa, that simply isn't the case. No, this is an example of the different approaches that both females have when trying to get close to Cloud, and how Aerith is willing to be more direct in getting through Cloud's barriers, whilst Tifa is more prone to letting Cloud's mental state fester, as she thinks of a way to properly get through to him. This is, I'm afraid, one of Tifa's biggest character flaws, and one of the major components to Cloud's psychic downfall in the original story. Now look, you may assume that this is me hating on Tifa and being unfair to her role in the story, and I'm afraid you would be dead wrong. I like Tifa quite a lot. She is flawed, and these flaws are a strength for the character as it gives her room to develop and to pursue an arc throughout the story not to mention allowing for conflicts with the rest of the cast. Characters having weaknesses and negative traits is a boon for your story as they are considerably more interesting and help to endear players to these characters. So don't worry guys, I like Tifa a lot and I shall ooze praise over her eventually. But for now, let's get back to the topic at hand. As for the aforementioned quote that Aerith gives to conclude the scene, I feel that this is not only a good message for those who are deeply entrenched in the shipping fandoms, but also for real life too, as one should not linger on the things that they have no power to change, and instead should use the lessons that they learn from their past failures to better their future. After all the time that they have spent together, Cloud and Aerith prepare to say goodbye to one another. For starters, Cloud and Aerith have the classic, so, moment, which has been utilised in many romantic works to depict the connection between characters. I mean, all of the tropes are here, what is the point in debating them? Cloud appears to be a little bummed out that he might not see her again, and as far as he is aware, he will return to Sector 7, get paid, and then likely skip town. He might never see her again. As such, he asks if she will be okay getting home, to which Aerith coyly replies, And if I said I wasn't? I'll go with you. I thought you needed to get back. Cloud actually uses this as an excuse to spend more time with her, despite Aerith pointing out how contradictory that is to his previous sense of urgency. Remember when I said to keep this line in mind? I wonder if someone blocked it off because of all the monsters that kept showing up. Pretty dangerous place for kids to play. Raised in the slums, remember? You're tough. Hmm, that's supposed to be a compliment? Well, any argument that people could make that he is only doing this to keep her safe, as opposed to his clear romantic interest in her, is counteracted by this line, as Cloud even acknowledges her as tough. Not to mention that he has seen her fight on multiple occasions, and she has lived in the slums almost all of her life. Aerith claims that she has a backup route in case of emergencies, which is not only considered safer, but faster as well. Again, Cloud's body language here is great. He shows annoyance when he discovers that she concealed a more convenient route from him, but that annoyance turns to a sly smile when he realises why she did it. The reason this interaction is great is because the two learn a lot about each other from this, as well as ascertaining that they both want their relationship to continue. Aerith discovers that Cloud wants the relationship to continue because he foraged for an excuse to go back with her despite his urgency to go to Sector 7. Cloud discovers that Aerith wanted it to continue because she intentionally took him down the longer route, knowing that the tribulations would extend their time together. For your information, the shorter route that Aerith mentions is actually just the main path through Wall Market and Aerith played 4D chess by making Wall Market seem unappealing to him, so she could pretend the side route was a viable shortcut. She knew he wouldn't want to enjoy the sights of Wall Market when she described them, so she made sure to make the route they took seem more appealing in comparison. Anyway, as Cloud is about to take the sewer route, the doors to Sector 7 open, reacquainting ourselves with a friend. Cloud, you're alive. I thought we'd lost you. What's going on? 
Hendricks. I'll explain everything later. But now I'm on my way to see Don Corneo. You should head back to Seventh Heaven, meet up with the gang. But... I'll be fine. You've seen how much ass I can kick? I have. Yeah! Yeah! So it turns out that Tifa is pimping herself out in order to extract information from the mob boss who rules over Sector 6, Don Corneo. Whilst Cloud is willing to listen to Tifa, and intends to head back to Sector 7 to wait with the others. Despite this, Aerith insists that Cloud should follow her, as Tifa certainly won't be safe in Corneo's place. One thing I enjoy in the original game that, unfortunately, isn't present here, is when Aerith immediately sets off after Tifa despite Cloud's desperate attempts to get Aerith to go back home. Cloud's overprotective nature is displayed here, and Aerith ignores it. As it happens, this is addressed in a later line in the original, as seen here. The characters head towards Wall Market and ask the first person they see regarding Tifa, which, after the discussion gets heated, results in the stable owner breaking it up. The stable owner, Chocobo Sam, doesn't want to get involved in Cloud's plan to break out Tifa, and as such refuses to assist them further. Instead, Cloud and Aerith decide to take matters into their own hands and enter Wall Market. There are plenty of activities to get up to here, some of which include interacting with the hotel host, going into the booth with a defective machine, which, mind you, exists in the original that holds Tifa's ultimate weapon, the Premium Heart, as well as finding both materia and music discs throughout the town. As for the story, Cloud and Aerith find Corneo's mansion, and Aerith makes a derogatory comment about it to which Cloud once again chuckles. Weird. I was told he hates her according to people on Twitter who've never played the game. Anyway, they enter the mansion and consult with the bouncers. They tell our pair that only women are permitted to see the Don, yet it isn't as simple as Aerith simply walking in. In order to enter, she needs to be vouched for by one of the members of the trio, the major players in the wall market political sphere. The individuals that make up the trio are Chocobo Sam, the stable owner that was encountered earlier, Madam M, the owner of the massage parlour in town, and Andrea Rodea, the lead performer and owner of the Honey Bee Inn. Aerith only needs approval from one of these people, and as such they head off in search of them. As they exit the manor, Cloud continues being protective of her, but as they speak, they are interrupted by Johnny, who apparently tries to compete with them to save Tifa. Honestly, I don't really understand what the point of this scene is, as Johnny cannot enter the manor himself, and even works with Cloud later during one of Chocobo Sam's side quests. So this is really strange. The first person on the docket is Chocobo Sam, who refuses to endorse Aerith as already having done so for Tifa. He offers to put her name in the hat for the next audition, but that obviously won't do. So he plays a bet with them in order to put her through now. If they guess heads or tails correctly, then he will put her through. This is actually a choice that matters, but not for this specific outcome. The choices that Cloud makes regarding Aerith's attempts to get endorsed will determine the side quest chains he receives later, and completing both chains are required for attaining a 100% save file. In fact, most people aren't even aware that there are different quests based on your choices, so I will make it clear what choices grant what quests. If you want to pursue Sam's quests, indulge his desire for the bet by choosing either heads or tails. Of course, as the coin is a trick one, the outcome is the same regardless, but you need to choose either to go for Sam's quests. If you want to favour Madame M's quests, choose No Deal instead. As the coin is two-sided, Sam was never going to put Aerith through, and as such they must look elsewhere. They try to enter the massage parlour, but can't. Instead, they head to the Honey Bee Inn and make an inquiry at the reception. Seeing as Andrea won't be available for a personal appointment for another three years, they, once again, decide to move on. The final option is Madam M, who resides in the now open massage parlour. Upon entering, they ask her about the invitation. In order to tempt her to help, Cloud has to undertake her patronage. You get an option between three courses. The poor man's, the standard, and the luxury courses, varying between 100, 1000, and 3000 gil respectively. 
As with the betting choice for Sam, your choice here affects whether or not you will get Madame M's quests. For the best chance to get her quests, reject the bet with Sam and select the luxury course here. For the opposite, indulge Sam's bet and choose the poor man's course. Regardless of your option, you are treated to a particularly awkward yet saucy scene. For the sake of the video, I will entertain you by playing all three. Make sure that you don't have the sound on speakers around family members please, and make sure the children avert their eyes. <laughs> This exclusive treatment is reserved for our most well-to-do patrons. First, the hand cream. A generous coating for each and every one of your richly deserving fingers. Let's start with the tips. That's it. Relax. I'm only here to help. Did that hurt? No. <laughs> then I'll move on to the base of the fingers. Let's see if we can't improve your circulation and get that blood flowing. <laughs> no, don't fight it. Stress is poison to the body. And finally, some gentle stimulation for the palm. No more than a touch. Just. Oh, what was that? A cry of pleasure? Is this how you like it? How about this? Or maybe this? <laughs> they knew what they were doing with these scenes. Madam M accepts Aerith as her choice thanks to Cloud's... sacrifice. According to her, Aerith won't be accepted if she wears her normal clothes. Aerith clearly likes what she wears, but then petitions Cloud's opinion on the matter, whether she genuinely wants him to offer suggestions on improvements, or if she simply wanted to tease him again. Regardless, the player is granted another choice. In order to build points for Madame M's quests, you'll want to choose It Matter What I Think? which causes Aerith to get a little self-conscious about her clothing choices, but if you want Sam's quests, then you should rebut Madame M's critique and praise Aerith's appearance. Though I do like how the positive option is Cloud simply saying that it looks alright, as this is not only high praise coming from someone like Cloud, but also because a simple answer like this is very meaningful to a woman, and as such, Aerith is flustered enough to tease him on it. Madam M notes that a dress that should be fitting would cost somewhere in the ballpark of a million gil. That's right, a million. I should expect Aerith to saunter on in wearing a fucking Iron Man suit for that kind of money. Either way, Madam M has already gotten Cloud signed up for the Corneo Coliseum tournament in order to get the prize money for Aerith's dress. And thus, we have our next destination. The two head off to the arena, and Cloud displays a great deal of confidence towards his success, and as such, Aerith has to rein him in a bit. This is what I meant when I said that these characters are good for one another earlier. When they get to the Colosseum, Aerith insists on joining Cloud as his combat partner, much to his dismay. Aerith likes to fight her own battles, so this narrative of Aerith being a useless damsel can take a hike. They take the elevator down, and we get a sneak peek at our venue. Hey! Lovebirds! Over here! In the city that never sleeps! Wow, oh, 
This place is really something. The player has to tackle a series of encounters with intermittent breaks in which they could talk to the opponent that they just defeated, and, on top of this, the flower bouquet outside Cloud and Aerith's changing room grows as more people show their support. This is because, as Cloud and Aerith are new, unknown competitors, they aren't shown the same respect as the more tenured participants. This is evidenced by the way the crowd reacts to them before the fights, as well as the dude who signals you to enter the arena. As for now, you have to speak to Johnny to initiate the first bout, but before then, Cloud can drink a strange concoction on the table. Honestly, I have no idea what this drink is supposed to be, or what it is supposed to do. I think it might be some kind of euphemism to Viagra, by the way Johnny describes it, but I genuinely couldn't tell you. Anyways, it is time for a tussle. The first fight is against a Beastmaster and his doggos. That's it. That's the fight. As for the second match, we are once again accosted by the buffoons that we came across and fought in the Collapsed Expressway earlier. Despite some additions to their ranks, Beck's badasses are just as lame as they were previously. It seems that Madam M and Sam have some history together, likely a spurned romance of some kind. We don't get any tea on this here, but I like that they give us not only some inkling that these characters have lives and connections outside of what merely pertains to the main characters, and, by extension, the audience, but it is also appreciated that they don't give us any more than that. You see, sometimes within storytelling, it is kind of refreshing to have some character stories and origins that aren't given to the audience, as we aren't following these characters nor are they vitally important to the story as a whole. I would call this restraint. You see, I don't need to know the spicy details on the relationship that Madam M and Sam had, as their lives are negligent when compared to the main cast, and all that really matters is that they have actual personalities outside of their plot significance, if that makes any sense. Just knowing that they have a connection is enough, no specifics needed. The third and final round commences, and this time our intrepid duo face off against Chocobo Sam's champions, two Shinra mechs by the name of Cutty and Sweepy. It's time to send these buggers to the scrapyard. Taking this rather well. I was looking forward to a little temper tantrum. When you bet it all on a toss, sometimes you get burned by Lady Luck. Every coin has two sides. You're right, of course, even if they are both the same. Later. 
And now, I believe I have a prize to collect. Sorry. The madam will have to wait. The Don's demanding that we tack on one more match, it seems. What? If they win out, then you get paid in full. Now hold on just a goddamn minute. His call, not mine. <laughs> According to Corneo's man, he isn't exactly pleased at a bunch of new competitors screwing with his bets, and as such orders one more match to be played. This one being an all or nothing bout. Madam M angrily heads off to Cloud and Eris room and informs them of their upcoming challenge. Tonight's Corneo Cup has been a spectacle like no other. And we shared your disappointment, ladies and gentlemen, when we told you that it was coming to an end. But nobody felt it more keenly than one time Corneo, who has decided that a bonus match is in order! Participating in this match will be this evening's leading lights, the dynamic duo that has crushed all competition thus far! Cloud and Eric! Man, this dude is my spirit animal. As the lift rises from below, we get our first glance at the horrifying monster that aims to slaughter our... A, a house. It's a... It's a house. Hmm. Okay. Let's begin the main event. The aptly named Hell House might very well be the most bizarre enemy you faced up until this point and it just so happens that it could be the first real test for the player as far as bosses are concerned. The Hell House is quite the difficulty spike, and this is mainly due to its gargantuan health bar, solid damage, and a robust moveset. Not to mention that this is one of the bosses that has some significant buffs on hard difficulty, but we'll get to that later. For starters, the Hell House was actually a basic enemy in the original game that you would fight on the way to Wall Market, and it was a strong enemy there too. However, they saw fit to limit this entity to being a unique creature that serves as a special boss that Don Corneo rules over in the same way Jabba the Hutt has the Rancor. Making the Hell House a unique boss was a really good choice, and one of the things that I really wish games would do when it came to weird enemy types parading their setting. The Hell House starts off as incredibly slow, occasionally belching out chairs as a basic attack. It can alternate between all of the four main elements throughout the fight, being fire, ice, lightning and wind, which is displayed via the effects on the windows. It becomes completely immune to the attacks of whatever element it is currently aligned to, whilst being more susceptible from damage via the opposing element. For instance, if the element is set to fire, attack with ice and vice versa. It will apply an element at the start of a fight and occasionally cycle through them. At the advent of the second phase, the true form underlying the Hell House appears, revealing itself to be a robot with functioning limbs that spring from the chassis of the domicile. It will then encroach upon the selected character rapidly. If you want to play efficiently or want an easier time on hard mode, make sure that Cloud is the controlled character before the second phase. As you might expect, it gains new moves, with the highlight being the Jetstream attack. The Hell House is considerably more mobile now, and will reposition itself from time to time. It will even take advantage of the rafters to launch an assault out of Cloud's range, before slamming back down onto the party. As more damage is inflicted, a quick transition to its third phase occurs in which it brings out the most irritating part of the fight, God House Mode. God House Mode creates a barrier around the Hell House that reduces physical damage by a tremendous margin. 
to the point that the damage numbers are negligible. In order to bypass this nuisance, you'll need to attack the now present arms, as they are its only weakness. This mechanic is what causes frustration for a lot of players, and it is easy to see why, as the game pushes the player to acknowledge and exploit weak points to supersede the boss's advantage. Of course, a skillful player with knowledge of its mechanics can make this fight look like a cakewalk, but the average one playthrough Andy might find this quite troublesome. The boss may use a move called the Godhouse Primer when Godhouse mode expires. This move is basically seen as the boss charging the shield back up, and if you get plenty of damage off inflicted on it during this time, you can get some easy build up on the stagger gauge. Things really begin to ramp up in Phase 4, however, when the Hellhouse reaches the summit of its mobility, re-engaging its barrier and entering flight. It will pummel the player with chairs for a short while, before winding up for a dive bomb. Before it performs Hellbound, it will drop its barrier and take on an element as before, which prompts the player to counter with the opposing element. Time this right, and you can ground it for an easy chance at some damage. Tackle each move as it comes at you, and eventually you'll reassess its property value. We get a satisfying conclusion to the mini arc that this chapter started, as this time Cloud initiates the high five with Aerith, no longer feeling embarrassed about it. Before continuing with the plot, the player can engage in the arena fights down below, and I would recommend doing them, as both Cloud and Aerith can get their level 2 limits here. You'll want to do Aerith's now of course. Returning to Madam M, she prepares to get Aerith changed, but as Cloud has nothing to do in the meantime, she sets him up with some quests. To begin with, the player's choices regarding the amount of side quests that you did during Chapter 8 are brought up here, and have a significant bearing on what dress Madam M gets for Aerith. Completing none of the quests grants one dress, completing half of the quests, as in free, gives a different dress, and completing all of the quests in Chapter 8 awards Aerith's best dress. Though I suppose that's subjective. But seeing as I am a warm-blooded heterosexual male, I am a big fan of the high affection dress. Hell, they made a figure of it. And it is quite the figure indeed. <clears throat> um, anyway. As well as that, the quests that are given here are based on the three choices that I commented on throughout the chapter. The coin toss with Sam, the massage course, and the opinion on Aerith's outfit. The combined choices offer one of two outcomes. Either you get Madame M's quests, or Chocobo Sam's. The key differences being one unique quest for both, and a different boss for the final quest, resulting in a quick talk with the quest giver of choice. The quest that is consistent with both is the squatting minigame with Jules, but I'll deliberate on that during a later segment. The choice here also affects an outcome soon, as will eventually be revealed. When the quests are done, Cloud returns to the massage parlour, and just before he attempts to enter, Take a deep breath. What about Tifa? I heard Corneo was gonna audition new girls soon. And Tifa's... Tifa's gonna be... I just... I, I don't know what to do. Well, I do. I'll come too! Cloud joins Johnny and heads on in to speak to Leslie once again. I understand that Cloud wanted to hand in the approval letter from Madam M, but I am not sure what his plan was beyond that as far as breaking Tifa out was concerned. We know that Johnny was trying to distract Cloud here for the upcoming reveal, but what exactly was Cloud's plan? Leslie and the guards aren't stupid, they're acutely aware of Cloud's plan to spring Tifa, and Leslie strongly dissuades him from doing so, though when he tells Cloud to bring both Aerith and the letter, he goes against the notion, as if he is having some kind of moral conflict regarding the goings on here. I mean, it isn't like we will talk about this later during a different chapter or anything. Cloud leaves the manor, and is about to head back to the massage parlour, but before he does... Hey, get out of the way! Quit talking! Move it, move it! Come on!
Hey ya. That's really Yeah. Corneo's got certain tastes. This dress is so gaudy and impossible to move in. Uh, uh, yeah. Cloud? Uh, excuse me. Huh. Cloud's reaction to Aerith's dress is great. His jaw drops and he stumbles over his words at the sight of her, which is different to his composed self. When he apologises for being so flustered over her, Aerith actually has a little smile, which shows that she clearly likes his attention. She complains about how it feels to move in the dress, though with how she sees Cloud's reaction, it makes it clear that she does actually feel beautiful in the dress all the same. Once again, we get an example of Cloud's desire to protect Aerith from harm and other foul things, when he states that he wouldn't let her go in alone, especially in the fervent manner in which he says it. Though, again, I'm not sure what his original plan was, as he didn't come up with the whole cross-dressing idea. Speaking of which, Aerith claims that Andrea Rodea has taken a shine to Cloud based on his performance in the Colosseum, and wants to meet with him personally. The two jaunt off towards the inn. As they reach the Honeybee Inn, Aerith explains the plan. The Honeybee Inn has a bunch of other interactions and references to the original game's version of this place, but most of the weird shit in the original got left out of the remake. An example of this is the scene where Cloud has to get fully undressed and bathe with a bunch of very obviously gay men in order to get some clothing pieces so that he can infiltrate Corneo's place. As it happens, this part is entirely optional in the original. I think the remake handles this part far better, honestly, not only for the goofy elements, but also because it is woven into the plot rather than being a random quirky thing you can come across. Cloud speaks to the Honey Girls and prepares to go backstage. This part is... yeah, this part is pretty funny. The dress that Cloud wears here is the reward you get for engaging in the side quests that this chapter offers. If you opt to not to do any of them, you'll get the worst one which looks very plain. In order to get the other two, however, you'll need to fully complete both Madam M and Sam's quest chains, which can only be done on two separate playthroughs of the chapter. I'd also like to explain some of the elements of this scene briefly, as people get the wrong impression here. Cloud does the dance only because Aerith encourages him by cheering for him. A lot of people say he did it for Tifa's sake, and not for Aerith, but if that were the case, then why did he try to leave moments prior? He was absolutely against this whole thing until he saw Aerith egging him on, which leads to this defeated sigh from him. Guys can do some silly and obnoxious things to impress girls, and this is no exception. Also, Cloud said that he doesn't dance, yet here he is, dancing for Aerith. The high fives are another example of him not indulging Tifa in one thing, yet warming up and doing the opposite when Aerith is involved. This isn't to say that he doesn't care about Tifa at all, but he was clearly willing to think of a different plan to rescue her that didn't involve embarrassing himself in front of a crowd. I also reject the idea that he did this because he thinks he is Zack and therefore only wants to impress Aerith that way. Bollocks. Zack wouldn't have had any reservations towards doing the dance. He likely would have found it fun. Yet Cloud clearly hates it. So this idea that there is some kind of off and on switch that is conveniently flicked on to make him turn into Zack when he interacts with Aerith but not when he is with Tifa simply will not fly. This bizarre viewpoint in which all of Cloud and Aerith's interactions are meaningless because he is just pretending to be Zack subconsciously when he is with her practically destroys Cloud's entire character and arc. It's why I tell you that people who push this narrative not only don't know jack shit about the plot, but also don't care about the characters. Y you know what, let's just put a pin in this, shall we? Later on in this very video, I will explain the story surrounding Cloud's identity crisis, and put to bed this whole Cloud is Zack narrative once and for all. As for Aerith's plan in general, some might say that she forced Cloud into doing this, and that is inherently scummy. But don't forget that Cloud chose to do this. He was about to walk away, but he saw it through for her sake. And with that, both Cloud and Aerith have their ticket to see Don Corneo, as Andrea gave his stamp of approval to let Cloud in, and the two of them head off to the mansion to rescue Tifa. Leslie, of course, sees right through the disguise, but lets them through regardless. The two venture up to one of the rooms on the second floor and await their orders. 
Cloud actually puts on an attempt at seeming feminine, so at least he's trying not to break character. As they wait, the doors lock behind them, and they are then gassed. Quite dark. Hey, can you hear me? Oh. Tifa? Yes? You okay? Mm-hmm. Good. Wait a minute. <gasps> Cloud? Is that you? Oh my god, that makeup! And that dress! Nailed it, I know, thank you. Moving on. As amusing as this is, I don't believe for a second that Tifa wouldn't recognise Cloud immediately. He isn't trying to mask his voice, and even Leslie saw through it, so she should as well. The joke, of course, is that because Cloud is quite a femboy in terms of appearance, that he would be easily confused as being a woman despite the arms and flat chest. But Tifa shouldn't be fooled by that, as she knows him and what he looks like. Some makeup isn't going to cover that. I want you guys to pay attention to this exchange here. Yeah, bit woozy, but I'll manage. <sighs> hey Tifa, how you doing? Uh, okay. Oh, right. I'm Aerith. A friend of Cloud's. Whilst this may seem like a pretty normal exchange, Aerith immediately heads over to Tifa as if she already knows her. And when Tifa acts puzzled, Aerith remembers to introduce herself. If you recall, I pondered on the idea that Aerith may already know Tifa subconsciously because of her future memories flowing backwards in time via the livestream, and how this gives her knowledge that she shouldn't be privy to. There are a fair few instances of Aerith acting kinda sus when certain matters are broached. There is an example of that in the next chapter that kinda validates the point I am trying to make here, as well as the example in the church from chapter 8. Aerith may try to cover it up, but she knows more than she lets on. Oh, and also, it is interesting that after all of the talk that people have of Cloud being sexually obsessed with Tifa, he doesn't really react to her dress at all. And no, you can't argue that the situation is too dire for that, as Cloud had no problem reacting to Aerith's dress when Tifa's well-being was uncertain. Now that he can see that she is fine, surely he would be allowed to drool over her. All I am saying is that Cloud clearly has a preference, and it has nothing to do with boob size. Though I find it hilarious that there are plenty of folks on Twitter that think that this scene here is an example of Cloud's jaw dropping over her dress. It's a shame that I have to tell you this, but that is what we call manual breathing, not a jaw dropping. <laughs> Though I wouldn't get your info from Twitter, as I am sure that Ground Zero from the Hiroshima bomb was less toxic than the FF7 Twitter or subreddits. The three of them head on up for the audition. In the original, Don Corneo can choose between any of the three characters based entirely on how many pieces of apparel the player gathers for Cloud. From least to most, it goes Tifa, Aerith, Cloud. However, in the remake, Corneo goes for Cloud. This is, just like with the scene in which Cloud denies Tifa being his girlfriend when Aerith asks him, a case of the remake aiming to create a consistent, objective narrative in which certain aspects of the story cannot be disputed. In the original game, the player could either accept or deny Aerith's inference on his relationship with Tifa, and that would impact the affection points that would be gained. However, the remake has settled on one response as being canon and within character and that choice was him saying no. The same applies here, as Don Corneo choosing Cloud was always the intended canonical choice. Arguments can be made that removing choices is an inherently bad thing, but I would disagree, as making a story with stronger, more consistent continuity is better. The thing I would agree on is that choices should matter if they are present, as opposed to some of the arbitrary and redundant choices that this game offers from time to time. The other two ladies are seen as leftovers for the other guys, which has some creepy connotations. Once again, I am not a fan of Corneo being oblivious to Cloud's true gender, as Cloud doesn't attempt to cover his voice. It is pretty amusing to watch, but doesn't make much sense as far as suspension of disbelief is concerned. Hey young fellas, we got guests, and y'all huh? got first crack at entertaining them. Courtesy of the ever-generous Don Corneo himself, never forget the Don provides. Yeah. Corneo! 
So, baby, ready to get to it? Yeah, I guess I'm good to go whenever. How about you, Tifa? Mm. Four guys between us. Okay, let's not keep Cloud waiting. Right. Wait. I know you. The Coliseum. <laughs> Honestly, I could just put a compendium of memes here to worship the greatness that is Cherith. After beating up the guys, Leslie walks into the room and reveals himself to be an ally. He gives the girls back their normal clothing as well as Cloud's stuff too. Weirdly enough, he carries the Buster Sword like it is a paperweight, and so does Tifa shortly after this, and frankly this annoys me. The Buster Sword is estimated to be in the ballpark of about 80 to 100 pounds, and could likely be even heavier if we take the metal alloy that it is composed of into account. So no normal person can just lift this thing one-handed by the hilt, never mind swinging it around at insane speeds. One of the defining things about soldiers, as well as the ones that carry large swords like Cloud, Sephiroth, Zack and Angeal, is that they can wield these swords because of their superhuman strength granted to them by the Mako experiments that they endured. Having any old person carry them around like this kinda damages that. I mean, I'm a little more accepting of Tifa carrying it, because she clearly harnesses her inner chi to increase her strength based off of her martial arts training with Zangan. But Leslie and other normal humans carrying it this easily is strange. This is one of the reasons I hate how they handled Cloud's killing of Sephiroth in Nibelheim in Crisis Core. That game has him wield it easily, and make a ridiculous jump to attack Seth even before the experiments. Sure, in the original he also wielded it too, but it was strongly implied and represented visually that he needed two hands to lift it, and he didn't do any anime jumping bullshit either. This might be a non-issue to most people, but I am a lot more critical of things like that, so whatever. They head towards Corneo's room and confront the crime boss. Wait, Cloud is just getting undressed in front of the girls? The dialogue options only change what Corneo's response is, but the conclusion is always the same. As the Don laughs gleefully, the Triumvirate have to make their way back to Sector 7 at breakneck speed, but now they'll have to clamber their way out of the sewer system to do so. In conclusion, Chapter 9 is quite the entertaining romp from start to finish, and is quite heavy with story and limited gameplay segments resulting in a chapter that is very entertaining on the first playthrough. But trust me, after playing through this chapter more times than I care to mention, I am happy to move on. The chapter opens with President Shinra receiving news from Heidegger, his head of public security, and Reeve Tueste, his head of urban planning. It turns out that Corneo was correct in stating that the President intends to drop the player on the Sector 7 slums to quell the avalanche resistance. Heidegger is very accepting of the plan, whereas the newly established character in Reeve isn't a fan of it. He thinks of the people, and the unnecessary destruction of all that they have built. Despite this, President Shinra aims to see the plan through, much to the director's dismay. We then rejoin our party in the grotty underbelly of the Sector 6 slums. Cloud is the first to awaken, and sees the girls unconscious in front of him. Judging by the hole above them, this was quite a fall, which begs the question as to how Aerith managed to survive this. Fall damage is a thing, as they are just mortal, though I can suspend my disbelief for both Cloud and Tifa due to their composition. We have already seen Cloud survive the church fall, so his ability to survive long falls is consistent, and once again, he is a super soldier. Tifa, on the other hand, can harness her inner chi to increase her physical aptitude canonically, so I can believe she would survive it too. As for Aerith, she's consistently displayed to be rather brittle on a physical level, and is one of the few characters that falls in line with normal human durability. Of course, she makes up for it with her incredible knack for magic, but that's by the by. I would like to bring up the fact that Cloud looks at Aerith first, and whilst this could just be a coincidence, this appears to be a little more considering that the game positions Cloud in such a way that he's facing Aerith when gameplay resumes. As you can see here, I am not moving Cloud here, he is coded to face her. What I presume this is, is a subtle way of directing the player towards what the devs consider the canonical option. 
which is backed up by the fact that were you to complete both of the ladies' quest lines, but then work one of them up here, then you would get their resolution scene later. The credits sequence displays moments throughout the story and Aerith's scene is displayed, clearly representing that scene as being the preferred outcome. This would reaffirm my statement that the devs consider Cloud as being someone who goes to Aerith first, although it still leaves room for player choice. For clarity, this was done on the first playthrough, which favoured both girls up to this point, though when I went for a more Tifa favoured route on the second playthrough, the outcome was the same. Cloud always looks in Aerith's direction. I am not trying to say that this is hard evidence either way, just that it is an interesting tidbit that you can read into any way you see fit. Personally, I think it makes sense for Cloud to wake Aerith first, not only for relationship reasons, but also because Aerith is the less physically apt of the two, and as such he would be concerned about her health from the fall. Depending on which girl you wake up first, you'll get a boost of affection to the preferred choice, and a corresponding scene with it. If you have watched this entire critique up until now, you'll probably be surprised to hear that I actually prefer Tifa's scene here as it actually contains some interesting character stuff, whereas Aerith's is kinda empty. Let me play both clips for you now. Aerith. Uh, Cloud. Uh. We have to get to Sector 7. Yeah. Tifa? Oh, uh, Cloud. We have to get back to the slums right now. Yeah. I didn't want to drag Aerith into all this. She'll understand. How do you two know each other? I saved her. She saved me. Round and round it goes. And that's all there is to it. Sure there isn't something else going on? <sighs> Damn it. As you can see, Aerith's scene exists mainly to push the plot along, but doesn't provide much more than that. Tifa's scene, on the other hand, gives us a little more. For starters, Tifa asks how Cloud and Aerith met, and Cloud claims that she saved him, and in return he saved her. Tifa then tries to see if he has any more feelings for her beyond mere friendship, to which Cloud goes cold. From Tifa's perspective, I see both a protective side, as well as that of jealousy. Of course, she cares about him to the point where she doesn't want someone to take advantage of him, which is interesting as she kinda does that herself later, and she obviously dislikes the fact that, throughout the course of the original story, compilation and all, Cloud pays more attention to Aerith than her. And as such, both Tifa and Aerith develop a friendly rivalry for Cloud's affection. What is more interesting, however, is that Cloud doesn't answer her implication. And before people claim that he chose to be silent as Aerith was waking up, I assure you, Cloud would have given a curt, it's nothing like that, to Tifa if he possessed no feelings for Aerith. It is also worth noting that he probably isn't entirely sure himself, and as such chose to remain silent. I think this scene is better simply due to the character elements in place here, though I also find it amusing that people who are vehemently pro-Tifa, especially the ones who have an irrational hatred for Aerith, would have chosen Tifa here, and as such would see Cloud not denying any feelings for Aerith, whereas before he was quick to shun the notion that he held any kind of romantic attraction to Tifa when Aerith asked him in Chapter 8. Again, I am not sullying anyone's personal choice here, I'm just laying down the scenes as they appear in a consistent fashion. Take that as you will. After this scene, a loud roar echoes into the chamber. A gargantuan, slobbering beast leaps into view and prepares to attack the trio. This is our first taste of three-person combat since the Airbuster fight, which is refreshing, and allows for us to be reacquainted with Tifa's moves. Abzu, or formerly known as Abs in the original game, which is a far worse name by the way, 
is a pretty sturdy boss for the halfway mark in the story, and he has some very punishing moves that will test certain skills from the player. Fire has a significant effect on the boss, as setting him on fire can make him vulnerable to damage for several seconds on top of building his stagger gauge. A lot of his moves are unblockable, such as Backwash Spout and Pounce. Pounce in particular is an absolute bugger of a move, as it is devilishly hard to avoid. It is possible, though you'll likely need to use a character that can cover more ground quickly in order to do so. Dodgers don't have iframes in this game, unlike how dodging is handled in the Souls games. Here, the efficacy of a dodge is based on how fast it takes the dodge to complete, paired with the distance the dodge covers. For instance, dodging Abzu's pounce with Aerith is practically impossible, due to the fact that her dodge barely covers any ground, despite how quick it is. Whereas Tifa's parry can avoid it easily enough, as it is absurdly fast and covers a lot of distance. This is basically a matchup game, sort of similar to how fighting games handle character matchups. As long as you understand what characters are strong in specific circumstances, then you should have no trouble with most encounters. As he reaches his second phase, he becomes enraged and gains new moves. Not only can he charge three times in succession now, but he also jumps to the pipes and uses Blackwater Blast which cuts off a portion of the arena with a devastating gush of dirty sewer water, which does an absurd amount of damage. This can easily one-shot your entire party if you aren't aware of what the move does, or if you don't position yourself well enough. It is easy enough to avoid once you know it is coming, but I distinctly remember getting caught out and having to redo the fight on my very first playthrough, so be careful. Utilise the skills you have learned to take down this muscle-clad creature. Even though Abzu survives this encounter, he slinks off with his tail between his legs. This gives the group some valuable time to plan their next course of action. There it goes. Do you think it lives down here, or...? It was probably Corneo's pet. And we were dinner. <laughs> hey, you don't believe that crazy story of his, do you? Shinra wouldn't sacrifice a whole sector just to take out Avalanche, would they? Destroying part of the city, killing all those people just to get at us? I don't know. Is Corneo the kind of guy who'd make up shit just to screw with you? I wouldn't put it past him. But if he was telling the truth, hmm? and there's still a chance he was, isn't there, then we should go. And if it turns out he was lying, then so what? Right? Mm. Hmm? Uh, Tifa. The rest of this chapter simply boils down to traversing the sewers, with the goal to reach an exit somewhere in the Sector 7 slums. You'll remember that I talked about the game's pacing earlier, and how some chapters are seen as filler to pad the runtime. Well, this chapter is one of the examples that is used to represent that. Of course, most would use the term filler as a derogatory one, but aside from filler not necessarily being a bad thing, and in some cases, warranted, this chapter is not really what I consider filler. Not only is the plot being progressed here, albeit slowly, but there are also moments here that help to foster the relationships between characters that cannot be done during more plot intensive parts, as the characters are doing what we see as mundane tasks actually give the characters time to get to know one another, and this chapter has just that. Besides, I stated earlier that Chapter 8 was a really good chapter to let the player relax after a myriad of chapters with a heavy focus on combat, and Chapter 10 is the opposite in this regard. Both Chapters 8 and 9 were long ones, and had a lot of downtime mostly focusing on dialogue, both plot and character-wise. As such, it is nice to be able to have a chapter in which the player can shut their brain off to a degree and let loose. This chapter doesn't overstate welcome too, so I find the complaints of filler a little bizarre. The sewer sequence is literally two rooms in the original, with no character additions in sight, just random encounters, nothing more. I would like to believe that we can all agree on the remake being better in every department as far as this segment of the game is concerned, yeah? Let's move on. We get some dialogue between Cloud and Tifa on what Shinra's ulterior motive regarding the player destruction is. It's really dark. I'm sure we'll be fine. Come on. Hey, Cloud. Assuming Corneo was telling us the truth, what do you think Shinra's really up to? I mean, they've gotta have an endgame. But I 
can't imagine what it is. Destroying a whole chunk of the city just to get back at us doesn't make any kind of sense. Yeah, I can't imagine any way they could profit from it. It's gonna cost them a fortune to rebuild. Corneo's lying. He's gotta be. Guys like him do it all the time out of habit. There is a little lore tidbit that I like here, so let me indulge you. In order to enable the power, they need to find a breaker. When they do, they comment on its workings due to it being, in their eyes, ancient. This is because the generator is electrical, and would likely have been powered by fossil fuels. When Shinra discovered Mako, and began to use that as their main power source, basic electrical supply units would have fallen out of fashion. None of these characters grew up in a time period where other forms of power outside of Mako were used, so to them, this is a dinosaur. Most people will have glossed over this, but I just think it is a great detail as far as world building is concerned. We learned that there were many coal mining towns whose land were bought up by Shinra so that Mako reactors could replace their dependency on coal, so this is almost a sneak preview to Corel and Barrett's backstory. Later on, the group tries to cross to the other side of the subsection via these inflatable rafts, and Tifa shows concern over the current situation. Damn it. I can't stop thinking about what Corneo said. I know. Me too. It's gotta be a trick. There's no way they'd go that far. But... But what if Corneo really was telling the truth? We have to get there in time to stop it. We have to. Right. Mm. <sighs> Eric, what are you not telling me? Huh? Before Cloud interrupted, Tifa was going to question Aerie for what seems to be a case of her withholding information. This could very well be evidence of Aerith being aware of the fates that bears down upon the Sector 7 slums, and she shows doubts as to their ability to stop it. Though she still feigns ignorance, she likely believes that she cannot disclose any of this information for fear of things going more awry than they should. After somehow struggling to cross a series of steady platforms, likely brought on by Aerith's inability to stop eating burgers, I guess. Aerith teases Cloud as her and Tifa's friendship continues to develop. Aerith makes the first meta comment about the theme of fate here, and appropriately follows the conversation I just touched upon. The two show signs of a great friendship, and sneak in a jab at Cloud's submissiveness. This cute scene is rounded off with the two fat souls crushing the ground beneath them, Seriously, how decrepit is this place that two sub 120 pound women can cause the ground to crack? Anyway, Cloud almost falls, the girls save him, moving on. I don't know what the danger is as he can literally super jump back up. I mean, the water full of feces I imagine? After this they reach what looks to be an exit, and need to drain the water to reach it. Both Tifa and Aerith work together to work the pump which would have been easier had they let Cloud do it, but whatever. As they're about to reach the surface, they are attacked by a gaggle of Sahagin, which prompts the characters to fight. Looks like they're hungry for more. We're not delicious, not even a little bit. You keep telling yourself that, you absolute snack, you. We then get a cutscene that exists for this sick trailer shot and our heroes eventually flee, climbing the ladder to safety. A helicopter bearing both Reno and Rude passes over the trio, with Reno showing discomfort to their mission. Understood. The Avalanche mission has been approved. We ought to proceed as planned. This is bullshit. What the hell are they thinking? Threats to public order are to be summarily put down. This is what we've always done. Summarily put down. <laughs> Guess it's a little late to grow a conscience. It is nice to give us a reminder that despite their loyalty to Shinra, they are still capable of displaying scepticism towards their employer's motives. Another thing I like is that Cloud tells Tifa that it is just a patrol. This isn't even a lie to ease her mind, 
Cloud genuinely believes it to just be a patrol, as he would have no reason to assume that this chopper is involved in the attack. Hell, they aren't actually sure if the plate is in danger just yet, as they are entirely dependent on Corneo's account of the situation, who could be lying or operating on faulty information. It's nice to have characters functioning only on things that they know, as opposed to having them be aware of elements that exist in the meta. Both Aerith and Tifa are shown to be very uneasy regarding the atmosphere, and Tifa states that there is a rumour that the train graveyard is indeed haunted. Aerith seems to buy into this, as both Tifa and her are scared after this info is presented. Cloud, on the other hand, remains stoic. As the player makes their way through the area, there are weird supernatural things occurring in which the walls become coated with neon graffiti, indicating that the rumours of ghosts inhabiting the area may be true. As with the previous chapter, this one is filled with a lot of unremarkable enemy encounters, with snippets of plot littered throughout. As such, we'll get through these swiftly. The trio make their way to a warehouse, which eventually opens mysteriously. Well, what do you think? game huh uh, but it'll be fine we've got a bodyguard don't forget mine <sighs> right ghosts aren't my thing <sighs> you're just being modest after you mind letting me go then <laughs> <clears throat> Oh boy, here we go. Aerith kicks off the love triangle between her, Tifa and Cloud, as she grabs Cloud's arm, prompting some jealousy from Tifa. As I said a few chapters ago, Aerith is very socially intelligent, and as such knows that teasing Cloud and claiming ownership over him will draw some jealous thoughts from Tifa. This is done in a light-hearted fashion of course, as Aerith clearly likes the competition. This is another scene that plays into both girls' personalities, as well as making Cloud uncomfortable. Though I think I could speak for most of us guys when I say that I wouldn't mind being the filling for this particular sandwich. We come across more ghosts, though Aerith has dropped the pretense of being afraid of them, and now seems more interested in communicating with them instead. This almost certainly falls in line with her ability to sense feelings in living entities, as these ghosts are vessels for missing children, and Aerith has an affinity for disenfranchised kids. The ghosts end up attacking them, yet Aerith still tries to get through to them. When Cloud is about to harm one, Aerith stays his hand. Don't! That thing's dangerous. I know, but even so... What the? Man, it certainly took you guys long enough to react to that. Yeah. Thanks, Cloud. You saved us. <sighs> Gonna need to find another way through. From here, they need to get across to the other end of the warehouse to get back to the slums but to do so, they need to deal with the annoyances that the ghosts throw their way. Despite this, Aerith still sticks to her cheery ways by attempting to play hide and seek with them. Reaching the control room, we find out that we aren't alone. Due to Tifa being afraid of the ghosts, Aerith goes to protect her. Gee, it's almost as if Aerith is just as brave and valiant as any of the other characters in FF7. Who would a thunk? Our phantasmal being turns out to be a ghoul. Not only a strong entity, but also a strong boss, and a frankly annoying one at that. 
The ghoul has a habit of switching between physical and non-corporeal forms often, and this makes it quite a pain to fight. You see, when in its physical form, magic has no effect, yet the opposite is true when in its non-corporeal form, in which physical damage is no use. Juggling between characters will be necessary depending on what characters have what materia at any given time. If you're on hard difficulty, you might run into the problem of not having enough MP during this fight, in order to use offensive spells whilst playing as either Cloud or Tifa. As such, you'll need to rely on Aerith's basic attacks instead. Something that should be noted is that the ghostly apparitions you fight here and other undead creatures can be affected negatively by restorative spells. For instance, using Kuraga on the boss is just as effective as pelting it with fire, and this is a staple of not only FF7, but the Final Fantasy franchise as a whole. What makes this fight quite troublesome is some of the moves that is at its disposal. Phantasmic Flurry causes the boss to reach out and grab the player occasionally, and honestly I have yet to find a consistent method on dodging this. That is how infuriating this move can be. Another move that twists my nipples is Pearson's Scream, a large AoE that causes the player character to become stunned when caught in it. Blocking doesn't seem to stop it, and most characters can't escape it in time, but Tifa's parry makes it possible. Moves like this, Balefire, and the constant rearranging of the scenery, turns this into one of those annoying zoners you see in various fighting games. I can see what they were going for, but the devil's in the execution I'm afraid, and this one leaves a lot to be desired. But if one thing can be praised here, it is that music. And it gets even better once that second phase kicks in. After reactivating the power, we can now leave the warehouse, but as they're about to vacate the premises, Tifa sees Marlene. We'll get some further context to this shortly, but for now, we exit and continue to the slums, fighting monsters as we go. The trio get to a rundown train, and the ghosts from before help to push the train forward. Now that is convenient enough, but this next part... This next part annoys me. I have a few issues here, for starters. Why are the trains operational here when this is a train graveyard for decommissioned trains that will all likely be melted down for scrap? That is convenient enough, as that is what allows them to hear this broadcast, but it gets worse still. The train thereon automatically patches through to the exact broadcast frequency that the Turks are using when discussing confidential information. Not only is it bizarre that the train can access this, not only is it odd that the train automatically connects to it like a fucking Wi-Fi signal, not only is the timing just right so that our characters hear it at exactly the right time they need to, but also it brings up the question regarding encryption. Surely the Turks would be on an encrypted line, so that random radio listeners can't just tune into it sporadically, in which this scene literally cannot happen, as even if the train could connect to Shinra frequencies, those wouldn't include that of the high-ranking Secretive Turks division anyway. If the line wasn't encrypted for whatever reason, which would have to be the case in order for this scene to make sense, then it makes the Turks look like absolute amateurish fools. Though, as contrived as this all is, the trio were already heading to the slums anyway, so all this does is confirm the thing that they were dreading. Not to mention that hearing this information has no bearing on the outcome of the situation, and doesn't give them an advantage that they wouldn't already possess, so in retrospect, it isn't so bad. However, all this does is make me question why this scene is here at all, as it adds nothing to the characters or story, and serves only as a needless contrivance that detracts from the overall quality of the product. That being said, the criticisms don't stop, as the skybox here looks like a crusty wank stain, and that is the nicest way to describe it. 
generally the skyboxes are either just fine, or even gorgeous in some circumstances, but here it is just awful. Also, minor quibble, how are the trains moving forwards without being on rails? As far as I'm aware, that's not how that works. Well, problems aside, we'll move on. As they near their destination, they are once again berated by the same phantoms that have plagued them thus far, and Aerith gets snatched away. The worrisome tone in Cloud's voice really gets across how he feels for her despite the limited time that the two have shared, and a moment of danger can allow both of them to make their true feelings known. Aerith is left with the ghosts, and this is where I will bring back up the point I wanted to make earlier. You see, the entity that prowls this area, and the one responsible for capturing the children, is tormenting our heroes by preying on their fears, and bringing them to the surface. This is what I alluded to back in Chapter 8. We have already seen what Tifa fears, and that is the impending doom that awaits her friends and the community that she is a part of. This is no better shown than with Marlene, an innocent child that doesn't deserve to die. We don't actually see what Cloud's fears are, though that is likely because of how well he covers it up, and as such he has nothing for the creature to feast on. Of course, he will end up having significant fears for his friends and for Aerith specifically, not only later on in this game, but also in the original, but we aren't at that part yet. As for Aerith though, we get a scene to show her weakness. Aerith is similar to Cloud, in that she hides her weaknesses behind a facade, though instead of a brooding, stoic mask that Cloud wears, she opts for a bright, cheerful and extroverted outlook instead, for if she is focusing on the world outside of her, then she could forget the demons that live inside. Her fear of abandonment stems from the tragedy that befell her as a child, both for the loss of her mother, as well as the lack of friends in the Shinra building. This, coupled with the scene in question, and the manner in which the other kids alienated her due to her weird powers, show us just why Aerith got so attached to Cloud, and why finding someone that she can lean on, someone who cares for her, can help to deal with her trauma. This is what I mean when I say that Cloud and Aerith's romance is fundamental to the story, as well as to understanding these characters. It is not meaningless. Not only does this scene give us a rare instance of Aerith being vulnerable, but my previous assessment is supported when the person to rescue her from this predicament is, you guessed it, Cloud. He shields her from harm, and Aerith finds comfort knowing that she does have friends to support her, no matter how much she doubts that. And with that, we prepare to face the malevolent monstrosity that infests the train graveyard, Eligor. Eligor is yet another instance of a basic enemy taken from the original game and made into a unique boss, though he still retains the option of stealing a weapon from him using the steel materia. I don't really use the bladed staff, but the weapon ability can be useful in some niche instances. Eligor has a habit of rushing around the arena which can make him difficult to land hits on, especially with certain spells, though fighting him up close has its nuisances too as the wonky lock-on can cause you to unintentionally strike the wheels as opposed to the body, which causes the attacks to bounce off. Phase 2 introduces a shipping container into the arena at the same time that the boss likes to use projectiles, so this is a welcome addition. He also applies Reflect, which will cause your spells to… well, reflect. The ghoul boss gives you the subversion materia as a reward, which allows you to character assassinate previously established characters and kill them off in a manner that makes absolutely no sense, oh wait, wrong footage. The subversion materia allows you to bypass enemy status effects, which is useful here. Hard mode makes this fight even more rough, but we'll deal with that later. Phase 3 gives the boss the ability to run around the arena with the sole purpose of driving you insane, though you do get the opportunity to dispose of the wheels without bouncing off of them, so there's that. All in all, this is a solid fight, but not one to write home about. Tifa then somersault kicks him so hard that he literally vanishes from existence. Defeating Eligor frees the kids from their servitude, and we get a beautifully melancholic piece to listen to as they finally reach the outskirts of the Sector 7 slums. A fence stands between them and the battle ahead, and it isn't going to get any easier.
The conflict is well underway as the trio arrive, and we see Barrett, Jesse, Biggs and Wedge fighting their way up the pillar alongside their brethren from both Avalanche and the Neighbourhood Watch. Whilst the tone is solid, I can't help but feel that the abject lack of blood takes away from the visceral elements that should be present. I'm not asking for much, it's not like I am expecting something like Kratos ripping off Helios' head in God of War 3. Just a slight blood effect to truly indicate that they are indeed being hit by bullets. Thankfully, they somewhat rectify this in the DLC, and they're certainly going to have to do the same in the future if that infamous scene makes a comeback. Aerith senses a disturbance in the Force, and the Whispers show themselves again. After a brief skirmish, the Whispers stop their assault and leave. Due to the fact that Tifa struggles to land a hit on one of them, it is clear that they don't leave because they're too weak and instead because they have successfully delayed the characters. Aerith's reaction displays doubt, yet they continue to the pillar. Once there, they somehow hear Barrett, despite the several hundred foot difference between them, and Wedge narrowly survives a nasty fall. Funnily enough, his fall is even more ludicrous in the original, and yet here they at least show the grapple hook break his fall. Cloud heads on up, alone, to assist the others. After a few minutes of fighting Shinra grunts, Cloud makes his way to the same level as Biggs, and witnesses him surrounded by whispers. Cloud rushes to his side to find Biggs in a precarious state. You made it. No, I might not. Hey, is Wedge? Don't worry, he'll bounce back. That's good to hear. Could have used some extra padding myself. <coughs> Don't talk. It's pretty bad up there. Cloud, promise me. Don't let it be for nothing. The player gets a dialogue choice like in the original, and just like in the original, this is a purely subjective choice that offers nothing to the plot. Though this does showcase Cloud's camaraderie with Biggs, and that is worth something. Despite the brave words, Biggs dies, and Cloud, in a clear display of remorse, uses this as a catalyst to fuel his fight against Shinra. As he continues scaling the tower, Cloud is halted in his tracks as a helicopter appears before him. Reno's dialogue makes it clear that they're attempting to pin the blame for the pillar destruction on Avalanche, which fits in with what President Shinra said about the propaganda surrounding both Avalanche and Wutai back in Chapter 7. Reno notices Cloud, and uses the opportunity to get revenge for the beating he suffered the day before, leaving Cloud trapped between a rock and a hard place. Tifa is sick of standing still, and decides to join Cloud on helping the defence of the pillar. When she asks Aerith to help with the evacuation, as well as finding Marlene, Aerith already shows awareness of Marlene's name before she is told it. This obviously follows on from the previously established information that we know about. Yes, Tifa mentions Marlene's name in the last chapter, but that wasn't attached to a face, and that scene in question made it clear that both Cloud and Aerith couldn't see Marlene, only a shade of a little girl. Aerith also knows that Barrett is Marlene's father without confirmation later, and while this would be classified as a writing error in most of us stories, this game has gone on record to show us consistently that Aerith has a limited knowledge on not only future events, but also of characters that she is yet to be acquainted with. As such, I find no issues here. Both Aerith and Wedge help with the evacuation, and, after Wedge fails to parlay with the guards, Aerith gives him a pep talk. Aerith stating that she doesn't want to rethink her choices is quite foreboding given what we know of her fate, but she is aware of that too, and despite this, despite knowing what the outcomes may be, she goes through with them anyway. I'll have more to say on this during her character section, so we'll leave it for now. Also, it is quite good to show that the guards are having moral conflicts regarding this situation, as they have been led to believe that the terrorists will be dealt with, and as such they only have to keep the peace. But the recruit breaks orders to let them through, reminding us of the fact that these guys are still just normal people and don't necessarily hold ideals similar to that of their corporate overlords. The senior guard is a little more resistant, but even he has a change of heart when we next see him. Aerith heads to 7th Heaven, alone, and wants the neighbourhood watch of the judgement coming their way. You all have to get out of Sector 7! Now! Please! Hmm? 
Slow down. Do you know what's going on? What do they want with a pillar? Well, there's still time, but... They're going to drop a plate on us? <sighs> yes. Those sons of bitches! What good do they think that'll do? Feel free to cry about it later. Right now, we need to get everyone to safety. Wait, the watch should clear the roads first. Ah, good thinking. Up to it. Avalanche, I take it? <sighs> Just a friend. Tell Tifa to lay low. We'll take care of things here. As Aerith closes in on the bar, the area becomes considerably more dangerous. We get a scene in which Aerith looks after Betty, the girl that gives you the cat side quest in Chapter 3. And I can't help but feel that, despite how nice this scene appears, Aerith is really taking her sweet time with helping Betty when Marlene's life is on the line. Run, woman! She really shouldn't be delaying this hard. Aerith veers dangerously close to yet another explosion, yet comes out unscathed. A tad convenient, but nothing compared to Sung just happening to notice Aerith as she is unconscious, causing him to change his plans. Aerith finally reaches the bar, and finds Marlene cowering under one of the desks. Who... who are you? I'm... a friend of Tifa's. <laughs> um, where is she? Right now, she's with Cloud and the others. Daddy too? You mean Barrett? Yep, he's there too. Wait, Daddy's not coming home? Not yet. That's why I came to find you. Tifa asked me to. She said, take care of Marlene. Uh. The thing is, this place isn't safe now. I'm going to take you somewhere safer, okay? Are they going to destroy the bar? Are they going to destroy our house? <laughs> I know it's hard. Just remember, you still have your daddy. You can build a new home together, anywhere. Shall we go? You smell nice. Oh? Like... like a flower. <sighs> I hope you remember it. I guess we should talk about what this scene here is supposed to convey, and honestly I don't think we'll know this for certain until the rest of the trilogy releases, but I'll give it a shot. I believe that this is Aerith either intentionally or unknowingly passing memories onto Marlene, and this can be backed up by a similar scene done with another character later in the game. We know that Aerith is privy to more information than she lets on, and the visual is the exact same as the Tism visions that Cloud has been suffering throughout the game which also have an intrinsic link to memories that Cloud either has or will have in the future. 
We see a vision of rubble falling onto Cloud in Chapter 3, so that proves the part regarding future memories. Marlene's reaction is that of confusion, but also concern, which begs the question as to what memories she extracted from Aerith. The fact that Aerith shushes her would also likely support the idea that Aerith passed them on knowingly. As for why Marlene is the recipient of this information, well, that must be because Marlene is clearly more special than we know. And there are a few hints to Marlene being able to communicate with the planet in a similar way to Aerith, which has led to many people theorising that Marlene is also an ancient, and that Aerith isn't the last. The ending of the original game, and spoilers, the ending to this game as well leads credence to this theory being true. Of course, this is speculation on my part, and will remain that way until a canonical confirmation is given. Marlene shows Aerith the flower that she gave Cloud, which I would argue pleases her, as this is confirmation that Cloud was lying earlier when talking about who he gave the flower to, as opposed to him merely forgetting, as there is no way that he would forget giving it to Tifa, so this would mean that he lied to show his availability. Though, in reality, Aerith associates the flower with Marlene due to her bringing it up. Before they leave, they are rudely interrupted by Sung, and we get a melancholic and dour version of Aerith's theme to go along with the scene. Aerith knows full well of the risks of turning herself into Shinra, but does so on the condition of Marlene's safety, which she trusts Sung to abide by. Returning to Cloud, we see that he's still being pinned down. Tifa rushes towards his position, which prompts Reno to shoot, but Rude turns the chopper, preventing him from hitting her. What could seem like a straightforward lack of synergy between the two, actually reveals itself to be a reference to the crush that Rude admits to having on Tifa during a scene in the original game, and a scene that may be in Rebirth. Tifa gets off lucky, as Cloud saves her. With Tifa in tow, they keep heading up, with Cloud immediately inquiring after Aerith's whereabouts. The combat is as you would expect going forward, though you'll have to avoid Reno's hail of gunfire as well. We then see Jesse taking on the Shinra forces. The whispers in this scene, as well as the knowledge of the original game, both indicate what is about to happen. And, as the music quietens, Cloud and Tifa come across Jesse, trapped and severely injured. Jesse! Just try to hang on. <laughs> so dramatic. I... I just wish that I could have had you over again. Everyone with Mom's cooking. I really wanted to believe. We could. Yeah. You owe me a pizza. <laughs> That's right. I do. But I don't think. Oh no. Tifa's crying. Did I say something wrong? <laughs>
The use of the music here and Tifa's reaction really helped to sell the scene. Though, if people got incredibly emotional at this, then I can only imagine what their reaction to the Forgotten City scene will be, depending on what happens. I also know that plenty of people meme on the you owe me a pizza line, either due to the line specifically or the delivery, but personally I thought it was fine. It is Cloud's way of adding levity by telling Jesse that she cannot die because she still owes him, whilst saying it in a very flippant manner. All in all, this is a nice scene despite ending with Jesse's demise. Cloud comforts Tifa, as she has lost two friends tonight. Don't forget that she would have seen Biggs' corpse as she climbed the tower, so she is aware of that too. Even so, Cloud knows that they have to keep moving forward, and so they do. Finally, they reach the summit and witness Barrett standing his ground. The three of them group up and prepare for battle. Reno enters the fray and immediately attempts to activate the plate separation sequence. A big problem here is that both Cloud and Barrett respectfully refuse to do anything about this and stand there while Reno messes with the console. Cloud eventually goes after him and we get our rematch. The Reno fight is, as you might expect, a tad different from what the initial fight in the church offered, and his moves are pretty straightforward to deal with. With two extra party members at your beck and call, you absolutely have the upper hand and can handle his first phase with ease. Phase 2 actually gives the player a bit of a breather as the bombing run is a joke to avoid, though Rude will provide occasional air support to Reno throughout this phase. Reno begins to use more ranged attacks now, including the infamous Pyramid attack, which traps the player character in a damaging barrier that requires you to swap characters to deal with. It had the same premise in the original, and I have to say it is a pretty cool move. Dealing sufficient damage to the chopper causes it to fall. Reno suspects that his comrade has fallen. Unfortunately for us, Phase 3 is just about to begin. Reno and Rude function similarly to how they were before, but their deeper movesets, synergized attacks, and the simple fact that they have evened the playing field make this an enjoyable spectacle. This isn't exactly a difficult fight, but with the high stakes and the player's expected desire to shut Reno up, it can be a pretty enjoyable bout. Barrett's awful aim aside, it is again frustrating that Cloud doesn't attempt to stop him, though an argument could be made that the Whispers would prevent this. For some reason, Aerith is about to explain where she is, but suddenly stops for no reason when Sung shoes her away. If they wanted to have the guards prevent her from giving away her location, then they could have simply had it so that they cover her mouth, or knock her out. Either way, she just refrains from finishing her sentence for no reason at all. After pondering on what Aerith being an ancient means, Cloud desperately calls out to her before the call is cut off. With no way out, and disaster looming, Tifa falls and looks towards the slums, dejected. Cloud pulls her to safety, and the three of them take an improvised escape route to safety. As carnage ensues, we see Wedge in the epicentre of the collapsing player, as well as getting an early cameo from Ket Shea, which makes sense given his affiliation. We are then left with which can only be described as absolute devastation, as Sector 7 burns. Sector 7 has been destroyed. Well over 50,000 people are dead. Avalanche has been routed, and Aerith has been captured. Tifa awakes to the sight of Cloud watching over her, before getting up. They make their way to the sound of Barrett, who is an emotional wreck due to the losses that they have suffered. Another change from the original is present here, and unfortunately it is for the worse. Barrett's pleas for Marlene are due to him believing that she was left behind, but he was there when Aerith said that she saved her. Unless Barrett is suffering from extreme amnesia, he should know this. The reason I say that the original handled this better is because Aerith never specified Marlene's name when she told Tifa about saving her in the original. Aerith states that she is safe, not Marlene is safe. After the plate falls, Barrett, understandably, shows incredible remorse as he believes Marlene was crushed, but Tifa reassures him that the she that Aerith was referring to was indeed Marlene. The original does a better job at showing Barrett's lack of info and why he reacts the way he does, whereas the remake simply screws up here. Barrett tells Tifa to hold on to the anger she feels towards Shinra. The shot of Cloud following this line makes it seem like a mirror to what Sephiroth told him in Chapter 2. 
Cloud heads off, with Barrett and Tifa in tow. Barrett asks Cloud as to where he is headed, and Cloud responds. Aerith's house. It's in the Sector 5 slums. And that's where Marlene is? Where we hope she is. Tell me she is. Give me something to hang on to. Even if she's not, I won't blame you for it, I swear. Who am I kidding? I'd probably try to tear your head off. Hey Tifa, know anything about ancients? I know I've heard of them at least. They come up in planetology books. Meant to be the original stewards of the planet. Could even commune with it, talk to it and stuff. That must be why the Turks wanted her so badly. Within my veins flows the blood of ancients. This planet is my birthright. It's nothing. Let's go. Having the game show as Tifa's perspective here is great, as we get to see Cloud in a state of abject fear, which is incredibly fitting after Chapter 11, in which he didn't get targeted by the ghosts at all. The only thing that he is truly afraid of is Sephiroth, and not him specifically, but more what he did to him. We'll hopefully get more of an opportunity to tackle the more nuanced elements of the Nibelheim segment in Rebirth, so this scene will hold even more weight. But there is also the concern that Rebirth will hold more to Crisis Core's continuity, which would be a disaster given how awful Crisis Core's rendition of the Nibelheim incident was. As they near Sector 5, Barrett retains hope that the others made it out, as he isn't yet aware of their fate. They arrive at Aerith's home and hope to find Marlene. Elmira is already aware of what has happened with Aerith, and Cloud brings up her being an Ancient, which prompts Elmira to explain Aerith's story. So she told you about that. She must trust you all a great deal. Yes, Aerith is an ancient. Probably the last one living. She's not my daughter. Not by blood, I mean. If that's what you were wondering. Hmm. About 15 years ago. My husband, he'd been shipped off to fight on the front lines. But then I received a letter saying he'd be home for a bit. So when the day came, I went to the station to meet him. He didn't come. I couldn't help fearing the worst, even then. But I told myself his leave must have been postponed, that he'd been delayed. Every day I went, to wait and to pray. And that's how I met her, her and her mother. I thought maybe they'd run away from Wall Market, or that they were topsiders fallen on hard times. I'd seen that sort of thing a lot. Take Aerith somewhere safe. 
Those were her mother's dying words. My husband had been away for so long, and I was lonely. So I convinced myself the safest place for the girl was with me. It took no time at all for her to start feeling like family. She was a real chatterbox. She told me strange stories. Like how she and her mother had escaped from some sort of facility. And how she wasn't sad because her mother had just returned to their planet. Their planet, huh? Yeah, that sounds about right. I didn't understand any of it at the time. When I asked if she meant one in the sky, she said no. This one, right here. I mean... What can you say to that? Mommy, don't be sad. That's what she said to me one day, out of the blue. So I asked her, what's wrong? A man you really, really loved just died. His heart came a long way to say goodbye. But he couldn't stay because he had to return to the planet. I didn't believe her, of course. And then, a few days later, I received a letter saying my husband had been killed in action. Things like that, she'd just know. It was a lot to deal with, but we were happy. <laughs> and then came the knock. Coming! <laughs> no! Go away! Aaron. You know you're not just any little girl. You're a descendant of the ancients. I had no idea what he meant, so I said, who are the ancients? They were the original stewards of the planet, whose boundless knowledge and wisdom shall guide us to the promised land. <clears throat> Some believe the promised land to be a myth, others an allegory of sorts. But we take the words of the scriptures at face value and believe it to be quite real. Which is why Shinra would like very much for Aerith to help You're us... You're wrong! I'm not an ancient! But Aerith, even when you're all alone, don't you hear voices whispering secrets? No, never! <clears throat> but all three of us knew that wasn't true. That man knew exactly who Aerith was, where she'd come from, and what she could do. Cloud also immediately wants to set off after Aerith, by himself if he has to. Despite the risk of his own life, he still wishes to go after her. This shows his development, and how Aerith brings out the best in him. Even when the others recommend against it, he seems irritated. He is her bodyguard, after all. Although, I don't know why Tifa trusts Shinra enough to believe that they'll let Aerith go. With returning to the ruins of Sector 7 being our next objective, the three of them head back via the collapsed expressway and take the path previously inaccessible due to being covered in rubble, which has now been cleared because of the destruction in the surrounding area. Evergreen Park, which was once such a serene place just a few hours ago, has now become a debris-strewn refuge for some of the survivors of the Plate Fall. Weimer, the guy who was the quest giver in Chapter 3, is leading the refugee efforts here, and Barrett speaks with him. We take the sewer path into Sector 7 that Aerith notified Cloud about earlier, and the trio feel an unnerving tremor, likely due to the lack of structural integrity caused by the collapsed plate. 
Upon entering the slums, they find Maul and others trying to free someone from the wreckage, and instead of Cloud being able to lift it by himself, which he absolutely can do by the way, he's shown struggling to lift it alongside the others. Cloud's inconsistent strength is pretty annoying to someone that cares about logistics like myself. I mean, how can you be able to slice through train cars and buildings with ease, but struggle with what looks like a several hundred pound slab of concrete? Bizarre. They look to find the remains of the bar, and I really like this version of Tifa's theme and how appropriate it is here. Though, on another note, does anyone else find it frustrating how many times Cloud simply says Tifa's name and nothing else? The issue isn't him showing concern or even the specific case of him referring to someone solely by their name in a certain context, just that he keeps saying her name and not applying anything else to it. If you listen out for it, you'll get what I mean. It's not a major issue, just a pet peeve I have with the dialogue on occasion. Conveniently, one of Wedge's cats is here and beckons the others to follow it into a gaping hole near Wedge's house. Following the cat down reveals what seems to be a Shinra facility hidden beneath the Sector 7 slums, and is clearly the same one that Wyma referred to earlier. The cat shows them to Wedge, unconscious but alive. What is interesting is that Wedge clearly dies during the plate destruction in the original alongside Biggs and Jesse, and the whispers that surround him during the CG cutscene make it clear that they're keeping him where he should be yet they help him survive as opposed to letting him die. There is no allusion to Wedge's survival in the original, so this is either a retcon, or the whispers function differently to how we all think they do. Before they get Wedge out of there, the grated floor conveniently breaks under them and casts them into the depths of the facility. What is even more convenient is that the three of them were separated despite being stood next to one another, so that's funny. This time, Barrett gets a solo outing. There is not much to comment on here other than the fact that this chapter is a wholly new experience, as the party never returns to the Sector 7 slums after the plate falls, and the underground facility never existed. Whilst on the surface, this simply seems to be an extra segment of gameplay meant to pad the runtime. It does have the added benefit of giving us a look at what damage was dealt to the slums, and the ending of this area is what spurs Cloud on to going after Aerith, despite what Elmira told him. With that in mind, it does justify its own existence. Barrett reunites with Tifa, yet Cloud is nowhere in sight, and the two of them fight their way back to where they were. He's okay. You sure? Making me worry like that. I'd kick your ass if you didn't look like shit. Thank God. Thank you. Okay, let's go. What is this? Barret! <clears throat> Alright, so why don't they stay with Wedge? I don't see any reason for them to fend off the strange experimental monsters that come to attack them, and surely the shutters would repel the assault? I suppose a Steelman argument would be that they have to stop the monsters from escaping and harming others, but I am sure the shutters would do a fine job of that anyway. Regardless, it's time for the obligatory boss of the chapter. This is one of the more unique bosses in the game due to its structure, and it begins with both Tifa and Barrett being faced with an onslaught of these beasts, yet they aren't quite as strong as they appear. Most of them come into melee range, but some appear on the catwalks and rely on range. These are prime candidates for testing the bullets from Barrett's new weapon if you bought it, but however you dispose of them, the second phase shows more on their way. Tifa and Barrett aim to fight them on two fronts, but as Tifa heads to the catwalks, the true threat appears. The key here is to have Tifa draw the experiment's aggro, and have Barrett attack the tentacles from behind. Doing so will expose its heart, 
and help to usher in the third and final phase. This time, Tifa and Barrett will face it and its cohorts head on. The experiment can pick and toss its lessers at the characters, and its jumping slam attack deals a lot of damage. This fight can be pretty tough on hard, but on normal it is a cinch. So much so in fact, that I crushed it pretty easily here. Not exactly a memorable fight, really. Thankfully, Cloud's entrance ends the fight, and Barrett delivers the killing blow. As I said, Cloud seeing the testing pods triggers another Tism vision, this time of an experiment that shifts to that of Cloud himself. While part of this may be tied to Nibelheim and the experiments he underwent, the dialogue later indicates that Cloud is concerned that Aerith would likely go through the same thing, and this steals his resolve to go after her, though he was almost certainly going to do that anyway. It is also worth mentioning that Cloud would never have seen this had Tifa and Barrett not remained instead of fleeing like any normal person would, so take that for what you will. As the whispers carry them away however, it would suggest that they were dangerously close to learning something they shouldn't, yet the whispers are responsible for Wedge being here, and as such they're responsible for Cloud and Co seeing this. So honestly, as far as the plot goes, I have no fucking idea. <laughs> Back to the surface, we actually get a really good scene where Cloud and Tifa tell Barrett the truth that they have withheld through the entire chapter. I saw them both at the pillar. Jesse and Biggs. Saw how bad they were hurt. I'm sorry, but... Don't. They have returned to the planet. They... They were supposed to return to us. If we stop now, they'll never let us live it down. <clears throat> so, we carry that weight. Marlene is awake and looking after Wedge and Cloud brings up the situation with Aerith again, and you can tell he really cares, seeing as he doesn't often talk this much. Despite this, Elmira once again advises against it. I think it is clear that Cloud wants to convince Elmira that getting Aerith away from Shinra is the best outcome, and not that he needs her consent to go after Aerith. He was about to go earlier, after all. Elmira offers them the best advice that they should hear right now. Sleep. All of them have fought for hours, and need to rest before inevitably heading after Aerith, so that is what they do. But the evening doesn't end here just yet. Okay, at this point in the game, the player will witness one of three scenes that are entirely dependent on the choices you have made, which dictate the current affection points that the other party members aside from Cloud have. You will either get a scene involving Aerith, Tifa or Barrett, depending on your choices, and I will discuss them all here. Before I deliberate on them however, I think it is worth clarifying that the description for this mission objective implies that all of the party members find their resolve here, which would mean that all of these scenes are canon. So you can put your pitchforks down now guys, I won't simply be dismissing a particular scene, nor would I want to as all of them are pretty damn good. They all serve a different purpose too, not only for the character that they are representing, but also for Cloud, and different motifs can be extrapolated from them. Though, if I were to be a little more pedantic, considering that the credit sequence is arguably the strongest depiction of what events are actually considered canon, then that would mean that if any one scene had to be canon over the other two, then it would be Aerith's, as that is the only one shown during the credits. Of course, the credits do depict chronological scenes in which the characters shift dresses in Chapter 9, but this is clearly done to showcase all of the options, and obviously couldn't have happened canonically, as the characters won't have changed multiple times in Corneo's mansion. 
so using this to invalidate the other credit scenes won't work. As for what causes which scene, I'll go over them. In order to get the scene with Aerith, the best way to do this is to complete all of her side quests, witness the language of flowers scene, get her red dress, and awake her in the sewers first, which is a similar method that you would have to employ to get Tifa's scene. By completing all of her quests, talking to her in the apartment, and awaking her first as opposed to Aerith. Assuming that you treated both girls equally, as I did for this initial playthrough, then the deciding factor for what scene you'll get merely comes down to who you wake up first in the sewers. As for the third scene, the best chance to get this is to simply refuse to complete any of the side quests in Chapter 3 and 8, aside from the one that you technically have to do for Chadley, though I'm not sure if that affects Tifa's rating in any meaningful way. Even so, to be on the safe side, wake up Aerith in the sewers to counterbalance that. Of course you have to wake them up no matter what, but if you didn't complete any of their quests, then you should get this scene. I'll break this down a bit more specifically later on, but for now, let's tackle the resolution scenes. Let's start with Barrett's scene. Cloud wakes up and notices that Barrett is no longer in the room, and heads outside. The two then converse. You should rest up while you can. Likewise. No, I'm good. Real good. <laughs> Besides, when I close my eyes, I start thinking about things. About people. Like Finn. Lazy little punk. Kid would do damn near anything, except what you told him. But ask him to paint you a picture, and boy howdy. No stamps in the tunnels. Finn's worth every one. Then there's Al, intel guy. He had these tricks for stealing codes I still don't understand. Stole his share of hearts, too. But when it came to the ladies, he just had the one trick. Bouquet of flowers hidden behind his back. Funny to think. Some of them might have even come from here. He pulled a flower trick on Tifa once, believe it or not. <laughs> she told him where to stick them. Of course she did. Our quartermaster Nelly had a good laugh at that. She was tight with Jesse. People sometimes took them for sisters, even. They'd say no way he'd get upset, but then they'd start giggling and, you know, They're strong. They're tough. Like me. <laughs> After we save Aerith, I'll introduce you to them. Sounds good. <laughs> Never thought I'd feel better after talking with your hard-boiled ass. Think you can sleep now? Oh yeah, like a baby. Barrett's method of holding back his pain and coping with it is by thinking about his friends, and he describes them to Cloud, with the intent of introducing them to Cloud, which not only doubles as him still holding out hope that Finn, Al and Nelly are still alive, but also showing his growth with Cloud as he's practically inducting Cloud into the group, which he didn't do before. What ends up being Barrett's resolve is faith in that they have the strength to overcome what evil had befell them, as well as powering through to become stronger than before. A neat facet of this conversation is the body language that both men display, as at the start they both have their backs turned to one another, but eventually turn and face each other, actually communicating as friends, as opposed to colleagues. All in all, the theme of this scene is belief, and is easily the most optimistic of the three scenes, which makes sense given how both of these characters are not known for letting their insecurities show themselves on the surface. But the next scene is considerably more lacrimose. I can only assume that Cloud goes back to sleep, 
and conveniently wakes up again at the same time that another character has gone to mope in the garden. Lo and behold, this is exactly the case. Cloud heads out to find that Tifa is there, and they begin to talk. Can't sleep? No. You too? I heard footsteps. Sorry, didn't mean to wake you. I'm a light sleeper. It's a soldier thing. <sighs> that flower you gave me the other night, that was from Eric, wasn't it? Oh. <laughs> I knew there was something weird going on. You buying flowers? They symbolize reunion, believe it or not. I was curious, so I looked it up. I tried to keep it alive as long as I could. But now, it's dead and buried. <sighs> like the bar, our home, and everything else. Everything from us again. You're hurting me. Uh. <sighs> it's stupid. I know that crying is a waste of time. That's not true. <clears throat> Thank you. It is a nice scene. Let's go through it. For starters, Tifa brings up that the yellow lily represents reunion, and asks if Cloud got the flower from Aerith. Cloud's response, or lack thereof, confirms this. This is interesting as this is Tifa probing as to how Cloud feels about Aerith, and her suspicions are met. She proclaims that him buying a flower is strange, so this could only mean that Cloud had a motivation to buy one and seeing as Cloud forgot that he even had the flower when she inquired about it in Chapter 3, would mean that he almost certainly got it from Aerith because of Aerith, as opposed to getting it for Tifa. Tifa is a smart woman, with a clear understanding of social cues, and she is obviously aware of Cloud's feelings for Aerith, and how they conflict with her own feelings for Cloud. This is why the setup in the sewers is important. The conversation turns towards the loss of said flower, as well as everything else, which leads Tifa into tears, and heads to Cloud for comfort. I have to credit both the mocap actress and Tifa's English voice actress Britt Barron for doing a stellar job at delivering Tifa's emotions through their acting here. I would like to point out that Cloud takes a while to reciprocate the hug here, and that is intentional. It isn't because he's heartless, but because he doesn't know how to respond to a situation like this, and he actually responds this way because of the manner in which Barrett hugged her before. This is confirmed in external material, by the way, but even if that wasn't the case, Cloud is a tad uneasy at this exchange, and prefers to keep his own emotions away from others. It would explain why he was so adamant to hug her immediately. A very specific shot is shown of Cloud's face, and an almost distant, disinterested look from him, almost as if he's thinking intently, followed by a pan across the flowers and water nearby. An interpretation that could be levied here is that Tifa's words regarding Aerith and the flower causes Cloud to start thinking of her 
and the likely danger that she is in as opposed to focusing on Tifa's feelings in the present. And this would be corroborated by his incensed behaviour when it comes to going after Aerith and saving her from Shinra. It could also simply validate my initial perspective of him being distant and cold when other people break down emotionally, and his own inability to sympathise with them due to his own personal trauma. I know a lot of people view this scene with a romantic lens, but I strongly disagree. I think it is a great scene, don't get me wrong, but I think it is trying to represent a different theme, and some of the elements of this scene lend themselves to Cloud thinking outwards and about Aerith more than that of Tifa. But, if you aren't convinced, let me discuss some other things. After a while, Tifa remarks that Cloud was holding her too tightly, and begins causing her pain. Not only does this prove that Cloud wasn't paying attention, but that he was focusing on something in particular which caused his muscles to tense up. I would argue that his concern for Aerith is what he was focusing on, but that is vague enough for other interpretations. Back to the point though, if he held genuine romantic interest in Tifa, wouldn't he be purposefully gentle here? Another thing of note that lends credence to my argument would be the fact that there are plenty of scenes that are meant to include soft moments between Cloud and Tifa that include some reference of Aerith. It is almost as if the devs wrote these scenes to specifically include Tifa's jealousy and paranoia of another woman taking away the guy she is interested in, but also so that Cloud never actually denies the notion. This runs parallel to the scenes where Aerith asks Cloud about his relationship status with Tifa and he quickly refuses the assertion. Remember when I talked about how even if the player was massively pro Tifa in the relationship department, and they woke her up in the sewers first because of this, the scene still pushes the idea of Cloud and Aerith's relationship, whilst simultaneously nailing the coffin shut on Cloud and Tifa's? Look, here's the thing. I can't convince any of the crazy ass shippers to change their views on these things, and I can only do so much to appeal to neutrals in this case, but I am not here to deny any person's subjective preferences regarding these scenes. All I can do is give you the information and references, and also my own interpretation of the more vague aspects, and let you come to the conclusion on your own. There is more to talk of regarding the Love Triangle debate further in this story, and in the next two instalments of the remake trilogy, but I also understand people's frustrations on this topic, and why a lot of them don't want to talk about it. Since this is a critique, first and foremost, I am obliged to speak about it, though this is something that I will thankfully be able to rein in my opinions of it when we go forward. So relax. The scene concludes with Cloud telling Tifa that crying being pointless isn't true, and this is poignant when the only time that Cloud cries in the story as a whole is when Aerith dies, so having Cloud say this here is neat. To wrap this up, I believe that the theme of this scene is loss, from the flower that symbolises reunion, to Tifa's friends and home, and to Tifa believing that she has lost Cloud to Aerith in the relationship department. I believe this scene to be a dour one, and a stark contrast to the more optimistic and hopeful tone set by the scene with Barrett. The one thing that is consistent with all of these themes is that they all purport to the character that finds their resolution. Barrett comes to terms with his belief and hope in the survival of his friends, Tifa laments on the losses she has suffered, and yet despite that pushes onward. And as for the final scene. The last scene includes Aerith, but she's not the one finding resolve here. It is actually Cloud who is the primary target for the message of the scene. Again, we are led to believe that Cloud returns to sleep, and this time dreams of a scenario in which he leaves the bedroom and witnesses Aerith walking down the stairs. In his confusion, he follows her out to the garden and speaks to her. How is this? Is this a dream? Maybe. You tell me. You okay? Don't I look it? I used to live in the Shinra building, back when I was really little. Hmm. Your mom told us. Right. So, it kind of feels like I've gone back to my childhood home, you know? Honestly, it's not that bad. So what? You wanna stay? Come on, Cloud. Don't be silly. Your mom's really worried too. 
too? So you're worried about me? Uh, of course I am. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Really. Is that... Everyone dies eventually. I suppose. So we need to make the most of the time we have. To live our lives the way we want to live. Every minute, every moment matters. I'll remember that. Good. So... <sighs> you need to embrace this moment. Right? I'm glad I met you, Cloud. I really am. I'm grateful for all the words we've shared. For all the moments and the memories. You've made me more happy than you know. And I'll always cherish what you've given me. But... But whatever happens, you can't fall in love with me. Even if you think you have, it's not real. Do I get a say in all this? It's almost morning. Time to go. I'm coming for you. If that's what you want, thank you. There is quite a lot to unpack here, and to begin with I want to outline just how differently Cloud acts with Aerith when compared to Tifa, as whilst he's not exactly uncomfortable with Tifa, he doesn't really open up or engage in her conversations as much, but as he speaks with Aerith, his interest is a lot more prominent. Funnily enough, when Aerith prods him about this by assuming that he is worried about her, Cloud's response catches her off guard. She knows he does care, but is surprised that he admits it so easily. Cloud remarks on the green swirls in the sky, and this is not only proof that this is indeed a dream, rather than an astral projection, seeing as the plate no longer adorns the sky, but also of the fact that this dream is more than likely promulgated by the livestream, and more specifically, by Aerith. The Aerith in the livestream, that is, not the one we are following as part of the current timeline as she would certainly have some things to say later when they rescue her regarding this dream, yet she doesn't. This also vindicates my take on Aerith, knowing more things than she lets on, thanks to the memetic legacy that future Aerith passed down. As Aerith talks about things pertaining to life and death, Cloud is always looking her way, and he genuinely seems to be listening intently. He even responds to her a lot more than usual, which can only indicate his interest in her. I say this as an introvert myself, we often remain quiet when in the company of people we don't know, and avoid partaking in conversations that do not interest us. Yet, when we are interested in a discussion, or are in familiar company, our tone completely changes, and that veil of awkwardness drops entirely. It makes complete sense that Cloud would act in this way if his feelings for her were concrete, but we'll get to that. The highlight of this scene is this quote from Aerith, But whatever happens, you can't fall in love with me. Even if you think you have, it's not real. This is often weaponized into making it seem like Cloud's feelings for her belong to Zack, and as such are meaningless, but this is completely untrue. To begin with, the narrative that Cloud has Zack's memories is fallacious, as Cloud never has any of Zack's memories beyond his own mistelling of the Nibelheim incident. Not to mention he never calls himself Zack, nor does he recall Aerith's name before she reveals it, 
nor does he identify Zack's parents as being his own when they're in Gongarga, on top of several other examples. Cloud merely believes that he is a first class soldier, and his view of a first class soldier was inspired by Zack, hence why he carries across some of his mannerisms. If Cloud mistakenly thought he was Zack, then even the recollection of the Nibelheim incident would be different, as he wouldn't recall going into Cloud's house and speaking to Cloud's mother, as Zack never did that. Nor would Zack refer to Nibelheim being his hometown on more than one occasion, even though the perspective we see in those false memories is that of Zack's. I want to get it across that this understanding of Cloud's character only proves that you didn't follow what the game was trying to say. What really happened is Cloud combined his own experiences alongside the perspective that Zack told him about after they escaped in order to create a third perspective, entirely independent of the truth as a persona that Cloud could hide his trauma behind. That persona is that of a first class soldier. Cloud still has his own memories and still refers to himself by his own name and carries his own personality, except the only difference is that he assumed he was in Soldier, and the trade-off was that Zack never existed in his memory in order to sell the delusion. Point being, Cloud is Cloud, not Zack. All that matters is his memory is faulty, and that is where some of his struggles come from. Back to the quote though, the reason this line is frustrating is because the English localization butchers the actual meaning. In Japanese, she says that it is just your imagination, and other European languages consistently translate the term to it is pointless. The consistent translations alluded to his love being pointless matches the devs' explanations of the scene, in which they state that Eris' lines allude to her own fate, and have nothing to do with Zack or any memories that are associated with him. After this line, Cloud looks away, almost as if he is mocking the sentiment. However, when Aerith caresses his cheek, his facade falls away as he tries to reach for her arm. This is a new look for Cloud, and honestly why I find it difficult for people to see this as not romantic, as this is very deliberate. Cody's delivery of his next line displays a sign of hurt, as he does truly feel like she is ignoring his feelings and almost discarding them. Of course, with proper context, this isn't the case at all, though Cloud couldn't possibly know that. Despite her words, Cloud vows to come and rescue her, pushing back at her sense of doubt and defeatist approach. As it happens, this feels very similar to the language of Flowers scene from earlier, and this is the point where Cloud shows not only a sense of authority and agency over his own decisions, but also a sense of purpose. Cloud's arc throughout the story may only be at its infancy, but this is the first major turning point for his character, as he discovers his resolve. He vows to rescue Aerith, no matter the risk to his own well-being, and gives us the final theme for the resolution scenes. Love. Not only does his love for Aerith fuel his strength and empower his mind here, but this also sits neatly alongside his personal drive when going after Sephiroth in the Northern Cave at the climax of the original game. She is his motivator. And whilst that is certainly very cliché, it is a trope that is used in abundance as far as the Final Fantasy franchise is concerned. Aerith's response to this and her facial reactions say it all. She is happy. Happy that he pushed back on her statement, because deep down she doesn't want to push him away, yet she does so for his own sake, because she feels that it is better to cast him aside and spare him the pain of losing her, though in reality, Preventing him from having something or someone to fight for is worse. I don't think this ends their romance, I think it strengthens it. Before I wrap up this scene, I would like to point out this line again. What seems like a nothing line on the surface actually carries with it some weight when you consider that Cloud's mom, Claudia, said that his perfect girl should call him out when he's being, and I quote, a silly goose. This is the only time where the word silly is used in reference to Cloud, and considering that all of these traits fit Aerith, and a deliberate focus on this line, on top of the fact that Claudia doesn't simply mention Tifa's name when referring to her ideal partner for her son, can only conclude that Claudia's description was meant for Aerith. Oh, and for the fools that claim it can't be her because Claudia doesn't know her, Claudia doesn't need to. She merely brings up the traits that Cloud should look for in a girl, and Aerith possesses them, if you think that Claudia needs to know who Aerith is in order to make these claims, 
then I simply do not think you are qualified to discuss media in any form. And that is a case of me being kind. These scenes are indeed great for a multitude of reasons, though I want to bring up a little thing that annoys me about them. If we are led to believe that all three of these scenes are canon, and for the sake of this critique, I would say they are, then that would mean that Cloud went to sleep, got up to see Barrett, went to sleep again, woke up to find Tifa in the exact same place that Barrett was, only for him to fall asleep again, and this time have a dream regarding Aerith that takes place in, you guessed it, the garden. Do, do you see the problem here? Not only is it massively convenient that both Barrett and Tifa had the same idea without speaking to each other about it, but also did so at different times so they could conveniently have some alone time with Cloud. As well as this, it is just as convenient that Cloud awakes at the right time to speak to both of them. This is why I would prefer that only one scene falls under the purview of canon, and the most logical candidate for that is Cloud's resolution scene, the one involving Aerith. This is due to it being the only scene showcased during the credit synopsis, it being the most plot relevant discussion when compared to the other two scenes, and because I feel like the scenes with the others could be pushed back to later segments of the story, where they may be more palatable. For example, the Tifa discussion could be had at Calm, and the talk with Barrett could happen at Cosmo Canyon. With all that said and done, this segment took up about three and a half thousand words, so you're welcome. Cloud wakes up from his dream with Aerith, and the team go downstairs. You've done more for us than we deserve. I won't forget this. If you ever need anything, all you gotta do is holler. Happy to help out. However I can. Elmira. I've been thinking about what you said. She's calling out to me. I can feel it. We all can. So please. She's our friend. We have to help her. I always knew it was coming. Knew that one day, I'd have to say goodbye to my baby girl. But not yet. <clears throat> Please, bring her back to me. <clears throat> Daddy! <clears throat> Marlene. Are you going? I'm sorry, honey. I wish I didn't have to. I wish I could be with you all the time. I really do. But if I stay here, I can't fight out there. Hmm? <clears throat> Some bad people are trying to hurt the planet. And Daddy, Daddy and his friends are trying to stop those bad people. The slums, your friends, the whole planet. It's daddy's job to protect it. Hmm? <sighs> and that's why I've got to go. You remember that nice girl who came to find you? Well, now we have to go find her. And when we bring her home, you need to say thank you. Okay? Okay. That girl, she was kind of... <sighs> what? Nothing. You should help her. We will. <sighs> You'll come back, right? Of course, I promise. Okay, you can go. <clears throat> Barrett. She's tougher than me. This is a really nice scene for Barrett, and shows exactly why so many people say that he is the underappreciated star of the first part of this trilogy. 
When Marlene speaks of Aerith, she pauses for a moment and seems a little sad, which ties back to the memories that Aerith bestowed upon her. There is more to be said about what Aerith should be doing with these memories, or even if she understands them at all, but we'll leave that to later. Cloud reminds the others what the objective is, and has a habit of doing so a lot going forward, further cementing his desire to see Aerith safe and sound. And on that note, the team discusses what their next decision will be. With the next objective on the way, we pick up a ped- uh, uh, a what? Pedometer. Oh, sorry, a pedometer. Anyway, if you equip the pedometer materia and walk a certain amount of steps, which can be easily achieved in this chapter if you intend on clearing all of the quests, it will be exchanged for another materia. Reaching the town centre reveals that a character named Kyrie is spreading propaganda about Avalanche and their alleged ties to Rutai. After everything that has happened, this angers Barrett to no end yet Tifa holds him back. After all of the action-packed, combat-heavy chapters that have passed, we have another palette cleanser chapter in which we can talk to the characters and engage in some side quests before we head after Aerith. I suppose an argument could be made that this is wasting time, but preparation time is always useful and there are plenty of people in the slums who are displaced and need help. These are the last quests in the game, and they could take a long time to get through. Thankfully, most of them are not super important to the plot or characters, though that doesn't mean that they're devoid of said things. Some of these include helping Johnny get his wallet back from Kyrie, the girl from earlier, who, might I add, can be seen during some of the earlier parts of the game in the background, which is a nice detail. In order to get it back, you'll need to help her, which nets you a key and reveals the identity of the guardian angel of the slums. You can save some chocobos and seek some ingredients for the Doctor in Aerith's stead, which will end having you fight a behemoth, one of the most infamous Final Fantasy boss type enemies. Once all is said and done, however, the trio return to Corneo's place to request his help to get topside. Inside the now abandoned building, they instead find an acquaintance. Whilst the others show scepticism towards Leslie, Cloud agrees to help, which can only be seen to be born of his desperation to get to the Shinra building and to help Aerith, as he isn't the sort to barter with the untrustworthy. This, of course, means that we have a return trip through the sewers. This section is new to the remake, due to the fact that Leslie is a new addition, though it is also a way for them to give a more believable method for getting to the plate than simply climbing some wires, but we'll get to that soon enough. The next segment is more or less what you would expect, as we've already been through here, but amongst the way, we get some dialogue that implies a level of regret from Leslie, and his inclusion of the story will almost certainly tie into Corneo's plotline later on in the narrative. We have more moments of Cloud merely saying Tifa's name without adding anything more of substance on top of it, and it is getting rather tiring, before we reach the destination. Unfortunately, it couldn't go that smoothly. After chasing and defeating the creature, Cloud recovers Leslie's key, only to find out that it isn't a key after all, but a pendant. Giving some background to a relatively minor character is nice as is, but it is clear that this is establishing a plotline surrounding his fiancée, and the preceding scenes practically confirm that. Really though, this helps to generate some trust with the others, as Leslie's motive becomes clear. They can relate to his desire for revenge against Corneo, and as such, their interests are aligned. Regardless, as long as he can provide the means to get topside, then he is considered an ally. It is time to get Corneo, and Leslie insists that he should be the one to deal with him. Unfortunately, this leads to an incredibly stupid scene in which Leslie has the gun to Corneo's face, and yet somehow Corneo disarms him like fucking Batman, and monologues. I can defeat, and when I unleash you, I'll get- <laughs> You sly dog! You got me monologuing! I can't believe it! Conveniently, Corneo lets slip about Shinra's plans to abandon Midgar and build a new city in an area plentiful with Mako energy. 
Their brilliant name for this place is Neo Midgar, and Corneo would have been a part of it. Of course, thanks to him spilling the beans on the Sector 7 plan, the higher-ups at Shinra plan to have him bumped off, which explains why he is in hiding, and follows the narrative pull for his return in Wutai and the Turks seeking him. When Cloud and the folks intervene, Corneo points to the return of an old friend. The Abzu fight is very similar to the previous one, just scaled up to a higher level, as well as the fact that Barrett replaces Aerith and the arena is larger. Oh, and he is accompanied by a plethora of his minions, who serve to be annoying most of all. There isn't much to be said here that wasn't said before, which to be honest, kinda sums up this chapter. The fact that we are nearing the end of it, and most of my commentary revolved around the first three scenes, tells you all you need to know. This time, however, Abzu makes this place his murky, disgusting tomb, and the three of them head after Leslie. The flower that is depicted on Leslie's pendant is that of the Yellow Lily, the same flower that has been seen time and again. The one that represents reunion, and Tifa mentioning this ties into her resolution scene in which she mentioned looking up the meaning for it. Leslie's words earlier about revenge is almost a direct comparison with what Cloud goes through after they pass through the City of the Ancients, and his closed off, angry feelings during the travels in the North. The words that the trio offer him are intended to steer him away from the path of vengeance, and to direct him towards holding out hope for his beloved survival. It doesn't get much time in the story, but Leslie, like our three heroes, has also found his resolve. After a display of solidarity from the others, Leslie fulfills his end of the agreement, and they leave the sewers. Side note, one of the tiaras as part of Corneo's stash quest is here, and should be grabbed. Outside, Leslie reveals that the means of getting to the upper plate are a bunch of grappling guns, like they used in the Sector 5 reactor job. Before they part ways, they share some words. Didn't tell you before, but we're looking for someone too. That right. Hope you find it. You too. Go. Hmm. By this point, everything in the chapter should have been cleared up, including the Colosseum battles for both Barrett and Tifa's level 2 limits, and, if you have been keeping up with Chadley's battle intel requests, you will likely have both the Fat Chocobo and Leviathan VR battles available. Hell, it's possible to have completed all 19 requests by this point, as I did for this playthrough which means that you can tackle the 20th and final mission, fighting the legendary Bahamut. Of course, these will all be tackled in depth much later. As for the mission with the treasures, delivering them to Maul nets some odd dialogue. You didn't meet her, did you? Tell me, what was she like? Never met her. Just her go-between. Um, you did meet her, Cloud. Mire identified herself as the Guardian Angel, I suppose the steel man of this line is that he intends to protect her identity, but in that case he could have simply said that he hadn't met her. I wonder if there was some kind of mistranslation with this line, but it is also possible that any point that they were trying to make here wasn't handled with much tact. Well, that chapter was an incredibly long one for side content, but very brief for plot significance. This is mainly due to it being some kind of interim chapter, the calm before the storm so to speak. This is the last time that we'll be in the slums for this game, and if it follows the original this closely going forward, then we won't be back here until the third part most likely, so anything that needs to be tackled should be done now. The amount of side quests you do will dictate the scene you get to close out the chapter. For instance, completing all of the quests will get you the scene with some character building between the three of them. Weirdly enough, the good Samaritan scene has no music to go with it, yet has the most character, whereas the Bad Samaritan scene has the avalanche theme. Rather strange, but I'll play both scenes for the sake of clarity. Pretty high. Excited? Oh yeah. Glad someone is. 
Aerith's up there, waiting for us. Then we best get a move on, huh? Ready? <laughs> so, when this is over, you gonna go on being a merc? That's the plan. Reckon it suits you. Yeah, it does. Used to think you were a little shit with a big attitude and a bigger inferiority complex. Quite possibly the worst person I have ever met. But that was before I figured you out. All this, it ain't you. Deep down, you're a pretty nice guy. Didn't see it when we were kids, but... Don't know about any of that. But kindness is no use on the battlefield. If anything, it's a liability. Hey, no one's asking you to treat Shinra with kid gloves. <sighs> Aerith's up there waiting for us. We're in the home stretch now, as almost all of the chapters going forward are plot focused, with the exception of the next one coming up, which is somewhat of a filler chapter, though still a good one. <laughs> Contrary to the original game, we have an entire segment dedicated to climbing up to the upper portion of Midgar. This is a considerable improvement too, as the original climbing sequence was bizarre. It involved climbing and swinging off of wires, placing batteries in order to make fans spin in order to create a footpath, as well as climbing broken tracks like ladders. It looked completely preposterous, and I struggle to believe that they could make a climb like that. The original game states the distance between ground level and the plate is about 50 meters, whereas the remake has changed this to being 300 meters instead. I would say that the remake improves this as well, as 300 meters helps the sense of scale considerably. Either way, despite this chapter only existing as a bridge between the last one and reaching the upper plate at the beginning of chapter 16, it still has some highlights that are worth talking about. To start, I really like the melancholic rendition of the Avalanche theme that plays here, which features in the Plus soundtrack, as it unfortunately wasn't featured in the main OST. It really helps set the tone that Avalanche is at its weakest point, with most of Barrett's friends dead and buried, and with thousands more innocents struggling to find family members within the rubble. As the trio begin their climb, however, I am not done with talking about the soundtrack, as I want to highlight a personal favourite of mine and one of the most underappreciated tracks on the album, the ambient and battle theme of this area, Fires of Resistance. What I adore about this track is the specific context it is couched in, with the trio standing resolute in their desire to save Aerith, fighting against Shinra troops with a brilliant vista behind them, mostly due to the sunset radiating light on the ruins. This helps to really push the heroism present, and represents the comeback of the heroes narratively. Plus, it just sounds really fucking good. A major threat in the form of a Shinra kill team is revealed, and Cloud advises subtlety in place of an aggressive assault. It is he who reminds them of their primary goal, and they elect to go around them. They are eventually attacked by a couple of third class soldiers, and an optional scene can be had if you interact with the walkie talkie. It makes sense as to why Barrett would want to invoke fear into Shinra after what they've done, but a stealthy approach is more appropriate, and is what they stick to. Eventually though, Barrett's lack of a healthy diet causes their cover to be blown, and forces the party into more of what this chapter offers, straightforward combat. There isn't much of note here other than the visuals, which have been criticised in the past, and rightfully so, as prior to the PS5 version of the game, the pre-rendered backgrounds were horrible, and this is likely due to a combination of low resolution renders, as well as the bad placement of said renders, as they do a world of hurt to one's sense of depth. Sadly, this issue persists in both the PS5 version and even the PC port, though to a lesser degree. You see, this particular shot here looks odd, 
but when it is viewed from a greater verticality, it actually looks fine, if not great. This is because they are designed to be seen from a particular angle, yet the devs did not account for them being seen in different ways. There is more to be said here, so I'll leave it for now. After a series of fights against enemies new and old, our flying foe from before makes an appearance. After a short, albeit janky escape, the heroes take a moment to pause, and reflect on the things they have lost. When they grapple up once more, they are accosted by the machine that has been pursuing them throughout the chapter. This time, however, there is nowhere to run. It is time to fight. The Valkyrie is a deviation from most of the other bosses in terms of design, as this enemy remains airborne, and cannot be hit by both Cloud and Tifa for most of the fight. Unless they have magic, of course. The Valkyrie itself is a remade version of the Heli Gunner from the original game, which was fought a little later and in a more nonsensical location. Having it here is a much better placement, and the fight mixed with gorgeous scenery and brilliant music crafted by renowned composer Keiki Kobayashi, best known for his work on the Ace Combat series, which makes sense given how he was chosen to compose the track for an aerial based enemy in this game. As for the fight itself, the first phase is Barrett's play zone as he is the only one who can lay down consistent damage. However, if it is hit with a wind spell, then it will be stunned long enough for the other two to jump up and hit it as well. This phase is short, thankfully, and when the player regains control, the odds are even as the Valkyrie will come down to the ground more often. The rotary cannons and artillery are standard attacks to deal with, but the boss has the ability to sleep the characters with its anti-personnel gas, and tear them to shreds with Firewheel. The rock in the middle of the arena can help with mitigating most of its attacks, but generally speaking, they aren't too difficult to deal with. Things change immensely in its third phase, in which it activates its limiter override, which reduces the amount of damage it receives from magic based attacks. On top of this, it launches a probe that tracks the player relentlessly until the player stops moving, upon which it will engage a giant laser around the impact area. Not only does this incentivize the player to keep moving, but it can also be used against the boss. Stopping the beam close enough to the boss will catch it in the blast radius, dealing a significant amount of damage, a large increase to its stagger gauge, and resulting in the removal of its limiter override. This fight is a lot of fun, but quite squishy, and can be defeated very quickly. Upon its defeat, however, it has one last trick up its proverbial sleeve. With the last obstacle out of the way, we have a straight shot to our destination. There's such a thing as too much excitement. Yeah. And there's still more to come. Guess so. Hope everybody's warmed up. With the Shinra building in sight, the trio plans their course of action, with Barrett suggesting a skirmish directly through the front door. After Cloud remarks about Barrett's foolishness, he urges them to take the parking garage instead, and the three of them make their way over there under the veil of the evening sky. When discussing the amount of guards in the area, the conversation veers to the war with Wutai, and Cloud insinuates that the war is merely dormant, and hasn't truly ended not with Shinra in power. I honestly wonder if we will see the war get back underway in the remake trilogy, as the party's eventual ties to Yuffie could force them into this conflict directly, which would be interesting to see. I only bring this up because of Cloud's comment on it, and how deliberate it comes across. They find their way inside by jumping onto the top of a Shinra truck that is headed into the parking garage, and it is very fortunate that they do not fall off. Inside, their cover is blown after Barrett falls onto one of the guards, which is played for laughs, but I'm not laughing. Frankly, it annoys the hell out of me that the guards don't see any of them atop the truck, especially the 350 plus pounds guy taking up half of the roof. With the band-aid ripped off, the trio cut their way throughout the garage, and find themselves taking an escalator to the main foyer area. It is strange that there is no one here, not even a receptionist, or a few security guards for safe measure, which really aids in making this part seem really convenient, 
as what would be the most heavily guarded building in the whole city doesn't seem to actually be well guarded. This is especially true for all of the guards in the garage area that didn't call for support or ring any alarms. Of course we will learn that the trio have some support as far as the camera systems are concerned, but that doesn't account for the guards that have already seen them. I'd like to also mention the existence of the coffee shop here, as these are small, albeit useful pieces of world building to remind us that people work here and will require refreshments. I bring this up because most games have a habit of making all of their lived in environs not feel lived in, so having something like this is a nice detail. In order to unlock the doors that will allow them to get to the higher floors, they'll need a key card, and it just so happens that they spied one in the reception cubicle. Of course, it was blocked by a strange defence mechanism for a reception, and their only entrance point is through the top of it. Tifa suggests that she deal with this due to her being the lightest and most agile member of the three, though I feel like we have just forgotten that Cloud can do shit like this. Either way, Tifa makes her way across and falls onto a couch below. The characters make a big deal about this, but we have seen her survive greater falls than this before. After a rather gratuitous climbing segment, Tifa gets the keycard and tries to lower the shields, but they end up dropping despite her input. The characters don't seem too concerned about this despite the fact that it would confirm that they are being watched, as someone else would have had to have dropped the barrier for them. You can also see the hardy data on a motorcycle that will definitely not come up again at a later part. From here, the player has two options, take the stairs or take the elevators. The elevator scene is the canonical option, as not only is it displayed during the credits, but also because a line of dialogue later in this chapter only makes sense if you took the elevators. Which in all honesty seems strange that the devs didn't account for this and add an alternate scene for if you took the stairs. Also, the elevator scene has more dialogue that pertains to the actual context of the mission, whereas the stair scene is played off for humour. That being said, Cloud makes a good point that taking the stairs will result in a better chance of them not being caught. Not only because there will be less cameras and a smaller chance of bumping into anyone, but also because they can lock down the elevators with them still on it. Even Assassin's Creed 3 got this right. Well, so you've learned absolutely nothing since you left us. Walking into an elevator in the middle of a hostile environment. Really? Point being, even though the elevator scene is canon, taking the stairs would be the most logical option as far as stealth is concerned. Taking the elevator results in some combat against Shinra guards, with this animation mess being a part of it. I mean, why did that look so bad? Another scene includes that of them scaring away a secretary, and a random employee on the phone completely ignoring them. But we also get a scene in which Barrett delivers a line indirectly alluding to Cloud's arc. Apart from the obvious joke about Scarlet having a dedicated simp, I would recommend listening to her theme just for the lyrics. You'd be surprised how incredibly sexual it is, which fits given her appearance and blatant sex appeal. Though I'm not exactly complaining. On the 59th floor, Barrett has a poignant statement to make about Midgard that I really like. From here, the game follows the route of the original in that you receive a keycard that is updated as you progress throughout the floors, and Barrett makes a point about this method. What I find funny is the general inconsistency on whether or not Cloud has actually been in the Shinra building before. In the original game, he claims to have not been there before, but in Crisis Core we see that this is nonsense, as he is present on the soldier floor with Zack once. We know that he doesn't have Zack's memories, so the idea that he remembers being there in Zack's place wouldn't add up, but he should remember it as if he was actually there. The remake doesn't really side with one perspective or another, so honestly I'm just using this as an excuse to shit on Crisis Core's writing again, as it is hyper inconsistent with the original game. Taking the escalator initiates another scene. Yes, every reactor, every pillar. Like I said, a full inspection. There's no telling what kind of damage there might be. If you see anything, anything out of the ordinary, I want to know. <sighs> Sorry to bother you, sir. No, it's fine. I brought the damage assessment for Sector 7 you requested. Sir, perhaps you should try and get some sleep. No, not yet. 
I need to finish preparing my draft of the reconstruction plan before tonight's board meeting. <sighs> Whatever reasons they might have had, destroying an entire sector is... it's beyond the pale. Director... I would strongly advise you not to say such things outside of this room. <sighs> Don't I know it. Seeing Reeve have reservations towards his company's actions is the first step in introducing Ket Shea into the story, so this scene is solid. We also get a sight of a mysterious bearded fellow watching the cameras. Arriving at the 60th floor, the trio enter into the Memorial Museum, only to be confronted with a conceited golden statue of the President. In this room, there are a bunch of pieces of Shinra memorabilia throughout the company's history. One of these is a picture of the employees, with a strange man wearing a gas mask at the forefront. This seems to be a reference to the character called Shinra from Final Fantasy X-2, and this picture existing here could simply be a reference and nothing more. But it could also be a piece of evidence showing that both FF7 and FF10 exist in the same universe, as well as potentially having taken place on the same planet. I'll leave it up to you to decide whether or not this is cool, or an obnoxious complication to the world building and setting. Have a guess at which perspective I have on it. The museum segment is good though, as it gives us a look at Shinra through a perspective that is admittedly biased to their side, but one that is necessary to balance out all of the criticism that the characters lay on them. This is presented no better than the diorama scene, which is another thing remade from the original. Let's play it, shall we? This is Midgar, our home, recreated in one ten-thousandth scale. As you can see here, the eight Mako reactors form a ring around the center of our city and keep Midgar running day and night. The Mako which flows beneath our feet is a truly limitless resource. At Shinra, we have developed technologies to extract it and transform it into the fuel and electricity that powers everything we do. Thanks to the miracle of Mako energy, our lives are richer and better than ever before. Mako keeps our lights on at night and made Midgar into the city that never sleeps. The triumph of technology and testament to man's potential. Nothing but a bunch of lies. Except that Mako has made people's lives better. It's made people blind. Blind to the cold hard truth. Even I used to buy into that bullshit. Remembering that makes me even madder. This scene does a good job at having Cloud point out the fact that Mako has positively impacted the lives of people across the world, even despite his own reservations around the reactors. The manner in which Cloud says this also seems like he's venting his frustration towards Barrett's lack of nuance. Notice how Cloud doesn't exactly disagree with him, just that he finds it annoying that Barrett has a one-sided view on it. For clarity, Cloud despises Shinra, so this isn't him protecting them or sympathising with them, just that he is willing to have a more nuanced view on topics like this, and, frankly, something that people in the real world could learn when debating similar topics. I suppose that I enjoy this, because having some depth to the character's perspectives and having morally good characters dabble in perspectives that might seem disagreeable, or even unsavoury to the audience, is something I wish more stories would take advantage of. I also say this because a later scene has a character that I wish had more depth for his purpose in the story, and the comparison between these two scenes is like night and day. The point here is that destroying the reactors won't simply solve the issues, as not only would others spring up as a result of it, but we have already seen the damage and loss of life that can come from it, and I'm not simply talking about the Sector 1 reactor. The entire platefall was a response from Shinra regarding the terrorist attacks on their city, and tens of thousands of innocent people died due to this. Of course, the reactors are harming the planet, but even in a scenario like this there are shades of grey, so just picture what this is like in our world, which isn't nearly as clear cut. As for Barrett's response, we know that he used to follow Shinra, and was all for assisting them in installing the Mako reactor in Corel, but the entire situation following that cemented his perspective that Shinra 
are an evil organisation willing to destroy towns to maintain their bottom line. Him looking at his gun arm shows us what he is thinking of in this scene without dialogue, assuming you are familiar with the original game's story, that is. In totality, I think this is a very good scene that opens up the possibility for more nuanced concepts, and I particularly like Cloud's Steelman view on Shinra, an organisation he loves. This is why I think Cloud is a really strong character, and why he is a cut above a certain Gary Stu from the same game. Don't worry, I have already alienated the Crisis Core and Zack fans from watching this critique, so I'm sure this won't catch me some flack from the comments at all. Nope. Not. At. All. At the end of the museum segment, the final part of the tour is a short movie in the visual entertainment hall, which grants us a breathtaking CG cutscene. What begins as a propagandised retelling of both the origins of Shinra and that of the Cetra leads into something far more sinister. Alright, there is a bit to unpack here, though it is worth noting that most of this scene seems to be veiled in secrecy due to the vague nature of its presentation. As such, we will likely see what becomes of this in the next two parts of the trilogy. To begin with, this scene is a depiction of the destruction of Midgar in Pillars of Fire as Meteor nears the planet towards the end of the original game. We see one of the robed men standing atop a building, as this is clearly supposed to be Sephiroth, and he teleports down striking down both Barra and Tifa to Cloud's dismay, leaving the golden-haired hero alone, which is likely what Sephiroth's goal is. To weaken the man that defeated him all those years ago, to humiliate him in the same manner, by taking away everything he loves and leaving him broken, both physically and mentally. This is backed up with the visions of both Meteor and Aerith praying, as these are some of the darkest moments from Cloud's experiences during the original. Here's the thing, is this a premonition, or a crystallised form of Cloud's fears? Or even something else entirely? I like the idea that this is a showcase of his fears, but removing Aerith from that equation harms its presentation in that case. The dialogue from the others after this makes it seem like they didn't see it, and that it was simply a vision that Cloud had. Perhaps this was placed in his head by Sephiroth himself, which would support my previous assertion about Sephiroth's goal being to tear Cloud apart. As we see just after this, Sephiroth is in the building, so this could be the case. Really though, I can't say for sure. From a spectacle perspective, it is brilliant, with gorgeous animation, excellent framing and a dramatic score to boot, but narratively I don't understand how this works, and it feels like classic Nomura, in that it looks great but requires additional input from the audience to squeeze interpretations from it as opposed to actually trying to make a scene that is easily digestible to the audience. Superficially, it is great. As for the objective view, however, I'll have to wait and see how this is followed up on later down the line before making any judgments. A rather dapper man awaits them outside the visual room, and offers to take them to the mayor, who resides in the building. We find out that Mayor Domino has been the man pulling the strings regarding the lack of security and the absence of alarms. Though this still doesn't explain why the foyer was empty, as I don't believe that he could successfully convince the workers, and especially the security, to leave the foyer unabated. Domino reveals himself to be Avalanche's mole, which explains where the reliable information that the upper echelons received came from. Though, his motivation is odd as it is entirely based upon the fact that he is forced to watch over the library, which is supposedly demeaning to him. Either way, I think it is a leap to have him want to kill off the president because of it. 
Also, the mayor is very short, which is fine, but then again most men seem to be that way. For reference, Cloud is 5 foot 7, which incidentally is the same height I am, and I can tell you that most guys are notably taller than me. The game even makes a point to show that Cloud is shorter than average, yet the point is that it doesn't limit him in any way, especially not with the ladies. Then again, he is handsome, so that makes up for it. I say this because Cloud seems to be quite taller than a lot of the other dudes, which is weird. The mayor gives them the password that they need to give to another accomplice in the building. All that they need to do now is to continue upwards. So, about this precious promised land of yours. Come now, Aerith, you misunderstand my intentions. I wish only to satisfy their material greed, so I can be left to pursue my great work. Our great work, my dear. Hmm. You're the spitting image of her now. I regret it to this day. If she had only trusted me instead of trying to run, it could have played out quite differently. What a terrible tragedy, to lose the last of the pure-blooded ancients. Though not completely, would you like to see your mother? Albeit through the lens of one of my microscopes. Did you really think we'd leave such a precious specimen to rot in the gutter? We collected and cataloged every last bit of her. Hair, skin, organs, every fragment of every bone. As breathtaking in death as in life. As you, my dear, Ivalna was elegance, right down to her cellular structure. <laughs> and there it is, that same elegance. Oh, yes. Time for yet another meeting. Sit tight. I won't be long. <sighs> this scene is great due to one simple thing. Aerith. Whoever animated her here did a stellar job, as her facade goes through many changes during the conversation. For the most part, she is completely uncooperative with Hojo and the other scientists, and keeps a poker face no matter what he talks about. Frankly, keeping her in a glass container like this makes her feel like a disposable experiment, and as such it makes sense why she's so adamant on providing any assistance. When Hojo talks about her mother, Ifalna, however, and starts to delve into his sadistic thoughts, her mask begins to crack. Her lips quivering, her eyes darting around as a defence mechanism to cover her emotions, she's doing everything she can to maintain a brave face so as not to lose to him. She refuses to allow him the satisfaction of hurting her, and despite Hojo's creepy and almost suggestive description of her, she remains stalwart. When Hojo leaves, Aerith reveals that his words did in fact hurt her, and why, in my eyes, scenes like this show exactly why Aerith deserves that happy ending just as much as the others. This scene also represents Aerith's entire character in microcosm, as she spends most of her time hiding her real trauma behind a facade, just like Cloud, except her facade is a happy one. She is doing the exact same thing here, keeping her true feelings away from Hojo, all to spite him from getting what he wants. Seeing Aerith in a vulnerable spot like this is inspiration enough to get her out of there, but returning to Cloud reminds us that there are still a few more hurdles in the way. After watching an interview with Heidegger, which, to be honest, just makes him seem incredibly malicious and not very endearing to the Shinra staff at all, we speak to the man we have been searching for, and he has to test the trio in order to make sure they're competent enough to be Avalanche members. After completing said test, he reveals what their next destination is. A rest room outside of the administrative meeting room which has ductwork that will direct the trio to a place in which they can eavesdrop on the meeting, and hopefully learn something that will help in rescuing Aerith. Before they leave, however, Cloud bumps into a Shinra guard. 
this is the same Kunsol that is Zack's friend in Crisis Core, and likely New Cloud as well, which is why this guard intends to get Kunsol over to speak with him. I would hazard a guess that Kunsol intends to ask Cloud about where Zack is, or what happened to him, but that scene doesn't actually happen. In fact, merely bringing Kunsol's name up causes another relapse, as the others catch on to Cloud's problem. Funnily enough, it took this long for anyone else to notice and comment on this, yet Aerith reacted to it immediately and tried to help him through it. So remember that when we talk about what characters are right for Cloud. Before making their way up to the floor in which the meeting will occur, the three encounter both President Shinra and Heidegger discussing a recent revelation. Tifa understandably has reservations about going into the gents' restroom, yet she elects to go with Cloud through the vents, as Barrett can't fit. After this totally necessary gameplay segment, the two of them reach the end, and listen to the department heads conspiring. The plan for Neo Midgar is back on, as they plan to get Aerith to spill the beans on the location of the promised land. Aerith is unwilling to part with this information, not because of choice, but because she doesn't know where it is if it even exists. Hojo, being oblivious to this, notes that in order to ensure that they will always have ancients to provide this knowledge, suggests that they forcefully breed her. We see that Cloud is disgusted by this idea, but I find it very interesting that they censor blood in this game, but not the idea of Aerith being raped. Odd choice, but consistent with the original, which is even more fucked up, as Hojo wanted to not only have Aerith forcefully inseminated, but also with another species in order to, in his words, save two endangered species. They pull back on this and merely suggest that she mate with soldiers in order to produce a crossbred specimen, likely brimming with both Cetra and Genova DNA. I reckon part of this is to have leverage over Aerith that they can threaten her with, for if they try to take her children away from her or harm them, then that might make her tell them what they want to know. Amusingly, the other board members aren't too pleased with this approach, because even with both Heidegger and Scarlet recommending that they torture her, even they still have limits. The G and S type soldiers that were first brought up in Crisis Core are mentioned here, and the President gives the go ahead to Hojo to do whatever he sees fit. With the meeting adjourned, Cloud and Tifa return to Barrett, and they follow him to where Aerith is being held. Outside, Hojo ruminates on the info that Sephiroth is in the building. Those that have played the original will already know of Hojo's connection to Sephiroth, and he plans to have Sephiroth and Aerith meet, with the intention of them mating so as to produce some particularly powerful children. Which begs the question, what would Aerith's kids be like? In the recently released novel, Trace of Two Pasts, on the ferry ride from June on, Tifa asks Aerith on whether or not she will pass on the materia that she got from her mother to her kids one day, which prompts Aerith into saying that she has never thought about it. This conversation likely will inspire her to think ahead for that, and is particularly interesting as this conversation has to have a purpose going forward. This doesn't exist in the original, and we haven't seen this part in the remake yet, though with Rebirth fast approaching, this might be brought up. Considering the fact that several hundred years after the closing scene of FF7, humanity had perished, most likely due to the lack of the Cetra thanks to Sephiroth's actions in that game, to me, it seems like there is a lot of precedence for Aerith to have offspring, which tie into the changing of fate itself, and would give purpose to this considerable change in the narrative. If I may be so bold, I honestly reckon that they're setting us up for a Cloud and Aerith romance in which both Aerith's Cetra heritage and Cloud's Genova cells will come together and create a new harmonious bond between two opposing forces in order to invoke a new age, in which humanity will thrive and prosper alongside the Cetra, as this can only be done by Aerith continuing her line. Now look. I am not saying that if Cloud and Aerith were to have kids, that they would be doing so solely for preserving her bloodline. No, they would obviously do it purely for wanting a family. What I am saying is that this feels like a natural conclusion to a storyline that it seems like they are setting up, and it will double not only as a happy ending for both the characters we are following, as well as for humanity, but it will also serve as the most humiliating end for Genova as having her DNA turned into a positive for the Cetra will serve to have the plight that is Genova's left in the dust and forgotten. To make my point crystal clear, 
Compare what I have said with the Genova cells to how Kratos describes the legacy of a cursed sword, Skofnung, in God of War Ragnarok. What do you intend to do with Skofnung now? I intend to use it. No! Don't you understand the legacy that thing carries? Not to mention the souls of evil berserkers. I will use it for good. That won't erase its history. No. But the story of this sword is still being written. Future generations will weigh its good deeds against the bad and decide for themselves. You've come a long way from when I first met you, brother. I have had good counsel since then, brother. TLDR, the heroes will get a great conclusion and Genova will lose everything. This is just my thought on the matter anyway, so do with that as you will. Whilst pursuing Hojo, the trio hear about the sickening methods in which he plans to torture Aerith with, before making their presence known. Hojo is as pragmatic as they come, with him showing complete apathy towards Avalanche's desire to kill the president, seeing as his sole motivation is the pursuit of knowledge through science. Unfortunately for him though, the three of them aren't there for the president. Hojo having a contingency for when he is in danger isn't so much the issue as the others just letting him slip through their fingers. Though, as with the train radio back in chapter 11, this contrivance doesn't actually prevent them from getting Aerith back. It merely delays them long enough for Hojo to secure himself some backup later. For now, a much more pressing matter presents itself. Specimen H0512, whom we'll call Hojo's Experiment for short, and its litter make for the boss of this chapter, and it is actually pretty formidable. Unlike the original, Red 13 has yet to make his appearance, so he isn't available here. The experiment can be pressured if its claw is destroyed in its first phase, so that is the priority. As for the fodder enemies, they should be ignored as they can be respawned and they pose little threat. The experiment can grab the player through seas, and Rake is a particularly nasty move that does a ton of damage. Phase 2 doesn't add any significant differences, yet Phase 3 strengthens the minions and allows the boss to use Mako Expulsion, an AoE that leaves a lingering trail which both slows and applies poison. It can also use Rake three times in succession now. Woohoo. This boss is quite forgettable, and I'm honestly just trying to find excuses to pad the length of the script at this point, so let's just move on. They take the elevator after Hojo, and a cutscene reveals the individual that I referenced but a moment ago. Red 13. Thankfully, Aerith is safe and sound, guarded only by an entourage of guards that should pose no threat considering how many we have faced thus far. Oh, I'm sorry, Hojo says that these guys should be enough. Oh, <laughs> my mistake. Well, I'm afraid Hojo is dead fucking wrong, and they go down without a cinch. Hojo being carried away by the whispers is brought on by him, almost revealing info that we shouldn't have yet. And this gives the trio the freedom to finally free Aerith. Before the characters can share a few words, a bunch of guards bearing lightsabers engage them. Dealing with them is easy enough, though I do think they're some of the coolest enemies in the game. Aerith isn't the only one joining the party, as our canine friend makes himself known. Whilst the others prepare for another fight, Aerith intervenes, for she already knows about him, and offers him something she has only given to one other person, a batch of memories. As he receives the memories, his reaction changes and calms down. In the original, he is already calm and doesn't require pacification, so I am curious as to why this was changed. It may have been brought on by the numerous other changes that were never meant to happen, and as such changed Red's outward personality. Aerith choosing to impart this knowledge to him, and him alone, could be because he is the only one mentally stable or mature enough to understand the weight of the information being presented. I could see Cloud or the others reacting quite emotionally to them, which may affect their decision making going forward. Red certainly understands Aerith's perspective, as will be evidenced at the end of the game, but we aren't there yet. As for Red's personal introduction, So what the hell is it? A fascinating question. Oh, <laughs> did it just talk? You asked what it is. Hmm. I am that which you see before you, nothing more. I'd a 
appreciate it if we simply left it at that. Agreed. given to me by Hojo. Then you must have another name. What is it? <sighs> he got away. With the characters finally out of the blue, something changes within Cloud. Cloud hears the distorted voice of Sephiroth talking and lumbers forward to the elevator. Touching it gives our first sighting of Genova and Cloud falls to the ground unconscious, not before muttering, Mother. A dramatic scene with a great use of those chosen by the planet, but I can't help but be distracted by the fact that all of the others just watch him walk about 20 feet without trying to help him or even ask what he is doing. They even react to it, so it's weird. I mean, have them looking in another direction or something, and they turn and look at him as he collapses, that might help, I don't know. Either way, with Aerith back by our side, and a new ally in the form of Red 13, the chapter closes on Cloud's unconscious body. You know, Reno, I think you might be due for some R&R. &R. Nah, I'm good. What are we going to do about Sector 7? We are going to do nothing. Been thinking, was all that necessary? Had we refused, someone else would have completed the task. We have spared that someone the burden of a guilty conscience. Perhaps that will ease yours. <sighs> yeah, no. Let's try another tack then. They were a sacrifice to balance the scales. Say what? After everything we'd taken from the planet, we were due to give something back. Do you actually believe that? Does it matter? <clears throat> yes, understood. The VP needs us. Cloud awakes in Aerith's room. According to Red, he apparently carried Cloud here, which is really odd and probably should have been Barrett. Before talking to Aerith, we can spot an impressive mural on the wall, which was painted by her many years ago as a child. Plenty of theorists have extrapolated that the images represent the Cetra, and events that may be to come. This is actually explored in the compilation, as the Shinra scientists noticed that her paintings might have given them the answers as to where the Promised Land may be located. A soldier who almost died as a result of the wild goose chase that Aerith's painting sent her on, even went as far as choking poor little Aerith, and her mother intervened to save her. But, in Aerith's own words, she doesn't know where the Promised Land is, though believes that she may one day find it within herself. Cloud breaks the ice by suggesting that Aerith open up about what she knows, and so she does. When Aerith states that Barrett cannot stay behind, the whispers once again appear, and Red finally name drops them. What is clearly a result of the memories and information that Aerith imparted to Red, he explains their purpose, which is to preserve the flow of time, and stop that which threatens nature's course. The whispers surround Aerith, and she talks about them removing aspects of her mind, before leaving us with a foreboding sentence. Aerith, what are you not telling us? I'm lost in a maze, and every step is taking me further from the path. Every time the whispers touch me, I lose something, a part of myself. <laughs> Follow them, the yellow flowers. Yeah. 
They are then interrupted by a call from Domino, who is joined by Wedge, who has somehow miraculously made his way up to the Shinra building, despite the fact that the others had to grapple and climb their way up, something that Wedge is clearly incapable of doing right now. Avalanche is planning a response attack because of what happened to Sector 7, and the party has to make their way to the roof. Aerith gives a little smile to Cloud, and they head on their way. This also confirms that the Aerith in the Dream wasn't our Aerith right here, as the Dream variant advises Cloud from going after her, yet our Aerith has no qualms with his attempt at rescuing her. The damage being dealt to the building via the Avalanche Assault has caused the pods holding experiments to be damaged, and they are now roaming around. After dealing with them, we get a fun scene depicting the beginning of Barrett and Red's friendship. In order to get to the roof access, they need to go through Hojo's lab, which is convenient. As the elevator door closes, Cloud spies a feather falling, the telltale sign of Sephiroth's presence. Well, assuming Cloud has the knowledge of his wing, that is. It is here that we come across Genova, and Cloud falls prey to yet another Tism vision. Sephiroth is shown floating down, but based on the other characters reacting to the sight of him, we see that he is actually here this time. Deny me. Embrace me. A touching reunion. Cloud grabbing his left arm is notable because that is the same arm that would be affected by Geo's stigma in Advent Children, so drawing focus to this shows just how far reaching Sephiroth's influence is, especially if this Sephiroth is the same one from that point in the timeline. After the fall, Cloud is separated from the others and works his way through the damaged area before being joined by Red. Sadly, Red 13 is not a playable character in the remake. As director Tetsuya Nomura stated that his introduction this late into the game with only one chapter left after this, meant that balancing this character would have been a nightmare. Not only because the player would have to adjust to an entirely new playstyle, but because every character has six weapons that are found at various points throughout the game, which have to be paced out so that the player doesn't feel overwhelmed by significant build choices all at once. As sad as it is to not have him available to play, not only will he be playable at the start of Rebirth, but he still has his uses here as an NPC. Red will sometimes use his limit, Stardust Ray, towards the end of fights, though I haven't noticed it having much of an impact. He will have more of an applied use a little later in this chapter, so it isn't all bad. But aside from being a guest member, he doesn't bring anything else to the table. They reunite with Barrett and make their way out, and when Red gets attacked by the entities, the ladies return. It turns out that this chapter's gimmick is that both the guys and gals are separated, and have to work together to create pathways for the other group so that they can navigate the drum and meet back up at the end. The means in which communication occurs between the parties is via the PHS terminals, 
going by the same name as the PHS system that allows the switching of party members in the original game. The girls head on up and activate the pods for the gents to get across, but not before commenting on Cloud's recent episodes. Once that is done, Red talks about Genova and how Hojo is obsessed with studying her. He refers to her as a calamity from the skies due to the fact that she is an alien. He also claims to know what fate is in store for these creatures. He could mean this in the way that their lives will only be full of suffering and pain, but he could also mean this literally, thanks to the knowledge that Aerith gifted him earlier. The rest of the chapter then boils down to switching between parties, fighting enemies here and there. There is the odd point of interest now and again, including Hojo's interest in Cloud, the girls weighing down a pipe, see, I told you they needed to lay off the Big Macs, and a short segment in which Red gets separated from Cloud and Barrett, which requires them to contact Tifa and Aerith so that they can help him. Beyond that, we have a nice heart to heart between Cloud and Barrett. This leads to them coming face to face with one of the bosses of this chapter. Yes, I said one of them. The Swordipede is yet another instance of a regular enemy from the original that has been given the boss treatment, and this one is cool in the fact that both phases of the fight play off of the gimmick that permeates throughout the chapter, switching between parties. The first phase consists of the Swordipede staying airborne, out of Cloud's effective range. But Cloud can use jump attacks, I hear you say. The problem with that is that the Swordipede resists melee attacks on its body, meaning that attacks have to be directed at its head, otherwise they'll bounce off. Magic is effective, but do you know what else is effective? Gun! Seeing as Barrett's attacks don't bounce off as he's shooting it from range, he is the ideal candidate for tackling this pest. When it reaches phase 2, it'll rip through the wall and head towards Red and the girls, forcing them into the fight. The parties were designed to both possess a ranged character so the fight is balanced in both phases, regardless of what materia your characters have equipped. Though despite the fact that you have the strongest magic character in the game with Arcane Ward as a means of producing double magic casts, the game evens the playing field as the arena benefits the boss's attacks, including this attack when the Sodapede goes all Beyblade on your arse. It's a neat fight, though definitely the weakest boss in this chapter, as the next three are excellent. After a dope transition, Aerith weirdly asserts that the elevators are safe, and they advance to where Cloud and Barrett are situated, amusingly struggling to break through the reinforced door. Speaking of that door, Aerith's hidden Herculean strength is enough to open it. With the crew reunited, they make their way back to where Sephiroth made his entrance, only to find the pod holding Genova to be destroyed, with the extraterrestrial woman missing. Other than the gorgeous particle effects, which this game nails by the way, the path in which Genova was taken is laid out by the mysterious goop on the floor. The track that plays when following this trail is called Trail of Blood, a remake of the original track by the same name. In the original, this name made sense, considering the trail you follow is that of, well, blood. Here it seems like another case of censorship which, as stated before, is odd, considering some of the subject matter that has been broached in this game, such as rape. But I digress. They take the elevator all the way to the 70th floor, which marks not only the landing pad in which they'll be extracted from, but also the president's office. It only seems fitting that we see the head honcho before we depart. We see that the glass window has been broken, as if something, or someone, has been thrown through it. It turns out that that is exactly the case as President Shinra is hanging onto the ledge, begging for his life. My understanding is that the whispers cast him through this window, as spoiler alert, he is supposed to die here, though this is because Sephiroth impaled him with a sword originally, so this is another change. For some reason, the whispers failed in their mandate, but there is precedence for them being capable of failure, as I will discuss soon enough. Something great to come from this, however, is Barrett's opportunity to finally confront President Shinra face to face. Thing is, I don't want your money. Please. Just let me live. Everything you want can be yours. I'm a man of modest dreams. Dropping you from 70 stories up would get me damn near the good. 
But not all the way. You want something more, don't you? More than this right here? Talk to me again like you know me. <laughs> Get on TV and tell them. Tell them what you did to Sector 7. That it was you who killed all those people. Then, you're gonna tell them the truth about Avalanche. That Avalanche ain't Wu Tai or anybody's puppet. That Avalanche fights for the people, the planet. That we fight to hold Shinra to account for its crimes. That is Avalanche. The filthy sewer rats who brought down a Goliath. You tell them that. As good as this moment is, it quickly loses its quality when Barrett allows the president to get behind his desk, as Barrett should be aware that he would likely have a panic button on hand, or in the case of what actually happens, a firearm. The game practically cheats here by having Barrett react later than he should considering his point of view, as he can clearly see Shinra priming to pull the gun on him even if we, as the audience, cannot. Not to mention that he should have his gun arm locked on him this entire time in order to prevent him from doing what he wants to do. This is basic stuff and Barrett is failing miserably at it. President Shinra uses this advantage to monologue and counter Barrett's talk about principles and ethics. His speech is cut short when he is run through with Sephiroth's blade. Considering that it was contrived that Barrett got caught off guard by a guy who he had his eyes trained on, it is just as contrived that President Shinra gets offed before he can capitalise on his advantage. Unfortunately, it gets worse. As Sephiroth is being protected by the Whispers, he powers through them to impale Barrett. Seeing as I want to end this segment on a high, I'll discuss my issues with it now. First off, baiting Barrett's death like this for an emotional moment feels incredibly cheap when the Whispers bring him back moments later. This is akin to how they handle Chewbacca's fake-out death in The Rise of Skywalker, and it just doesn't stick. The intent was to shock OG fans, as they wouldn't expect Barrett to get snuffed out like this, but the lack of commitment because of the Whispers course correcting soils it. But my bigger issue here is actually with President Shinra himself, more specifically his character as a whole. You see, the scene with him in Chapter 7 showed that he has the room to be a more complicated character, with deeper motives and intentions than just killing for money or power. And this scene here squanders that. This is true for the original also, by the way. But I feel like this critique falls on the remake most of all, as they had the freedom to improve on his character at base. But instead of just complaining about it, I want to explain what I mean. In storytelling, villains generally tend towards two very basic archetypes. One being a standard simplistic villain with easy to understand goals, often relating to conquering all life or destroying it. These characters are pure evil, and are often bested by pure altruism. The other type holds the more complicated villains, that seem sympathetic, ranging from being admirable in their villainy to being a fallen hero. Neither of these archetypes are intrinsically better than the other, but they can be seen as more or less appropriate than the other depending on the specific context it is used in. Case in point, this game follows a similar method in how it handles its antagonists as some of the other Final Fantasy games, in which there is a grounded human evil and a more fantastical deific evil. Examples would include Emperor Gestahl and his crazed scientist Jester Kefka from Final Fantasy VI, or Queen Bran and the furry Kuja from Final Fantasy IX. The strength of having two villainous forces like this, regardless of whether or not these villains are opposed to one another, allows the writers to include both archetypes at the same time. Both FF6 and FF9 kinda do this, and I think 6 does it more effectively, whereas I wasn't impressed with 9's writing in general. In 7's case, the game has both Sephiroth and the Shinra Corporation acting as the stereotypical black and white bad guys, when I believe it would benefit from one half following the more sympathetic villain perspective. As I am discussing President Shinra here, I'm sure you can guess which one I'm targeting. Seeing as Sephiroth's goal is to destroy the planet and gather all of its life energy into himself in order to obtain god status and careen himself off into the vacuum of space, 
eventually colliding with another planet full of intelligent, sapient life, only to repeat what Genova did to this planet, I think it is safe to say that Sephiroth can fulfil the role of ultimate bad guy, and he is, which is enhanced by his pure badassery. This would mean that Shinra could be a more complicated villain, and have motives that would still define him as evil, but perhaps hold views that even the heroes can sympathise with, even if they disagree with the methods he uses to obtain it. The problem is that President Shinra's entire goal is that he takes what he wants and discards that what he cannot have. They built President Shinra up to being a character that will utilise manipulation, media control and savvy business strategies to increase his lot in life, as well as ushering in the society that he wishes to have. Sure, he absolutely wants as much power as he can have, but that doesn't have to necessitate in him being so bland. A very specific example I have to compare with this is that of Tywin Lannister from George R. R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire franchise of books, or the more commonly consumed TV show Game of Thrones. For this case I will use the show specifically, but the same comparisons could also be drawn to the book counterpart. In the season finale of season 3, titled Misa, the leader of the Northern Armies, Rob Stark and other major characters have just been slaughtered at a wedding that was meant for his uncle from his mother's house, Edmure Tully. This was a dramatic yet logical throughline to a series of events that coalesced in all of Rob's personal errors regarding his choices throughout the war coming back to bite him, or stab him I guess. We discover that Walder Frey, the man responsible for organising this massacre, made a deal with Tywin Lannister, the man warring against Rob, because Rob insulted him by breaking an oath that he had to marry one of Walder's daughters by marrying a different woman instead, choosing love over duty. What would be a blissful option in most other fantasy stories would end up being one of his many critical errors in this more cynical world. When Tywin discusses the infamously dubbed Red Wedding with his son Tyrion in this scene, he explains why he made the choice he did. I'm all for cheating. This is war. But to slaughter them at a wedding, explain to me why it is more noble to kill 10,000 men in battle than a dozen at dinner. To save lives? To end the war. To protect the family. Throughout the story up to this point, we have generally seen the Starks as the protagonists, and the vast majority of people following the story see them as the heroes. So, logic would dictate that their enemies are the Lannisters, and they would be viewed as evil, and the show does tend towards depicting most of them to be cruel, spiteful and drunk on power. So when Tywin organises to have Rob killed at a wedding, showing complete disrespect to a guest, we obviously look upon Tywin with utter contempt. What matters here, however, is how Tywin justifies his choice by claiming that killing Rob, however unsavoury the method was, would have prevented the death of thousands more innocents, the rape of thousands of women, and the complete structural destruction of the realm. Of course, Tywin's first concern was his family and his own life, but that doesn't negate the fact that he uses sound logic here. The Northern armies were on a vengeance fueled warpath, and we literally see what they're capable of doing when Rickard Karstark killed two innocent Lannister boys in lieu of being unable to provide such justice to Jaime Lannister, who killed his son the season prior. Regardless of his reasoning, this action was despicable, and even Rob himself chides him on this. Those boys didn't kill your sons. I saw Harry and I on the battlefield, and Torrance was strangled by the Kingslayer. They were his kids. They were boys! Even if Tywin's motivation was purely selfish, stopping the war would have done a lot of good for the realm, but our personal infatuation and connection to the Stark family makes it difficult to acknowledge that, as it was the Lannisters that drew first blood. This setting is obviously far too nuanced to call Tywin a strict villain, but that is entirely my point. He is a character that is capable of performing both noble and villainous acts, and sometimes those two are more closely intertwined than one may think. The way in which this ties back to the FF7 remake is that President Shinra operates in a manner very similar to Tywin, where his power and resources can allow him to have full control of many parts of the world, orchestrated via his ability to spread media propaganda. By having the President justify his actions to Barrett as him taking the lives of tens of thousands to benefit hundreds of thousands more, as in, destroying Sector 7 allows Shinra to remove the only threat of them building Neo Midgar, 
a beautiful utopia in which all of the innocents may thrive. This could add a layer of depth that doesn't defend his actions as good, but still allows him to both benefit personally, whilst also helping the lives of the innocents that would participate in his utopia. A sacrifice to balance the scales, as Sung put it. Considering the false flags, and the Shinra gods making it seem like Avalanche were the ones that were trying to destroy the pillar, this would make the public flock to the corporation, and this would bolster the president's plan to build his new society. The president organised a mission that resulted in the deaths of tens of thousands, perhaps more, but if his primary goal is to snuff out Avalanche specifically, as they are the only threat to his new world, then the innocents who died would simply be seen as collateral damage to him. Having the president try to defend himself, and seem like the good guy here, would add another layer that makes him more compelling. He would still be evil, don't get me wrong, but he's just so on note that I can't find him intriguing. I mean, imagine a scene in which Barrett tells him to think of all of the innocents he condemned to death, only for the president to respond by saying that their deaths were unfortunate, but necessary, in order to rout your pathetic organisation. This could do wonders in generating a heated back and forth, in which they both challenge each other's worldviews, and we get a perspective of President Shinra that we haven't seen up until this point. And then, as Barrett says something that causes the President to doubt himself, or even reconsider his actions, a blade pierces the chest of the President, and any chance of having him redeem himself for all of the horrible things he has done is gone and the true villain emerges, one who has no desire to change, and only seeks suffering and agony. Look, I am in no way saying that I am a genius writer, nor am I saying that this is some kind of perfect rewrite, I am just trying to get across what I think is a massive waste of potential, and I hope people understand what I'm saying. As President Shinra should be more of a political player in this world, I also think he should be more complex to compensate and our more traditional, morally black villain would be Sephiroth, which would satisfy both the folks that want more complexity to the narrative and the characters, and those that just want a typical story of good versus evil. There are plenty of other villains that I could have used to elucidate this point, such as Emperor Palpatine from Star Wars, and Sauron from The Lord of the Rings when discussing more strictly evil villains with unsympathetic end goals to villains that have a lot more understandable reasonings for the evil actions they commit to, like Thanos from Marvel, or even Garo from One Punch Man. All of this is to support my point that President Shinra was sadly, quite lame. To bring us all the way back to the initial context though, killing off Barret here was clearly done as a way to get him out of the party so that there are only three members, plus Red, to fight this next boss. Brace yourselves, because this one is a doozy. The Genova Dreamweaver is one of the hypest fights in the game both due to its presentation and the pure nostalgia factor that it carries. In its first phase, it remains static in the centre of the arena, relying on ranged magic, crowd control abilities, and the incredibly annoying tentacles that protrude from it. Destroying the tentacles should be your main focus, as this will limit its capability to damage you, and opens it up to being pressured. It will often utilise this circle of energy that travels along the floor, which will inflict the stop status if a character lingers within it. It will track the player so constant movement is needed. This is particularly troublesome if you have laid down an arcane ward as Aerith, as you need to remain within the ward to double cast spells, so being forced out of it isn't ideal. Vengeance is a nasty projectile which does an absurd amount of damage, and is very difficult to dodge due to its speed and lack of a prominent tell. An interesting move is Rejection, which causes Genova to become completely immune to all magic damage until physical damage is dealt, in which she will respond with a devastating slash from an Astral Blade. Knowledge of this move will help so you can be prepared to dodge, as there is more than enough time to do so. The fight doesn't possess any real threat until it hits half health, upon which Phase 2 commences, in which it goes all cosmic horror as Genova will unleash tentacles across the arena which have to be dealt with in order to make her vulnerable again. 
In all honesty, this phase is quite bad, as failure to end the phase quickly during her vulnerability periods can lead to constantly having to deal with tentacles, which can happen for long periods. It is in phase 3 when the fight gets saucy, as she gains the ability to move positions, and her moveset deepens. As established in the phase transition, she can now shower the player in acid, which functions as a pretty large AoE when used. She will use everything she has to keep you zoned out, so get in there and slap her up until she's done. Oh, and before you say it, did you seriously think I would end this without mentioning the music? Say no more fam, I got you. Enjoy this absolute banger. As said, Barrett is revived by the Whispers, as Red states. Genova may be down, for now at least, but Cloud still has a score to settle with Sephiroth. Sephiroth turns out to be one of the robed men that we saw earlier, but not just anyone in particular. It was the same one scaring the kids in Sector 5, the one bearing the number 2 on his arm. This thing with the robed men is a confusing one, but best left discussing when it becomes more relevant in the story. Something cool here is that you can see the flaming wreckage of Sector 7 in the distance, a stark reminder of the damage caused. Cloud rejoins the others, but there is no rest for the weary as another problem makes itself known. The chopper is piloted by Reno and Rude and is carrying a VIP, or in this instance, the VP, Rufus Shinra. Not only does this provide an answer as to what the earlier scene with the Turks was for, but Rufus's introduction spells the end of one era for Shinra and the birth of another. Cloud tells Barrett to take Aerith and get her somewhere safe, along with the others, and elects to remain and buy them some time. Not only does this show how far Cloud and Barrett's friendship has gotten, as Barrett wants to stay behind and help him, but this also concludes the first part of Cloud's arc as he is willing to put his own life on the line to save the people he loves, the person he loves. Despite Barrett's reservations, he agrees, and leaves Cloud to do his thing. Just the two of us. Well, maybe three. The fight against Rufus is, I would argue, one of the strongest bosses in the game mechanically speaking, not to mention it carries with it a significant cool factor. The first phase involves dealing with both Rufus and his pet doggo Darkstar, 
Rufus is one of the few bosses that cannot be simply beaten by aggressively attacking him head on without a plan. You have to play by his rules, and as soon as you understand that, the fight becomes much more enjoyable. The reason why most people don't like this fight is because they don't understand how to fight him, and complain when he counters all of their attacks. That's right, I absolutely am saying that this is a skill issue, so cope with it. Your first course of action is to remove Darkstar from the equation, though Rufus won't let you do it that easily. The same tactic applies to the original game also, so this is one of those fights that was adapted very faithfully and improved upon. Rufus and Darkstar have incredible synergy, and a lot of their attacks are contingent on one another. Whenever Rufus takes some damage, Darkstar will simply heal him back up, though this doesn't happen the other way, hence why Darkstar should be dealt with first. They will often follow up on an attack that the other one performs, and this can be prevented by severing the link between them, which is visualised during the battle. If you beat Darkstar down considerably, Rufus will come in to protect his pupper. When you get Darkstar to half health, Rufus pulls this shit out of the bag, and the two of them gain a whole plethora of moves. For some reason, Rufus can utilise a whole series of moves based entirely on the coins that he has at his disposal. Such attacks include, but are not limited to, Bright Lights, which fires two lasers towards Cloud, which are easily avoided, Tread Softly, a move in which he combines with Darkstar to leave electrical traps on the floor which will stun Cloud if he is caught by them, and Thunderclap, a move in which Rufus channels Darkstar's lightning to fire a high tracking shot towards Cloud that will stun him on impact. These moves all have different effects and require different methods to handle, which serve to keep the player on their toes. It should be quite evident that Cloud is alone here, and as such has no support, so it is vital that he carry a healing materia to sustain himself. Once Darkstar is done, Rufus calls him off for some one-on-one -on -one time. Phase 3 is where it gets real exciting, and where the nuances of his mechanics reach the most interesting. You see, Rufus relies heavily on his movement, which is enhanced by his shotgun. He propels himself around the arena with his shots, occasionally stopping for an attack or two before reloading. The key here is to strike him whilst he's reloading, as any other time other than that will result in him countering you. Thankfully, the game tells you when he chooses to reload. Of course, he has a built-in defence if you keep hitting him whilst he is vulnerable, as a little visual effect indicates that he can now counter you. This phase will vary from easy as pie to incredibly frustrating if you don't know what his patterns are, so let me spell them out. He will shoot four times before he has to reload, with each one of his gun-based actions counting as one shot. For instance, when he propels himself, that is one shot. But even when he fires multiple bullets during Gun Akimbo, that still only constitutes as one shot. This is because the action itself is considered a shot, not each individual bullet. This means that so long as you keep a mental note of what his ammo count is, you should know when to capitalise. This is a bit harder than you think though, because if you stick close to him waiting for him to become vulnerable, then he will use a get off me move to create distance, and if you get hit by this whilst you aren't blocking, then you will be too staggered to benefit from his vulnerability window. This means that you have to remain astute, and keep your guard up as much as possible, and whilst he's reloading, you can instantly stagger him. The attacking question is Cloud's Braver, though this isn't the ultimate cheese you think it is. Sure, if you land it, it will make the fight almost trivial, but landing the actual attack is the entire struggle. Because of the wind-up, if you use this attack as Rufus starts his reload animation, then he will simply counter it, meaning that you will have to preemptively use the move when you know he is about to reload, not to mention being close enough to him in order for the attack to land. This is why memorising his ammo count is important, and this exploit is there to reward the player for being attentive. Whilst his ammo count is always consistent to 4 shots, he can buff himself using a move called Combat Load, which will increase his available shots from 4 to 6. This will only apply for that reload cycle, and is still easy enough to handle, but this little tweak to his pattern can throw players off should they expect him to only have 4 shots. All in all, the mechanics of this fight are great, and more importantly, are consistent. All of these elements coming together, with the strong balance of the fight, the cool factor, the badass music, and the context of the fight itself, make for one of the best bosses in the game, and one that doesn't get nearly as much love as it should. But with that, Cloud shows off his strength and bests the new president in one-on-one -on -one combat. Tifa comes to Cloud's rescue, 
and the game shifts us to the perspective of the others taking the elevator down. Something interesting here is a specific piece of characterisation for Aerith, as the explosion above prompts the group into being worried about the well-being of both Cloud and Tifa, or at least it is in the English localization. The original Japanese dub has Aerith scream, Karaudo, Cloud's name. Aerith knows full well that Tifa is up there too, as she would have told them that she intends to stay behind and help Cloud. So Aerith singling out Cloud for her concern shows that he is at the forefront of her mind, and this is consistent with her characterization throughout the original game and the novels, as a lot of her actions later in the story and even beyond her death are motivated by her love for Cloud as the driving force. So this isn't too far-fetched, especially seeing as the Japanese script is the original, which would mean that the English dub took out this nuance in favour of her having a generic line to worry about the both of them. It is stuff like this that leads to confusion regarding the narrative, and honestly due to all of the controversial shipping debates that spring from misinformation regarding the characters, I would lay the blame on poor translation, and this would be a damning indictment on the state of localization as a whole. That being said, we aren't out of the woods yet, as we have another boss to deal with, though this time we will have Barrett, Aerith and Red to handle it. Having the fight with the arsenal take place in a random room within the building, as opposed to on the elevator, is a considerable point in the remake's favour, as the elevator is a stupid place for a fight to occur. Not to mention, the original also had the Valkyrie fight take place there too, which was shifted to earlier instead. Fortunately, we move from one great fight to another, as the arsenal is another enjoyable foe. That being said, the foundation for this fight is built on the notion that the arsenal was ordered to kill them all. But don't they need Aerith alive? What happens if the arsenal squishes her, like, right here? That would completely screw their plans. Either way, this fight is strong because it tests certain skills from the player in the same way the Rufus fight did. Whilst that fight prioritised attentiveness and the ability to track the enemy's patterns, this one pushes the player into using their understanding of positioning and their ability to kite the boss's attacks between multiple characters. The fight begins with the arsenal guarded by three barrier drones that prevent the robot from taking damage. These pesky things need to be dealt with first, and that is quite straightforward for the two at its sides, as both Aerith and Barrett are ranged characters, and both of those drones are in the open. The third one behind is a little more tricky to deal with, as the arsenal turns to track the player, so splitting Barrett and Aerith up so they can enact a pincer strategy is the best play here. The arsenal is equipped with enough firepower to level a small town, and that is no more evidence than in its primary fire move, which deals devastating damage. To the player's luck, however, this arena is littered with cover that you can jump behind at will. This is useful for avoiding pretty much all of its moves. However, its primary cannon can tear through the rubble after about two or three shots, so you only have a limited amount of cover to utilise. Thankfully, you can damage the cannon as the shot is charging to prevent it, though it can try following up with another shot, so be on guard and counter that one too. Cover won't mitigate all of its attacks, as the homing lasers will go around it, so that is a manner in which the boss can level the playing field. Staying in one place for too long will enable the boss to place an electric trap down to stun the player, which is pretty troubling as this is one of its methods of flushing the player out of cover. Red can assist in taking the drones down, and when they are all dealt with, the boss decides to kick it up a notch. The arsenal takes advantage of its mobility more now, so avoid its charge. This gives it the opportunity to go around the cover and track down the player in a much more menacing fashion than before. In this phase, its wheels are still covered by barriers, so focus on the chassis instead. During its homing laser, you can damage it during the charge to prevent it from firing, though it is on its back, hence the difficulty in doing this. Of course, this only serves to support the strategy of diverting its attention to one of the selectable characters so that it can be targeted by the other. Phase 3 steps it up even further, and the laser destroys the support columns, which leaves more cover lying around, but those can be easily destroyed by its pulse cannon, so I think you would prefer having the column as it were. Pressuring the boss out of this attack will leave its wheels vulnerable, so this is a good time to deal with them. Piling on the pressure backs the bot into a corner, and it decides to use everything it has got. The firewalls tunnel you into one narrow path, and its ultimate attack, Cry Havoc, is absurdly powerful. With no more cover in sight, it is time to finish this tank off quickly. After quelling this juggernaut, we can finally take a breather. 
Prior to the Arsenal fight, Wedge witnesses the elevator fall and attempts to head down after them, but the whispers stop him in his tracks. Despite Wedge's best efforts to push through with motivation to fight for his friends, he isn't strong enough to do so. And as he apologises to Cloud, he is thrown through the window to his demise. In the original, Wedge is assumed to have been crushed during the fall of the plate, and Maiden of the Planet confirms his death. But in the remake, they elected to have him around for a bunch of reasons that we have already gone through. This wouldn't be so bad if the Whispers were not portrayed as trying to prevent any changes at all, but unfortunately, they are. So Wedge even making it this far is odd. Still, fate caught up with him, and he is now gone. Some people, new players and old, strangely didn't seem to grasp that this is his death scene, because I guess the sound of glass smashing and the fact that he was on the 64th floor wasn't obvious enough. Barrett, Aerith and Red find their way to the ground floor, and find themselves surrounded by Shinra guards. Cloud makes his entrance in the most badass way possible, atop the bike that could be seen earlier, and Tifa arrives soon after, in a vehicle that isn't quite as badass. They then make their grand getaway. The final chapter begins, and the party witnessed the Shinra building being surrounded by whispers, which I would presume is some form of gathering to indicate the significance of the events that follow. We then cut to both Rufus and Sung. Rufus reacts to the presence of the whispers, but a deliberate shot shows that Sung is blissfully ignorant of them. When we come back to the party, Barrett asks after Wedge, but there isn't any time to think about things that have occurred as a monumental force of Shinra guards is headed their way. It is time for another motorcycle segment, this one being a remake of the one from the original that functioned in pretty much the same way. I've already been over how it works, but this one is a definite improvement over the last one, as the spectacle is more varied and action-packed. The drawback is that it is significantly longer, and does sort of overstay its welcome. As we near the end, our first boss of the chapter bursts onto the scene, the Motorball. In the original, the motorball was fought on foot, but here they elected to incorporate it into the bike gameplay. On one hand, this helps with keeping the boss design fresh, but on the other, the difficulty in dealing with the depth perception and the repetitive structure of the fight holds it back from being great. Overall though, this segment is great for a first playthrough, though Square Enix, in their infinite wisdom, recognised that allowing the player to skip the tedium on repeat run-throughs was preferable. Eventually, Cloud and Red combine to finish off the Infernal Machine, and it plummets into the darkness below. The party disembark and head forwards, eventually being confronted by the Silver Swordsman once again. Okay, asshole, let's... Don't! And you... You're wrong. Those who look with clouded eyes see nothing but shadows. Everything about you is wrong. <laughs> All born are bound to her. Should this world be unmade, so too shall her children. The world won't end today. For you. You will. And 
listen. The whispers let out an unholy screech, and we get a remade scene of Zack's iconic last stand against Shinra, though we see the whispers surrounding Midgar, which is similar to what is happening in the present right now, likely indicating that Midgar is currently some kind of nexus point in which fate centres itself. Before Zack attacks the troopers, it cuts back, and Sephiroth opens a portal with his sword, Virgil style, before issuing a challenge towards Cloud. As Cloud is about to follow him, Aerith pulls him back, warning him that after this point, there is no turning back. She steps forward, and I can only assume that she purifies the portal, perhaps making it safe to go through, and explains the stakes. With Sephiroth casting the whispers aside with ease earlier, it is safe to say that he is going against fate, because he is fated to die by Cloud's hand at the end of the original game, and defeated again in Advent Children. The case of livestream novels seem to imply that Sephiroth's consciousness persists in the livestream, and the opening of the remake also implies that he cast his consciousness back to that point in time, proven by Aerith's different reaction at the time. Aerith, in the livestream, sensed this disturbance, and followed him back, giving her past self the memories she would need to defeat him again. This would all seem to lead into Aerith preserving fate with the intention of making sure that Sephiroth cannot win, as opposed to letting him have the chance for victory. However, this isn't the case at all. Aerith makes many statements that would show her as being anti-fate, from her saying that the future isn't set in stone, to literally attacking the Harbinger of the Whispers shortly afterwards. This would seem out of character, but actually, Aerith, throughout the compilation, always shows that she has an optimistic view of the future. Her future. But as we all know, she doesn't make it that far. I believe that this is Aerith struggling with the idea that fate should be left to stop Sephiroth's victory, even though she knows that this will lead to her death, whereas she wants to live and have a happy ending, and so wants to defy fate even knowing that this would risk Sephiroth succeeding. As it happens, I think this is an incredibly good dilemma for her character, and actually injects more humanity into an altruistic character like her, as even if she doesn't want to be the self-sacrificial type, if it can be avoided. Oh, and for your information, it could be avoided. Aerith didn't have to die for the heroes to succeed in the original. The only reason Holy didn't work was because it was activated too late. Defeating Sephiroth earlier, or preventing him from getting the Black Materia at all, would have meant that the livestream didn't need to be used. And, by extension, Aerith didn't need to die. Aerith's death was a tragedy for the characters to deal with and overcome, as opposed to being necessary for the plot. Hell, if Aerith lived, she might have been able to prevent Cloud from handing over the Black Materia in the first place, and could have helped fix his psyche earlier, which she really wanted to do. Not to mention having her around would have made the final battle that much easier. In summary, I believe Aerith's decision here is her attempt to find a happier ending for herself, on top of preventing Sephiroth from gaining more power. With the characters feeling motivated to continue, they head forward, and we prepare for the home run. An interesting tidbit here is in how all of the characters react to entering the portal. Cloud and Tifa do so begrudgingly, untrusting of what lies beyond. Aerith and Red, the ones that understand the magnitude of what lies ahead, and the ones that are confident in their decision to oppose fate, walk through without concern. And Barrett goes last, contemplating about what he should do, before vowing to return to Marlene and following the others beyond the pale. They arrive in what appears to be the same location, but before long, the world seems to collapse around them. The Whispers come together and form the Whisper Harbinger, the physical representation of the entity that controls them. This would be the point where I discuss why the Whispers couldn't stop certain things from occurring, and the answer is quite simple. They aren't omnipotent. The Whispers are simply vessels that do their best to keep the flow of time consistent to how it was set to be from the planet, though they can be surpassed, and that is our goal here. Cloud finds his way to Tifa and Barrett, and the Harbinger spawns three Guardians, named Rubrum, Viride, and Crosseo. These Guardians seem to have copied the traits of the three members in front of them. Rubrum mimics Cloud, wielding a sword. Viride mimics Tifa, with a large gauntlet, 
and Croseo mimics Barrett with twin cannons. Of course, this is the normal interpretation of what they represent, but another interpretation is that they are reflections of the Sephiroth remnants from Advent Children, Kadaj, Luz and Yazoo. Kadaj wields a two-pronged katana and would represent Rubrum. Luz wields a gauntlet and therefore would perfectly match Veride. And finally, Yazoo wields guns, which matches Croseo. To add to this, the description of the Whisper Triumvirate suggests that they were created to protect the future that gave birth to them. The remnants are created and found in the North Cave two years after Sephiroth's death, meaning that they currently don't exist, and as such may never exist if the heroes succeed in overthrowing fate. As for the fight, it can be quite chaotic handling the three of them at once, but it isn't something you'll have to do for very long, as the Harbinger splits up the fight like a school teacher dealing with some bothersome students, and the party has to flee upwards. All three of the Guardians have difficult moves to handle, some of which are as follows. Rubrum's Flurry, as it hits multiple times, Veridi's Azure Plume, which causes lightning to appear at the highlighted areas surrounding it, and Croseo's Amber Whirl, a paired laser blast that can send the player flying. It is also worth noting that all three of these Guardians are completely and utterly immune to a select element each, with Rubrum being immune to fire, Veridi to lightning, and Croseo to wind. Hitting them with their respective element will cause them to absorb it, which is relatively uncommon in this game as far as bosses go. They can use their respective spells as well, or at the very least the most powerful versions of them, also known as the Arga variation. After destroying Rubrum in a 3v1 this time, this causes a piece of the Harbinger to crumble away, proving that not only are the party capable of defeating it, but that this is also done by destroying the Guardians. Aerith and Red rejoin the party, and a barrage of rays travel from the Harbinger and burrow their way into the heads of the party members, showing us a vision of the future. Red's statement confirms his understanding of events, and also confirms that even in a future in which he and his young survive, he still consider this a bad end for all involved, and vows to fight against it. The party are split up once again, Cloud, Barrett and Red tackle Veride and Croseo, whilst Aerith and Tifa fight Rubrum. After a haunting vision of Meteor falling towards the planet, Cloud protects the women from Rubrum, and the party makes their plans. The final phase of this fight is initiated by the three Guardians fusing together to become... Bahamut. If the Guardians are meant to be a reference to the Remnants, then their fusion is likely referential to Bahamut's Sin, whose summon materia was held by Kadaj in Advent Children. Either way, this is likely the first time that most players will have faced Bahamut in this game, so it can be quite difficult as most of its attacks are difficult to avoid, and its ultimate attack, Mega Flare, can even wipe out the entire party if the characters haven't been levelled a lot. Defeating the Whisper Bahamut will unfuse the Guardians, and now is the time to finish them off. As each of the Guardians fall, more visions will stem from the Harbinger, with Cloud facing off against Sephiroth, Aerith's Prayer for Holy, and, most importantly of all, Cloud laying Aerith to rest in the Glade. The fact that the last of these visions directly refers to Aerith's death, and it is this moment in particular that hangs over the head of the narrative like the Sword of Damocles, is why I strongly believe that one of the core reasons for the remake existing as a new story is so that Aerith will survive, though this can be explored further later. Eventually, the Harbinger is toppled. Destroying the Harbinger seems to teleport the party to the White Dimension. But finally, after 18 chapters of this game, the true villain enters the ring. I'm waiting, Cloud. <gasps>
In the scene, we see Sephiroth channel what is left of the Harbinger into himself, bolstering his already insane power. Sephiroth lifts the wreckage around them with a flick of his hand, and throws them at the party. With them separated, Sephiroth bears down on his intended target, Cloud, and the final battle commences. What can be said that hasn't already been uttered a thousand times by other people? Sephiroth is badass, and his fight is really good too, so let's talk about it. The first phase pits Cloud and Sephiroth together in a one-on-one -on -one fight, and Seph is a very formidable opponent to fight without assistance. He has access to a broad range of spells which require different methods of dealing with. For instance, blocking Faraga can work, but timing a dodge might be better but you absolutely have to block the initial hit from Blizzarga as the range and tracking on that spell is far too strong. Just make sure to dodge after the first block. Sephiroth prefers to fight with his sword, Masamune, however, so beware. His primary attack is Telluric Flurry, which can be countered with both the natural counter from Punisher Mode and counter stance from the Twin Stinger. Aeolian Onslaught, on the other hand, requires you to block the first hit and dodge the second, but the timing has to be precise. Sometimes, if you attempt to strike him with normal attacks, he will be prompted to deflect your blows with ease, which just looks really damn cool. On occasion, Sephiroth will knock Cloud to another part of the area in order to spice up the spectacle of the fight, though Cloud will do the same back if you stagger him, which is quite easy to do in the first phase. As for his second phase, he hits Cloud with a few judgement cuts, propelling him backwards before attempting to hurl a rock at him. Thankfully, it is none other than our sweet little Aerith to save his skin, though there is a bit more to it than that. You see, depending on your choices throughout the game and your playtime on the party members in the previous fight with the Whisper Harbinger, you might get someone else here and before the start of Phase 3. For instance, favouring Tifa both throughout the game and playing as her for an extended spell during the previous boss will almost certainly net her as your first addition. I'm sure the same could be said for Barrett, but I didn't get any footage for that. Either way, all that matters is that you will have three party members by the end of it, with the fourth member that didn't make the cut joining after the fight alongside Red. For the sake of this story synopsis, and for the sake of canonical continuity, I would say that Aerith comes first, and then Tifa joins in, with Barrett and Red coming in later. I like this scene here because Aerith teases Cloud, but when he responds, she chuckles at it. This is because she clearly knows that he is being sarcastic, and sees it as his way of being pleased to see her, and her insult towards Sephiroth is also cool. For his second phase, he is fairly similar, but he is no longer susceptible to being stunned when countering his Telluric Flurry, though the damage mitigation is the same. He gains the ability to throw energy blasts from his sword, and a new move called Hell's Gate where he leaps into the air and thrusts his sword into the ground in which certain areas are marked for damage. Sustained aggression pushes him into phase 3, in which he spawns his legendary wing, and traps the both of them in a gravity well. Before long, Tifa joins the fray, and with three members ready to fight, this is where the real shit begins. Sephiroth can now infuse himself with any of the four main elements, which not only renders him completely immune to said element, but gives him an ability that is themed to that element. For instance, Fire Infusion allows him to use Firewall, a wall of fire that separates part of the arena, and can zone certain characters off. The infusions can be used against him. As you might recall, when an enemy is immune to a specific element, they are more than likely weak to the opposing element, and that rule also applies here. If he is feeling particularly cruel, he'll use Octa Slash, a rapid slash attack that does a truckload of damage. After beating him down further, you'll see that he is not quite done yet, as Phase 4 begins. You can see that consuming the energy from the Harbinger has allowed him to have some control over the Whispers to a degree, and thus proves my point about them not being omnipotent. He summons a flaming ball of energy from the sky, which could be Meteor, though I doubt it considering its significance in the story, and I doubt it is Supernova either. Can you imagine if Supernova was this weak source? 
Sephiroth vacates the ground in favour of the air, and relies on moves such as his Shadow Flares, which engulf the arena in gravity orbs that draw the player into them. One of his attacks centres around him, sending the Whispers to damage and lock down a character. And they do a lot of damage, though he also has his famous Heartless Angel, which casts his sword onto the ground, reducing the HP of anyone caught in the vicinity to 1, which prompts immediate healing. You'll notice the countdown above his head, that is his ultimate move for this fight, named Divine Proclamation, which calls down the Death Ball from above, resulting in an instant game over. Though I think it is harder to get caught by this than it is to actually beat him as it takes an eternity for him to parry up all the way. Sephiroth sits in the hall of great final bosses in video games, alongside the likes of Virgil, Slave Knight Gale, and Senator Armstrong, to name a few. Of course, time will only tell about whether or not his future fights will be any good, but for now, if this fight is any indication of what we can expect going forward, then we shall be eating good in Rebirth and Beyond. The team unites to finish him off, and as they clear the path for Cloud, Sephiroth smiles before Cloud's blow lands, which lets us know that he was clearly sandbagging the whole time. It certainly explains why this fight isn't all that difficult. A huge blast of light erupts from the impact, and a shot not too dissimilar from the prelude to the final, final fight from the original game occurs, in which Cloud falls into some kind of pocket dimension, and... Okay, I'll be real with you here. This is the most convoluted part of the plot. I know that this is obvious to most people, and the Final Fantasy games are known for their abstract and weird narrative choices sometimes. Hell, even the original game suffers from this too so don't pretend that that game gets away with it. But I truly find it difficult to comment on the logistics of what's happening here. This is because messing with destiny and time travel as plot devices damages your script, and it rarely works for a narrative. It certainly makes my job much harder, to say the least. So, for the time being, I'll let the game speak for itself. <laughs> lies ahead does not yet exist. Our world will become a part of it one day, but I will not end. Nor will I have you end. This is... The edge of creation. Cloud, lend me your strength. Let us defy destiny together. Seven seconds till the end. Time enough for you, perhaps. But what will you do with it? Let's see. The few things that I have gathered from this scene are as follows. Sephiroth here has already seen Cloud use Omnislash before, as he was killed by it the first time and countered that exact same attack in Advent Children meaning his ability to deftly counter it here makes a lot of sense. The ominous line Sephiroth utters here is stated to be referring to the amount of time Cloud has to leave the edge of creation, 
and is the amount of time he has in order to make a choice, as it will. Personally, I much prefer the more accepted interpretation in that it refers to the length of time it takes for Sephiroth to kill Aerith once he appears in the original game, and how, time enough for you, refers to Cloud being able to save her if he doesn't freeze up in fear like he did originally. Lastly, as it pans out, a nebula shaped like the Yellow Lily can be seen in the background. The next few scenes are there to set us up for future events, as well as providing some fan service too. We see Rufus taking the head of the Shinra Corporation, with the board members ready to heed his new orders. Hojo stands looking at the now vacant capsule once containing Genova, as the other scientists try to repair all of the damage that has occurred. Hojo, instead of being frustrated, actually laughs maniacally, as this outcome was more than he could have hoped. And then we return to the outskirts of Midgar, to the battleground in which Zack met his demise, or where he should have met his demise, that is. To his own surprise, he bested the large outfit that was sent for him, and despite holding some injuries, he's still alive and kicking. A rather deliberate shot is shown of a crisp packet floating past him bearing the likeness of Stamp, the mascot dog that we have seen before. Unlike the mascot we have seen previously though, this one looks very different, which likely means that this is happening in an alternate timeline, and there is more evidence to support this too. An explosion sends Zack flying backwards, and we see that the whispers that were once surrounding Midgar are gone, vanished in a wave of light. The whispers have been defeated for good. The people in the slums are doing their best to adjust to the chaos in the past week, and a lot of the people have participated in efforts to provide relief and shelter for those displaced from the platefall. Just like with Zack, Maul and the others witness a shower of golden particles falling gently down to the ground, indicating a significant change in the rules of the world. We pan through the Sector 5 orphanage to find none other than Biggs, in the bed and still alive. Not just him though, but also Jessie too, as her gloves lie on the cupboard next to him. As for Wedge, I'm not too sure, but I do have a theory attached to these scenes that I will divulge much later which will hopefully help to explain what is actually happening amongst this confusion. Marlene is seen watering the flowers in Aerith's room, and as Elmira calls her down for food, she stops, and turns towards the flower before hearing her father's voice through the flower. It then cuts to Barrett's perspective, with him vowing to come back. We see our party reformed, on the outskirts of Midgar, ready to step headlong into the next stage of their journey. Raindrops begin to fall, and as the opening beats of Hollow begins to play, we see Zack carrying Cloud towards Midgar, with a symbolic shot of Cloud and Aerith walking past them, which seems to show that these are functioning on different timelines. As they head off away from the city, Aerith gives us our closing line. The unknown journey will continue. Well, there it is. It only took 66,000 words to cover, but the plot is now dealt with. So, in summary, what are my thoughts on the story as a whole? Well, for starters, the game does a great job of taking advantage of the remake format in order to flesh out certain aspects of the story that couldn't be achieved in the original, either due to time constraints, budget or hardware limitations, not knowing what kind of depth to add to scenes, or perhaps all of the above. These would include the trip to the Sector 7 plate in order to get bomb materials for Jesse, which was completely absent from the original in favour of simply heading straight for the Sector 5 reactor, the scenes with Leslie and his backstory, and the underground lab in Chapter 13. These aren't necessarily incredible additions, but there is no harm in fleshing out certain aspects of the game either for plot, character or gameplay purposes. In some cases, these are blatant improvements. For example, the warehouse raid in Chapter 4 is absolutely an improvement as it fulfils many angles. The party heading off to the Sector 5 reactor immediately after handling the Sector 1 reactor in the original game was incredibly jarring, as a plan of that calibre would take some serious planning, so slowing this plot detail down and giving the characters excuses to get more materials actually benefits the narrative here. As Cloud doesn't get reminded of the promise to Tifa by her in this game, they simply move it to this chapter instead, 
Not to mention that this chapter also serves to foreshadow Cloud's eventual Mako poisoning by introducing it in the form of Jesse's sick father. To top all of this off, it serves as a means for Jesse's guilt about the reactor bombing to be brought up and remedied. Not all of the new additions in chapters are necessary additions, or at the very least could have been shortened or tweaked to be more consumable from a gameplay perspective, but as a whole, the content and pacing of the story is more than acceptable. Views on the contrary be damned. In terms of the work itself, I always break down a story into four key categories, that being plot, character, world, and theme. I have been over the plot in somewhat exhaustive detail, and for the most part it holds up quite well, though the last few chapters do ratchet up the contrivances and messy writing, as well as going all in on the concept of fate, which is very difficult to write, and based on how it was executed here, I think I would have preferred them to stick to the original story in that regard. I generally prefer more subdued storytelling, with more grounded rules as it helps me remain invested if I can understand the logistics. Of course, the plot device in the form of the Whispers exists solely to justify Rebirth and this installment as being sequels to the original game's story, so I can let this change slide as it does seem like they're going to do something with it. Although this critique will remain as a time capsule of sorts, in order to catalogue my understanding of the game's narrative as it stands right now, so if the other parts completely fuck the story up, it will be amusing to rewatch this to see how little I got right about certain parts. As for the rating of the plot, considering that the first half is a very strong remake of everything you would expect from the original, with some new stuff sprinkled in for added depth, but let down some in terms of quality for the ending, I would say that it is pretty damn solid for the most part. The real strength of this game's story comes from its characters though, and we'll be talking about them soon, don't you worry, as they're almost all excellent. The world building is also very good, though most of this is fortified in the parts of the story going forward. It is difficult to talk about the world building as a whole here when we spend our entire time cooped up inside one city, but our understanding of the Shinra Corporation the many factions in play, the use of Mako and energy production, which, in turn, set up story beats where other resources are acknowledged, and the life of the poor and disenfranchised are all delved into here in sufficient detail. The DLC will go a little further in bolstering what we already have, but I was satisfied with what I learned from the game about its setting, and I certainly felt immersed. Remember when I brought up that little tidbit about how Midgar used to run on more traditional means of power, such as through fossil fuels? And how the characters claiming that the tech is ancient helps to instill just how much Mako has taken over the city. With it being so fundamental to city life that fossil fuels and such got pushed to the wayside, as they were completely obsolete in comparison? Yeah, well, that is what I mean by world building. Something that most people would gloss over, but a detail that helps to enrich the world to someone like myself, and that is worth praising. In summary, I have tackled two of the four major components of the story, with the other two being dealt with later, and I would argue that the plot and the world building even out to being, well, decent. Solid, even. I don't think the plot is the strength in any Final Fantasy game, and this is one of the few Final Fantasy games that has good world building from the ones I have played so I would like to think that he get off well here. As said before, the real strength of this game comes from its stellar cast of characters, and I think it is about time that we move on to them, shall we? For this segment, I will be talking about the main cast of characters that we play as in the party, as well as some of the other notable characters that have enough of a presence within the story to warrant discussion. Seeing as he wasn't playable and was introduced so late, I won't be including Red 13 in this segment, though he will obviously be discussed in Rebirth and beyond. For starters, I think it is apt to begin this segment by talking about the protagonist of this game, Cloud Strife. The main star of the show is none other than the blonde-haired soldier boy himself, Cloud Strife. He is often rather maligned as a character, especially when compared to the other, more charismatic protagonist of the compilation, but I find this preposterous as he is arguably the most well-defined character, especially as far as character arcs are concerned, and I'll go over that now. 
For starters, Cloud begins his journey as a mercenary, formerly of Shinra's elite task force known as Soldier, and he agrees to assist Barrett with his goal to destroy the many reactors that populate the city's infrastructure in exchange for money. He is called Callus, and cares not one whit about the planet or its plight. In Barrett's own words, this made Cloud like the worst person he has ever met. Deep down, however, Cloud is someone who has had a difficult childhood, being constantly ostracised due to the villagers' views on his father whom we never meet, and this sin is passed down onto Cloud. Despite his mother's love, his lack of a mentor figure in the form of a father, and his own awkward nature, made it difficult to foster relationships with the other children in Nibelheim, especially with Tifa, who was the most popular girl in their age group, and honestly, one of the few actual girls of their age group. Despite the confusion on this topic, Cloud's motivation for befriending Tifa was more so in order to get into her friend group rather than getting into her pants, for as she noticed him, then the other guys would as well. One evening, Cloud invited Tifa to the well in the centre of town, and told her of his plan to leave and join Shinra, with the aim of becoming a soldier, just like his hero, Sephiroth. Cloud's journey through Shinra is something that will be deliberated upon when they become more relevant in the story, so for now I'll bring us back to the remake. After the destruction of Mako Reactor 1, Cloud encounters both Sephiroth and Aerith, which serves as both Cloud's meeting of these characters for the first time narratively, but also these two characters are involved in the time travel shenanigans that perpetuate the story. With that in mind, Cloud is accosted by Sephiroth, with his mental state sent into decline, only for Aerith to bring him back up. Cloud shows immediate interest in Aerith, which will be expanded upon as they spend more time together later in the story. He rejoins the others as they return to Sector 7, and meets back up with Tifa, as she was the one to recommend the Sector 1 reactor job to him in the first place. After spending time helping the folks of the slums out, he and Tifa retire to discuss what he did after leaving Nibelheim, and he divulges the truth that Shinra aren't like what he expected them to be, and by the time he entered, they weren't seeking heroes anymore as the war with Wutai was over. With Cloud embarrassed and ashamed for failing his mandate, he felt as though he had no purpose anymore, and as such began seeking the life of mercenary work so that he could put his talents to use in order to bolster his own gains. Of course, we know that Cloud is only partly telling the truth, though this isn't exactly his fault as his memory is tarnished and unreliable. It is only when Cloud meets Aerith again does his arc truly begin, as he finds a purpose in his life, and one that would inform his development with the others too. One of the reasons why I see the church fall as being the inciting incident is entirely because it begins Cloud's arc, and it is his arc that pushes the plot forward significantly, for if he doesn't meet Aerith, and if she didn't attempt to join him in Chapter 9, then he would have headed back, collected his money, and more than likely moved on to greener pastures outside of Midgar. He had no compulsion to stay, not even for Tifa's sake, but it is his connection to Aerith and his desire to save her after she gets captured that propels himself and the others into discovering Sephiroth's plans, and in knowing this, cements his choice to go after Sephiroth beyond Midgar. Whilst most of Cloud's character comes to a head later, I find him to be such a strong character as his flaws are well presented to the audience, and it is his weaknesses that drive him forward as a character. He never had an easy upbringing, he never knew his father, lost his mother in his hometown during his teen years, had no friends to rely upon for the most part, watched his one best friend die in front of him before losing his memory of him entirely, and had to watch his childhood hero kill the woman he loved. On top of having to keep fighting beyond that, with geostigma and depression and what have you, Cloud did the right thing even when he knew he wouldn't get a happy ending, though one may presume that this will change, and for Cloud's sake, I hope it does. If you asked me what my favourite character is in FF7, or even what my favourite female character is in gaming as a whole, I would say Aerith. This is due to her not only being such a sweet, likeable little bean, but also due to her inner strength, as she is one of the most mentally stalwart characters within the story. Aerith is known for her bubbly, extroverted nature, but that only belies the tragedy that she harbours below the surface. 
As the last survivor of the Cetra, she holds a great deal of pressure in keeping her legacy alive, both literally and figuratively. And she also feels the need to fight against Sephiroth and his plans, no matter the risk to her own life in the process. This is one of the driving forces of her character choices throughout the original story. Does she uphold her duty, and fight against Genova even if that means risking her life, or does she focus on her own wants and desires, by seeking friends, seeking a family, and something that will make all of her years of suffering and loneliness worth it? This is the sort of narrative arc and conflict that she faced in the original, and the remake adds the layer of fighting against fate too. Now that she knows of her fate, and the successful outcome that led to, does she steer that path, knowing that she will die and won't get her happy ending? Or does she resist fate, knowing that this risks Sephiroth claiming victory in the end? This is the sort of impetus that I expect to drive her character going forward, but as for this game, I was incredibly pleased with the extra bites of her character that they offered, with some prime examples being the language of flowers scene, which gives her a chance to get her anxieties off her chest, and the scene in which her fears of abandonment are brought to the forefront. I am a fervent defender of her honour as a character, especially when many sociopaths on Twitter would label her as mean, selfish and manipulative. Sadly, most of these people have an agenda against her, and most only say these things to prop up Tifa, as they're obsessed with making Tifa look perfect as opposed to the naturally flawed character that she, and everyone else is. In the end though, it only makes sense that Aerith is one of the strongest characters in the game as far as actual character goes, and the remake does a brilliant job at expanding upon both her strengths, as well as her innate weaknesses too. Most people know Tifa well enough by now, and frankly it does annoy me a little that Aerith gets pushed to the side in discussions about strong female characters in place of Tifa, as I feel too many people assert that a strong female character has to be physically impressive as opposed to being well characterised. But thankfully Tifa isn't anything of the sort. She is a good character, and one that exists to show the importance of responsibility in characters. What I mean by this is that Tifa is part of one of the most interesting parts of the story, that being Cloud's internal struggle with his identity. One of the things I like, and unfortunately the compilation squanders this, is Tifa's acceptance that she was one of the main reasons that played a hand in Cloud's issues that perpetuated throughout his adult life. She didn't accept him into her friend group, and turned a blind eye to the suffering visited upon him by others in the village. She wasn't the main individual at fault, but she was complicit in it. In the original, it was clear that she wanted to make up for lost years and her own faults at pushing him away by trying to keep him close and assisting him with his journey. Though this resulted in her withholding important information that could have helped with him fixing his mental state earlier. Eventually, after bringing the truth to light, they held a much stronger understanding about one another and healed their relationship for good. Well, until Case of Tifa, that is, because she then starts trying to guilt trip him into having feelings for her, and berates him for still feeling depressed about Aerith and what have you. But as I said, the compilation doesn't do much for her as it undoes her arc, but I do like how she is someone that holds a great deal of guilt within her, and how she struggles to heal that relationship with Cloud, which causes him to falter further and it propels the story forward. As with the Deuteragonists, most of her development comes in future instalments, but the game does a good job at making her endearing and offering up the opportunity to make people understand where her depth comes from, as most people seem to only know her from that Italian Senate meeting. A lot of people would describe Barrett as being the most underappreciated character in the remake, and it is easy to see why. He is charismatic, an emphatic leader, and a loving father. Barrett came across as rather simple in the original, and would often be depicted as being a fool, but the remake made him much more competent as a leader. Having Barrett openly challenge Shinra in multiple scenes, with him not afraid to apply his worldview makes him an engaging character to watch on screen. Obviously, I was critical of the scene with President Shinra in Chapter 17, but there was plenty of room for improvement here with a slight alteration to the writing. Part of Barrett's character is tied to his daughter, Marlene, who clearly has a significant role to play as evidenced by the scene with Aerith in Chapter 12, not to mention by her scenes in the original as well. 
The ending scene with her reacting to Barrett's voice through the flower shows that she has more power than what she lets on, and likely has some subtle ties to the Cetra in some form. This is something that the sequels will need to address, but more on that later. As for Barrett, I can see Square giving him a lot more room for growth during Corel, and his relationship with Dine will be interesting to see. His personal strength and boisterous confidence allows him to steal scenes even when Cloud is in frame, as despite Cloud's role as the protagonist, it is Barrett that is the outspoken one. As with all of the other characters, Barrett will hopefully have his role expanded and fleshed out further due to the opportunity that Rebirth and Beyond provides. For now though, I know who is receiving my Father of the Year award. Sorry Dad. Few names strike utter terror in fans of the RPG genre, and fewer still hold such infamy in the minds of gamers than Sephiroth, the one-winged angel. Sephiroth's evocative demeanour and badass design helps to exemplify him as a potent villain, and the remake takes it up a notch by having his villainy transcend time itself. On one hand, this can be a cause for concern on the writing front as time travel is a stone best left unturned, generally. Though, in this context, giving Sephiroth a much larger presence helps to truly represent the danger he creates, and leaves ample room for his growth in power in subsequent instalments. Sephiroth's enhanced presence in this segment of the story is most likely down to his exploits in the novel On the Way to a Smile, during the case of livestream chapters, in which Sephiroth tampers with the livestream beyond his death at the hands of Cloud, and sets events in motion that inform the story of Advent Children, and potentially more. You see, it is theorised that as traces of Sephiroth still exist in the livestream, he managed to harness and send his essence backwards in time granting his younger self memories and power in order for him to overcome fate and achieve his ultimate goal, dominion over all life. This seems quite plausible when you cross-reference this theory with the line that Red 13 delivers here. Whispers, perhaps best described as arbiters of fate. They are drawn to those who attempt to alter destiny's course and ensure they do not. The flow of the great river that is the planet, from inception to oblivion. Red states that the Whispers monitor the flow of time from the genesis of the planet to its eventual end, whenever that may be. As the Whispers are agents of the livestream, vessels that were created to assert its will, this means that time itself is intrinsically linked to the livestream. If, say, one were powerful and competent enough to understand and traverse the livestream, then they would presumably be able to travel through time as well. It is this understanding of the rules, combined with Aerith's side of the story in case of Livestream White, that also show why Aerith knew the things that she did, as she would have also sent her consciousness back too, in order to warn her younger and currently alive self about Sephiroth and his plan, and give the heroes the chance to counteract it. This is why Aerith has many moments throughout the story where it seems like she knows about events that are yet to transpire. Aerith and Sephiroth are polar opposites to one another, yet also appear as mirror images. Both Aerith and Sephiroth have green eyes, both of them have bangs in their hair, both of them have links to Cetra and Genova in some form, and both of them carry the white and black materia, respectively. Seeing as this opposition has already been framed in the case of livestream chapters as part of the book, On the Way to a Smile in 2009, the narrative that the remake offers has clearly been in the planning for years. Hell, I would even go as far as saying that the idea of the characters defying fate and having another go at things likely stretch back to the original idea of remaking the game around the time Advent Children was initially released in 2005. As a tech demo for a potential PS3 remake of Final Fantasy VII was showcased, and seeing as Advent Children was released the same year in which the case of livestream stories were set around, this would make it seem like they were preparing this story for quite a long time. This is, of course, mere speculation on my part, as there is no confirmation for this, but when you consider some of the developers' notes on the story, and Nojima's insistence on making the next game in the titular franchise, Final Fantasy VIII, a more positive and hopeful one as far as the ending was concerned, then the purpose behind the narrative changes becomes more logical. Don't forget that the reasons for the remake's delays were more of a matter of studio issues as opposed to the team's lack of desire to create a new story to embellish 
and complete the tale of one of the most beloved games to ever exist. To bring this back to Sephiroth, despite the obvious concerns to changes regarding the narrative, both as a whole and from his end specifically, I would like to hope that the dev team knows exactly what direction they want to take the story, and as such we shouldn't be concerned, though only time will tell. Oh, also, as a final note, I have seen a considerable amount of disdain held for Tyler Hoechlin's portrayal of Sephiroth, which I find frankly absurd. As much as I love George Newburn's portrayal, his always seemed more appropriate for the Sephiroth that we see in Crisis Core and events prior to the Nibelheim incident. As an absolute gigachad that, whilst still quite serious and moody, has a noble side to him. It is when he falls to the dark side that his attitude and presentation changes, and it is here where I think Hocklin does a better job personally. In layman's terms, I think Newburn conveys a war hero better, and Hocklin nails the sinister and malevolent monster that enjoys suffering and destruction. Whilst I can't shame people for having a preference, and nor do I want to, I can play the two together so that you can judge for yourself. You have failed again, Essie. <laughs> but through suffering and will grow strong. Isn't that what you want? Of worlds. Loveless again. You never change. A common story. If we were to enact it, would I be the one to play the hero? Or would you? It's all yours. Indeed. I think both are great, but then again they are both a damn sight better than Lance Bass's version. I'd also like to point out the fact that both Newburn and Hocklin have played Superman in different iterations, so they both have a track record of playing both sides of the good and evil spectrum. And with that, I think Sephiroth is just as strong of a villain here as he can be, given that it rests on the amount of knowledge the player has regarding him. A newer player will likely struggle to understand his relevance, which will be given in Rebirth, but a player who is knowledgeable of him should recognise the gravitas that his presence holds, and how significant his role is. All in all, the characters are handled brilliantly in this game. There are plenty of us to mention, most of them side characters, but aside from mentioning them during the synopsis, I try to stick to the main cast here. The strength of the character writing stems from having the freedom to delve deeper into the ways in which the characters think, act and feel, thanks to the added longevity of the story. In the original, it definitely felt like they skimmed through character moments and arcs, as opposed to giving their stories time to breathe. This is no better represented than with characters like Vincent, Ket Shea, and even Yuffie to an extent. Though, as you will see, they already capitalised on Yuffie's character already. Having slower moments, times where the characters will simply have dialogues with one another, is imperative to generating audience attachment, and seeing as they had already succeeded with that with far less, then I say that Square have got a good chance to really push the writing for these characters further still. And, on that note, I think it is about time to move on to the gameplay side of things. The gameplay of the FF7 Remake has been one of the developer's core focal points when designing this game, and it sees a departure from the traditional method of turn-based combat that the original was known for, in favour of a more typical, almost hack and slash type system that keeps the same fundamental design around tactical combat, in which the player has to manage their ATB and party members during fights, but also allows for a more standardised action experience which better represents the type of combat that the characters would undergo canonically speaking. To begin with, the foundation of the gameplay starts with the general movement. If I were to describe how the movement functions both in and out of combat, I would say it's fine. Just fine. There is nothing exceptional here, as it functions perfectly well, though one of the good things is that the characters are responsive when controlled, as many modern games like to include realistic turn-in animations that directly get in the way of the player's actions, sometimes leading to errors in gameplay. Whilst the FF7 remake may not have incredibly detailed and beautiful movement animations, it does function quite well for the player's benefit both out of combat, but more importantly, in combat. The UI is another point of praise, as it is one of the sleekest designs I have seen in modern gaming, with it presenting clear, useful information for the player in a stylish fashion without being too convoluted to read. It minimises when outside of combat, only presenting the character's HP and MP, 
but within combat it will also add the ATB bar alongside the limit meter. Alongside this, there is a guide for the controls on screen as a constant reminder should the player need it, though this can be disabled if it gets too intrusive. A strong aspect of the UI is when facing bosses, as during the cinematic transitions between phases, the UI remains, allowing the player to not only get a breather, but also to prepare for the next phase, using the info on the UI to judge their next action. Now, for the meat and potatoes of the gameplay, the basic combat. Each character has their own specific style of fighting, with their own unique abilities, and the combat system is designed around enabling said abilities as much as possible. This ties in directly to the ATB system, in which the ATB bar gradually fills throughout the duration of a battle, allowing the character to perform special moves when a bar is filled. Hitting enemies with basic attacks, or blocking incoming damage will help to fill the meter faster, facilitating more and more special moves that will end the encounters faster. It is this straightforward loop between basic attacks enabling special abilities that are the heartbeat of the entire combat system. Whilst not a point for the mechanical aspect, I truly appreciate how weighty the combat feels at times, even when using basic attacks. As for the character's specific gameplay, each one of the party members fill a specific niche or archetype within the party's structure. For instance, Aerith's role centres around her magical aptitude, and therefore makes her the ideal candidate for being the primary spellcaster of the group, both in terms of offensive and supportive spells. Giving her the materia and accessories that benefit magic heavy builds should be prioritised to her. An example would include the ubiquitous healing materia, as her innately high magic stat increases the value of healing spells, meaning a single cast of Cura from her can grant more health than a single cast of Curaga from someone such as Tifa, for instance. Whilst these specific roles certainly seem like an upgrade to the original, as most characters in that game felt very similar to one another with the only noticeable differences being the animations and their individual limit breaks. In reality, it is a little more nuanced than that. An argument can be made that because the difference between the characters were more negligible in the original gameplay-wise, it therefore means that the gameplay in the original would be much more free-form as characters were not limited by specific roles. An example of this would be if you wanted to take Aerith and turn her into a physical attack powerhouse by giving her tools that increase her physical damage, which is something you could do in the original as she could kill enemies by horny bonking them with her staves. In the remake, Aerith can inflict physical damage, but only when directly next to enemies, and the damage is painfully low, meaning that you can't really focus on making every kind of build for every kind of character. On one hand, this may seem like a negative, but it's worth noting that the character archetypes in Remake are built around the optimal playstyles for each character, and having each character fill in a particular niche means that every character has a purpose and a reason for subbing them into your party, whereas in the original you could easily keep to the same three members as there wasn't anything to differentiate between them. Let's break down the specific gameplay styles for each of the playable characters now, shall we? Cloud functions as the jack of all trades. He is capable of outputting considerable amounts of both physical and magic damage, further rebuffed by the weapons and accessories that he has equipped. You can pretty much use him with whatever build you want, and it will be viable in some form. Each character has a unique ability, all of which are quite powerful. Cloud's unique ability allows him to switch between two distinctive fighting modes, those being Operator Mode and Punisher Mode. Operator mode is Cloud's standard method of attacking, with simple combat, straightforward movement, and the ability to block both close and long ranged damage. Punisher mode, however, trades the normal guard with a counter attack, which can mitigate damage and deal a reasonable amount of damage to almost any blockable attack from close range. Unfortunately, Cloud cannot block damage from ranged targets whilst in Punisher mode, and his movement is slowed to walking speed. The last thing to point out about Punisher Mode are the normal attacks. Instead of the normal attack strings, which can be cancelled at any time, Punisher attacks have a long wind-up, followed by a flurry of strikes dealing good damage, and holding the attack button at any point will result in a strong attack that temporarily puts Cloud in the Berserk state. The main intention of Punisher Mode is for it to be used on staggered targets, as using any character's unique ability on a target that is staggered will build up the ATB gauge faster. Experienced players will be able to get a lot of use out of Punisher Mode, and the combo potential that this mode shift has is pretty high. 
The best way to go over his gameplay is to talk about his weapons and the abilities that come with them. The Buster Sword is one of, if not, the most iconic weapons in video game history, and its reputation is preserved in the remake. Unlike the original, where the Buster Sword would become irrelevant as soon as you have the option to get Hard Edge, as later weapons would function as a strict upgrade that often come with more materia slots as well. This is true for the weapons that the other characters have as well, but we'll get to that. As for the Buster Sword in the remake, it is designed to reinforce the balanced playstyle that I previously mentioned, with the weapon providing a favourable stat spread between both physical and magic damage. On top of this, it also provides an upgrade to defence when upgraded. The FF7 remake changes the way in which materia slots function, as every weapon for every character will all have 6 linked materia slots once fully upgraded, as opposed to the varied and unchangeable slots from the original which resulted in some weapons basically being completely unviable, especially when taking the endgame fights into consideration. Instead, the weapons are balanced around the stats they provide, and most if not all weapons have been designed so that they can be used effectively in the vast majority of situations. As a trade-off, none of the weapons can have 8 linked materia slots like some of the high-end weapons from the original, but this might have been done so as to leave room for a sense of growth in the subsequent parts of the remake trilogy. The Buster Sword's weapon ability is Focused Thrust, which is unlocked directly from the beginning. Focused Thrust is a stinger-like attack that hits multiple times and inflicts a large amount of stagger onto the enemy. Any ability that inflicts stagger is incredibly useful, and Focused Thrust is arguably the best iteration of the Focus abilities in the entire game. The second weapon that Cloud gets is the Iron Sword, obtained from the weapon store owner in the Sector 7 slums after dealing with the monsters in the scrapyard. The Iron Sword is another weapon that is balanced around a broader playstyle, though it is more weighted towards magic. The weapon itself doesn't stand out much outside of its ability, Triple Slash. I talked about this a little bit when I first brought up this weapon and the idea of weapon abilities much earlier in this critique, but I'll divulge a little more here. Triple Slash is easily one of the best abilities in the game, due to both its high damage output and the fact that it is an AoE ability. Being able to jump between different enemies and sometimes eliminate them in large groups is incredibly useful. Getting an ability this strong that early into the game is an added benefit. I suppose I should clarify how exactly the player can achieve full weapon proficiency. In the ability description, the game gives the player an instruction that revolves around the ability in question. Case in point, the Triple Slash ability suggests that the player strikes three enemies upon a single use of the ability. For the longest time, I assumed that you absolutely had to fulfil this criteria in order to max out the proficiency, but it turns out that this requirement is classified as the proficiency bonus, meaning that you don't have to follow these requirements to the letter to unlock the ability for use with all weapons. You gain proficiency every time you use the ability, and gain a significant boost if you fulfil the requirement. Whilst it is likely that you will passively get all of the abilities through playing naturally, I would advise trying to max out the abilities as soon as possible so as to swap weapons out as soon as you get them. The Hard Edge is a weapon that can be obtained very early on in the original game. You either had the option of stealing one from the 3rd class soldiers in the Shinra building, or purchasing one from the weapons vendor in Junon. In the remake, it is purchased from the weapon vendor in Wall Market, first available in Chapter 9. To begin with, let me just say that they improved upon the design massively. I mean, just look at how shit the original one looks. It looks like one of those plastic toys you would get for children. The Hard Edge is a sword built purely for physical damage at the expense of magic damage, and it is a good pick for Cloud's primary weapon when Aerith is in the party. The weapon ability that is tied to it is called Infinity's End, and there is even a track in the OST with the same name. Infinity's End consumes two ATB charges to land a devastating blow on the unfortunate soul that happens to challenge you. It has a really long wind-up, but does bonus damage to enemies that are staggered, which can be pretty incredible during fights against some of the most challenging bosses the game has to offer. In terms of looks and aesthetic value, this weapon is ass. Even statistically, it doesn't do anything better than any of Cloud's other weapons, but it does give you one of the most underappreciated abilities in the game called Disorder. Disorder performs a physical attack that changes Cloud's form, and gives him a significant boost of ATB back for successfully landing the attack. This encourages the player to use the move frequently, and you can stack up a lot of damage with this. 
The Nail Bat also alters the strong attacks from Punisher mode to resemble a baseball swing, which is incredibly limiting and exactly the reason as to why most players won't use it. Which is a shame, because this ability is fantastic, especially as far as making visually appealing combos are concerned. Disorder is far better served when used with any other weapon, so it is simply a matter of earning the ability and then switching the weapon. The Nail Bat is obtained through completing the side quest in Chapter 8 as a reward for killing the Hedgehog Pie King. In the original game, the Nail Bat was obtained way later on in the Temple of the Ancients. The remake does offer some remade content from the later segments of the original and places them into the Midgar segment, specifically to give the player plenty of content, and this is shown through weapons, materia, and especially summons, though this is a topic to be broached upon later. The next weapon is the Mithril Sabre, a sword that can be purchased from the same vendor that sold you the Hard Edge, this time in Chapter 14. The Mithril Sabre is yet another weapon that made an appearance in the original, and is the first purchasable upgrade to the Buster Sword that you can get post Midgar, being available from the weapon vendor in Calm. The Mithril Sabre favours magic damage over physical, and is ideal for use if you want to commit to a magic-centric build for Cloud, or if you simply need someone to fulfil the magic wielder duties during hard mode when Aerith isn't around to do so. The Mithril Sabre sees a lot of use for expert players during some of the VR bosses, and has a cool design. The ability attributed to this sword is the Blade Burst, a freeway wave of magic damage that spreads out from the caster. Blade Burst is a remake variant of one of Cloud's level 2 limits from the original, Blade Beam, which functioned in a similar manner. Despite being relegated to an ability this time around, it is still pretty powerful. I mean, take this clip for instance. I was trying to get the proficiency maxed out, and I used the ability as soon as I possibly could, and it just so happens that the enemies in this particular challenge are set out in such a way that allows for you to complete the proficiency in one singular attack. The Twin Stinger is a brand new weapon for this game, and aside from its obnoxious visual design, it isn't that spectacular stats-wise. This sword is found in a chest within the drum in Chapter 17. It does come with an excellent weapon ability though, called Counter Stance, which functions as a buffed version of the Punisher Mode counter that Cloud has. Counter Stance lasts for a couple of seconds, and unlike the Punisher counter, it can be triggered by both ranged attacks and magic. However, it will only blink Cloud so far. When used in combination with Punisher Mode, as well as Disorder, this is how you are able to make stylish looking combos with Cloud. Nothing compared to Devil May Cry or Final Fantasy XVI of course, but still pretty cool nonetheless. The last ability to mention is Cloud's default ability, Braver, which is yet another ability that is a scaled down version of one of his limits from the original. Every character comes with an ability that is not tied to any weapon in particular, and Cloud's Braver is a straightforward ability that deals high damage. Not much to comment on other than that. For most players, they will opt towards a melee build that favours physical damage or a balanced build. Choosing Hard Edge or the Iron Blade are two suitable choices for this playstyle, but I generally opt to stick with the good old Buster Sword. Not only for gameplay reasons, but also because of the aesthetic value as the Buster Sword is by far and away the best looking weapon in the game. Oh, and it has the cannon buff too. Aerith is the closest thing to a tank in this game, and this isn't simply based upon how jacked he is. No, he has some abilities that are designed around him drawing damage towards himself, and his defense is naturally high. When paired with the cover materia, Barret serves as the ideal damage sponge. Barret is also a ranged fighter, relying on his gun arm prosthetic to dole out long distance punishment. His unique ability is called Overcharge, which releases a barrage of heavy shots towards an enemy increasing the stagger gauge heavily. Upon using it, the ability has to be recharged before it can be used again, the process of which can be sped up by hitting the same button again occasionally to pump the weapon faster. What the game doesn't tell you in regards to this, is that timing the charges in between basic attack bursts actually optimises the process. Each charge alone is relatively slow, and not something you would want to do as opposed to simply opting to output more damage. If you shoot normally however, and then charge the unique as Barret begins to reload, he'll do it much faster. This rhythmic motion helps to keep piling under pressure whilst refreshing the unique ability quicker. Barret doesn't just have ranged options however, 
as, just like in the original game, he has a couple of melee oriented weapons to utilise, which change up his combat style entirely, including his unique. The trade off, of course, is that you are sacrificing the ability to deal with airborne enemies easily, and as such I prefer to stick with the ranged weapons. Speaking of which, let's go through them, shall we? Barrett's trusty sidearm, literally, is the Gatling Gun, a standard, well balanced option for both physical and magical damage. The weapon ability that is tied to this weapon is Focused Shot, which delivers a potent blast of energy which inflicts heavy stagger. Interestingly enough, if used when Barrett has two or even three bars of ATB available, the ability will consume all of them to massively boost the stagger that is applied. As with Cloud's Focused Frost, any ability that has the term Focused within it will inflict stagger as an inherent part of it. The only character that lacks a focus ability is Aerith, but we'll touch upon her abilities later. The Gatling Gun is, as expected, a rather basic option for builds, without pushing the player into a specific niche in any way. Barrett's second gun is the Light Machine Gun, which is obtained in Chapter 6 as an item that Biggs offers before leaving. The LMG favours magic a little more, though its true strength lies in the ability that comes with it. The ability Lifesaver is one of the reasons that Barrett is built for tanking damage, as this ability, once activated, causes Barrett to trade the damage that other characters take with himself. For example, if Tifa gets hit with an attack that does 200 damage, then Barrett will slowly lose 200 HP, whilst Tifa slowly recovers 200 HP. When paired with Barrett's Steel Skin ability, this means that Barrett could soak up most of the punishment that the party suffers. This weapon is a remake variant of the Assault Gun from the original, which was obtained after defeating the Guard Scorpion in Mako Reactor 1. The Big Burfer is a weapon that leans toward physical damage, and the ability tied with it, Maximum Fury, unloads an intense stream of bullets that deals great damage. The length of time that the ability lasts is determined by the amount of ATB charges that are consumed when the ability is activated. This is a great ability for using on enemies that are staggered. The Big Burfer is sold by the Sector 7 slums weapons vendor once he migrates to Evergreen Park after the slums are flattened by the destroyed plate in Chapter 13 onwards. The closest weapon from the original that I could find that most resembles the Big Burfer in terms of design is the W Machine Gun, though that might be pushing it. It very well may be a brand new design as opposed to being a remade weapon. The first of the two weapons that are melee focused, the steel pincers are pretty unimpressive. It can be purchased from Moggy in Chapter 14 using Moogle medals. Out of the two melee weapons, I find that the Wrecking Ball is better, because the charging uppercut isn't all that useful when compared to Barrett's other, more destructive offensive abilities. They are a remade version of the Atomic Scissors from the original. Speaking of which, the Wrecking Ball is actually pretty decent, and does loads of damage in order to make up for how slow it is. It is obtained after defeating the indomitable behemoth in the underground lab, and the ability that comes with it is Smackdown. Smackdown causes a large AoE centred on Barrett which does great damage, though the windup is quite long. You'll notice that these past couple of weapons have all been obtained within a short time span within one another, and that kind of explains why they all seem so forgettable when compared to the weapons that the other characters obtain. Though, seeing as Barrett was out of the party for a notable length of time by this point, I suppose it follows that most of his weapons would have had to have been backloaded towards the second half of the game. This weapon is another remade design, this one being Cannonball. His last weapon is the EKG Cannon, which is the ideal gun for concentrating on magic damage. When it comes to weapons, most of Barrett's aren't all that spectacular, and neither are the abilities. Personally, I opt for Big Bertha, as most of the upgrades favour health increases which falls in line with his design philosophy as the tank of the party. This weapon is brand new, and didn't feature in the original game. The starting ability is Steel Skin, which gives Barrett a form of hyper armour. This is really good for spells and abilities that you can easily be staggered out of, and help to solidify the tank mentality. Barrett does have the capacity to deal tremendous damage though, which falls in line with tank classes present in other games as well. Sticking with his ranged tools is the ideal choice, and applying both of his buffs at the start of the fight before using the other characters is the ideal way to play Barrett in my eyes. It is quite ironic, come to think of it, that the best way to play Barrett is to not play as him.
Earlier in the critique, when first discussing Tifa's gameplay, I classified her as the closest thing this game has to a traditional glass cannon, being that she's quick and has a high DPS output, but less than ideal defensive attributes. She is built upon juggling her chi level, which is intrinsically tied to both her unique ability and her starting ability called Unbridled Strength. Tifa's unique changes depending on what level her chi is currently at. For instance, at level 1, she will be able to perform a basic uppercut, but at level 3, she can perform Rise and Fall, a powerful attack that applies a significant amount of stagger. The higher her chi level, the longer her combos are too, both on the ground and in the air. Assuming that you are at a chi level of 3, and you use Rise and Fall, Tifa will then be forced to drop down to level 2, which grants her the use of Omni Strike. Using this unique will drop you back to the default value. The idea around her combat style is to juggle the chi level, by keeping it as close to level 3 as often as possible, without neglecting the power of the moves that come with it. In a boss fight, for example, you will want to start off by using Unbridled Strength twice as quickly as possible in order to get her combos as strong as they can be, and when the boss becomes staggered, you'll want to use Rise and Fall, then Omni Strike, and then subsequently use Rising Uppercut to consistently raise the stagger percentage. What is the stagger percentage, you may ask? Well, that is the number that is below the stagger bar, and indicates what the percentage modifier of the damage you are inflicting currently is. For instance, here the stagger percentage starts at 160% meaning you are dealing 1.6 times the current damage you would deal normally. So, if you inflicted an attack that deals 145 damage, then it will jump up to 232. At 200%, you're dealing double damage. All of Tifa's unique attacks, no matter the chi level, increase this percentage, with an achievement being unlocked for pushing the percentage past 300%. Before Yuffie was playable via the Intermission DLC, Tifa was easily the most combo-heavy character in the game, and definitely the most stylish gameplay-wise. Her weapon abilities are evidence of this. The Leather Gloves are her basic weapons that offer the right balance between health, physical damage, and magic damage. The ability with this is the Dive Kick, a powerful airborne strike that can even be activated after Rising Uppercut, which plays into the combo potential that she has. The Metal Knuckles are her physical damage-favoured weapon, and the one that I would say is the best suited to her playstyle. The ability this one offers is called Overpower, and is a quick attack that deals good damage and combos well off of basic attacks. Whilst I haven't talked about Materia yet, this ability is great for use with the Synergy Materia, as the quick bursts of consistent damage, combined with Tifa's faster accruing of ATB, make Overpower a great tool for enabling Synergy. This is obtained after defeating the Crab Warden at the end of Chapter 5, and was purchased in Wall Market in the original. Her next weapon, the Sonic Strikers are made with the purpose of granting more Materia slots, although this makes it rather redundant once all of the weapons are fully upgraded, as every weapon ends up having 6 linked Materia slots. Its ability is Focused Strike, which, if you remembered, is the ability type that inflicts Stagger. An extra specialty of this ability is that it allows Tifa to dodge backwards before propelling her forwards to strike the enemy, making it a great counter tool for skilled players. This weapon is brand new, and is found in a chest within Mako Reactor 5 during Chapter 7. The Feathered Gloves are honestly a weapon that I forget exists, as it really doesn't excel at anything. It is another new design, and they do look good, but I don't know. The ability is interesting though, Star Shower is a badass looking flurry of attacks that empowers the next command that is used. This is another ability that supports the notion of her being a combo based character, though it does require a second bar of ATB in order to immediately follow up with a command that can be buffed. This weapon is found in a chest in the sewers beneath Sector 6 during Chapter 10. The Mithril Claws are Tifa's magic based weapons, though I wouldn't recommend making Tifa the primary magic user in the party. To be fair, this is one of the great things about FF7's magic system, allowing the player the freedom to make any character fit a particular build, even if said character isn't built for it. The ability paired with it is called Chi Trap, which leaves an orb of energy that deals intermittent damage. This is almost certainly her least useful weapon, as it suits her playstyle the least. It is obtained after defeating the failed experiment in Chapter 13. Once again a remade design, this can be purchased in Calm in the original game. 
Purple Pain is the last weapon for Tifa, and is obtained from a chest in the foyer area of the Shinra building in Chapter 16. It is designed around her HP pool, and has a great ability tied to it. True Strike is almost like a Pokemon evolution of Focus Strike, but instead of inflicting Stagger, this deals extra damage to enemies that are staggered. Not only that, but it increases the Stagger percentage too, so when laying the smackdown on bosses is required, this ability is perfect. This is a brand new weapon for the remake. Her starting ability is Unbridled Strength, which I have already touched upon. As stated previously, her ideal build is centred around whatever deals the most physical damage. So opting for the Metal Knuckles, and learning how to use all of her abilities in a combo effective manner, is the best way to play her. The final playable character in the remake is none other than our Strawberry Cheesecake herself. Aerith. Obviously she fulfills the role of the magic caster of the group, and as stated much earlier on in this critique, she functions as both the white mage and black mage, or more commonly known as a red mage. Due to her extraordinarily high magic stat, she should possess any magic materia that you have on hand, as she can make the best use of them. Something interesting is that almost all of her attacks deal solely magic damage, though there is an asterisk here. If you are next to an enemy as you attempt a basic attack, Aerith's swings of the rod will collide with the enemy's hitbox and deal physical damage, though this is pretty negligible. There is one of her weapons which bizarrely favours physical damage and this decision has always baffled me. Her unique ability is called Tempest, which is a simple charge attack where she can yeet a barrage of magic at an enemy from a stationary position. If charged all the way, she will unleash a devastating attack that hits once upon impact and again as it explodes. This functions similarly to ice magic, which we'll get to. Generally, she should stay away from enemies, and focus more on casting offensive magic, as her abilities favour this style. Aerith's base equipment, her guard stick isn't her best tool, but it arguably has her best ability, called Arcane Ward. Arcane Ward casts a ward either on her or on a party member, and anyone that casts an offensive spell within the ward will cast that exact same spell again for 0 MP cost. This can be combined with Synergy to cast 4 spells, 3 of which cost in 0 MP, if both the controlled character and the character with Synergy are within the ward. This is a very strong ability, especially on hard mode. Aerith's Silver Staff is a new weapon, and is purchased using Moogle medals from Moggy in Chapter 8. The ability that this weapon offers is called Sorcerer Storm, which is a melee-centric flourish that deals lightning damage. Seeing as most of her gameplay revolves around ranged combat, having an ability like this on hand for the sake of dealing with those who get too close is very useful. The Arcane Scepter is another new weapon made for the remake, and it is granted as a reward for completing one of the quest pathways in Chapter 9. The ability that is tied to this is called Fleeting Familiar, which summons a fairy familiar that occasionally attacks enemies, as well as following up on Aerith's commands too. This can also be paired with Arcane Ward to double the casts that the familiar makes. Arguably Aerith's best stave, the Mithril Rod is found within a chest in a train graveyard and makes a return from the original, which was initially available for purchase in Wall Market. The Mithril Rod has the highest magic stat, and seeing as Aerith's physical damage is worthless, there is no reason not to use a weapon such as this. The ability that comes with it is called Ray of Judgement, which requires two bars of ATB to use, and fires a laser that deals significant damage to staggered enemies. This ability functions very similarly to Cloud's Infinity's End. The Bladed Staff is bad. No, seriously, what am I supposed to say about it? It is a staff built almost entirely towards physical damage for a character that almost entirely deals magic damage, and the few instances that she can deal physical damage is when she's right next to an enemy, and even then it barely does anything. The ability it has does facilitate some interesting combos though. The Lustrous Shield can absorb pretty much all ranged damage, and knocks enemies back. If you are interested, there are plenty of combo videos out there that showcase what can be done with this ability in the hands of a skilled Aerith player. The one that springs to mind is seeing Rude get pinballed around as he keeps hitting the shields, so this ability is quite strong, though it requires the player to have practically perfect positioning to make use of it. It is, interestingly enough, the one and only weapon that is obtained by stealing it from an enemy. The enemy in question is the boss Elagor from the end of Chapter 11. 
This weapon makes its reprise from the original, and the method of obtaining it was the same, though Eligor there was a basic enemy, not a boss. The last weapon to discuss is the Reinforced Staff. This weapon is obtained in Aerith's old bedroom in the Shinra building in Chapter 17. Seeing as Aerith was gone from the party for a while by this point, it stands to reason why it took this long to give the player her final weapon. The staff itself is fine, but I can't for the life of me wrap my head around this ability. It's called ATB Ward, and operates in the same way as the Arcane Ward, except it, it is shit. For two ATB charges, you can cast a ward which allows allies to regain a small amount of ATB when they use abilities from within the ward. Alright, let's just unpack this. To begin with, the game states that it is allies that benefit from this ATB regen, not Aerith herself, and they are limited to this small area in order to benefit from it. The issue with it is that when facing enemies or bosses that are incredibly mobile, you're not going to be able to take advantage of it all that often, and the amount of ATB that the characters get back is equivalent to a partial amount from Aerith's current gauge. So you aren't even getting a full bar back, which would justify why this ability costs 2 ATB charges to use. Considering how expensive the ability is, how little it benefits the player, and how late in the game it is obtained, it is honestly baffling just how this was considered an acceptable ability. I feel that it should have benefited from a similar buff to what the Synergy Materia got, in how that went from not just a worthless, but in some cases detrimental materia, to being what is probably the most busted materia in the entire game. Her starting ability is Soul Drain, which deals a decent amount of damage and absorbs MP from the target, which is very useful. As you can clearly tell, Aerith is evidently the mage of the group, and all of her abilities cater to it, because of her innately high magic stat, she also heals much more when she uses cure spells, so she should be the primary healer. When it comes to handling the stronger bosses of the game and the VR challenges, she is invaluable in outputting some crazy magic damage. I'll be touching on the materia system shortly, but first, seeing as it is relevant to character playstyles, I want to deliberate on what certain materias bring to the table in terms of benefits to certain characters. The first and most prevalent example would be parry. This materia allows the select character to input both the block and dodge commands simultaneously to perform a different dodge animation. That can inflict damage on enemies should the character's hitbox collide with them. Every character has a different animation, and some are better than others. Both Barrett and Aerith have slow and cumbersome animations, with long recovery times before they can be performed again, making the parry materia a waste of a slot for these two. Cloud's parry is a lot quicker, and can help him to circle strafe around enemies in a way that Barrett and Aerith cannot do, not to mention that the recovery window is very fast. The character that benefits the most from this, however, is Tifa. As soon as you get the parry materia, you should immediately give it to her, as she can zoom around any arena at Mach 5, dodging practically any attack that an enemy can throw at her. Some attacks that are incredibly difficult to dodge, such as Abzu's Leap, can be effortlessly avoided this way. The foremost example of its usefulness is when fighting the game's super boss, Vice, most of all. Deadly dodge is also more appropriate for some characters rather than others. It is garbage when used by Aerith, as she is really slow and the magic burst doesn't do much, not to mention that she should be far from the front line anyway. It is okay when used by Barrett, but not exceptional but it is quite clear that both of the melee-oriented characters are the ones that are built for this materia. Both Cloud and Tifa do very well with this, as they'll both likely be dodging towards enemies, and their versions result in an AoE that can hit multiple targets. So both parry and deadly dodge can be used with every character, but they are both obviously favoured towards the melee characters. The Provoke materia serves as a lure for enemies to attack the character that has it. You certainly wouldn't want someone like Aerith to have this equipped, but who did I say serves as the tank of the party? That's right, Barrett. He can make good use of this, especially seeing as it only activates on a character that is not currently being controlled by the player. And I did say that Barrett is better served as the guy that buffs and then absorbs pressure whilst you play as other characters. So this is perfect for his playstyle. We then have Refocus, which is very useful on every character, to be fair but a character it suits very well would be someone that has to make use of ATB actions often, such as Aerith. 
This is because she doesn't just have to drop wards, but also dedicate ATB for spells, both offensive and defensive. When you consider the ATB ward that I discussed previously, giving her the option to have free ATB charges on command until the end of the battle is quite good. Also, seeing as refocus requires a full limit bar to activate, and seeing as Aerith might not need to heal or protect the entire party all of the time, then giving her refocus is a good call. Besides, it is her who starts with the material equipped. When a character takes a lot of damage during a battle, or when they stagger enough enemies, they'll raise their limit gauge, seen next to the MP bar. When filled, this will allow them to unleash a very powerful ability that doesn't require ATB to use. Every character has two limits, which is only a fraction of what they can get in the original, though it isn't a fair comparison, as this game only covers Midgar, and it is likely that the player would have only achieved two limits on every character before they leave the city, so it isn't worth waffling on about. As stated earlier, some of the abilities in this game repurposes some of the original game's limits, meaning that we will likely see brand new limits in the next two iterations, hopefully as an addition to the ones we have currently, rather than replacing them. Every character starts off with one limit, and can gain the second by completing their relevant battle in the Colosseum. The earliest that these can be obtained are Chapter 9 for Cloud and Aerith, and Chapter 14 for Barrett and Tifa. Starting with Cloud, his limits are purely damage centric, and are called Cross Slash and Ascension, respectively. Cross Slash only deals physical damage here, whereas in the original it also applied Paralysis, though some enemies wouldn't be affected by it. Ascension is a renamed and updated version of Cloud's level 2 limit from the original called Klim Hazard. Bizarre name, by the way. Being the level 2 in this game, it takes a bit longer to charge, but does more damage. Honestly, as cool as these look, and they do look very cool, they aren't all that interesting to talk about. They deal damage. That's it. The same could be said for both Tifa and Barrett. So let's talk about theirs, shall we? Tifa's two limits are called Somersault and Dolphin's Flurry. Tifa is interesting, as in the original game, her entire limit system was built on her chaining new strings to her limit combo. Her Somersault was her second string, following Beat Rush, and that game had a slot reel RNG system that dictated whether or not her limit would miss, hit normally, or hit for critical damage. As powerful as hitting multiple limits in a row was, the chance of missing a part of the string was a very real concern, and was the balancing act that the game justified. Here, both of her limits are just damage focused, and there is nothing else to it. Dolphin's Flurry is a remade variant of Dolphin's Blur from the original, but with a lot more visual flair to it. Don't get me wrong, all of these limits look awesome, and I can't wait to see how cool the remake variants of the later limits look, but I can't help but feel as though they could have added more unique modifiers to distinguish each limit from the other, and to justify the player in using the level 1s over the level 2s. For example, in the original, Aerith had Healing Wind as her level 1, which was more often than not, more useful than both of her level 2s, being Fury Brand and Breath of the Earth. Fury Brand was great for grinding limits, something I had to do a lot for the sake of this critique. God, that music still rings in my ears to this day. And Breath of the Earth was a cleanse, which wasn't even necessary in most instances. Hell, it even conflicted with limit grinding, as it would cleanse the Fury status entirely. The point is that the nuances of that system meant that level 1 limits weren't always left in the dust, as some of the later limits weren't always direct upgrades. Not to say that there weren't examples of that of course, but I'm sure you follow me. Barrett's limits are as follows. Fire in the Hole is his basic limit from the original game, except with a better name, and Catastrophe is his… wait, what? They gave him his final limit this early? I mean, I assume that they'll give him a different limit as a replacement for his level 4, and it isn't as offensive as giving Cloud Omnislash this early, so I suppose I can let it slide? Just it's… weird, that's all. Both of these just deal damage, though Catastrophe hits multiple times rather than just once, so there is that. The only character who has any meaningful difference between her limits is Aerith, who has both Healing Wind and Planet's Protection. 
Healing Wind is a straightforward, powerful heal for the entire party, which is never not useful, and Planet's Protection is a shield that grants temporary damage immunity for the entire party. This is obviously very strong, though I have had instances of party members falling before the limit hits, because it is based on a wave that travels outwards from Aerith, meaning there is a travel time before contact, so party members can be knocked out before then. Just because the limit system is a lot more simple than the original doesn't necessarily mean it is worse though, as limits are separate commands in the remake, whereas in the original they were intrinsically tied to the basic attack command. Whilst this wasn't too much of an issue most of the time, if you wanted to save a limit and just use basic attacks, then you had to equip other materia that let you mimic the same action, such as the mug variation on the steel materia, or death blow which only had a 30% chance of hitting. This issue is actually compounded when you factor in things such as Tifa's ultimate weapon in the original, named the Premium Heart, which dealt more damage the higher her limit gauge was. Sounds great on paper, right? Well, when you realise that her limit will eventually fill, and you have to use the limit in place of her attack command, this means that you will perform a massive amount of damage during the limit, but then next to nothing until you can fill it again. Whilst it could easily be argued that allowing the player to separate these commands would mean that she would be too strong, as this choice was an intentional piece of balancing, I still feel as if it is incredibly annoying to work around, and made the premium heart far too irritating to use consistently. Still though, you could save limits across battles in the original if you felt like it, which is something that was removed from the remake. Whilst this isn't something that you're going to notice all that much, there are some egregious examples. For instance, during this fight in Chapter 2, it will last long enough that the player will likely accrue a limit, but just as you get it, you might think to save it for the moment when a strong enemy drops in to say hello. Just as you're thinking this, however, the fight ends, and your limit is discarded before you get to use it. Again, something that might have been scrapped for balancing sake, but I can't help but feel as though it would have been fine as they seem to have lessened the insane power that the limits can offer, so this decision comes across as odd. All in all, the limits are fine, but I hope to see more variety to them in Rebirth and beyond. I have mostly talked about this game's combat positively, though I am not here to simply dole out praise. There are some caveats to touch upon, starting with the limited aerial capacity that the characters possess when it comes to air combat. There is more to add to this when I get around to the DLC, and I can already tell you that the DLC proves that Square did listen to feedback when making it, not to mention that the Rebirth gameplay trailer gives me more faith in where they are going in relation to the game's combat. But back to the point. It can be quite frustrating to have a character like Cloud, who has proven that he can fight in the air for long periods of time, simply jumping up, striking thrice, then falling back down again. Rinse and repeat ad nauseum. It makes the combat come across as shallow in this area, and makes you wonder why they didn't just prevent this from being possible and expect the player to rely solely on both Barret and Aerith for dealing with flying foes. Another issue is the noticeable lack of iframes on dodgers. Now I know that you can't expect Souls-esque dodging in this game, but there are some attacks that you can't avoid half the time no matter how tight your dodge timing is. This is especially true for characters like Barret, who rolls around like an obese cat. I suppose it is also a little frustrating that you can't really do no damage runs of this game seeing as it is practically impossible to avoid damage, despite the game wanting you to avoid attacks entirely sometimes. Perhaps I am simply being too unfair to the game here, and that is more than likely, but I have played many other games with far better combat systems, so I guess I have simply been spoiled, that's all. This game does have good combat for the most part though, no doubt about it. The last topic regarding the combat in this game is based on the armour, accessories and materia. Most of the armour pieces in this game are designed to provide buffs to either the defence or spirit stat, which increases the character's resistance to physical and magic damage respectively. Some of them are made for holding materia, and give less impressive stat bonuses as a trade-off. One of the interesting aspects of the original game that is no longer present here is the materia growth aspect of the different equipment. There, you had weapons and armour that would either have normal growth, double growth, triple growth, or no growth at all. 
These are oftentimes directly correlated with the strength of the equipment in question. For instance, some armour and all of the ultimate weapons had zero growth, and sometimes wouldn't even provide materia slots at all. The remake stays true to this when it comes to armour, but not with the weapons, as there are no weapons with zero materia growth present in the remake. It is also apparent that they didn't want the player to upgrade materia too quickly, and likely didn't want some weapons being seen as objectively better than others by giving them double or even triple growth. When the remake first released, the Digital Deluxe Edition provided three new pieces of armour and two new accessories. Thankfully, these don't give major benefits that ruin the experience, and are meant to be beneficial more so in the early game, though the Superstar Belt does see a benefit when used during the Vice fight, but we'll get to that. The release of Integrade in 2021 provided all of these as well as the bonus summons, which I will discuss soon. The accessories are incredibly varied, with some providing resistances to particular status effects, and some giving boosts to stats. Though some offer more interesting modifiers, like the Transference module, for example. This accessory increases the limit gauge every time a bar of ATB is consumed, which makes it a very good pick for use on a character like Tifa, who can generate ATB much quicker than other characters due to her high speed stat. The real substantive aspect of the game's combat, however, is entirely predicated on the Materia system. There are five different types of Materia that they're all categorised into, being as follows. Magic Materia encapsulates all of the offensive and supportive spells that the game has to offer. Such examples include all of the four primary elements, fire, ice, lightning and wind, poison and cleansing spells, time-based spells and barrier spells. All of the elemental spells function differently too, Fire sends a dumb-fired ball of flame towards the enemy. Blizzard casts a chunk of ice which remains after an initial hit, before exploding again. The drawback here being that this can miss more easily. Lightning is very useful, because it is guaranteed to hit, regardless of where the enemy is positioned. Right next to you, or behind a wall, it doesn't matter. Wind got buffed with the release of Integrade, and works in the same way as Blizzard, except it can't miss if the enemy is within sight. The wind sticks to an enemy, and then explodes again after some time, therefore hitting twice. Due to its ability to double hit, and because there aren't many instances where enemies would be immune to wind, it means that this spell is incredibly viable with Synergy. Every Materia has a series of levels attributed to them, and the increase in level wants the player has accrued enough AP throughout their battles. When it comes to offensive spells, like the ones I have just been over, they gain stronger variants which take longer to charge and cost more MP, but deal significantly higher damage, and have a much higher chance of staggering tougher enemies and bosses. Magic Materia are the most common ones that you'll find, and make up most of this game's combat system when it comes to magic. The Final Fantasy games are pretty hit and miss when it comes to magic systems, as games like FF6 have a good magic system in the form of Magisite, Whereas titles like FF8 and FF9 have bad ones, FF8 in particular having an incredibly janky and convoluted system in the form of the draw and guardian force mechanics. FF9 has a system that barely gives players any spells to work with, and honestly, despite being in the absolute minority on this, it is one of the many reasons why I didn't like FF9. When it comes to its franchise family, FF7 far surpasses its ancestors and predecessors in this regard and I would argue that it has one of the best magic systems in any game that I have ever played, because it doesn't just allow for flexibility with its magic, but it is also a very concise and easy to understand system that still allows for balance due to the limited materia slots that the player has. The next category is referred to as Command Materia. Command Materias do exactly what they say on the tin. They grant the player the use of additional commands, such as Assess or Prior, and these commands vary in viability. Assess is particularly interesting because it is classified as an offensive command, so it combines with Synergy, which is very weird. Some materia that fall into this, like Chakra, don't seem to be all that amazing, though there are plenty of examples of command materia that have yet to be remade from the original game, so we still have plenty of gameplay additions that can be discussed when the next games release. Independent, or Complete Materia, provides slight modifiers to the character's controls and basic moves or provide additional stat bonuses, especially to HP and MP. Examples of independent materia that affect basic moves would be the aforementioned parry and deadly dodge materias.
Support materials are made specifically to be used in conjunction with either magic, command or independent materia and enhance them. Support materia require a linked materia slot to be used and have to be paired with a compatible materia, as not all of them are. Examples include elemental materia, which applies the paired element to the weapon or armor that it is equipped in, and either implements elemental damage with weapons or increases the character's resistance to damage from said element when equipped to a piece of armor. When fully upgraded, an elemental materia can even allow the character to absorb damage from whatever element it's paired with. A very popular materia that falls into this category is Magnify, which allows certain spells to either hit multiple targets or apply a buff to multiple allies. It is worth noting, however, that spells using Magnify are heavily diluted in their potency either dealing less damage per enemy, or restoring less health per ally. Upgrading this materia reduces the drop-off in the spell's efficacy, and makes this materia very useful for pretty much every scenario. There is one materia that is categorised as support, and I have alluded to it many times, and that is Synergy. Alright, let's talk about balance, or in this case, a lack thereof. You see, when the remake first released, this materia was horribly underpowered, as it not only provided a negligible advantage in most scenarios, but it was even a liability sometimes. Let me explain what I mean. Synergy causes the character that has it equipped to follow up on the player character's commands with the spell that Synergy is paired with. Sounds pretty good, right? Well, the thing that I didn't tell you is that this follow-up action consumes not only the MP for the base level of the spell, but also an ATB charge. The reason this was considered underpowered is because consuming an ATB charge every time the player does an ability means that you cannot have said character conserve ATB for a rainy day, such as for a desperate heal when you need it. Not to mention that making it so that each cast costs MP means that a character like Aerith might not have MP for when she really needs it, which kinda ties into the previous point. This is what I meant by it being a liability, as it effectively meant that you couldn't use any abilities as it would proc your ally into using Synergy, which caused them to use up some MP and an ATB charge every single time. It seems as though Square Enix noticed this, and decided to buff it for the release of Integrate over a year later. However, it seems they overdid it a bit. They scrapped both the MP and ATB charge cost for its use, which made it more viable, but now it is far too overpowered. Not to toot my own horn, but I reckon I was one of the first people to discover how this thing was buffed back when Integrade first dropped, as I was struggling with the Leviathan VR battle in Chapter 13, and I decided to experiment around with different Materia combos, and I gave Synergy a shot. Needless to say, I beat Leviathan on the subsequent attempt, and completely wiped the floor with it. The occasional cast of thunder every time Tifa uses overpower might not seem like much, but it stacks up. This massive buff is so strong that it can easily trivialise the hardest bosses in the game, and I wouldn't be surprised if it gets reverted back in Rebirth, or removed entirely. It wasn't exactly a shock to me when I started to see other players using this materia more in VR challenges, especially against Top Secrets or Vice, because it really is that strong. Though, I suppose it sparks a debate as to whether it is better to have things be underpowered or overpowered. In my eyes, it is better to have something be overpowered than underpowered, as you can simply opt not to use the meta strategy and handicap yourself, rather than having some abilities basically being left to gather dust, because they're far too weak. Of course, the ideal is to have a game that has perfect balance, but in this specific scenario, I would lean towards something being more overpowered than underpowered. The final materia type are the summons. Summons are a powerful entity that can be invoked in certain battles and boss fights, and function as an immortal ally that can use abilities for a short period, before finishing off with an ultimate attack before leaving. Not all summons stay for the same amount of time, and can even be forced to leave prematurely if the character who summoned them is knocked out. The original game didn't offer any summons to the player until you left Midgar, so the remake had to change this and offer a decent selection. That being said, there are still loads of summons yet to be seen, so I wouldn't say that they have blown their load too early. All of the summons have abilities that set them apart from one another, 
though most of their individual viability differs entirely depending on the enemies or boss that are being faced at the time. For instance, Shiva would be completely irrelevant when facing a creature that absorbs ice damage, whereas Ifrit would completely smoke them. Some summons, such as Fat Chocobo and Bahamut, don't have any specific elemental property to them, and are great if you don't want to risk benefiting the enemy, but obviously don't exceed when facing an enemy whose weakness can be exploited. This was something that was much more prevalent in the original, as well as having the option to pair summon materia with elemental materia, to apply said element in the same way you would do it with a magic materia. It was clear that this was changed in order to fall more in line with the mechanical shift in how the summons work in the remake. Whilst I will ruminate on the actual fights with the summons themselves in the discussion regarding the VR missions, I will briefly touch upon what summons you have available in this game now, including the bonus ones included via DLC content. Most summons are unlocked via the VR missions, with some exceptions. The ones that are obtained outside of the missions are Ifrit, which is given to Cloud via Jesse at the end of Chapter 3, and serves as the tutorial summon, and Chocobo slash Moogle, which is the reward for clearing the fan maintenance room in Chapter 6. The ones that are obtained through the VR missions are, in order, Shiva, who is available to be 4 after clearing 4 of Chadley's missions, Fat Chocobo after 9, Leviathan after 14, and Bahamut after 19. In accordance with all of these, the ones granted via the pre-order bonuses, which have now been made available to all players, regardless of the game version, are as follows. Cactuar, which returns as a staple of the Final Fantasy franchise, Chocobo Chick, which can cast magnified spells, and Carbuncle, which is arguably the best summon in the entire game, and I'll explain why. Carbuncle can cast his light spells which can apply barrier, magic barrier and haste on the entire party, which is useful enough as is, but his real strength comes from his ultimate, Diamond Dazzle, which not only fully heals the party, but also revives fallen allies and restores all of their health. He might not stick around long, and you can only invoke this once per battle, but this is incredible for some of the most challenging fights in the game. What is even better is that because the summons use their ulti when they bow out after the character who summoned them falls, this means that if your entire party is wiped out whilst Carbuncle is out, he will just bring everyone back, completely nullifying the team wipe. This is like Mercy's old school res from Overwatch, if you're one of the boomers that remembers when that was a thing, of course. It is almost annoying that this was locked behind a pre-order bonus at first, especially seeing as devs almost always make their pre-order bonuses benefit early game players, before losing their relevance later on. This, on the other hand, is so damn strong that it is frustrating that it was locked off from a large subset of the player base for so long. Then again, with how easily this can trivialise the boss fight against Vice, one might argue that it is too good. So, with all of the aforementioned aspects accounted for, how does this game's combat stack up? Well, it is worth noting that the devs placated the purists of the franchise by incorporating an ATB system so as to appeal to the idea that there is still some form of turn-based element in it, but the game is very much action-oriented in nature, though not on the same level as the recently released Final Fantasy XVI, the combat there of which I far prefer. Still though, this game's combat, which revolves around using abilities to stagger your opponents, with some flexibility allowed for style points, combined with the inordinate potential for builds offered by the Materia system, with enemies balanced around the mechanics the game gives you, is unsurprisingly pretty damn good. Up until the release of Final Fantasy XVI, I would have declared this to have the best combat in the series, though that isn't exactly a high bar, considering how limiting turn-based combat is, and why the devs have shifted away from it as the technology and game engines have improved. I see it in the same way I do towards Resident Evil, and a shift from a fixed camera perspective to an over-the-shoulder third-person one. As much as this may be hard to hear for some people, changing from a system that limited the player's ability to comprehend their environment and adjust to it, to one that offers full freedom of not only perspective, but also no longer constrains you to the frustration of changing the movement controls every time the camera changes, is an objective improvement mechanically which is by far the most important aspect to, well, actually playing the game. I want more player freedom and control, not less, 
and whilst I don't have any animosity towards turn-based combat, it is undeniable that it is a thing of the past, an antiquated system that falls short when compared to most modern titles. Sure, there are things that I prefer in the original game's combat system, but if you paid attention to the individual points I made during this section, you'd know that none of these preferences are exclusive to turn-based gameplay. The remake's limited options and variety of mechanics prescribed to the limit system, and how the original is generally superior here, have nothing to do with the original game being turn-based. They could have easily included more limits in the remake, and applied different statuses to them without completely changing up the style. My point being, is that just because I say that the original does some things better in the combat department, doesn't mean that this is a concession that a turn-based system is superior, because my criticism has nothing to do with the overarching combat engine, just individual mechanics and their nuances. There is more to add to this topic in regards to the changes and improvements made in the DLC, but we'll get to that later. The music is one of the biggest parts of Final Fantasy as a whole, and I will say quite firmly that the soundtrack of the FF7 Remake is my favourite video game OST of all time, possibly even beyond gaming. Of course, the original is great too, but I would personally argue that the remake has so much more to offer in regards to the audio quality, diversity of musical styles, and the inclusion of both beautiful and melancholic tracks as well as bombastic, high-octane battle themes. It also has to be said that this game's soundtrack is absolutely enormous, being roughly 9 hours long separated across 7 discs, and that is only accounting for the base OST. If you include the integrated soundtrack and the soundtrack plus tracks, then it is even longer. What is crazy though, is that the quality never diminishes. Sure, there are some tracks that are more favoured than others, but every single track is brilliant, and the same can't be said for most OSTs out there on the market. Whilst there are a ton of composers behind this OST, the main two that handled the project are Nobuo Uematsu, composer of the original game's soundtrack amongst others, and Masashi Hamauzu, known for his works on certain Final Fantasy titles, most notably Final Fantasy X. Most of the tracks in the game are remake renditions of the same tracks from the original, sometimes with some additional flair or straight up new elements included within, but a lot of the tracks are brand new, composed solely for this game. For the sake of this segment, I have composed a short list, with timestamps available both here and in the description. I generally try to stick to the rule of assessing 10 tracks for the main game and 5 for the DLC, more on that later, but I will be directly comparing an additional 5 tracks for the main game with their original counterparts so as to show the difference. As much as I wanted to, and seeing as I have already kinda talked about it a bit previously, I will be refraining from discussing Hollow here, as the YouTube gods don't take too kindly to actual songs with lyrics, though I will leave a link in the description to another breakdown of the song for reference. Lastly, I would like to clarify that most of this comes down to taste, and I have seen many people state that they prefer the original game's OST because, in their own words, the remake sounds too much like a blockbuster movie. Which is funny, because that sounds like praise to me. As the devs have a higher budget and less hardware restrictions so as to use full orchestrations in the game, as opposed to tracks in a MIDI format. It is also worth stating that I am no expert on music. Then again, I am not an expert on most things. <laughs> so take what I say here with a grain of salt. Anyway, let's begin. The beloved opening track of FF7, and one that was treated magnificently with the improvements to the instruments, granting a fittingly explosive demeanour to this track which perfectly represents the mission that our heroes partake on to begin with. Also, I am a massive fan of stories that introduce the player with a grand opening filled with action and suspense, as this is often followed with a perfect counterweight that slows the pace down, and, in an almost thematically relevant manner, this is the same way that I chose to arrange these tracks, so enjoy.
An incredibly ominous track that embodies Shinra's oppressive grip on the world, with a slow yet heavy melody that smooths out to an almost heroic part of the track, which could represent the warped, propagandized view that not only the public has towards them, but also the way they view themselves. The iconic battle theme of Final Fantasy VII has an extended version here, and this plays as Cloud attempts to evade the law enforcement and make it back to his comrades. Whilst the main theme of Final Fantasy VII is officially labelled as Cloud's theme, this track has always embodied his character better, I feel. Or at least, his character early on in the story. That of a cold, stoic mercenary whose heart is currently empty of purpose. He is a formidable warrior, yet one with a history of tragedy, and a history with Shinra, as the motifs of the Shinra theme within the track portray. Originally played in the Village of Calm in the original game, this track is a wonderfully cosy piece that makes the player feel at ease, as if entirely unburdened by all of their troubles. Yeah, you knew we were going to talk about this absolute banger of a track at some point. I, personally, am a huge fan of the fact that they decided to make this track from the original a theme exclusive to the bosses of Shinra's mechanized division, as the track named The Arsenal is a leitmotif of this. With a heavy metal approach to this track, combined with the more bizarre electrical touches of the original as well as the overwhelming choir, this theme easily gets the blood pumping and the longevity and complexity of the composition is one of the reasons I hold this game's OST with such high regard. Anxiety might be one of the few instances where I prefer the incredibly dour and melancholic approach of the original, though that doesn't stop the remake version from reiterating that same depressive appeal that this track is supposed to invoke, especially when combined with Cloud's tragic past, and the heartache he has yet to endure. As stated when I discussed this boss earlier, this track was composed by Ace Combat composer Keiki Kobayashi, and it is incredibly fitting that it plays for an airborne robot. The dark and intimidating chords, juxtaposed with the incredibly heroic aspects of the track, really suit the context of fighting underneath a sunset with the aim of saving a close friend.
Speaking of sunsets, how about this absolute pearl of a track? Whilst it doesn't play for long, and serves as the calm before the storm for the fight against the Valkyrie, it is such a bittersweet track that shows the vestiges of hope that still remain despite the calamity that has just ensued. And this serves as a scaled down example of the overall themes that perpetuate throughout the entire story. A personal favourite of mine, this track is an underappreciated banger, and whilst the theme mostly conveys what you might expect, a fight against a new head of the mega corporation that you are actively fighting against, I like how the third phase of the track plays that exact same heroic sounding part of the Shinra theme I talked about previously, which could represent the fact that Rufus himself isn't wholly evil, and could be foreshadowing his eventual redemption that he undergoes in Advent Children. I was initially planning on using the Whispers theme in this segment as I was narrowing down the shortlist, but I eventually settled on using this instead, as it carries the same motif, yet escalates it to the level you would expect for an entity that supervises over the destiny of everyone on the planet. Aside from these tracks, as stated before, I wanted to compare some tracks from the remake to their original counterparts, with some slight discussions on them for extra effect. Though really, this is more to show just how much difference there is between them. I vastly prefer Tifa's theme in the remake, as I think it just does more with the track, especially with the beauty of the opening. One of the most dark and foreboding tracks from the original, the OST version given in the remake is the more subdued rendition played during Sephiroth's first appearance, though the soundtrack plus does give the much more grandiose version that plays near the end of the game, so there is that. To be fair, it is safe to say that there will almost certainly be a rendition that is more akin to the original game's version in later parts of the remake, so I suppose it is water under the bridge.
I don't suppose it is personal bias when I say that Aerith's theme is one of the best pieces of music I have ever heard. But even if it is, I don't really care. The remix version seems a lot more hopeful to me, whereas the original feels, well, not even melancholic. It is just straight up depressing. This might not have anything to do with how it sounds or how they were composed, as it could just be a subliminal trigger in my brain that instantly reminds me of the context in which this track is played in the original. But I just feel like the original version is depressing, which could be said for the vibes that the entirety of the original OST was going for, as opposed to the remake's more positive and hopeful nature, which, to its benefit, perfectly conforms with the narrative themes of the remake. There is a reason why every Let's Player who played the original lost their mind when Phase 3 started to play, and that is because Genova is one of the most fire tracks from the original. A bizarre, alien-like theme that refers to one of the major villains of the game. The remake version is likely only going to play for this fight in particular, and there may be new versions for the other fights, which is why there are so many new elements to this track that the original didn't have, as it was a much more simple melody. Arguably one of the greatest villain themes ever, and definitively one of the most infamous. One Winged Angel is a dark, intimidating track, perfect for the main antagonist of the story. And it might be an unpopular opinion to say this, but I think the remake version blows the original out of the water. Not that the original is bad, but the added layers, larger orchestration, the crescendos and release of tension, all part of a track that is a whopping 10 minutes long, serve to make a much more complete version of the track. All in all, this soundtrack is a masterpiece, and that is before I talk about the DLC tracks soon enough. If you want more detailed breakdowns on the soundtracks of this game, there are plenty of creators you could check out who both react to and talk about the tracks with much more knowledge than I can bring to the table. Still though, I did need to talk about the music to some degree, so here is my contribution. Anyway, there is one more topic left to discuss before I dive into the DLC content. There is plenty of extra content and various gameplay styles that are available in the game, and this is the time to discuss them. The vast majority of the extra content comes via the VR challenges, 
but there are smaller aspects that I wanted to leave to this segment, such as the bike sections. Either way, let's take a look at the extra content. The first time that the player has any opportunity to partake of the challenge modes that the game has to offer is in Chapter 9 after fighting the Hell House, when the Colosseum opens up for additional battles. There aren't many when compared to the VR room, and they aren't even the slightest bit challenging, but they do offer valuable rewards, chief among them being the manuscripts for the level 2 limit breaks for each character. You can obtain both Cloud and Aerith's limits in Chapter 9, but you'll have to wait for Chapter 14 to return here with both Barrett and Tifa in order to obtain theirs. These challenges will pit either one or more characters against a bunch of enemies that come in waves. After each wave, the HP and MP of every character is partially replenished, even during the hard difficulty challenges. This might seem too strong, but in some of the harder challenges, it often doesn't offset the MP that is used in order to take down some of the tougher enemies. The VR challenges are first available in Chapter 16, when you have to engage in one of them in order to receive the next keycard that is required to proceed throughout the Shinra building. After completing this, some more are available in the same room, though it doesn't include all of them, as most challenges are reserved for the VR room in Hojo's lab. This room in particular is only made available after completing the game, and is found early on in Chapter 17, making it convenient for players trying to access it later. The hardest challenges are found here, and some of them include unique enemies that cannot be found elsewhere. The reason for the difficulty in these challenges is because the player is forced to play them in hard mode, with one specific challenge requiring you to face off against a moth unit, which has an ability called Ultra High Voltage, an incredibly hard to dodge move that can one-shot the player if their character has a low max HP and low defense. As annoying as this is, this can be offset by abusing the elemental resistance given through the elemental plus lightning combo, and I believe that this was intended to push the player into being innovative with their equipment, rather than just mindlessly beating down their enemies. What is harder still, however, would be the final challenge available after completing all 20 parts of Chadley's Battle Intel. Top Secrets. This challenge pits the player against five rounds of summons, on hard difficulty, with a unique boss for the fifth round. I said I would talk about the actual mechanics regarding the summons moves here, rather than during the materia section, so it's time to do that. The summons that you have to face are all of the ones that you would have previously faced in the Battle Intel challenges so the player should be experienced enough with their movesets to be prepared for this, though having the proper elemental setup for Materia should be accounted for. The opponents are, in order, Shiva, Batchokobo, Leviathan, Bahamut, and lastly, the Shinra prototype robot called Pride and Joy. Shiva can be surprisingly tough for a first fight, due to her high damage, ability to stun the player, and her tendency to use diamond dust towards the end of a fight. With her element being that of ice, fire is the obvious counter, but I would advise against using the fire plus elemental materia combo, as one of the later rounds will make this a poor decision. She has a lot of moves that are tough to avoid, such as whiteout and her ice spells, but the next round is definitely made easier to compensate. Fat Chocobo, also known as the Chunkin' Chicken, Plump Pigeon, Pompous Poultry, Chungus Cockerel, Rotund Rooster, Corpulent Capon, I'll stop, is a summon that barely moves and relies on his own summoned entities to dole out damage, though this shouldn't dissuade you from the idea that he is capable of moving incredibly fast, as some of his moves have him careening around the arena without a care in the world. As adorable as this Chungus is, you do have to turn him into a KFC bargain bucket if you want to achieve victory. Still though, he is pretty much a punching bag, as he doesn't put up much of a fight. The same cannot be said, however, of Leviathan, who is the third opponent on the list. Leviathan is really, really, really annoying. It teleports to the edge of the arena and blasts water attacks at the party, which wouldn't be so bad if his hitbox wasn't so obnoxious, being very difficult to hit in most circumstances. Yet even this pales in comparison to the most annoying aspect of this fight, which is when he takes to the skies and calls down water spouts and carpet bombs the area with water projectiles. Most people opt for Cloud, Tifa and Aerith as the party makeup, which leaves only Aerith for laying down consistent ranged damage on Leviathan, so the others will have to cast magic, ideally lightning to bring him back down. 
With the water spouts taking up a massive area of the arena, this part is infuriating to deal with, and is by far the worst boss of the lineup. If you get this far, however, you have one real challenge left, and that is Bahamut. The venerable King of Dragons stands or floats, as the penultimate threat you must face before defeating the Pride and Joy prototype, and he's seen as being the hardest boss of the lot, and there is a good reason why. For starters, Bahamut has no elemental weakness, and has a lot of moves that are very difficult to avoid unless you are using a high mobility asset such as Tifa's Parry. One of his abilities, called Flare Breath, can inflict silence upon the party, meaning you cannot cast spells for a lengthy duration. This is bad because spells are your best bet to stagger him out of his charging phase for his ultimate attack, Mega Flare. If you fail to do so, he will activate a particle field around him which deals constant damage, so that's another thing to account for. The real kicker of this fight, however, is what he does when he reaches half health. He powers up and summons none other than Ifrit, and he fights alongside him. So not only do you have to worry about preventing Bahamut from ravaging your rectum with Mega Flare, but you also have to do this whilst Ifrit is there to interrupt you. Ifrit himself is really easy, but his presence complicates things. Ifrit is not present during the normal fight against Bahamut, only during Top Secrets, but if you can put an end to Bahamut quickly, then sweeping up Ifrit should be a walk in the park, and you will have cleared the hardest part of this challenge. It is actually worth pointing out that you can skip Ifrit's summon entirely if you time the stagger of Bahamut at a certain point of his health pool and there are tutorials out there that can show you how to do this. It is worth noting that this was considered more viable back when the game had just come out, as the integrated release having buffed Synergy meant that you could easily clear this entire challenge by just abusing that alone. If you have made it this far, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is the Pride and Joy prototype, which looks like a prototype version of Proud Clod from the original. This Robit is equipped with a lot of moves that inflict various effects, and require many different methods of evasion, but most of them aren't nearly as threatening as anything else that you would have dealt with up until this point. Except, of course, for his grab attack, which will temporarily disable a character from the fight entirely until either his arm is crippled or a certain amount of time has passed, in which he will slam the character on the ground, effectively one-shotting them. At this point, you may be struggling for MP, making revival difficult, because remember, this fight occurs on hard difficulty, which means no items, such as Phoenix Down. And that is even assuming that you brought a revival materia with you, as it can take up a valuable slot that could be used for something else entirely. Aside from his grab though, Pride and Joy is relatively easy to topple, and an effective player can lock this bot into a constant cycle of being toppled, making this fight pretty straightforward. Should you achieve victory here, you will receive the Gotadamaran accessory, which grants the character who has it equipped with a full limit gauge upon entering a fight, and after using said limit, passively generates the gauge throughout the rest of the fight, allowing the player to consistently unleash their most powerful attacks, which is very effective for hard mode, should the player unlock this before attempting that difficulty. There are different minigames that pop up throughout the game, with most of them relegated to side quests. Personally, I prefer that, as forcing the player to engage in these minigames on every subsequent playthrough gets tiring after a while, and this is something you will have to do for a 100% playthrough. The most infamous minigames are the squatting and pull-up minigames that Cloud and Tifa have to deal with respectively. These minigames consist of pressing the correct face button inputs in a rhythm that progressively increases in speed the more successful inputs are made. In order to make it harder, the visual aid disappears from the screen, meaning that the player has to either rely on the character's animation to determine what point they're at, or go entirely off of the rhythm that they have adapted to. When you add this to the fact that the button order changes between rounds, it is no wonder why so many people struggle with this. That being said, this is everything I want a minigame to be, completely optional, without locking an incredibly good reward behind it, which leaves it for the players that want to challenge themselves specifically. All in all, it is pretty simple and mechanically satisfying. There is also a minigame called Whacker Box, which features Cloud having to run through the cordoned off area behind the kid's hideout and destroy as many boxes as possible within the allotted time. The boxes that provide more points are also more durable, 
and these are the ones that you want to use the abilities on. The first thing that should be done is to destroy the time boxes, like this is a Crash Bandicoot time trial, before going after the others. Something to note is that the abilities that Cloud has are directly tied to the weapon he is using. You can't simply use all of them on one weapon. For instance, if you want to use Disorder, then you have to use the Nail Bat. If you want to use Infinity's End, then you have to use Hard Edge. This mode is pretty straightforward, but there is a significantly harder version in the DLC, and we'll get to that later. The last minigame of note are the bike sections, both in Chapter 4 and 18. These are also rather fun, but the devs did make sure to include an option to skip these on repeat playthroughs, which is a small mercy, as they are quite long-winded. If only they applied this to the other minigames that are plot relevant, such as the honeybee in dance scene. Again, these are fun, but get tedious when you have to replay them over and over again. Upon completion of the game, you can replay the many chapters in hard mode, which increases the enemy levels and even adds more moves to specific bosses. Some examples of this are, but not limited to, the Scorpion Sentinel gaining a second attack of its tail laser, and the Hell House not only spawning Tomberries, but also calling in two robots when it gets very low on health. Whilst these changes certainly spice up these fights, there aren't many of them, and I wouldn't call this a standout feature. What baffles me though, is the specific change they made to MP regeneration in this difficulty. Normally, when you sit down at a bench, you fully refill both HP and MP for all party members. And whilst this seems too easy, I don't think the change to completely remove all MP regeneration upon resting was the right choice to balance this out. Not whilst the ability to use items was also removed, that is. And that is the crux of the problem. Removing the option to restore both HP and MP at benches, but allowing the player to use items, would actually be a good way of getting some use out of the items that would normally gather dust in one's inventory, especially things such as Aether and Elixirs, which I barely had to use, if at all, when playing through this game for the critique. This decision is one I vehemently disagree with, as it makes the experience more difficult whilst taking away the one thing they could use as a finite resource to level the playing field. Seriously, just ask yourself, have you ever, in any Final Fantasy game, felt the need to use all of your items? Most of the time, you end up stockpiling them and never using them. So hard difficulty could have been a great excuse to get some use out of the more niche items that you'll find throughout your adventure. On top of this, hard mode introduces manuscripts that grant the player skill points to fully upgrade all of the weapons in the game, which are either obtained through defeating major bosses or through completing side quests. This is fine on the surface, but there is one specific example I wanted to point out, and you may recall me deliberating on this during the plot synopsis, and that is the fact that you will be expected to replay Chapter 9 multiple times in order to obtain all of the manuscripts. Seeing as you'll get one from completing each of the quest paths that you can obtain during this chapter, that means that you'll not only have to play through this chapter once initially, but at least twice more for the dresses and resolution scenes and twice more after that just for hard mode so you can obtain both manuscripts. It doesn't help that this is already a long and dialogue heavy chapter, but you also have to go through the robot hand segment each time as well. I think this is really annoying, and doesn't exactly help my view on hard mode as a whole. Only those who aim to 100% the game will end up playing this, as a casual player who might want to challenge themselves on a first playthrough, likely won't feel too enthused to replay throughout the entire game just for a higher difficulty, and one that isn't exactly well balanced or thought out at that. Just over a year after the release of the Final Fantasy VII Remake, Square Enix released the next-gen port of the game for the PlayStation 5, called FF7 Remake Integrated. This port offered a series of quality of life improvements, increased frame rate, and an additional piece of content based around a brand new story focused on one of the iconic party members from the original, whom we haven't seen yet, Yuffie Kizaragi. Roughly equating to about an extra 10 to 20 hours of content, this DLC is a worthy addition to the mythos of Final Fantasy VII, and it is high time that I go through it. As you should expect, I will be going through this in a similar manner to how I dissected the base game, which means I'll be starting with a synopsis of the story. Let's begin. We begin with Yuffie arriving in Midgar, which is a story we didn't see in the original, and hopefully one that doesn't conflict with any information that the original provides. 
She hums her own theme, and is startled by some pigeons which causes her to fall. She starts her rehearsal for what she will say to the Avalanche sect that she has been sent to rendezvous with. According to her dialogue, she claims to be an elite special forces operative for the new Wutai government which not only gives her a new role that she never had in the original, as opposed to her simply being a glorified thief, but also states that Wutai has had a shift in government, likely as a response to their peace treaty with Shinra, in which the Wutai nationalists are vilified and imprisoned for trying to start the war back up, and more info is given on this later. This is a positive addition for the story, as more complexity to a world rife with politics is necessary, and the exact thing I advocated for when critiquing the way they handled President Shinra. I couldn't really find any specifics on this, but the way that this DLC has been directed, and with how there is less of a focus on fate and the whispers, with a greater focus on building the world and making Shinra more threatening rather than being incompetent, it makes it seem like Naoki Hamaguchi, who is now the lead director, had most of the control here too, despite Nomura still being credited as lead. Seeing as Nomura decided to step back and have a reduced role prior to the release of the DLC, this would add up. There is definitely a difference of direction here. The Mughal uniform is her way of making contact with Avalanche, as the Avalanche liaison should also be wearing a similar costume. Yuffie's combat feels a lot more fluid than any character in the main game, not only due to the things that the combat team learned when making both, but also because they had the freedom to only develop a fully functioning system for one character. Yuffie comes across a robed man bearing the number 11 on his arm. For some reason it takes her a second to realise that he has no Moogle palm, and is therefore not the contact she is looking for. Whilst this might be a stretch, the look of this man's hair seems... familiar. I wonder who this looks like. Again, it is probably a stretch, but when I first saw this scene, I was really wondering if this was going to turn out to be Genesis who was experimented upon after being taken back to Shinra, and with Deep Ground having a significant role in this DLC, this does seem plausible. Keep this in mind if number 11 returns in Rebirth or beyond. You heard it here first. Yuffie reaches the Sector 7 slums, and catches the news report about the bombing of Mako Reactor 5, placing these current events at the same time that Cloud has just arrived in the Sector 5 slums with Aerith which explains why she doesn't bump into him. Aside from her blurting out her clearly anti-Shin reviews out in the open, she hears a man call out to her, bearing the same Mughal hat that she is wearing. His name is Zhijie, and is clearly of Wutaian descent, likely why he is the contact. He escorts her to their HQ, and they enter. You can see Jesse, Biggs and Wedge talking to each other just outside the headquarters, which is neat. Less neat when you realise that two of them will die tonight, and the other the following night, of course. I haven't ruminated on it yet, and I honestly wanted to keep it for this segment, but I don't really understand why the main theme of FF7 is considered Cloud's theme when it rarely plays when specifically relating to Cloud. It plays here when he is not relevant at all, so how does that work? You know that you can't just play character themes at random and just expect the audience to interpret away the reasoning for it. There has to be a reason for this, other than just having a theme dedicated to a hub area. Yuffie meets the members of Avalanche here, none of which are the members that Barrett talked about during his resolution scene, and as we find out just a little later, this group is a different cell entirely. The members are Nayo, Zhijie, Billy Bob, and Polk. Yuffie notes that a man named Sonon should have arrived, and Polk confirms that he arrived hours ago. She gives them the Chow Beans which are an incredibly tough edible named after the Dachau mountain that you can climb in the original. These things can practically break the jaws of anyone who isn't experienced in eating them, and is a recurring item that has a narrative use later. Think of them as less stupid dumb apples. Yuffie has to wait for Zhijie to obtain both her and Sonon's fake IDs, so she has the opportunity to talk to the other members, and Polk offers her the chance to play Fort Condor. Yep, that's right. That awkward minigame from the original has a board game variant, and it begs the question as to whether or not there will actually be a Fort Condor game mode in Rebirth and Part 3. I'll discuss this in the extra content section, of course. From here, Yuffie can embark on exploring the slums, fighting the enemies and partaking in quests. She can also engage in Fort Condor games against other players, and has to work her way up facing lesser opponents before she can get to the big leagues. All of the opponents are characters that you have encountered in the main game, 
Some characters are expected, such as Johnny, Jesse and Wedge. Some are a little out there, like the Shinra middle manager, who is famously known for saying one of the stupidest lines in the game in the train, and Kyrie, who seems to be everywhere. The one I find really funny though, is Roach, who is seeking out Cloud as a rival, and seems down to play a board game for some reason. If you speak to Chadley, you can fight the summon known as Rama, Lord of Levin. Rama is also yet another recurring summon in this series, and you normally receive his summon materia in the original when you enter the Chocobo Jockey Room at the Gold Saucer. Rama is the only summon available in the DLC, not counting the extra content summons that you could get. Being a summon that calls lightning, he's very good against robotic enemies, and you'll fight plenty of these later. Whilst I would advise waiting until Sonon joins the party before facing him, you can beat him with Yuffie alone pretty easily if you simply abuse her parry and the ranged version of her ability, Windstorm, which I'll touch upon later. Upon returning to the hideout, Sonon returns and introduces himself to Yuffie. Sonon is a brand new character in the remake, and I'm sure that bodes very well for his health. He infers about Yuffie's father, Gordo, and states that he was trained by him, and how she is nothing like her old man. Despite this, Yuffie clearly wants to shift the conversation away from him, hinting that there is bad blood there, and anyone who has played the original will know why. Though some dialogue later implies that there may be more to this than what is provided in the original. Yuffie assumes that he has been drinking and lazing about whilst he has been here, which isn't true, as he has used this time to scout around and gather information. I really like Yuffie's chaotic energy, even when she comes across as a brat, as it sets her apart from the other, more mature characters. She is only 16 after all, and I think most adults can agree when we say that we were all pretty stupid at that age. Hell, some of us still are. <laughs> Nayo tells them to follow her outside when they are ready. The three of them talk about local politics and the quality of living down in the slums. Eventually, they near Seventh Heaven and spot two familiar faces returning to the bar. Nayo notes that they are part of the Avalanche Splinter Cell, showing the limited allegiance that our group shares with that of Barrett's. Nayo ushers both Yuffie and Sonon to the side, therefore avoiding any kind of continuity breach if Yuffie meets Tifa and Barrett. As of the time of this critique, Rebirth hasn't been released yet, so I can't say as to whether or not Yuffie will remember these two when she joins up with the main party, but even if she doesn't, it stands to reason that she wouldn't keep them in her mind as they are both pretty much complete strangers to her. Biggs greets them and inquires about Cloud's absence. Barrett and Tifa break the news, but both remain hopeful at his survival. I'm not sure how I feel about this, as it would be more impactful if they believe Cloud was dead, and this is kind of reinforced by Tifa's dialogue in Chapter 9. They shift the conversation onto what President Shinra said, by slandering Avalanche and claiming their collusion with Wutai, which Barrett denies with a great sense of vitriol. After Tifa calms him down and prevents him from giving up their secrets to the crowd, Biggs informs them of Don Corneo's interest in Barrett, following on from the setups given in the base game. As they head inside, Tifa claims that she'll investigate this matter, and just runs off rather than giving the others any proper headwear. She is rather quiet, and her theme plays here, so she is likely still worried about Cloud, but her investigation into Corneo has nothing to do with that, and is purely for Avalanche's sake, so it isn't woven in too well. The overall mission for Yuffie and Sonon is to steal what they believe is the ultimate materia that Shinra are developing. There isn't much more information given other than that, and there is no such thing as an ultimate materia in the original at any point, so this is quite intriguing. They head to the meeting point for their contact, who will provide the IDs for travelling via the train, but bump into Corneo's goons beforehand. Seeing as Corneo is a pimp, his men are looking for candidates for him, and an amusing scene plays in which Yuffie, who misunderstands the situation, or simply wants her ego stroked, who knows, believes that the men are showing interest in her, when actually they are interested in Naya. She sees right through it, and the men try basically kidnapping her, inciting a fight between them and both Yuffie and Sonon. The fight ends when one of the guys comes and informs the others that a more qualified applicant has appeared, being Tifa of course, and they spare no expense in their description of her. With that fight out of the way, they reach the meeting point, 
Nayo notes that they had someone who could make IDs in-house before they left with the Splinter Cell. This is obviously referencing Jesse. The contact arrives looking like a hip-hop artist, because that is sure to keep prying eyes off of you, and hands over the IDs, which I presume were paid for in advance. They also encounter another robed man, and it seems like they're showing them a lot, which is odd as they don't really have much relevance in the DLC's story. A pigeon arrives with a message from Gigi. He urges them to head to the pillar to meet up with him, and the trio oblige. Upon reaching him, they find that he has been accosted by Shinra guards, and he flees from them, prompting not only the guards to give chase, but also Yuffie and Sonon as well. What follows is an extended sequence which involves following Gigi and his pursuers through a factory in the underbelly of the slums, occasionally beating up the odd monster here and there. This is a cool set piece, backed by good music, which develops depending on the segment that the player is at. In the OST, this track is labelled as The Runaround, and has five parts, which should be an indicator as to how long this segment is. The DLC only consists of two chapters as opposed to the base game's 18, but these two chapters are quite lengthy, especially with all of the side content taken into consideration. After falling off of the conveyor belt, the two encounter a creature called a Horned Cryptshare. This fella is pretty strong, but not quite boss level. It drops a Gozu Drive accessory, which can be used in tandem with the Cthonian armlet earned earlier. This accessory increases damage dealt in proportion with the character's current HP, so the higher the HP currently is, the more damage that shall be dealt. One of the things that I like about the DLC is how they have put a greater effort into their level design and movement. It isn't exactly masterful by any means, but being able to manipulate the environments and climb structures is a damn sight more interesting in terms of diversifying the gameplay. People generally didn't like the forced shimmying segments as it slowed the pace down, and was often a smokescreen for loading and unloading textures and areas. It didn't really bother me per se, as every game does this to some degree. Even the vaunted camera system of the recent God of War games still has blatant loading screens, despite the adherence to a one-shot way of directing the scenes. They descend to a lower level, and come across a sleeping monster. This enemy is the Levricon, and is normally encountered whilst exploring the world map in the original. This is similar to the Horned Cryptshare in that it is a very strong unique enemy, but not quite a boss. Still though, the music here is an absolute banger. It drops the Mezu Drive, which is similar to the Gosu Drive except that it increases damage inversely proportional to the current MP that the character has. This means that the lower the character's MP is, the more damage is dealt. What follows is a pretty pointless minigame, but a satisfying one nonetheless. If you just enjoy smashing shit for no reason, then you'll like this, as you have to ride the platform to the other side, destroying Shinra boxes. After getting across, the duo enter into the facility proper, and make their way to a wide open platform where Gigi is being held captive. Now spill it! Who gave you that information? Oh, his name was something like... Heidegger? Wrong answer! I'm gonna ask you again. Alright, alright, I'll tell you. It was Rufus. You don't say. <laughs> Was it Hojo? <laughs> nice going, Gigi. Ready to do this, boss? Born ready. Great. I'll draw their attention. You grab our guy. A diversion, huh? I like it. <laughs> but don't forget, I'm the leading lady. <laughs> hey, you! Evildoers! Over here! What the hell? Who's there?
Yuffie makes her grand entrance, and the guards call in the big boy. Sonon frees Zhizhi and lets him flee, before they are met by the titanic titanium terror known as the Gigantipede. This is the first major boss of the DLC, and let me tell ya, what a way to start. It is incredibly slow moving, but has some tricks up its proverbial sleeve. For starters, its head is immune to magic damage, but its tail is the opposite. In order to account for its slower movement, it has a lot of zoning abilities, not too dissimilar to the ghoul in the base game. Biotoxin Bomb will leave a damaging area on impact, and it can deploy drones that should be dealt with promptly. At the start of Phase 2, it moves out of melee range and deploys said drones, before it comes crashing down onto the arena. It is the third phase, however, where it starts to get frisky. The cover protecting the head is damaged, revealing a giant drill. Keep using the same tactics as previously, and this mammoth of a machine will eventually crumble. Zhizhi hands over the employee IDs, which are used to get them around the Shinra building. Most of the story beats and dialogue in the DLC is actually decent, but I take issue with Zhizhi knowing about Shinra's plan to destroy Sector 7. Even if he only has a hunch, he should relay this information not only to his group, but also to the Splinter Cell and the Neighbourhood Watch, as they also have a vested interest in keeping the residents safe, and can prepare evacuation efforts prior to a disaster happening yet they aren't aware of this when the event in question happens. The entire reason Shinra's plan works is because Avalanche weren't aware of it until it was too late, and the way Yuffie and Sonon react to this info later makes it seem like they never heard Zhizhi say this here. All in all, none of the heroes should be aware of this info yet. The only ones that should know prior are Cloud, Aerith and Tifa, who procure this info from Donkon Air, and Yuffie and Sonon, who hear it from Scarlet at which point it is probably too late. So yeah, this is a plot hole, as I don't accept that Zhizhi would keep this info to himself. The next scene shows that the HQ is under Shinra surveillance, which, whilst that may lend credence to Zhizhi's inability to provide the info to his compatriots, is debunked later when they see Yuffie and Sonon off at the train station. Not to mention he could have gone to Seventh Heaven and informed the Splinter Cell. So there is that. During the bustling train ride, Yuffie displays her famous motion sickness, and Sonon divulges on the past of his sister, Melfi. She was killed by a mechanised unit towards the end of the Shinra Wutai War around five years ago, and this drives Sonon's quest for vengeance against Shinra. Yuffie disassociates herself from Melfi, and the first chapter reaches its conclusion. They arrive at the Shinra building. One thing I like is that this place is actually full of people, as it should be, whereas it was strangely empty in the main game. The mayor calling for the place to empty isn't a strong reason as this decision would be questioned heavily by security. Why does the reporter, who is the same one snooping around in the Sector 5 slums, aggressively try to get a statement from Yuffie specifically, other than creating forced tension of course? It is kind of annoying how they don't even try to prepare for the situation by wearing different, less conspicuous clothing as well. At least in the base game, the trio that went after Aerith were exploring the areas reserved for visitors, and a guy who looks like a soldier escorting them wouldn't make people look twice, so there's that. Sadly, this is all to get a commotion going just so that both Yuffie and Sonon can sneak through, which is contrived as hell. That being said, Scarlet and her guards also enter the elevator, and for a moment, I was about to criticise how they don't seem suspicious about these strangely dressed and fully armed people casually going down to a heavily restricted floor. But Scarlet immediately sees right through it, and uses this as an opportunity to gloat. She leaves the elevator and locks the door behind her, forcing us to proceed through a gauntlet of enemies in order to get to the grand prize. Sonon confirms that Scarlet, being the head of the Advanced Weaponry Division, was the primary individual to blame for Melfi's death, and laments on how he might not get a better chance to kill her. Yuffie helps him refocus, and they head onwards. The atmosphere here is immaculate, helped on by a brilliant score that underlines the highly technological environment that they're stumbling into. Remember how I discussed the additional lore that they've added regarding Wutai and its political landscape? Well, here is the payoff. Yuffie chastises her father for being weak-willed and a drunk, which prompts Sonon to talk about him. Yuffie states that Godo has actually been imprisoned, by the new government's doing, 
which is not the case at all in the original. In fact, Godo is pretty much the de facto leader of the place alongside the other Guardians, and not from behind bars as he seems to be here. This adjustment can only mean that we're likely going to be participating in a coup for the Wutai government in either Rebirth or Part 3, as this additional law has to have been added in for a reason. And seeing as you can go to Wutai as part of an optional side quest in the original, it will almost certainly be mandatory this time around. Back on topic though, Scarlet is overhearing everything, and is using this opportunity to test her weapons. On us, of course, and that is what most of this chapter will entail. As Scarlet is keeping tabs on them, she describes them as Teenage Ninjas, which is evidently a reference to Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, as turtles are a consistent theme of all things with Tyan, as well as Sonon describing Yuffie as a mutant earlier. It is pretty amusing, that is all. From here, both Yuffie and Sonon make their way through the production facility, facing various threats, and even come across a half-built chassis of what appears to be Proud Claude, as it looks much larger than the Pride and Joy prototype that I've previously mentioned. There is a training facility here, which is a similar type of game mode to the Wacker Box minigame from the base game. Remember when I said I would talk about it? Well, I won't be. Not yet, anyway. Sonon and Yuffie discuss the partnership that they have developed between Wutai and Avalanche, and whether or not it is just temporary, or something more. Sonon notes on the differences that they have in worldview, and they end up getting lost. But that does give them time for a little break. They keep on fighting through the forces that stand in their way, before reaching Scarlet's observation room that we see in the base game. They assume that the ultimate materia that they have been searching for lies within this tube, but Yuffie can't see inside to verify this. When they return to the room, it turns out to not be the case, and they're attacked by two dudes in mech suits, and the player is forced to fight them in an incredibly cramped room that doesn't suit these enemies in the slightest. Beyond the fighting, Scarlet wishes to communicate with Yuffie and Sonon directly, and does so via hologram. Yuffie seems to be checking out the... <coughs> goods, whereas Sonon challenges Scarlet directly. She directs them out of the room, where she has more obstacles in store for them. This next sequence is quite cool, as you get to choose a path through the next area by selecting what type of enemy that you wish to face, and will repeat the process until you get to the end. Of course, if you want to assess every enemy, you'll have to go through here multiple times. Thankfully, the devs implemented a terminal that will allow the player to teleport back to the star if need be, which prevents the necessity of multiple playthroughs. Once done, they head into the next chamber, where Scarlet has prepared her nastiest surprise yet. The Crimson Mare is a badass fight, and is our first time seeing Scarlet actually entering the fray as opposed to staying on the sidelines. The Mare is highly mobile and can barrage the player with attacks very quickly, assisted by the many turrets that litter the arena, which should probably be dealt with first. Not only can the player target the mech, but they can also go after the pilot as well. Depleting Scarlet's HP will render the mech temporarily inoperable, which leaves ample room for the player to lather hits in. The second phase adds another interesting layer to the fight, in that Scarlet can hot swap the weaponry of the mare frequently, making her moveset much more varied. The initial upgrade that it receives are twin Mako cannons, capable of emitting searing hot beams of plasma towards their targets. Though these weapons can be destroyed, making the mech impotent for a limited time. After a while though, Scarlet will re-outfit the mech with more weaponry. It can also wield both a sword and shield for a more melee focused style. In summary, this is a fast paced and exciting fight, and suits the gameplay style that the DLC offers incredibly well. After this hectic fight ensues, Scarlet is left vulnerable. Upon activating a personal panic button, we are presented with the first appearance of Deep Ground, an organisation that originated in the compilation game Dirge of Cerberus. Whilst Dirge is not looked upon fondly, and for good reason, there are plenty of aspects that can be taken and improved upon, and the DLC does just that. First on the docket is the surreptitious servant of darkness, Nero, who exits a containment vessel and communes with his brother, Vice. Whilst the context here is vague, especially for newcomers to the remake, this is clearly made to appeal to those of us that have consumed the compilation, for better or worse. We return to the heroes, and they are interrogating Scarlet. When Yuffie inquires after the ultimate materia, 
Scarlet presupposes that there must be a mole within Shinra feeding info to Wutai, of which she is absolutely correct, of course. She declares that the ultimate materia in question is currently in development, but is nowhere near completion. Yuffie decides to probe a little further. You are correct that we're in the process of creating an exquisite new materia. However, it is far from complete. Yeah, right. You must think I'm stupid. Would I lie to you? Regrettable though it is, other plans have been deemed a higher priority. What other plans? <laughs> well, just between you and me, my colleagues and I are going to drop plate number seven on the slums. And then we're going to blame it on Avalanche and Wutai. I don't get it. You're gonna drop a plate? And? Oh dear! I think your friend might have run into trouble. Aren't you going to save him? <laughs> Quickly now! <laughs> Yuffie finds Sonon engaged in battle with a clan of elite operatives belonging to Deep Ground, and they discuss the information Yuffie obtained. As stated before, this should be the first time that either of them learn about the plan to destroy Sector 7, as they wouldn't have the opportunity to relay this info back to the Avalanche team, and therefore wouldn't be able to stop this reckoning. The Deep Ground soldiers are capable of using active camo to flank their targets, and can sometimes trade hits with Yuffie in a grab animation that emphasises the level of skill that these guys possess. The cutscenes reinforce this too, as they successfully kite the two Wutaians into a position which forces them to retreat into a room. When the guards stop with their aim trained on them, this isn't an issue, as the guards have been expressly ordered not to kill them. Instead, Scarlet seeks a little payback. It turns out that they were corralled into a VR room, and are forced into a skirmish against a series of opponents, which are relatively straightforward to deal with, until the final challenge presents itself being a floating projector enveloped in a shield. This little guy can manifest this... thing... Which seems kinda similar to the final form of Hojo in the original, I suppose, but I digress. This fight is centred on defeating the monster in order to expose the projector and destroy it. Due to the projector's health and the length of time it remains staggered for, it will likely take two cycles to destroy it on a first playthrough, and the creature itself isn't that durable, so this fight can be pretty swift. Aside from a pretty sneaky grab attack and some application of poison, there isn't much to discuss here, as this is merely the prelude to the main event. They leave the room and witness the mess left behind by Nero. I think it goes without saying that the particle effects are pretty incredible in this game, arguably some of the best I've ever seen in a video game, and this moment is evidence enough. They proceed down the hall, and face down the Architect of the Abyss. Subjects on site. It's time. Initiate the Tvia field test. Sir. Take a different tack. I can't blame a girl for trying. Now, let the games begin. Nero comes across as relatively simple and not that threatening on the surface, aside from his slippery movement and his fondness for grabbing the player, but his appearance obviously belies a darker power, and one that was restricted, as it is clear that he is merely holding back. Relinquishing the straitjacket enhances his power, and this fight significantly, as he can speed up his own attacks with haste, and uses his powers of darkness to sap the player's life force, gradually draining health. This is all a steady progression, however, to his third phase, 
wherein the arena starts to drown in darkness and Nero's power grows. He begins to use things such as teleportation, zoning, ranged magic, and can even coat the arena in dark energy in order to mask his movements. The real gimmick here is the gradual life sap, which if left unchecked will drop the player into red health levels, and it is here that Nero can use Soul Erosion, an ability that will instantly knock out the targeted character if their health is within the level that would cause the colour to change to red. This can be easily countered by quickly healing above that level, though supposedly you can stagger him out of the move as well, but this is not something I was privy to whilst gathering footage. It is a fun and tonally excellent fight, and with a little graft, both Yuffie and Sonon put an end to this tenebrous foe. Despite their victory, Sonon notices that the threat is still here, and flashes back to when he lost his sister, with a symbolic mirroring of the situation. But this time, Sonon won't lose another person close to his heart. One of my personal gripes with the base game was the abject lack of balls that the game had when it came to displaying graphic content during serious situations, most notably blood, as this is something that can take the player right out of it. If you're going to establish darker themes such as genocide, political strife, pimping, and even rape, then you can't be afraid to have a slight smattering of blood when a dude gets riddled with bullets. Seriously, I can't be the only one who has this issue. Either way, thankfully, both here and in the most recent trailer for Rebirth, they have included some blood to remind us that this isn't some Looney Tunes skit. People are actually dying here, and it is often messy. FF16 got this perfectly right, and it was annoying to see people disparage that game as being too much like Game of Thrones because of its nature as a darker story. Hey, guys, you do know that George R. R. Martin doesn't own a monopoly on violence, right? Okay, moving on. It is here that we get the full roundabout on Sonon's story with Melfi, and how he sees Yuffie as someone who can fill in that hole of a younger sister to him. As he pushes Yuffie to safety, he falls to his knees, and sees Melfi again once more. The beans may be a tad on the nose, but I like the detail of him failing to eat it despite being able to do so easily earlier, as he is failing to move on, and the world isn't done with him yet. As Sonon perishes, Nero reaches out from the shadows, carrying his corpse away, indicating that Sonon won't be left to rest in peace, and that Yuffie may have to confront him in the future. Yuffie flees from the Shinra building in tears, desperately trying to once again disassociate herself from the bond she had built with Sonon, before bearing witness to the horror of the plate collapsing. The build-up of pain she has suffered is released, as she screams into the night sky, closing the book on this chapter of the story. This is just wrong. It has been some time since the events that have just unfolded, and Yuffie now roams the world, unsure of what to do next. She didn't procure what she set out to obtain, and is now aimless in terms of motivation, which leads neatly into her role alongside the rest of the party further into the story. Speaking of the party, we actually get to catch up with them, and see them after the conclusion of the main story. I can't even begin to tell you how excited I was to see this, as this is our first taste of what the outside world looks like in the remake trilogy. Their characters have an amusing set of discussions on the road, and attempt to flag down a car, with Tifa showing Aerith how to do so due to her lack of experience doing so. They eventually succeed, and the driver in question is Chocobo Bill, the owner of the Chocobo farm who will almost certainly remember them when they come to procure Chocobos later. Eventually, they reach the town of Calm, and it begins to rain. Aerith, being unfamiliar with the feeling of rainfall, is excited to see it, and signals to Cloud about it. Cloud asks if she's okay, and she shows her signs of nervousness. Barrett interjects about her line, stating that it is a sign of being hungry, and it is cute to think that only Cloud knows of Aerith's anxiety of the outside world, and his willingness to both comfort and support her about it, shows just how far their relationship has come, and will go. The two of them share looks, and head off to the town, 
staging our opening for Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. That being said, it ain't over. We return to the church in the Sector 5 slums to find Zack standing there, pacing back and forth, curious as to what to say to Aerith when he sees her. I know that I have made it clear that I don't really care for Zack, but I am mostly ambivalent towards him. He's fine, I just think that people massively overrate him. Either way, I do actually like this scene. Despite the criticisms towards Caleb Pierce's performance, which I think is valid in the case of what little I have heard from the Crisis Core remake, I think he does a good job here. What is intriguing though, is what happens when he enters. We see a crowd of people, scared and crying, for an unknown reason, but what is bizarre is that the camera focuses solely on Zack's reaction, with him seeming like he has seen a ghost. He utters Aerith's name in a concerned tone, and it cuts to black. This has been a scene that has racked many a person's brain, but my reading of this, bolstered by the additional context provided by the trailers for Rebirth, is that Zack is completely separate from the others, and is situated in a parallel timeline in which the entire party has been slain. What he sees here could be a recently constructed headstone or memorial dedicated to Aerith, and the people of the Sector 5 slums have come to participate in a wake, as she was seen as a pillar of the community, and as such they are mourning her passing. Some people have lingered on whether or not the bright white background behind Zack has any significance, as it could represent that Zack is truly dead, and this is all in his head, but I doubt it. It is likely just the glare from the outside, hyperbolized for dramatic effect. As to what the scene truly conveys, however, will have to be ascertained in the future. The story is shorter than the main game, so there is a higher likelihood that this story would come across as more focused. And whilst there are some really good additions to this story, such as the extra lore regarding Wutai and its political landscape, the perspective of another avalanche group outside of Barrett's team, and a much more well handled inclusion of the Deep Ground organisation, there are also some aspects that detract from the story that was already present such as Zizhi being aware of the danger awaiting Sector 7. Overall though, I would say that it balances out to being decent overall. Generally, this DLC was well received, especially due to how well they executed the additions of the compilation, and by that I mean how they massively improved said additions in every conceivable way. Despite the inclusion of this DLC in the first part of the trilogy, this may be the only one, as there doesn't seem to be any plans for other side stories in the form of DLC in later games. Now, let's take a quick gander at the characters. I will be taking a look at the Deuteragonists and two of the villains here, as there is a lot less to build on in terms of characters here due to some of them already being present in the main game, and the shorter nature of the DLC making it difficult for characters to get the appropriate amount of development that they need. Yuffie was an entirely optional character in the original game, and therefore didn't get nearly as much screen time as was needed in order to flesh out her character. Due to her obvious canonicity from her inclusion in the compilation, such as in Advent Children and Dirge of Cerberus, she was certainly going to be a main character in the remake, and this DLC helps in setting her up for her entry into the main party. Yuffie is characterised as a die-hard nationalist of her homeland, operating off of the stories of her elders and the expectations foisted on her by being the daughter of one of the nation's leaders, Gerdo. She had a sketchy relationship with her father in the original, but it was because she saw him as a coward that bent over backwards for Shinra by accepting the peace treaty rather than trying to destroy them for everything they had done. Of course, Gerdo did what he had to do for his people, and the other elders were in agreement with this. He still held hatred for Shinra, and always cared for Yuffie no matter how much she pushed back against him. Eventually, they would repair that bond, but that would be the last time that Godo held any relevance in the story. The DLC frames the relationship between them as being even more skewed, due to Godo being supposedly imprisoned, and her agreement with this decision. She also claims to be an agent of the government that jailed him, which could lead to some interesting conflict between the two going forward, when he will obviously break out. This would be a perfect opportunity for us to see the Shinra Wutai War being resumed, as this was already set up as a possibility in the base game. Because Godo could rebel against the Wutai government, this might be noticed by Shinra, who uses the opportunity to attack once again. 
Imagine a set piece where the full party joins the defense of Wutai for Yuffie's sake, due to the relationship that they all foster for her. When paired with an extra garnish of internal Wutai politics, this could be a great narrative thread, though I highly doubt that this is ever going to happen. Sonon is a brand new character for this story, and he is, well, pretty bland. To be fair, with how short the DLC is, and because they plan to kill him off, it stands to reason why he doesn't get a whole lot to his character. But my concern is with how dry he is as a personality. Every line seems to be delivered with pure apathy, and it doesn't really help people latch onto a brand new character. As far as consistency goes, however, there aren't really any issues with him, as his character is a student of Godo, whose main drive to defeat Shinra is to avenge the death of his sister. All of the traits that spawn off of these core ideals are consistent to what would be expected of him, so from a writing standpoint, he is fine. Making his dialogue a little less dry and wooden would have gone a long way though. Scarlet gets a lot more time in the limelight here, and I am a big fan of it, as she is really fun as an antagonist. It also makes sense as she is the direct antagonist for Sonon. As the director of the Advanced Weaponry Division, we often assume that she would stay on the sidelines, but having her pilot her own mech makes her that much more imposing. Really though, it is her charisma and downright arrogant personality that makes her a compelling villain. A person who is just evil in every sense of the word. Both of these characters are pretty weak in Dirge of Cerberus, and only Nero gets much screen time here too. When I said that they were handled better here than in Dirge, I mostly meant this in the sense that they were simply used as weapons rather than being fully fleshed out characters. These are two genetically enhanced soldiers, who are part of a division that even most of the higher ups are unaware of, with their DNA being altered by Mako energy during the fetal stage. Their entire lives are to be slaves of Shinra, and I think it serves the overall story better if they are simply muscle. One of the things that is incredibly frustrating about Dirge's plot is that Deep Ground is established as being a much more grounded threat for the heroes than Sephiroth was, who was a threat to the entire planet. Lowering the stakes at first is actually what made me somewhat interested in that story. But of course, as expected, they just had to jump the shark and enforce yet another world-ending threat in terms of both Chaos and Omega. When combined with the laughably stupid choice to have Vice be a vessel for Hojo's consciousness, however the fuck that is supposed to work, it meant that the end of that story was just bad. It completely invalidated Hojo's perfect death at the hands of the heroes in the original, especially thematically, as Hojo injecting himself with Genova cells and rejecting humanity before transforming into an imperfect monster before being killed and forgotten by society was a perfect way to spit on one of the most disgusting characters in the entire story. It was appropriate. Back to the point though, I simply think that having both Vice and Nero simply be really, really special soldiers is just the better choice. Of course, the ending of the Vice fight shows that they're gonna go down the same path most likely, so I won't hold my breath. The general gameplay is obviously nigh indistinguishable from the base game, with the only notable distinction being the extra layers added to the level design which facilitates the increased verticality that the characters possess. The biggest changes are reserved for the combat, which focuses on the one area that received substantial criticism in the main game, being the limited control that players had in regards to aerial combat. Yuffie can launch enemies into the air quite easily with her basic attacks, and can follow them up into the air, as well as maintaining her airtime by interchangeably throwing out her shuriken and recalling it back. It is quite basic, but gives her the option to consistently handle airborne adversaries. I am not sure if they will give the other party members similar aerial control in Rebirth and Beyond, as this could simply be a playstyle exclusive to Yufa, but at least it shows that the devs are still adding to the systems that they have in place. Whilst the shuriken is ravaging enemies, Yufi can continue piling under pressure by throwing smaller projectiles at opponents using her ninjutsu techniques. The DLC opts away from allowing the player to control different party members, as Sonon can only be issued commands. But that isn't the death knell of strategic combat that you might think it is, 
as they included a synergy system to make the most of this change. Sonon is capable of dealing with enemies quite well, and has abilities that are meant to draw enemies away from Yuffie. Something that is very cool is that if Yuffie falls during combat, he will sacrifice his own health to resurrect her, as you can't control him, but this does mean that he will need to be resurrected himself. Another good addition that the combat devs made was the inclusion of a perfect block mechanic, which can grant a particular buff to Yuffie if she times her block just as an enemy attack connects with her. The buff varies depending on the weapon that she is wielding. Most of her abilities also have a lot more going on than most of the character abilities in the base game. And speaking of which, let's get into them, shall we? The two characters have three weapons each, excluding the bonus DLC weapon that Yuffie receives. Before I discuss them and their abilities though, I'll use this opportunity to talk about both Yuffie and Sonon's basic weapon abilities. Yuffie has two basic abilities, those being Art of War and Windstorm. Art of War is an ability that hits multiple times, and has an added benefit of making the struck enemy more susceptible to attacks from her ninjutsu style. Windstorm, an attack that obviously deals wind damage, has two variations depending on whether or not Yuffie has her shuriken in hand. If she has the weapon with her, she will create an AoE that is effective at dealing with weaker enemies, but the version that is cast when the shuriken is currently embedded in an enemy is far superior, as it deals a significant amount of damage, and has a very quick cast time. Sonon's basic is Twirling Lunge, which functions similarly to all of the focused moves for the characters in the base game, as it vastly increases the stagger gauge. With these established, let's see what the weapons give you. The default weapon for Yuffie in both the original and remake is the Four Point Shuriken, a cool looking weapon that offers a balanced approach. The ability tied to this is called Elemental Ninjutsu, which changes the elemental affinity of Yuffie's ranged attacks when the Shuriken has been thrown. This is very strong in pretty much every scenario, as the damage bonuses do add up quite quickly, but is useful as it doesn't force the player to have one of each elemental materia on hand at all times, just in case an enemy comes along that is weak to one of them. This ability also goes hand in hand with Banishment, more on that soon. If you wish to opt for a more magically oriented playstyle, especially when combined with Elemental Ninjutsu, then the Boomerang fits the bill. This weapon is another one that returns from the original game, being obtainable by stealing one from an enemy called Formula, in the same location that you can find Yuffie for the first time. In the remake, it is found within a chest in the Avalanche headquarters. The ability granted via this weapon is called Brumal Form, which allows the player to avoid any attack and move in a particular direction if timed correctly. It is basically another dodge with tighter timing, though it does grant an ATB boost if performed successfully, encouraging players to use it often, just like Cloud's Disorder. It is yet another ability that factors into Yuffie's more complex and flashy combat style. In direct contrast to the Boomerang, this weapon is more focused on physical damage. It is brand new to the remake, and is found in a chest deep in the bowels of the facility that Yuffie and Sonon trips through. The ability that this gives is called Banishment, which I alluded to earlier. Banishment is an ability that casts a magical attack on an enemy from a distance, which can either be straight magic damage, or altered to whatever affinity that Yuffie has changed to via elemental ninjutsu. It can be charged in power by simply using ATB on other abilities first, after enough has been used, Banishment can do tremendous damage to either a single target or a group, as the size of the blast is pretty damn large. The Cax Star is a bonus weapon, initially obtained by pre-ordering the Integrated release in 2021, before becoming available to all after the release of the PC port at the end of that year, and around the time that I began this critique, which should put it into perspective just how long it has taken to get this bastard out, so you're welcome. Anyway, the weapon isn't too special, and its ability, Cactuar Caper, is a pretty standard attack that hits multiple enemies in quick succession. Sonon can empower Yuffie's special abilities whilst in the synergized state, which causes both Yuffie and Sonon to attack simultaneously, and can heavily stagger enemies when comboed to its full extent. Both of Yuffie's basic abilities, Art of War and Windstorm, gain buffed variants when synergized, though both Yuffie and Sonon have to have at least one bar of ATB each to perform. This mechanic is insanely strong, and honestly kinda trivialises the entire DLC relay. But there is one drawback, 
and that is that Sonon's ATB gauge increases significantly slower whilst synergized. Despite not being playable, Sonon still has different weapons with different stat spreads. As you might expect, there are abilities tied to each of them, so let's go. The most well-rounded staff for Sonon, the Martialist staff is likely going to be left behind pretty quickly as soon as you get the other two, but it is fine for what it is. The ability connected to this weapon is Swirling Storm, a flurry of attacks that deal good damage. It may not be a spectacular ability, but it is good for staggered enemies, though I think you would be better off using Sonon's ATB for synergized abilities instead. The staff that is geared towards physical damage, this staff is found in a chest before you head into the underbelly of the Sector 7 slums. The ability that comes with it is called Fighting Spirit, and allows Sonon to focus down on a singular enemy, which is a good way of building ATB. His final staff is the Jin Staff, which is built for magic damage, and is likely the most useful if you simply abuse the synergy material often. It is found in a chest early on in Chapter 2, and its ability is called Insight, which lures an enemy into attacking him until Yuffie inflicts a certain amount of damage to them. As you can see, most of his abilities are meant to make Yuffie's job easier, as they help facilitate her moves. All in all, the paired combat style of both Yuffie and Sonon is incredibly fun to engage in, but clearly lacks the flesh that the original game's combat had, due to the DLC being much shorter as a content package. Still, it is a great stepping stone for further advancements to the combat system going forward. Instead of dedicating an entire segment to it, there are only two new pieces of materia added via the DLC, and one of them is the Rammer Summon, who I have already mentioned. The other is a command materia called Ninja Cannonball, which is found in a materia capsule in Chapter 2, and allows an extra attack that can be performed in which Sonon uses his staff to propel Yuffie into an enemy. It is pretty cool, but being the only new addition to Materia makes this seem lacking. Yuffie and Sonon of course have their own limit breaks, though they are limited to the one that they have at the start. Yuffie has Bloodbath, where she charges towards the enemy, blending them to shreds with her shuriken, and Sonon has Dance of the Dragon, where he channels the power of Rutai's guardian spirit, Leviathan, to pummel enemies with his staff. The real power though lies in their ability to synergize their limit breaks together. Yep, that's right, you can delete anything from the face of the earth by waiting for both characters to gain their limit, and using Limit Sync when synergized. What results is an incredible looking finish that is hopefully utilized in the sequel games. There are also some changes to the equipment and accessory system too. One of the things that the base game lacked was equipment that double or even triple materia growth, and Intermission adds both of these with the Ninja and Volant armlets. The Cofonian armlet is quite unique in that it can have certain accessories paired with it for additional bonuses. The last new piece of equipment added in the DLC also has an extra bonus attached to it. The Firebird armlet can prevent being knocked out once per battle, just like certain accessories in the base game. Including equipment that have bonus effects is a good change, and puts this DLC more in line with the original game in that regard. One of the new accessories added into the DLC is the Extolled Ribbon, which renders the wearer immune from all status effects. It was incredible in the original, and it is very good here too. The gameplay additions of the DLC serve the exact purpose that they are expected to, as test runs for the mechanics and items that are potentially going to be included in the following games, and in that regard, I think that the inclusions and changes are for the better. Remaining consistent with the base game, the music in the DLC is just as fantastic. As said during the segment on the main game's OST, I will be covering 5 tracks from the DLC, due mostly to the lesser pool of tracks to pick from, and because I have chewed the fat long enough on this topic. Anyways, here we go. Yuffie's theme has been wonderfully recreated in the remake, and offers a much lighter tone to the story as a whole, incredibly fitting for a goofy, downright immature lass. That being said, there is also a battle variant that is absolute fire. Listen for yourself.
This track stands out to me not just for being a great track individually, but because it builds a bridge in terms of style with Crisis Core, which is good for the overall consistency of the compilation's soundtracks. Of course, I have a certain, well, disdain towards Crisis Core, and one that is entirely founded on objective reasoning, but it does have to be said that I do really like Crisis Core soundtrack, so getting that same vibe here does put a smile on my face. Yet another high energy track that perfectly encapsulates the duel with the boss in question. This track really pleases me with the subtle hints of the Wu-Tai theme strewn throughout. Listen out for it if you can. Of course, the same motif that is used for the Shinra robot fights is also reiterated here. This track is actually not a remake of one from the original game, but from Dirge of Cerberus instead. Masashi Hamauzu was the composer for that game and has created some brilliant renditions of those tracks. This one in particular is a hard hitting beat that represents the might that the specialist Deep Ground Division has to offer. I went back to listen to the Dirge of Cerberus OST in order to try and find any connections between Nero's themes here, in comparison to that game, yet I couldn't find any. If anyone does know of any links, feel free to let me know. Anyway, in regards to this track, I think Nero's boss themes are superior to that of his brother, especially as they are so damn creepy and dissonant in their composition, making the title for Phase 1's track very appropriate. The slow, malicious build-up in the first phase surges upward as the second phase includes piano notes and a gentle crescendo. Phase 3 gathers up all of that dark energy and lavishes the player with a nightmarish lullaby that is sure to send them into a permanent soporific slumber. The DLC keeps the trend going in regards to having a tremendous soundtrack, and now it is just a matter of time until Rebirth releases, which shall hopefully possess not only an incredible array of new tracks, 
but also a collection of tracks from the original game that have yet to be remade. I also challenge Uematsu-san and all of the other composers to make another rendition of One Winged Angel that surpasses the length of the remake version. Can you imagine a ridiculous 20 minute version that is unrelenting and just keeps going? Come on, do it you cowards! <laughs> the DLC doesn't have nearly as much side stuff to offer, to no one's surprise, but what it does offer might stand out a lot more in comparison. As far as hard mode and the combat sim challenges go, there isn't much difference, but Top Secrets returns and has some variations, mostly in that it is an absolute joke difficulty wise. The three rounds have you facing Bahamut and Ifrit, Rama, and the 0.5 version of Pride and Joy, which I think is supposed to be a harder version, but I couldn't really tell the difference as it died in the blink of an eye. Bahamut is easily the hardest part of this challenge yet again, and as such it is fortunate that he is the first opponent, as getting past him means the rest is smooth sailing. Rama is a really cool summon, and has a lot of moves that urge the player into getting precision blocks due to some being difficult to dodge. His moveset seems purpose built to facilitate zoning, which is rather counterintuitive to him as Yuffie's windstorm can be used from the other end of the arena and absolutely shreds him. However, as cool as he is, he falls victim to the same mechanic that all of the others do, the Synergize system. Synergizing with Sonon and just full on inting into the enemy is legitimately the best strat to complete this challenge, and it is laughable just how much damage you can inflict as well as how easy it is to stagger them. The attempt to balance this feature by lowering the ATB gain barely matters, as you do so much damage without it, and the ATB should just be used to spam Synergized Art of War anyway. I can safely say that whilst I welcome team up attacks, the poor balance basically cripples this challenge entirely. The two other things that the DLC offers in terms of meaningful side content are the minigames, one being the Shinra Box Buster challenge, and the other being Fort Condor. Let's start by going over the Box Buster minigame. You'll notice how similar this is to the Wacker Box game from the base game, with some changes to account for the added depth that Yuffie's mechanics allow. The two different coloured boxes are either weak to Yuffie's physical damage from melee attacks, or her magic based ninjutsu attacks. You can destroy both types of boxes however you want, but if you want to conquer the hardest difficulty variant of this minigame, you'll need to be as efficient as possible with the time bank, and have an acute understanding of what route to take, and what abilities to use. I noted how the ranged variation of Yuffie's windstorm ability does far more damage than the close range one, and that comes into play here. In order to conquer the soldier difficulty, you need to accrue 50,000 points, which actually means that you have to destroy every single box in order to attain it. This is really difficult, as you'll likely only be left with a few seconds to spare, no matter how efficient you are. I generally don't like challenges that have such a fine margin for error like this, especially for people like myself who enjoy completing everything that the game has to offer, and I had to for the sake of this critique. Either way, if you're struggling with this, make sure to use the ranged windstorm on the 1500 point boxes, and build up the power of banishment so that you can easily crush the group of 1500 boxes towards the end. It'll take some trial and error more than likely, but it is absolutely feasible. It is a welcoming challenge I suppose, and definitely more memorable than the version in the base game, that's for sure. The pièce de résistance of the DLC side content is, of course, Fort Condor a board game named and based upon the infamous minigame from the original game, the premise of which revolves around defending the stronghold from the opposition army. A tower defence, basically. The board game changes this up by allowing the player to engage upon their opponent's defences too. The rules are as follows. Both players have three towers that they must defend, while simultaneously attempting to destroy the opponents. The towers have their own built-in defence mechanism to ward off attackers, and the game ends when either side loses their main tower. Both players have different types of boards at their disposal, some of which have higher ATB charges, allowing for more units to be deployed quickly, or larger units to be deployed at all. Some boards that have lesser ATB charges, or less useful spells, will have a faster ATB charge speed to account for it. Speaking of spells, these are one-time use benefits that can either support your own units and towers, or weaken the opponents. Basic offensive spells such as Fire or Lightning can give the player an edge in removing a portion of a tower's HP so as to help with controlling the board earlier, or they can be used defensively to quickly dispose of an immediate threat to your own towers. 
Supportive spells, such as Cure or Haste, can help with empowering your own units. Units function almost like a game of rock, paper, scissors, where some units excel at taking down another type, but are heavily enfeebled when attacked by another. The player will have to remain aware of these things at all times, and adjust accordingly. The player can see what board the opponent uses, and what units they have at their disposal before the match begins, so this gives the player the forewarning to adjust their own build to counteract theirs. The units you'll have available at any given time are decided by a Tetris style random selection based on what units you chose beforehand, and what the situation calls for the most. Whilst the player will likely opt for the stronger units due to their health and damage output, sometimes it can be salubrious to deploy weaker units, as you can spam them more often and keep the enemy pinned down. The position in which you can deploy your units depends on where your other units currently are, and this change can be visualised by the line on the board. You will only be able to place them on your side to begin with, but advancing your units to the opponent's side will allow new units to be spawned there as long as there are any currently surviving units available to spawn off of. A strong strategy can be to place barracks as far up as you can go, so the enemy are too pressured to attack your base as they are too preoccupied defending their own. This isn't exactly airtight though, and some opponents have board layouts that can exploit this aggressive strategy, so make sure to experiment. Some units are constricted to melee attacks only, and this can make them worthless against airborne units, who have no such restrictions. Generally, you're going to want to opt for ranged and preferably airborne units as much as possible, as that can entirely prevent some enemy units from being able to attack you at all. Most of the boards that you can use are either won through beating other opponents, or by purchasing them from vendors. The same can almost be said for the units too, as you can purchase most of them although some are found in chests throughout Chapter 1, even during the segment where you follow Zizhi. So if you want every advantage in order to beat all of the opponents, you should get close to finishing Chapter 1. The win conditions, as previously stated, are simple. Either destroy all of the enemy towers, or just the headquarters. There is a time limit to force the player into a sense of aggression, because if the timer expires, then the person with the most towers left standing wins. So if you lost a tower, but were within inches of destroying the opponent's headquarters without destroying either of their outposts, then you will lose when the timer runs dry. If both players have the same amount of towers left standing by the end, then it will come down to sudden death, in which the victor is decided by whoever shifts the deficit first. Merely destroy a singular tower to claim victory. There is a version of this game that is available on hard mode, which changes some variables to make it more difficult. For starters, every opponent has a modified version of the board they had previously to mix up their strategy. The win condition is altered so that the player has to specifically take out the headquarters, and sudden death lasts but a minute, and if the player fails to take out the enemy headquarters in that time, then they automatically lose, regardless of whether or not the player has the same amount of towers as their opponent. This change was probably made to prevent the player from turtling, which is a viable strategy in most RTS games. Defeating opponents in hard mode will reward the player with manuscripts for both Yuffie and Sonon, so there is a reason to do these again. In totality, I think this is a very fun excursion that sits in the same category as Gwent from The Witcher 3, in which it isn't a necessity, but something that every player should try at least a little bit. The inclusion of this mode here caused people to question whether or not the Four Condor minigame from the original will actually return, as you're only required to do it once in the story, and even then you can lose it without many repercussions. Personally, I can see it returning, but with clear changes so as not to scare off new players from a minigame that, in all honesty, wasn't even that bad. It just suffered from the typical PS1 era issue of poorly conveying the gameplay across to the player. Overall though, I give this minigame a big thumbs up. It's good. The vast majority of Final Fantasy games often have a very difficult opponent to overcome, more commonly known as the Super Boss. And whilst it can be argued that the base game already had a Super Boss through Top Secrets, I don't really think that counts. For starters, Pride and Joy was one of, if not the easiest enemy in that challenge and it is a bit unfair to consider multiple bosses in a row to be the same as a singular adversary. No. The true super boss of the FF7 remake is the one given via the DLC, another recurring threat from Dirge of Cerberus, the main antagonist and Nero's brother, Vice the Immaculate. 
Even before the battle starts, the game notifies you that you cannot use the Goddammering accessory in this fight, so this is meant to be a pure display of skill on the player's part, as opposed to abusing the strongest asset that is available. Vice is very strong, durable and can cover great distances to the player very quickly. Moves such as crosswise cleave and evisceration are quite difficult to dodge and can deal tremendous damage. His ability to sometimes deflect melee attacks makes applying pressure that much more difficult, but if you manage to successfully dodge either of the two moves mentioned previously, he may become pressured and therefore vulnerable to damage for a short period of time. This is generally your best window for damage, so make the most of it. If you can recall back to the fight with Reno, you'll remember that he had a thrust attack that Cloud could vault over, opening him up for damage. Well, it is the same here, except for the fact that you absolutely must avoid the attack as it cannot be blocked. Still, as long as you're aware of the tell, you could deal with this so consistently that it will basically become a free period of damage. The parry materia can make dodging this a lot easier. After dealing a sufficient amount of damage to him, he will execute a phase shift, which allows him to change into one of two alternate modes that change up both his attacks and his resistances. The first mode change sees him adopt the Mako Cannon that his deep ground ally, Azul the Cerulean, wields in Dirge of Cerberus. In this phase, he loses that pace that he had with his gun blades, and relies on raw firepower instead. This makes him a lot easier to pin down, though it isn't quite that simple as despite this phase making him more susceptible to circle strafe in a melee attacks, he is actually completely immune to physical damage during this phase. So you either have to back away and pummel him with magic from a distance, which is exactly where he wants you to be in this phase, or you can use the elemental materia to somewhat bypass this if you want to remain in melee range. The biggest threat here is his grab move called Mutilation, which can be pretty tricky to avoid, and Azure Assault in which he slams the cannon into the ground and causes a few ground projectiles to head outwards. One move he uses is called Ballistic Black Hole, which draws the player in whilst close, and deals small amounts of tick damage. The real danger of this is not only how he stays close to it, but how the gravitational pull of this can make avoiding some of his moves like Mutilation that much harder. He also gains a move called Rejuvenation, which reduces his stagger gauge over time, and asserts that this phase requires raw damage to break him out of it which is exactly why magic damage is essential. The worst part of the fight by far is when he shifts back into his gunblade phase and prepares to unleash Immaculate End, his ultimate attack. This attack will more than likely one-shot the entire party, unless one or more of them have a really high defense stat and have a barrier cast on them. Some strategies revolve around damaging him in a very specific period of time so that he can be defeated before he gets to use this, but in most circumstances your best bet to survive this is to simply have either weapons or accessories dedicated to surviving instant death attacks, such as the Superstar Belt or Revival Earrings. Another way of coping with this is by summoning Carbuncle just before he uses this move, so that the summon can instantly res and fully heal the entire party afterwards. Regardless, I hate this move. It isn't exactly gratifying nor enjoyable to lose a fight that you're doing incredibly well on just because the boss hits the fuck you button and ends the fight. It also forces the player into equipping certain items and summons just for this one move, which restricts the player in what they can do during the fight. Things like this are bad from a design perspective, and you should never take away control from the player like this unless it is some kind of scripted loss during the story. One of the reasons people hated Melania's waterfowl dance in Elden Ring is because of how incredibly harsh that move was to players that hadn't committed any kind of mechanical mistake. And before anyone says anything, I am not saying that these two moves are remotely comparable. You can dodge waterfowl dance consistently, but I was referring to situations where the player might have their backs against the wall, and can't possibly evade the move because of totally normal positioning, which wouldn't have killed them in any other scenario. Simply put, don't take away player agency, and certainly stop using unavoidable instant kill attacks to make your fight seem difficult. The reason why older JRPGs, such as the original FF7, had this was because the combat was incredibly shallow and limited. You couldn't move around enemies to avoid attacks, and the only real difficulty in those types of combat systems were the moments where enemies would simply deal too much damage for the characters to handle. It was all down to numbers, rather than skill expression, and that was the necessary trade-off in turn-based RPGs because of the system's inherent limitations. 
These exact limitations don't exist in the FF7 Remake, due to the game taking place in a three-dimensional space, which allows for more nuance when it comes to designing enemy movesets. I think an instant kill attack can work in this fight, but it should either be a well-telegraphed AoE, or an attack that can be dodged. Having this cinematic cutscene, where the player is just supposed to say, well, I'm dead, isn't good boss design, and I will die on that hill. Not that I think many people will disagree, but hey -o. Anyway, his third phase will have him draw the twin blade of Rosso the Crimson, another member of Deep Ground from Dirge of Cerberus. His moveset focuses on high speed attacks and confusing the player with teleportation. He will sometimes teleport away from the player, and this is where the gimmick of this phase comes into play. Upon entering this phase, he gains an incredibly strong HP regen which will give him almost 1000 HP back every second. If you leave him be for too long, he'll get all of that health back, so aggression is the key here. It isn't all bad though, as the trade-off is that staggering him is pretty easy during this phase, and you'll need to do this as you are not going to be able to outdamage his insane health regeneration. As an inverse to his Cerulean phase, he is immune to magic damage in his Crimson phase, so physical damage is the way to go. It is about this point in the fight where most people will be about to defeat him, but otherwise, from here he can change phases whenever he wants. And you bet your arse he can use Immaculate End again, which means if you have used up your one-time activation of the various revival assets that you had on hand, well, I hope you paid for your funeral insurance. One of the best strats for beating this fight is simple. Use Carbuncle, and use Synergy with Wind Spells for optimal damage. Play as Tifa almost exclusively, and spam parry throughout the fight to avoid Vice's incredibly difficult to avoid moves. Have one of the other characters cast Regen every so often, and use ATB on moves such as Overpower, with the Transference module equipped, to generate her limit as fast as possible. Make sure to have at least Tifa equipped with Elemental Materia on her weapon, so she can handle all of Vice's phases, and rely on your Cognition to steer yourself to victory. And if that isn't enough, there are plenty of guides on YouTube that can show you how to make this easier. Either way, I really like this fight, if you exclude Immaculate End for reasons I have already deliberated on. The fight concludes with a cutscene tying it into Dirge of Cerberus, by showing Vice's link with Hojo, which is still retarded, but whatever. And the player is rewarded with an additional two Gotadamarang, allowing for the entire party to have one. In summary, the Intermission DLC is pretty damn good, not only as a piece of extra content to tide player over until Rebirth releases, but also in terms of its additions to the gameplay mechanics and story, especially in regards to both setting up future payoffs, and connecting it to the compilation content in a way that is not only satisfying for continuity, but also in how it improves upon a once vilified piece of content within the FF7 mythos. Most people who upgraded their version of the game would have gotten this DLC free, but people who downloaded the remake as part of PS Plus before the integrated port dropped, had to purchase it separately, and it was roughly £16 or $20 in the US. This could be considered steep to a degree, as the Blood and Wine expansion for The Witcher 3 was only around an extra $5 more when it released, and has enough content to be its own game. But I would say that when compared to other DLC content, Intermission is probably worth the asking price, especially for what it sets up going forward. And with that out of the way, I can wrap up the discussion on the DLC. The themes of Final Fantasy VII have always been a core aspect of the story, and there are a few to discuss. I want to begin this segment by making it clear that the original FF7 and the remake have a different central theme, and this is important for discussing what the purpose of the remake really is, and why the two stories convey different things. The original was a story of life and death, and the various ways that these manifest throughout the world. Some of the imagery and motifs are pretty blatant, such as the parallels between both Aerith and Sephiroth, with Aerith having aspects that represented her role as Warden of Life, such as her bubbly, altruistic outlook, emphasis on her healing abilities, and her possession of the White Materia, Holy. Sephiroth carried symbolic opposites, having a cynical and misanthropic view of life. Most of his abilities were focused on destruction, and he tends towards the Black Materia, Meteor. Aside from this being emphasised in the case of livestream chapters in On The Way To A Smile, as the white chapters represent Aerith, and the black chapters, Sephiroth. 
The mirroring between the two is even represented by the similarities in their looks. Both of them have green eyes, they both have bangs in their hair, and both possess sharper features, at least in their original artwork. With Aerith being consistently described by the devs as the most important character in the story, really, the main clash of powers in the original story was between these two, rather than Cloud and Sephiroth, as their conflict is based entirely on personal grounds. This is why the original game ended with Holy attempting to counteract Meteor, requiring the additional aid of the planet's life force to stop it. This is exactly why the remake put such an emphasis on the opening scene with Aerith fleeing from the alley, as she senses a disturbance, as an excerpt from One Winged Angel plays, albeit much more restrained. The case of livestream chapters make a point to establish the manner in which the flow of time is influenced by the livestream, which not only serves as an explanation for the existence of the Whispers, but also how both Aerith and Sephiroth managed to traverse the stream to a moment in the past. Sephiroth likely went back to try and claim victory, and Aerith did the same just to stop him. But they are merely energy, so they required their physical selves in that current time to carry out their plans, whether or not they were even aware or understood it. This brings us to the central theme of the remake, and why it is different. It is pretty simple. Destiny, or more accurately, the defiance of it. You see, I believe the purpose of the remake is quite clear. Based on the character outcomes of the original, the bittersweet conclusion of Advent Children, and the novel's exploration of the livestream, the purpose is to amend a certain tragedy that represented the game for years, and that is Aerith's death. One of the most frustrating takes I hear when discussing this game, and the purpose of the story, is that Aerith's death is too important to be changed, and how she had to die for the plot to work. These statements are objectively wrong. You see, Aerith's death was important because of the themes that the original game were attempting to convey, and her death was inspired by the tragic loss of Hironobu Sagaguchi's mother, which served as an important reminder that death is often unceremonious and can happen in the blink of an eye. It is also important to remember that this event happened a few years before the release of FF7, and as such was a formative moment for his perspective on stories as a whole. In regards to the logistics of the story, however, Aerith's death was not vital at all. In fact, the heroes would have probably prevailed much earlier than they normally do, as Aerith's presence changes things significantly. For starters, having a mage of her quality around would make things easier to begin with, and her presence would have been enough to prevent Cloud from giving the Black Bateria to Sephiroth at the Northern Crater, as she has already shown that she can enter his psyche to communicate with him. As such, this alone would completely invalidate Sephiroth's plan, but even if he were to obtain it, she can explain to the party what is required to save the planet, as in Holy, immediately rather than needing the party to uncover the truth without her, which cost valuable time. And on top of all of that, the manual for Dirge of Cerberus confirms that Holy would have worked, if it had been activated earlier, which it would have if Sephiroth was either killed sooner thanks to Aerith's help, or if Aerith stops Cloud from giving the Black Materia to Sephiroth, in which they can simply kill him when he is helplessly encased in Amber, without the power to destroy the planet in his hands. The livestream was required because Holy was activated too late, not that Holy was always going to fail. If that was the case, then what was the point in it entirely when its entire purpose was to counter Meteor? Sephiroth's decision to kill Aerith was the correct one from his point of view, as she was the most direct threat to his plans, and it doubled up as being a severe blow to Cloud 2, which pleased him. He couldn't anticipate that Aerith had an ace up her sleeve. He thought he had won, which is why he laughs at Cloud before the final duel between them in the Northern Crater. Aerith's death was meant to be an absolute tragedy, entirely because she didn't have to die in order for the heroes to succeed. It was the low point that put Sephiroth squarely in the lead, and obliterated the morale of the heroes, as none of them expected to lay one of their friends to rest. So, with the point made clear that her death was not mandatory, you can see why the remake exists to right that wrong. With an entirely different thematic outlook, and plenty of impetus for its existence, this is why we see many references towards her death throughout the remake, and why the finale is literally the player destroying the concept of fate. Regardless of how janky the writing may be, what is the point of the remake if things stay the way they were? 
On another note, I have also noticed that the same crowd that wants Aerith's death to stay the same seem to be completely fine with Zack surviving in the remake, as if his death wasn't important to Cloud's situation at the start of the game. It almost seems like a bit of bias towards certain characters from what I see. Before I move on to another theme, I want to use an example from the game that supports the thematic difference between both the original and the remake, and that is the destruction of the Sector 7 plate. In the original, the plate practically squashes everything beneath it, and the party doesn't get to return to the slums, reinforcing the bleak and depressing aesthetic that the game was going for, and I have seen some criticism levied towards the manner in which the remake handled it, as there the party do return to the slums, attempting to help those that are still trapped, and to bear witness to how much damage has been caused. The criticism seems to fall along the lines of how the slums should be inaccessible, or how having survivors detracts from the hopelessness that is meant to inform the central theme, and these would be somewhat agreeable, if the themes were the same, but they aren't. As far as logistics go, it is quite plausible that most of the plate will have fallen apart, and become strewn across the slums below, rather than perfectly flattening it like a neat pancake, so that counters the idea that there wouldn't be anything to go back to. But the real purpose of the return was to instill the ideas of hope, perseverance and life, whereas the original made this situation a lot more anticlimactic, and emphasised the death that the situation caused, therefore appealing to its core theme. I would argue that both methods are valid and effective, but I simply wanted to clarify that these differences are not made because the writers didn't understand what made the original tick, especially seeing as they're mostly the same writers. No, it is apparent that there is a different route that they want to follow, and the game's story falls in line with these changes. Another theme of the remake, or FF7 as a whole, are the many relationships of the game. I have already talked enough about the contentious topic of the love triangle, though the examples of both romantic and platonic relationships are there. There are, of course, other examples too, and the reason I think this is a theme is because of the willingness to show the many different kinds of ways that characters are attached to one another throughout the story. There are positive relationships involving family, such as Barrett and Marlene, Aerith and Elmira, Cloud and Denzel, just to name a few, as well as examples of toxic familial relationships, such as Sephiroth and Hojo, Yuffie and Godo, and Marlene and Dine. The bonds of toxicity in these relationships are sometimes rather complicated too, such as between Cloud and Tifa, where Tifa unintentionally played a role in Cloud's ostracization as a child, and how part of her arc was recognising and atoning for this mistake by attempting to build that bridge between them back. A lot of people think that these two are super lovey-dovey, and if so, I honestly think you missed the point. Speaking of the bonds of brotherhood, what about Cloud and Zack? The two of them are shown to be strong friends, who would live and die to protect one another should the need arise, and this is also depicted through the Avalanche trio too. An interesting relationship is Yuffie and Sonon's, as Sonon seems to look upon Yuffie as a surrogate sister to fill the hole in his heart because of the one he lost. And what about the bizarre relationship that Sephiroth and Genova share? Where Sephiroth has this warped perspective about how Genova is his true mother, due to his experimentation closely aligning with her own physiology, and how this separates him from his true mother, Lucrezia, who never got to have a relationship with him at all. The most important one of them all, however, is of course the love that both Cloud and Aerith share with one another. Without diving into the countless canonical sources to support this, and the logical parallels between other Final Fantasy couples, Cloud and Aerith are one of the few relationships that are entirely wholesome, and don't suffer from bad blood between them. No, Cloud beating Aerith up at the Temple of Ancients doesn't count, you fool. He was being controlled. You see, the two of them hold the most obvious romantic chemistry in the game, and actually have a natural relationship. You know, genuine romance, where they secretly want to spend time with one another, and sometimes show that in awkward ways. As opposed to two six-year-olds sitting on swings, eating ice cream in a primary school playground, playing at the idea of being boyfriend and girlfriend, because that isn't exactly my idea of romantic. I'm just glad that there isn't an example of a high school-esque relationship that features an unfaithful guy taking a girl for granted, and that is seen as a good pairing. Nope. None at all. 
A smaller theme that I wanted to touch upon, and one that I vehemently disagree with, is the game's allegorical perspective towards climate change. Now, don't worry, this isn't going to be some political tirade, but it does seem to be a theme of the story, so I'll touch on it briefly. My main gripe with it is how it doesn't accurately match up to real world comparisons, therefore weakening the allegory completely. Mako seems to be directly compared to fossil fuels, which is interesting because fossil fuels clearly did exist in this universe at some point, as not only do we see machinery that was powered by electricity in the sewers, but Barrett's hometown, Corel, is a mining town whose main export was coal, and there is backstory in how the town's coal mines were shut down and replaced with Mako, and how this is shown to be a negative, which is intriguing. Either way, Mako is a filtered version of the livestream's energy, and draining it from the planet has adverse effects, eventually leading to its death if it were to continue. My contention is that Mako can't be directly compared to things like coal, as Mako is directly draining the planet's life energy, whereas coal and other fossil fuels are said to contribute excess levels of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, therefore perpetuating the greenhouse effect. But regardless as to whether or not this is a real life concern isn't the point. What is agreeable is that burning coal is not directly to blame for the destruction of the planet, nor is it equivocal to bleeding the planet, and this is why I reject the idea that this allegory fits. Even if the developers always intended this to be the message, the manner in which coal mining and the usage of fossil fuels is vindicated when depicting the lives of the people in Corel counters their point. So this would be an example of death of the author, and how their own content opposes their message. Still though, this is seen as a theme of the game, so I saw fit to mention it. So, I've talked a lot about this game's quality in abundance, and I have also described some of its shortcomings, but I wanted to take an example of a criticism that I agree with, and one I disagree with so as to broach more on the topic. The criticism that I agree with is a simple one, though it is predicated entirely on how the sequels handle it going forward, and it is the entire premise of The Whispers, an inclusion of fate into this universe. Generally, I am pretty much against time travel and predetermined universes in storytelling on principle, as these things can not only substantially derail the story, but bring up a whole host of questions regarding the established rules. There are some things that are vital when writing a story, one of these is sticking to the rules that have been established, also known as internal consistency. An example of this would be with someone like Superman. We know that someone like Superman cannot exist in our world, and if we were to delve into his physiology, we would likely find it incredibly illogical in how his power can even exist. But the DC Universe consistently shows us that his power is derived from the amount of solar radiation that he has received. If he spends enough time underneath the sun, then his power will increase. If he goes closer to the sun, then he will receive more radiation, and therefore his power will increase even more. Were we to remove him from sunlight, his power drains. All that matters for his stories is that they remain consistent to a rule that they have set. It is the same with lightsabers. People use lightsabers as an argument as to why the plots don't have to make sense. As lightsabers aren't real, so who cares? Well, I care, and people who are interested in strong storytelling also care. The thing is, lightsabers were always shown as being concentrated beams of plasma that can cut through most things, though not all, and can be activated by pressing a button. Whether or not this makes sense in the real world is entirely irrelevant. As long as it is logically consistent with the rules that the creator has established, then it is perfectly understandable. The problem here is that things such as time travel and the concept of fate are incredibly difficult to write, as having characters that can influence previous events in time means that they'll almost certainly be enacting constant change, and therefore would be bending the rules of their universe all of the time. This is where we get to the next vital aspect that should be thought about when writing a story, and that is believability. It is important that the audience understands what is going on in the story as much as possible, and if you bring incredibly difficult concepts to the fore like the ones just mentioned, then you are going to lose your audience very quickly, which is what often leads to messy writing. Lastly, my final issue stems directly with the concept of fate, and it is because this takes the agency away from characters. I don't want to consume a story that tells me that a character was always going to make a certain decision at a certain time, 
rather than them making an informed decision based entirely on the character's ideals, personality, and whatever the situation calls for. This issue is something that plagues the final part of Remake's story, and is the only thing that keeps me from labelling the story as good. If the overall point of the remake wasn't to allow Aerith's survival, which is an entirely subjective preference of mine, then I would likely have said that the game's ending destroys the entire story, and drags it into a 1 out of 10 category. However, I am willing to see what they do with this first before jumping to conclusions. And you never know, maybe they'll manage to be one of the few examples of stories that handle these concepts effectively. The other criticism is one I don't agree with, and one that I haven't seen people substantiate, and that is the criticism of the game's pacing. A lot of people, even fans of the game, say that the pacing is downright bad, and yet none of them go into detail as to why. You see, this irks me because the remake was a great vessel for adding more detail to parts of the story that the original glossed over, and this is nothing but a benefit. For example, after returning to the Sector 7 slums in the original, post-bombing of Mako Reactor 1, the party rests for the night, and then immediately sets off for Mako Reactor 5 the next day. Not only does this prevent the characters from properly formulating a plan, especially to account for the increased security due to the loss of Mako Reactor 1, but it prevents the player from settling down and adjusting to the characters. The time that Barrett spends making a plan for their next mission is time that can be spent allowing Cloud to rest, and to flesh out the other characters such as Tifa, who was introduced at the same time. Now I don't know about you, but the breakneck pace of the original isn't a good thing, not for storytelling anyway, and the remake practically fixed this warped pacing by allowing the player to breathe, and the game does this multiple times after significant story events occur. I mentioned this earlier in regards to Chapter 8, but this is also done after the player falls, in which they bombard the player with side quests in Chapter 14 before the final stretch of the story. This might sound like a bad thing, but sometimes you need to break up the monotony in the story by providing filler, as this is something that is quite true to life. Most of our lives are pretty bland for the most part, but then the occasional thing comes along that spices it up. These aren't always nice things, sometimes it can be a personal tragedy, and that rings true for the characters in a story. Pacing becomes an issue when the plot goes too fast, and too many tumultuous things happen within a short time period of one another, or when the game just keeps giving you side quests to distract you from the main story. Looking at you, Final Fantasy XVI. All in all, I would argue that the pacing for this game is pretty strong. I don't know if I would use it as an example of a game with incredible pacing, but I certainly wouldn't use it as an example of the opposite. There are certainly many theories that people hold regarding this game, and they love to manufacture them in order to spark up discussions on a game that is over three years old now. This is all well and good, but these theories don't interest me, as most of them come across as a way of reaching for innocuous information to come up with the most batshit takes on the story possible. Most of these theorists get basic facts about the story wrong too, and come across as closeted shippers rather than people who are actually interested in having an intellectual discussion on what the story offers. But, seeing as I did mention it in the synopsis, I did have a theory of my own, and a simple one at that. This is what I refer to as the Particle Theory, and it basically confirms that there are at least two timelines. During the ending of the game after defeating the Whispers, we get a scene of Zack standing triumphant over the corpses of the Shinra guards that were sent to dispose of him, and as he walks towards the place he left Cloud, he is knocked to the ground by a distant explosion, centred around Midgar. In an earlier scene, we see that the Whispers had surrounded Midgar, yet there wasn't a comment from either Zack or the Shinra forces on the strange floating entities that were encircling the city, so it is obvious that they couldn't see them. After the Whispers are vanquished, the ones surrounding the city here disappear in what seems to be a pretty big explosion, and it is here where Zack actually sees the particles falling around him. He seems confused by this, obviously, and then we see the people of Sector 7 attempting to rebuild, before they too see the particles. Lastly, there is another shot of particles falling near the leaf house in Sector 5, and we see Biggs awake from his slumber. Considering that Jesse's gloves are also on the table, it is evident that they survived. Well, in one timeline anyway. And this leads us to the scene that sticks out like a sore thumb, the scene where Marlene is watering the flowers in Aerith's room. We have a clear shot of the outside, 
and there are no particles, even though this is just a stone's throw away from the leaf house where there were particles falling. So this pretty much confirms that these are not in the same timeline, and this makes sense, as it is clear from the ending of Intermission that they have a different purpose in store for Zack. Seeing as he is in Sector 5, he will likely rendezvous with both Biggs and Jesse, and presumably Wedge if he's still alive here, and he will have his own mission, and hopefully he will finally get a character, which will run parallel to the main timeline where our primary party exists. At the very least, this would confirm two timelines, but as far as we're aware, each of the scenes that show particles falling could be their own timeline entirely, and might not have any connection to the others. If this is the case, then there theoretically could be infinite timelines. But if that is indeed the case, then it doesn't bode well for the writing, as there would be an infinite amount of timelines where Sephiroth succeeds, and an infinite amount of timelines where the heroes succeed without effort. Keeping it strictly to two, and having these stories hold importance with one another without any universe hopping shit would be the best outcome from what this ending shows. Anyway, there you go, that is my theory for this game, so you're welcome. And I didn't even have to be hopped up on that good shit in order to fabricate some of the whacked out perspectives that the FF7 theorist community holds. I just used clear references from the game, and made a logical conclusion to what I believe is the best answer to explain the timeline issue with the limited information that the game offers. Moving on. Alright, I'm about ready to wrap this up, so let's just go over what I've covered one last time very briefly. The story, for the most part, is a pretty damn fearful recreation of the original, and utilises the additional depth that was added to flesh out not only parts of the plot, but also character work and the world building. When compared to the Midgar arc from the original, it is hard to argue against the remake being superior narratively, when there's so much more to analyse and so much more meaning that can be derived from it. There are certainly a few minor areas where the original had a better execution, but these are few and far between. It is the last act of the game and the major changes to push the story into sequel territory that mar the quality of the game's writing as a whole, and is the primary thing that purists take issue with. Seeing as some of these questionable aspects of the writing have yet to be fully delineated upon, and are left to the remaining parts to deal with, it can be hard to properly nail down all of the writing issues outside of the basic causal effects to the rules of the universe. Generally, the story is pretty solid, and is an improvement on the original version of the Midgar story, but the ending pokes holes that may eventually cause this ship to sink. It is merely a matter of whether or not they can patch these holes. The gameplay is very good, and gives the player a lot to work with when it comes to build variety. Not as much as something like Elden Ring, mind you, but then again these are two entirely different games with different focuses. With a tight, responsive control system, good balancing, and plenty of enemy and boss variety, this game succeeds in the gameplay department. The DLC is an excellent addition to the overall package, and includes some changes to the gameplay and story that are almost certainly test runs for the complete ideas that will be fulfilled in Rebirth. The themes are also handled very well, and are well represented by the story and characters within it. The reason why this was my first full-blown critique for a video game on this channel is because of not only my adoration for this universe as a whole, but because I had a balanced set of views that could be levied upon it. This video can also stand as a potentially prescient chronicle of what the following games are going to be like, and it will be interesting to look back on this critique in a few years to see just how wrong I was. So, what is my verdict for this game? Well, I don't really like setting scores for games, as they are incredibly reductive, and you shouldn't need that if you have watched this entire critique. But I would say that this game is very good. As good as the original? Well, that isn't exactly a fair comparison, as this game only accounts for about a quarter of the entire story, and a third of this upcoming trilogy. Because of how well this game makes up for some of the mistakes of the compilation, and oh boy are there a lot of problems with the compilation, I would say that this game gets a pretty big thumbs up from me. That being said, there is a lot that the sequels have to do to answer the questions that I was left posing towards the end of the game, and when they release, I will be there. It might take like three years for me to finally finish critiquing it, but it'll happen. Before I go, there is one last thing that I wanted to bring up again and that is the tonal differences between the music in both the original game and in the remake. More specifically, I wanted to use Aerith's theme as a direct example, 
as anyone who has listened to both versions will probably agree with me when I say that the original version is a lot more depressing to listen to when compared to the remakes, and it can be difficult to pin down the reason as to why, but this is something that seems to ripple throughout the entirety of the original soundtrack. I actually find these differences to be emblematic of the themes that both games are trying to convey, as the original version has a much more melancholic and dreary countenance to it, which embodies the bleak and bittersweet world that it is a part of, and the depressing fate for the individual that it is attached to. This falls in line with the themes that Sakakuchi wanted to set, and the remake does the opposite. In the remake, her theme is that much more optimistic, and this might be due to the increased clarity in the instrumentation used thanks to modern sound chips, which helps to solidify the idea of defying fate and hoping for a better outcome. Things might not necessarily change for the better in this new story, but this sense of optimism leads to hope, and even if that hope is folly, well, I don't think I can put it better than the White Wizard himself. There never was much hope. I hope you enjoyed this critique, warts and all, and, just like the party, I will be seeing you in Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. Thanks for watching. Hey you, you're finally awake. If you managed to make it this far, then congrats, this critique came in at around 107,000 words so you can understand why this took so long. Anyway, I wanted to not only use this as a platform to shill my Patreon, which is the best way that you can support my work directly at this current time, but it is also where I can tell you about what projects I have in the pipeline, and what to expect. For starters, I will still be focusing on game playthroughs here and there, so that won't be changing, but as for any other pieces of long form content that I'll be working on, well, I'm gonna go through them. The next main project that I wanted to work on is a series that will take me into the foreseeable future to complete, and therefore will always give me something to work towards until another major release comes out, and that is a full series critique of the mainline Assassin's Creed franchise. I want to look at what made the earlier entries so strong, and what made the latter entries so... well... bad but it will also serve to be quite an interesting project for me as it has been a long time since I have played many of these games, so being able to tackle them again may lead to me having a fresh perspective on many of the titles, for better or for worse. I am still on the fence on when I intend to make a video dissecting Crisis Core, as I am quite firm on the perspective that the game is objectively bad, and deserves to be torn asunder eventually. But because of the absolute mental fatigue that I have after breaking this game down for the past two years, this may not be anytime soon. I am also awaiting a PC release of God of War Ragnarok, so I can do a double feature of both God of War 4 and Ragnarok to show why both of these games are phenomenal, and how well they work as a duology. And due to my recent completion of Final Fantasy XVI, and how it is one of, if not, my favourite in the series, I can foresee myself doing a critique on that game as long as it gets a good PC port. There is still a lot for me to improve when it comes to script writing, editing, sound mixing and all that jazz of course, and I hope I shall. Anyway, I will let you get some sleep now, as you'll clearly need it, and I'll see you in whatever project it is I am working on next. See ya!